Icon Audio Arts. The ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn. Jack Kerouac. This book is dedicated to my son, Eden Garrett Giuliano. Contents. Introduction. Rishikesh Rising. 1. Will I Wait a Lonely Lifetime? Liverpool and Hamburg, 1940-1961. 2. Don't Allow the Day. Liverpool and London, 1962-1963. 3. Please Escape Me from This Zoo. America and the World, 1964-1965. 4. Right is Only Half of What's Wrong. London, 1966. 5. The Love Inside Us All, Inner Space, 1967. 6. Across the Universe, The Beatles' Rishi Kesh Diary, 1968. 7. Mother Superior Jumped at the Gun, Ascot, Henley, St. John's Wood, and Surrey, 1968. 8. Good Evening and Welcome to Slaggers, Central London, 1969. 9. Heads Across the Sky, New York, Los Angeles, and London, 1970-1979. 10. The Love There That's Sleeping, Home, 1980-1995. 11. It Don't Come Easy, Resolution, 1996-2003. Introduction. Rishi Kesh Rising. There is a rare film of a long-ago afternoon in February 1968 preserved by an Italian television crew who, along with the rest of the world's media, descended on the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's enclave in Rishikesh for a glimpse of the Beatles as aspiring mystics. Even today it is an enticing image. Here are John, Paul, George, Ringo, Mike Love, Donovan, Mia Farrow, with her sister Prudence and brother Johnny, and the Beatle wives singing sweetly to the jangling of acoustic guitars. She'll be coming round the mountain when the saints go marching in, fronted by George Harrison and Mia Farrow. You are my sunshine, jingle bells, as well as a ragged rendition of the Hare Krishna mantra. The Maharishi urged everyone, Fathom the infinity. Dive into the Ganges, fathom the infinity. To which George replied, Hey, I guess we don't merely just exist after all. I played it all back in my head in the early summer of 2000 as I struggled along in the stifling midday sun past the sparkling Ganges, past the thatched huts of small groups of ashen-covered dope-smoking babas, and finally the monsoon-carved boulder-strewn left turn that took me to the Maharishi's padlocked front door. Over the years, I've spent a lot of time in Rishikesh, first drawn there in the early 1990s by images I saw as a kid flickering across my family's old black-and-white TV of George, John, and their friends walking peacefully along brick walkways lined with painted stones deep inside the Maharishi's secret Shangri-La. Driving along the road from Hardwar, the nearest train stop from Delhi, I might have missed it, but even without being told, I knew somehow that this was the place. Although the area had been built up over succeeding decades, Rishikesh is still very much a quaint village highlighted by an astounding black-topped suspension bridge, Ramjula, that connects the seeker to the other side of the Ganges. It is only just wide enough for two or three people to walk across shoulder to shoulder. After a sharp right turn, you are on the home stretch to Maharishi Central, circa 1968, the place where the Beatles were inspired to write some of their most compelling and spiritual music. Look hard enough and you will find photos of all of the Beatles arriving as I did on that gently swaying bridge. If nothing else, the wide swirling Ganges and the cloud-covered blue mountain range are enough to touch the hardest of hearts. 
In this still magical valley, there are dozens of tiny temples from which by 4.30 in the morning you can hear the echoes of blowing conchs, the chanting of the Hindu faithful, the smell of the pungent aroma of dupe, North Indian hand-rolled incense, and smoldering cow dung fires. Rishikesh overwhelms the senses and, within moments of arrival, transmits an immediate peace. After a few days, the restless mind reads that as boredom, but it soon turns into something deeper, richer, and much harder to define. Almost as soon as the Beatles had left in the late spring of 1968, the Maharishi ordered the heavy iron front gates locked. No one, except local caretakers, some Indian followers, and those foreigners bearing a signed letter from the master, were allowed entrance. As I fell into none of those categories on my first trip to Rishikesh in 1998, I was turned away in brusque Hindi by the guard. Still, I was determined to see inside the place in hopes it might somehow have remained frozen in time. After some debate, My wife at the time, Vrinda, and I decided that if we got up early enough, around five or six, we might just be able to sneak in. Not expecting intruders at such an early hour, the guard was sound asleep at his post, his rifle tucked under his chin in the small booth at the outside perimeter. We walked silently through the ten-acre estate, with its own functioning post office, a large multi-story dormitory, and several dilapidated stone cottages. Then we decided to sneak out through a second gate at the opposite end of the property. There we met a good-natured wide-awake guard who advised us politely not to go out that way, as there were most certainly man-eating tigers, spitting cobras, and several wild elephants in the jungle beyond not to mention the 300-foot drop directly into the rock-strewn river below. Several months later, I took my 24-year-old son, Devon, a family friend from Delhi, and a couple of mischievous Indian boys inside at dusk. This time there was no guard, no guns, and even no gate. Apparently the decades-long policy of guarding the birthplace of the Beatles' White Album and the spiritual revolution of the 60s had been abandoned. As we ventured inside the basement of a large dormitory, an old man rushed over from one of the cottages and warned us to come out immediately, as the tigers often came at dusk to feast upon young deer in the ravaged rooms that had once hosted the elite of the pop world. We didn't have to be told twice. We made our way to the famous house where the master had met privately with the Beatles to discuss the inscrutable truth. He had offered the war-weary world of the late 1960s. It was not at all the million-dollar house to which John Lennon had referred impishly in his quasi-musical litany to the Maharishi, but rather a simple stone and wood house with several large windows that allowed us to see inside. There was a moderately large living room, a kitchen, and perhaps two bedrooms at the back. Legend has it there is a cave underneath the house where the Maharishi performed deep meditation. What struck me was how often writers like myself, without any first-hand knowledge, exaggerated John's description that this house was some kind of mansion with a helipad. The Maharishi's elaborate chair, or asan, with carved lion's feet, stood empty on a veranda facing the compound, broken, weather-beaten, and perhaps not used since the Beatles had sat round and strummed their acoustic guitars. The next morning I came back alone, excited, and almost able to feel the imprint of the Beatles and company from some thirty years ago. This time I met an old sannyasi or renunciate, Ravinda Damodar Sarup Swami, a godbrother of the Maharishi. He remembered well the Beatles' brief but very public time there, and dancing with Mia Farrow during an impromptu acoustic concert by Donovan, the Beatles, and Mike Love on the roof of the dining hall. He also recalled the day a helicopter took John Lennon and the Guru for a ride over the Rishikesh Valley. Intrigued, I questioned him further, but he only smiled and offered me a tattered notebook he took from a trunk. It contained some seventy pages of scrawled Hindi, which had evidently been a monk's diary. You write book about Beatles and Guru Maharaj, then you must read this, my writing from that time. Everything is here. You please take, sir, he ventured. He asked me to return it after I had read it. 
He then walked me down along the curving lane to the front gates of the Ganges, pointing out along the way four pebble-covered stone domes, which he said the Maharishi had built for the beetles to use for their advanced meditation. Inside the little buildings were about ten feet round at the base, with a small area for resting, reading, or eating, and a little wooden ladder to a platform on which they would presumably have sat in the lotus position to ascend into the lofty godhead from which we all sprang. They were never used. In many ways, the Maharishi's Rishikesh estate is a kind of cultural time warp. The events which took place there so long ago have somehow imprinted themselves on its fiber. Pilgrimage is an ancient and important element of human history, and my trek to Rishikesh informed and inspired this book. There, amongst the old stones, rusted signs, tigers, and solitary sadhus, many of my views on the Beatles' real import in our cultural history were crystallized. In the exotic, perfumed Himalayan foothills, I was surrounded by the ghosts of John Lennon and his cohorts, and simultaneously exorcised any doubts which I might have had about going forward with this potentially risky book. Here, in a visionary flash, John and Paul were sitting on the stone steps of the former bungalow, composing the gentle I Will, while Ringo smoked a cigarette at their feet. As Donovan and George played love songs in the sunny grounds, the Beatle wives chatted in a circle with the children of the ashram staff. Overwhelmed by the enduring magic that hovered amongst the broken buildings, I left my companions to stand alone along the edge of the mountain about which Donovan had once sung, First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is, and made a kind of silent pact with history before me. For everything that this place, and indeed the Beatles, had given me, I would write without reservation or restraint. Two years later, I am in a cramped mobile home in a northern Florida campground, and you are at the other end of this collection of words which spilled out of my search for the Beatles' secret history. Whether or not I got it right now seems entirely up to you. Jeffrey Giuliano, 8 December, 2002, Alachula, Florida. Chapter 1 Will I Wait a Lonely Lifetime? Liverpool and Hamburg, 1940-1961 After I stopped living at Penny Lane, I moved in with my auntie who lived in the suburbs in a nice semi-detached place with a small garden with doctors, lawyers, and that ilk living around there. Not the poor, slummy kind of image which was projected in all the Beatles' stories. In the class system, it was about a half a class higher than Paul, George, and Ringo, who lived in government-subsidized housing. We owned our house and had a garden. They didn't have anything like that. John Lennon I was always well-mannered and polite. My dad brought me up to always tip my hat to my elders, and I always used to do it until I was about fourteen and I didn't wear a cap anymore. Paul McCartney after leaving Liverpool's Blue Coat Orphanage at 15, where he and his brothers resided since their father's death, Alfred Lennon drifted through a succession of dead-end jobs and ended up as a porter at a smart Merseyside hotel. It was around this time that he first became acquainted with the teenage Julia Stanley. It was a beautiful meeting, remembered Alfred. A mate and I were sitting in Sefton Park, where he was attempting to show me how to pick up girls. I'd recently bought myself a cigarette holder and a new bowler hat to boot, just to try and impress the ladies, you know. There was this little girl we had our eye on. As I walked past, she said, "'You look silly.' Well, I replied, "'You look lovely,' and sat down beside her. Anyway, she said, "'If I really wanted to sit beside her, I would have to take that silly hat off.' So I got up and I flung it in the lake. It was, as they say, the beginning of a monumentous relationship, if not one that the clannish Stanley family would easily embrace. As Julia's sister Mimi Smith remembered, he was really quite good-looking, I'll admit, but we all knew he would be of no real use to anyone. Young love, however, overruled common sense, and on 3 December 1938, the couple married at the Mount Pleasant Registry Office in Liverpool. Alfred recalled the grand occasion. One day, Julia said to me, well, let's go get married. I said, if we are, then we've got to do it properly. She said, I bet you won't. 
So damned if I didn't, just for the lark. It was all a big laugh, really, getting married. They spent their honeymoon at the cinema, and afterwards they went home to their respective families. The next day, Alfred packed up his few belongings and signed on for a three-month tour of duty aboard a passenger liner bound for the West Indies. Julia, somewhat constrained by the circumstances in which she now found herself, had little to do but wait for her man. Over the next year or two, Alfred breezed back into her life from time to time, each time settling in for a week or two with the Stanleys. After one such visit, Julia discovered she was pregnant. Typically, Alfred Lennon was nowhere to be found. A few months later, she packed a suitcase and checked into the maternity hospital in Oxford Street. Just after seven o'clock the next morning, on 9 November 1940, John Winston Lennon was born and placed under Julia's bed in case the hospital was struck by one of the bombs which regularly rained upon Liverpool. Mimi rushed home through the war-torn streets to pass on the good news to the rest of the family, but by this time their widowed father had moved into a modest three-bedroom terrace house at 9 Newcastle Road in the Penny Lane district, which became John's first home. Charlie Lennon, Alfred's youngest brother, remembered visiting young John there once while Alfred and Julia were still together. I was on leave from the army when Elf happened to be ashore. He asked me if I'd mind coming up to Newcastle Road to help him with a bit of painting he wanted to do. Afterwards, we went out for a drink together, and he confided his feelings about Julia and John. He told me he felt very guilty about being away so much, but that on several occasions the ship's captain had threatened to clap him in irons if he attempted to leave the ship. Every now and again he'd ring up Mimi from Southampton just to see how they were all getting on. She'd tell him not to worry as they were all okay and being well looked after by the Stanleys. Anyway, my second day at the house, little John and I took a stroll to the shops just for something to do. I bought him a red tin bus, and while I was chatting with the young lady behind the counter, John suddenly stormed outside with a huge toy Donald Duck tucked precariously under his arm. Well, after I collared the little bugger, we went back inside, and I ended up paying for both of the toys. But I didn't mind. John was a lovely little boy. All in all, I only ever saw John a few times as a lad. I know he certainly didn't visit our home. It was never, oh, I'm going to see my gran or anything like that. His mother absolutely never came near our side of the family, as she had been that hurt by Alf. In early 1942, Julia received word that Alfred had left his ship in America, thus effectively closing the door on their relationship, and decided it was time to move on. Years later, though, John said he had the impression that Julia and Alfred enjoyed some happy times together. She always used to tell me about them larking around and laughing. I think Alf must have been very popular with his shipmates, as he used to send us concert programs with his name down for singing things like Begin the Begin. The next chapter in Julia's life began when she got together with John Elbert Dykins. Some say they met at a dance, and others that they bumped into each other while Julia was working part-time in Penny Lane as a waitress. Whatever the truth, the couple fell in love, sparking great controversy in Julia's family. John's maternal cousin, Dr. Leela Harvey, explained, From the little I have been able to gather, Mimi, and to a significantly lesser extent, Pop, Julia's father, had some very grave reservations regarding John Dykins. The general consensus was that Bobby... Julia's nickname for her new lover, might have been from a lower class than they. Anyway, Julia was still legally married to Alfred. The couple, however, threw caution to the winds and promptly moved into a tiny flat and gateacre with a five-year-old John. Mimi then took it upon herself to intervene in what she supposed were her nephew's best interests. One day she stormed in and demanded that John be handed over to her, as she felt Julia was no longer fit to look after him. It was her contention that in view of her sister's recent so-called indiscretion involving the out-of-wedlock birth of a daughter, Victoria Elizabeth, it would be wrong for her to keep John, especially when Mimi, she said, could offer him a well-ordered, financially secure environment. John Dykins, however, overruled Mimi's objections, informing her that as John was Julia's child, she could keep him if she wanted. And, of course, 
She did. Julia Baird, John's younger sister, confided to me that it broke Julia's heart to consider giving John up. After all, within five years, circumstance had robbed Julia of her husband and her infant daughter, Victoria, who had been put up for adoption via the Salvation Army and was now threatening to snatch her son. Soon, however, Mimi reappeared with a social worker vowing not to leave the house without John. They're not properly married, Mimi declared. Therefore, John should come and live with me, at least until Julia gets her life together. I'm afraid that doesn't really make any difference as far as we're concerned, Mrs. Smith, said the young woman. The boy, after all, is her son. Julia must have been thrilled to have the full force of the law on her side, but this was short-lived. A routine inspection of the flat revealed that John didn't really have his own sleeping quarters. Julia tucked him in beside her at night. He would have to live elsewhere until a separate bedroom could be arranged. This time, Julia had no choice but to agree, and so John was packed off to Mimi's. As a child, John was surrounded by a clan of five women he termed as his Amazon aunties. He called the experience his early feminist education. It was scary because there was nobody that I could relate to, he remembered later. Neither my aunties, friends, nor anybody could ever see what I did. It was a very, very frightening experience, and many times the only contact I had was reading about people like Oscar Wilde, Dylan Thomas, or Van Gogh, and all those old books which Mimi had. They talked about the suffering they went through because of their visions. They were tortured by society for trying to express themselves. All I ever saw was loneliness. A precocious child with a talent for drawing and writing, by the age of seven he was penning his own little books. One of them, Sport, Speed, and Illustrated by J.W. Lennon, contained a witty collection of poems, caricatures, and short stories which demonstrated his keen sense of the absurd. In 1986, Paul McCartney recalled the literary Lennon. Inside the house, he'd often be busy at the typewriter, writing in his famous in-his-own-right style. I never actually knew anyone who personally owned a typewriter before. At the age of 12, John left Dovedell Primary for Quarry Bank Grammar School a mile down the road from Mimi's. He was soon restless and bored with his studies, however. People like me are aware of their so-called genius even as a kid. Didn't they see that I was cleverer than everyone else in the school and that the teachers were stupid as well? I used to say to my auntie, you throw my bloody poetry out and you'll regret it when I'm famous, and she threw it out. I never forgave her for not treating me like a genius when I was a child. Why didn't they train me? Why did they keep forcing me to be a cowboy like the rest of them? I was different. I was always different. Why didn't anyone notice me? By the mid-fifties, Julia's passion for American rock music had transmitted itself to John and she purchased his first guitar, which he soon learned to play. In early 1957, at 15, he formed a skiffle group with his friend Pete Shotton. Initially called the Blackjacks, they later renamed the group the Quarrymen. It wasn't long before Lennon was cutting the image of the rabble-rousing teddy boy, decked out in drain-pipe trousers, sparkly white jacket, and slick pompadour coif. Rock had become the outlet for the young man's inner demons and profound insecurity. Lennon's half-sisters Julia and her younger sister Jackie were never really aware that the young man who came to stay at weekends, amusing them with his cartoons, caricatures, and sketches, was a budding superstar. But the family's rented home at one Blomfield Road, just 15 minutes from Mimi's, was John's musical training ground, and his mother, who could not only sing and dance, but also play the ukulele, the banjo, and juggle, was his mentor. Julia Baird recalls her mother and John jiving around the house to Elvis's hound dog, and that she and Jackie were often chased out of the bathroom so that their brother could rehearse in the cramped but acoustically superior bathroom with his fledgling band. The first time the girls saw their brother perform was at the 1956 Empire Day celebrations on Rosebury Street. As we struggled through the rowdy crowd, says Baird, John suddenly caught sight of us and summarily hauled us on to the makeshift stage, an old lorry parked sideways along the middle of the street, so that we could watch the fun reasonably unscathed. I remember the first guitar I ever saw, recalled John, in an interview conducted for Rolling Stone in 1970. It belonged to a Liverpool guy in a cowboy suit with a western hat and a big dobro. They had real cowboys, all right, and they took it seriously. Don't forget, 
There had been cowboys long before there was ever rock and roll. Be that as it may, young John was a confirmed die-hard rock and roll convert from the very first Elvis record Julia had ever played him. And it wasn't just the king who succeeded in quickening John and Julia's pulse either, but also the legendary Buddy Holly. That'll be the day was the first tune I ever learned to play, said John. Julia taught me on the banjo and patiently sat with me until I worked out all the chords. I remember her slowing down the record while I attempted to scribble out the lyrics. First hearing Buddy absolutely knocked me for a loop. To think it was my own mother who was turning me on to it all. According to Mimi, Lennon's first real interest in playing any sort of musical instrument came about quite differently. As far as I know, the only musical encouragement John had ever had was from a bus conductor on the way from Liverpool to my sister's in Scotland. He happened to have an old mouth organ my husband had given him and was trying to play it all the way there, which of course drove all the other passengers mad, I'm sure. The conductor, however, was apparently taken by John, and when they finally arrived in Edinburgh, told him if he came down to the station the next morning, he would give him a really good harmonica. Of course, John kept everyone up half the night going on and on about it. Early the next morning, however, John was down there first thing. I believe he must have been around ten at the time. The poor conductor had no idea what he started. Mimi, who had watched her nephew and his friends, George and Paul, dash in from riding his bike to write songs together, never really accepted his career choice. I just couldn't understand it, she once commented. Here was a nicely spoken boy, attending church three times on Sunday of his own free will. He was in the church choir. Suddenly, here he is twanging on a guitar. I told him it was distracting from his studies as an art student. Nothing, however, would have ever convinced me that John would make his fortune with that boy at the front door, Paul McCartney. But in the end, I had to concede that music was far more important to him than his career as an artist, illustrator, or even school teacher, which I had mapped out for him. Well, Mimi reacts like all mothers, Lennon has said. What are you doing with all that long hair and what's all this I read about in the papers? She'll never change. The fact was that while Mimi was all business, Julia was quite simply fun. When Mimi poo-pooed John's music, Julia encouraged it. When John took to wearing tight clothes, Mimi was outraged, but Julia was thrilled. Still, for all her gaiety, there were dark corners in Julia's life. In the mid-1980s, John's paternal uncle Charlie introduced me to Taffy Williams and Eddie Baller, two old drinking buddies who both had a tale to tell about the pretty, leggy former cinema usherette and her lifestyle before she hooked up with Dykins. Her name was Julia, Judy Lennon. She always wore those seamed stockings and very high black heels, Taffy told this author. She had a nice figure and bright red hair. She was a good looker and funny. Judy was a laugh. She drank like a lady, I remember, and made love like one, too. I didn't always pay her, at least after a while, but in the beginning it was purely business. She didn't come cheap, either. Lots of blokes were after her at the time. It was more the fun of her that we all liked, I suppose. The sex was sort of a bonus. She was the kind of woman that men liked. Certainly no one thought of her as any kind of criminal. First you had a good old knees up with her in the pub, and then you went up to her room and did what you had to do. To give such a beautiful lady a few quid was all right. It wasn't any sort of big business or anything. I think she just used the money for makeup, hair, things, and that kind of kit. There is no question that Julia Lennon was a party girl. She played the banjo in pubs, entertained the neighborhood children in her home, and was close to her four sisters. Most of the time, however, she was also flat broke. Seemingly happy with her simple Liverpool life, she had to depend on handouts from her father and what she could earn as an usherette. By all accounts, she was an intelligent, independent woman, independent enough to do what she wanted when she wanted, and if that stretched society's post-war mores, then so be it. Judy was her own woman, in whose short life she had many men, but also two extended loving relationships, one with Alfred Lennon and one with Bobby Twitchy Dykins. Eddie Barler also insisted that he'd had it off with old Judy. He was then a merchant seaman on shore leave due to a hip injury. The way Judy saw it, there was nothing wrong with a little fun for money. 
Liverpool was full of girls like her, though she never walked down Lime Street like the others. That was the difference, you see. She wasn't really a pro. She was too good for that, just a fun-loving girl short on cash. If a mate could help her out, why not? I still think of her often. Poor Judy. Pauline Lennon, John's stepmother, after Alfred remarried late in life, told me privately and also stated publicly in her little-known book, Daddy Come Home, that John was aware of his mother's early extracurricular income. In fact, on the occasion that she and Alfred visited John at his Tittenhurst estate in Ascot, 1969, John referred to his mother as a fucking whore, a slut, a cocksucker, and an old slagger. Whoever told him such things about his mother, I have no idea, Pauline said in a transatlantic telephone interview. But it's true he said them. Perhaps he just made it up in his mind. But it hurt Freddy very much to hear it. I can tell you because even though their marriage was by all accounts a failure, he loved her very much until the day he died. Although John was always Julia's strongest supporter in the face of criticism which often rained down on her from other family members, privately he was affected by her overt sexuality and sometimes over-the-top behavior. But his sketchy relationship, her, wasn't the only emotional bump in the road for the sensitive young man. Over the years, this author became close to several of John Lennon's extended Liverpool family, especially his younger sister, Julia Baird. However, one of the most engaging characters I met whilst making my way through a cadre of nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, old friends, and neighbors was one Norman Birch. Norman was his maternal uncle who lived in a house Lennon bought in the mid-1960s. I spent days sitting in the cluttered front parlor hearing about John, the naughty little boy with gooseberry eyes. Birch disturbingly told me that John had been sexually molested from an early age by George Smith, the gentleman dairy farmer uncle with whom he lived, Mimi's husband. George got up to all sorts with young John. When I asked Birch what he meant, he demurred at first, saying that everyone involved was now long dead, so there was no point in bringing up such unpleasant memories. I, in turn, countered that John was an important figure to the world, and only a small part of his history belonged now to the surviving family. To understand the music, you had to understand the man. And a series of sexual assaults by the only father figure he'd ever known must have had an important influence on the composer's complex character. Yes, he said, his teacup rattling as he spoke in a near whisper about the things George had done to John. I didn't have the heart to press him for details, but he swore to me that it was true and that Mimi had been aware of it at some point. This, he ventured, was one of the reasons she was always so hard on John, as if somehow she blamed him for it. It has been fairly common knowledge over the years that John occasionally indulged in homosexual encounters which might have been inspired by Uncle George's visits to his bedroom. It didn't happen often, Birch told me, and George wouldn't dare stay long for fear of Mimi. Long enough, however. How do you know about it, I asked. John told me. Once, he replied. He begged me not to tell as he was a bit older by then and George had passed away, and I never did, not even to my wife Harry. Whether or not George had ever laid a finger on the little boy, no one can now know for certain. But what I heard, and more importantly felt, in that tiny front room just off Penny Lane had the ring of truth, or at least the possibility. Only a mind filled with such dark secrets, fantasies, and fears could have been so expressive, original, forward-thinking, and often black as John's was. In any case... What would Norman Birch, by then well into his seventies, have ever had to gain by lying to me or anyone else? Reflecting on what are admittedly Birch's unproven allegations, I think Lennon was certainly a tortured soul. There are many examples in his lyrics of inner frustration and even paranoia. In Your Blues, he sings, I'm lonely, I want to die. And Mother from the Plastic Ono album, he shouts, Mother, you had me, but I never had you. I needed you, but you didn't need me. And on and on. 
The Second World War was in its third year when James Paul McCartney was born on 18 June 1942. Although money was often scarce, cotton salesman Jim McCartney was determined to give his two boys, Paul and Michael, a good upbringing. Jim's motto was toleration and moderation. And this later showed itself in Paul's gentle lyrics, which tempered his partner's biting edge. As Mercy Beat editor Bill Harry confirmed, I'm sure it was his father's influence which was behind Paul's always liking ballads and soft songs and numbers from musicals. At grammar school, Paul was voted head boy of his form several times, which brought him extra privileges. His fellow students at the Liverpool Institute remembered him as an exceptional class organizer, a skill he would exploit as a Beatle. If anyone was my big inspiration, it was my dad, he has said. I used to like the radio a lot, Fred Astaire I loved. From an early age, I was interested in singing tunes. Dad used to play a lot of music and even had his own group called Jim Max Band. So I suppose I was quite influenced by him. He had to give it up eventually because he got false teeth and he couldn't play the trumpet properly anymore. Paul took up the trumpet at 13 and quickly discovered he could pick out tunes by ear. His musical tastes included an eclectic mix from Pat Boone to Ray Charles. When Lonnie Donegan spearheaded Britain's skiffle craze in the mid-50s, Paul was hooked. You only had to know a couple of chords. Somebody had to get a washboard to do the rhythm, so you'd have to go to your mom and say, Have you got a washboard? From the humble McCartney house, now a full-blown tourist attraction on Forthland Road in Allerton, Liverpool, the two almost equally talented brothers both pursued careers in entertainment. But talent isn't always enough. From their childhood, Mike always seemed to draw the short straw, due in part to his accommodating nature and unswerving sense of loyalty. It was Mike who, more often than not, took the heat for Paul's childhood misadventures, like the time the boys burned down their Auntie Jin's garage and acted as intermediary between his brother and their father. As Mike pointed out about Paul, he was the first boy, the best-looking, and the one who got all the girls, and then all the fame. Still, the brothers were close. They especially admired the Everly brothers and listened to virtually every word and nuance of their songs until they could do a near-perfect impression. Paul imitated Little Richard, added Mike, and was one of the few white people Richard acknowledged as being a very good interpreter of him. Ironically, despite his reputation as the most outgoing Beatle, James Paul McCartney has always kept his emotions in tight check even to the point of controversy. Many suggest that this characteristic stems from his mother's abrupt death from breast cancer when he was just 14. When Jim McCartney told his two boys of their mother's death on 31 October 1956, the first words that flew out of Paul's mouth were, What are we going to do without her money? As he sang in yesterday, I said something wrong. Now I long for yesterday. That night he cried himself to sleep, praying for a miracle to bring his mom back. Two days later, he acquired the new love of his life, his cheap Rossetti Lucky Seven six-string acoustic guitar. Brother Mike's now familiar observation, lose a mother, find a guitar, spoke volumes. The early loss of his mother has always shaped Paul's relationship with women. Like Mary, his mother, a selfless, hard-working nurse and midwife, the women who mattered to him were strong and independent, like actress Jane Asher and photographer Linda Eastman. When it came to marriage, however, what he wanted, demanded of a wife, was the traditional role of homemaker and mother, which he had lost so early in life. Of all the Beatles, George Harrison hailed from the most conventional and stable family. Born on 24 or 25 February 1943, he was the well-behaved son of a bus driver and the youngest of four children. The others were Peter, Harry, and Louise. George and his brother Pete, said their mother Louise, were always together. As a tot, George would often look at a photograph of his brother and think it was him. He never played about the streets as a child. He used to like swimming and was always fond of something constructive to do in his spare time. 
Unlike John and Paul, George didn't demonstrate a serious interest in music until he reached his mid-teens. When Louise, a ballroom dancing teacher and lover of big bands, spotted that her son's notebook was filled with sketches of guitars, she promptly bought him a cheap acoustic from the father of one of his classmates. Young George put it away in a cupboard for some three months. Then he began to practice sometimes through the entire night until he mastered the chords. Eventually, he formed his own first band, The Rebels, with Brother Peter. When George realized he needed a better guitar, he took a job as a delivery boy to pay back his mother for the 30-pound, solid, wide-body acoustic with white inlaid trim, which soon came to a tragic end when a friend accidentally pushed a chair into it. Although Harrison had it repaired, it was never the same again. He really wanted an electric guitar, but his father was none too keen on him buying it on credit. George, however, was determined and approached his brother Harry. He persuaded me to go down to Hassey's, where all the groups bought their instruments, says Harry. There he showed me the guitar he wanted. It was a hundred and twenty pounds. George fiddled with it, trying to look like an expert, but no sound came out. So the salesman pushed a button on the amplifier, and suddenly there was a tremendous blast, and all the instruments on the opposite wall crashed to the floor. After that, I just had to let poor George have his guitar. The Harrison brothers, however, weren't the only ones to encourage George's dreams. Mrs. Harrison, too, took an active role in supporting her son's budding career. She allowed the boys to rehearse in her living room and told the other parents not to worry because the four occasionally missed school. She also supported their trip to Hamburg, even though George was deported because legally he was too young to play in a bar. Mrs. Harrison was the world's first Beatles fan and never lost her enthusiasm for the group. She even calmly took Paul's 1967 announcement that they had all used LSD. In front of the television cameras, she had said that she trusted George not to do anything to harm himself. If he took drugs, then drugs were okay because he knew what he was doing. Sister Louise, too, followed in her mother's footsteps. Despite the 11-year age difference between them, she shared a particularly close bond with George. I loved all three brothers very much, but I suppose because I had now reached the mature age of 11, I felt a greater sense of protectiveness towards George. The four of us grew up in a strong and secure, good-natured family atmosphere. Mom and Dad nurtured us in a way that helped us to grow into confident individuals with great compassion. When Louise Harrison moved to the USA and married an engineer in the mining town of Benton, Illinois, George and his brother Peter visited for almost three weeks during September 1963. Louise, an ardent Beatles supporter, was instrumental in getting their early records played on American radio. During his first visit, she and George hitchhiked to the town of West Franklin to persuade radio station WFRX to play She Loves You. It is even said he composed the melody to Day Tripper at his sister's 1940s bungalow. But something even more significant happened on that visit. Louise arranged for George to play with a local country rock band, the Four Vests, so he'd have some fellow musicians to hang out with. She had even given them some Beatle records so that they could learn the music before he arrived. A gig was then held at the El Dorado VFW Hall, which was the first appearance by a Beatle in the USA, some six full months before their Ed Sullivan Show appearance. George was introduced grandly as the Elvis of England. It was Richard Starkey's affable and easygoing nature that got him through a bleak childhood in the impoverished Dingle section of Liverpool. Born on 7 July 1940, he was an only child whose parents divorced when he was just three. He spent three years confined to hospitals, first at the age of six when he suffered a burst appendix, and at 13 when he caught pleurisy and spent two years in a children's sanatorium. I wish I had brothers and sisters, he once lamented to his barmaid mother, Elsie. There's nobody to talk to when it's raining. Later, he regarded the Beatles as the brothers I never had. His neighbor and distant relative, Nellie Coots, dubbed 
Auntie Nellie with the wooden belly by the local kids, recalled that Richie was musically inclined from an early age. In Liverpool, they used to have an annual Orange Day parade, explained Nellie. When Orange Day came along, the Stanleys all paraded. Their homes were decorated, and they all marched in the band. I remember seeing young Richie playing a little tin drum, marching along as pretty as you please. He also played the accordion. In Liverpool, that was generally passed down from father to son, but Richie was a member of the accordion band at the Orange Hall. He learned it there. He took up the drums when he joined the Hospital Ward Percussion Band. His kindly stepfather, Harry Graves, known to sing for a supper and a pub or two himself, encouraged young Richie's blossoming interest in music and bought him his first drum kit. Well into the 1960s, Elsie was still looking out for her little boy. She confided to close friends, Richie gives me an allowance and I put away ten pounds each week for him in case he's ever down on his luck. The seed that would soon blossom into the songwriting collective known as Lennon and McCartney was sown when they greeted each other in passing outside a local suburban chippy late in the spring of 1957. Then a couple of weeks later, Paul recalled seeing John climbing aboard the number 86 bus bound for town. Their first official meeting, however, took place at St. Peter's Parish Church Garden Fate in blustery Woolton Village on 6 July 1957, sometime in the early afternoon, when John and his ragtag skiffle group, the Quarrymen, were busking on a makeshift stage to the delight of the Hamlet's rocking youth. In October 1986, McCartney granted me a rare interview in response to my questions regarding his first meeting with Lennon. As it turned out, John and I were mates with a fellow from Walton, Ivan Vaughan, he said casually. One summer's day, he invited me to come along to a fete in Walton. John was about 16, so I was maybe 14 or 15. I remember coming across the field and hearing all this great music, which turned out to be from the quarryman's tannoy system. I thought, oh great, I'll go listen to the band, because I was very much into the music at that point. Later, I met the lads in the church hall. They were having a beer, I think. The lineup of the band was Len Gary, Pete Shotton, Colin Hanton on drums, Eric Griffiths on guitar, and Nigel Wally, who acted as their manager. Now, we all used to think that John was really pretty cool. He was a bit older than the rest of us, and he would do a little bit more greased back hair and things that were not allowed at our homes. He had nice big sideboards, and with his drake, he looked like a bit of a Ted. Now, that particular day, I happened to pick up a guitar that was lying around and started to play 20 Flight Rock. I knew a lot of the words, which was very good currency in those days. Lennon's recollection of their historic meeting was one of grudging respect. Well, he could obviously play, he later admitted. I thought to myself, he's every bit as good as me. I'd been the kingpin up to then. It went through my head that I'd have to keep him in line if I let him join, but it was good because he was worth having. The young Paul reveled in his role as John's on-stage foil and steady street corner accomplice. What they really needed now, however, was a solid lead guitar upon which to hang their funky backstreet sound. Paul remembered the events leading up to their eventually settling upon George. He was always my little mate. Nonetheless, he could really play guitar, particularly this song called Raunchy, which we all used to love. If anyone could do something like that, it was generally enough to get them in the group. I knew George long before any of the others, as they were all from Walton, and we all hung out with the Allerton set. We both learned guitar from the same book, and despite his tender years, we were chums. Lennon, who was now attending the Liverpool College of Art, was skeptical about admitting such a veritable baby into the group. How would it look for someone as talented and popular as he to be consorting with someone so young and undistinguished as George? In the end, however, the young man's exceptional skill coupled with Paul's insistence that he brought on board overcame John's initial reservations. The Quarrymen's first recording session in the summer of 1958 was viewed by the lads as something of a lark. The band, which included John Duff Lowe, arrived at the house of one Percy Phillips, a retired railway man, to lay down a demo in his makeshift studio, which was at 53 Kensington, Liverpool. Duff recalled the afternoon in a rare 1993 interview. I can't really remember who organized it. 
I have a feeling it was John who had heard of this recording studio in Kensington. It was a Saturday afternoon, and we waited in an anteroom. It was in someone's lounge, I think. Anyway, we waited until the other band finished off. Then we ran through two numbers, That'll Be the Day and In Spite of All Danger. The latter, a one-off McCartney-Harrison collaboration, was a spirited late 50s doo-wop, which held the distinction of being the first original song recorded by three members of the band that would later become the Beatles. According to Duff, the session left much to be desired. The guy did a sound check, such as it was, as there was only one big microphone hanging in the middle of the room. Then he said, Right, lads, you can go on tape, and I'll do the record off the tape, or you can go straight on to the record. Now it's an extra half crown if you want to go on tape. We said, Oh, well, we can't afford that. We'll go straight to record. In spite of all danger, was getting a bit long, and he started to wave his hands to bring us to a finish as we were getting pretty close to the hole in the middle of the record. It was just a shellac demo, and the more you played it, the worse the quality was. Paul wrote on the label, That'll be the day, Holly, Petty, and in spite of all danger, McCartney, Harrison. That summer was indeed monumental, for John Lennon at least, for another reason— His mother, Julia, died on 15 July 1958 when she was hit by the car of an off-duty policeman. She had just visited Auntie Mimi on Menlove Avenue and was waiting for a bus home. Seventeen-year-old Lennon was shattered. We were sitting there waiting for her to come home, he remembered. Twitchy and me was wondering why she was so late. Then the copper came to the door to tell us. It was like it was supposed to be, you know, the way it is in films, asking if I was her son and all that. Then he told us, and we both went white. It was the worst thing that could happen. We'd caught up on so much in just a few years. We could at last communicate. We got on. She was great. I thought, fuck it, fuck it. Fuck it. That's really fucked everything. I've no responsibility to anyone now. The shocking loss of their mothers created a bond between Lennon and McCartney. John was devastated, McCartney said. He loved his mom more than anything, but at that age you're not allowed to be devastated, particularly not teenage boys. You just shrug it off. I know he had many private tears. Look, it's not that either of us were remotely hard-hearted about it. It shattered us, but we knew that you just had to get on with your life. We were like wounded animals, and just by looking at each other, we knew the pain which we were feeling. Before the quarrymen made their first real splash at the cavern on Matthew Street in the city center, their initial home was the Casbah Coffee Club. It was run by Mona Best, mother of future drummer Pete in the basement of the family's 14-room Victorian house in the affluent West Derby area of Liverpool. Mrs. Best recalled, I used to have them coming in and out of my house as if it were a railway station, so I thought, you know, we've got a nice cellar. Maybe the gang would all like to go down there. I'd never seen a club with such atmosphere. It was all volunteers that helped get the club together. They put in hours, including John Lennon. Pete remembered how on 29 August 1959, Lennon's band officially christened the Casbah. We needed a group to open up on Saturday. I knew George because there was another club down the road called the Lowlands, and he used to play there with Ken Brown. Ken said the group had broken up, but George had said, I know a couple of guys who say they've played in a band before. If they're interested in coming down, would you let them open? Mom said, yes, let's see them. It turned out to be John and Paul, but there was no drummer. It was John, George, Paul, Ken Brown, and they played under the name of the Quarrymen. What stood them apart was their refusal to play the usual hit fare, preferring the American rock icons Chuck Berry, Carl Perkins, and Gene Vincent. They had great charisma, said Pete. The way they stood, the things they did, made them stand out from the rest of the groups. Mrs. Best initially frowned upon this motley bunch with unkempt hair and grubby clothes. Her relationship with John Lennon in particular was rather uneasy. The quarryman's leader openly criticized the pseudo-beatnik climate that Mona was trying to cultivate in the Casbah. 
According to John, the crowd which hung out at the club was merely posing at intellectualism. The Casbah was a teen dance hangout, nothing more. Also, he jeered at Mona's attempts to promote the handsome Pete as a musical James Dean. Still, all of that aside, Lennon painted several murals on the ceiling of the club. They were his usual pot bellies and caricatures. The quarrymen continued to rock the Casbah, eventually with the much older drummer Tommy Moore, and going for better gigs with better pay. Ever intent on cultivating their blossoming image, they tried several new names over the following years, including the Beatles, the Silver Beats, and the Silver Beatles. By August 1960, they settled upon the Beatles. Earlier that year, in January, John invited his art school friend Stuart Stutcliffe to join the band. John and Stu's connection had been both immediate and profound. Stu was fascinated by John's fiery take-no-prisoners attitude. While Stu painted intimate portraits of him, John wrote his friend long, thoughtful letters and reams of abstract poetry. For the first time, he could let down his guard and pour out his innermost feelings. But although he was a talented painter and designer, Stu made no pretense at being any sort of musician and was obliged to learn the bass as he went along. As part of his growing charismatic personality, John, too, became very interested in the opposite sex. He started bringing home a girl called Cynthia Powell from the Whirl. They had met at art college in a lettering class and soon became rather an item. Lennon insisted she bleach her hair out of reverence for his own personal sex symbol, Bridget Bardot. Unfortunately for Sin, says Paul, she just happened to come along at a time when everyone was trying to turn their girlfriend into a bargain basement Bardot. You see, we all happened to be in an age where a ravishing sex goddess taking off her clothes was the fantasy for us boys. We were all smitten. So the girls had to be blonde, look rather like Bridget, and preferably pout a lot. John and I used to have these secret talks where we intimated we would be quite happy for our girlfriends to become Liverpool's answer to Bardot. My girlfriend was called Dot, and of course John was going steady with Cynthia, so eventually we both got them to go blonde and wear miniskirts. It's terrible, I know, but that's the way it was. Cynthia was very good for my brother, says Julia Baird. She loved him desperately and only wanted the best for him. Anyone could see how terribly in love they were. I've always felt it was a great pity that they eventually parted so unhappily. Seeing them there together at our Auntie Harry's, no one could ever have guessed how terribly cruel their ultimate fate would be. Back then, they were both the absolute picture of teenage love. By the end of 1959, John had moved into a dingy flat with Stu at Hillary Mansion's Gambier Terrace near the Liverpool Cathedral. Mimi, of course, hated the idea and did her utmost to convince him to return home immediately, but to no avail. However, John continued to visit her at least once a week to get his laundry done and have a good home-cooked meal. A local newspaper, looking for a good story, concocted a piece on John's flat entitled The Beatnik Horror of Northern England. Stuart's influence on John was a double-edged sword. As a talented artist, he encouraged Lennon to explore his own ability as a painter, yet his presence in the group engendered controversy. McCartney explains, Look, I had problems with Stu, I'll admit it. It's a regret now that he's died, but sometimes you can't help it if you run up against controversy. The main thing was he couldn't really play the bass very well in the beginning, so when we did photos and things, it was a bit embarrassing. We had to ask him to turn away from the camera, because if people saw his fingers, they'd realize he wasn't in the same key as the rest of us. Look, I was probably over fussy, but I thought, well, this isn't really a good thing for an aspiring group. We obviously have a weak link here. Look, he was a lovely guy and a great painter, but he was admittedly the one I used to have all the ding-dongs with. By April 1960, as the Silver Beatles, the boys snagged seven gigs backing balladeer Johnny Gentle on a ballroom tour of Scotland. Although they were encouraged by a taste of real work, they came home as broke as ever. Someone actually asked for my autograph, Paul wrote to his dad from Inverness, and I signed for them too, three times. 
Their initial trek to Germany in August 1960 came about more as a result of a lack of alternatives than any great success in England. They were under the impression that they'd been booked at Hamburg's popular Kaiser Keller by small-time Liverpool promoter Alan Williams, but later discovered they were to appear as the new house band at the CD Indra in the Red Light District on the Reeperbaum in the notorious St. Pauli District. Meanwhile, Pete Best had formed his own band, the Blackjacks, and was playing on a spanky new drum kit Mona had purchased for him. When Tommy Moore quit the Beatles in June 1960, he left an opening for a drummer. Now, Best auditioned on 12 August, and four days later, he was on his way to Hamburg. I didn't think we were going anywhere, he conceded, but it was a chance to break into the business. The German audiences were wild, and that's when the charisma really started to happen. I don't think in their wisdom they thought that they'd ever become megastars. He fondly remembered donning the stage costume of a leather jacket and a pink hat. We loved Gene Vincent. That was where the leather came from. You could buy it very cheaply in Germany. Vincent had a fantastic band called the Blue Caps. In the film The Girl Can't Help It, Gene and the Blue Caps wore these flat pink hats. So for the first time, we went on stage in leather jackets, flat pink hats, and cowboy boots. Living in close quarters with the others in cold, dingy rooms at the Indra gave Best time to observe the mercurial, complex Lenin. There were two sides to John. He would spend an awful lot of time by himself writing very lengthy letters, and he'd talk about Cynthia and his family. But Mimi or his Uncle George, he wouldn't open up about at all. Some might say he was callous or even crazy, but I think that was just his way of handling people to make sure that they didn't get too close. Once he was by himself or in the company of friends, he was a very different John Lennon. In Germany, Lennon alone amongst the Beatles hiked to the post office every week to send home his entire earnings to be sure that Cynthia had what she needed. As for his own expenses, he'd often hire himself out as a guitarist to one of the local strippers to earn a few marks. Best remembers him as outwardly aggressive but soft when it came to sin. There would be moments in Hamburg when John used to settle down and we really talked. Sometimes the two of us would go out and down a couple of beers together and chat about our hopes for the future. He used to tell me how hard it was being away from her and how they planned to settle down and seriously begin raising a family just as soon as the Beatles began to pay off. There were definitely two distinct sides to John. One was the outrageous guy on stage who continually lost his temper, took the mickey out of people, and generally acted the goat. The other side of John, which of course the public didn't often see, was really very gentle and tender, and never more than when he was speaking of his Cindy. For the Beatles, life on the Reaper Bomb was an eye-opening experience. While they could drink for free throughout their raucous sets, that soon didn't deliver quite the kick they needed to keep going during their eight-hour musical shifts. Then they turned to an array of amphetamines known as Black Beauties, Prelies, Preluden, and Black Bombers to rocket them into high gear and keep them there. Sex, too, became an enjoyable diversion, and they took full advantage of their freedom. George Harrison, for instance, lost his virginity in St. Pauli. In Alan Williams' 1975 memoir, The Man Who Gave the Beatles Away, he proclaimed that one of the Beatles, whom he couldn't name at that time for legal reasons, used to regularly date the buxy, leggy transvestites of Hamburg's red light district. Lennon later noted that Williams' memoir was by far the most accurate account of that time in the Beatles' lives. Horst Fascher, a bouncer in one of the club, also collaborated his story. There was a transvestite who regularly used to give John blowjobs. When he found out she was a man, he was merely amused. That alluring ladyboy was in fact a wall American G.I. who went by the street name of Jackie Hart. She lived in one of the seedy flats above the club near the Indra, and according to what she told this author during a 1991 interview, was really in love with John for a time. To Lennon, of course, it was merely sex, but Hart told me she had deep feelings for the inwardly sensitive Beetle. He never did anything femme, she said. He was all man, and merely allowed me to go down on him. There was never any possibility of anything else. He said he thought of me as a woman with a twist. When it was over, more times than not, he would pick up his bottle of scotch, slap me on the backside, and lumber back down the stairs without saying a word. He sometimes seemed a little embarrassed by his sexuality. 
but I didn't care. John was beautiful, both as a lover and a person. When I would see him in the clubs, he would ignore me. He once warned me that the others must never know, so he was obviously very much in the closet, which was fine. As for me in those days, I defy anyone to have ever known my secret. By his own admission, John was always a hitter, striking out at both boys and girls from an early age. Likewise, he was deliberately hurtful and verbally aggressive to those he felt were in a weaker position within his orbit. It is now known that in addition to several early sexual episodes with local girls, including a neighbor, Barbara Baker, and schoolmate Thelma Pickles, from around the age of 12, Lennon also experimented with one or two older boys while visiting his Aunt Mater in Edinburgh. John confessed this in a private conversation in mid-September 1979 with Len Ono, an abbreviation of Lennon and Ono used for their business in New York, staff member George Spirin. John knew I was gay and told me he'd had a number of experiences himself, both as a kid and an adult. Spirin confided to me in the winter of 1984. He said his first encounter was with an older boy who spent the day playing soccer and carousing with John and then forced him to orally copulate the young man in an old milk van in a parking lot. He said he was embarrassed by the incident and other than Yoko had never told anyone. I am sure he was telling me because he knew I was having a tough time back then and wanted to try and reach out to me as if to say, hey, I know what you're going through, man. John was always very kind and compassionate, at least to me. He also told me that while he had gone on to have several homoerotic experiences and even one brief relationship in Germany many years previously, he didn't consider himself either gay or straight. Sex is sex, he told me. Their expressions are almost irrelevant. I had needs and I fulfilled them. That's all there is to it. Still, if Lenin was gender blind when it came to sex, he certainly didn't allow others the same latitude. John was always on at anyone he thought he might be gay, said his Uncle Charlie. I didn't see him that much as an adult, but I remember he was always going on in a joking way about poofters, fags, and queens in conversation. As long as Lennon maintained that gays were different from himself, no one would ever discover his perhaps humiliating secrets. In June 1961, during their second trip to Hamburg, Tony Sheridan, a popular transplanted English club singer, invited the Beatles to play with him on a Polydor recording session produced by well-known German orchestra leader Bert Kampfert. Although the Beatles had recorded before, this was their first truly professional session. On the morning of 22 June, they climbed into a taxi, followed by another piled high with their gear, and made their way through Hamburg's sleepy side streets to a school on the outskirts of the city. They set up on the tiny stage in the gymnasium and recorded eight tunes, six backing Tony and two others, My Bonnie and Cry for a Shadow. The latter, a parody of The Shadow's Frightened City, was written under the working title of Beetle Bop. It also earned a pair of lofty distinctions. It was the only song ever written by Lennon Harrison, and it was the Beatles' first original song to appear on record. John and Paul returned to Liverpool on 2 July, and were playing the Cavern on the 14th, Holyoke Hall near Penny Lane on the 15th, Blair Hall and Walton on the 16th, and back to the Cavern for a lunchtime session on the 17th. That night they roared off to Litherland Town Hall. Thereafter, they maintained a gut-wrenching schedule of virtually non-stop performances throughout the North for the remainder of the year. They were now down to four core members. Sutcliffe soon became a member of the Beatles in name only, his mind constantly elsewhere. He was more concerned with returning to his true passion and began taking sculpture classes at Hamburg State School of Art. At the Top Ten Club in Hamburg in June 1961, Stu played his final gig with the Beatles, performing Love Me Tender for the last time. As a parting gesture, he gave Paul his Hofner president bass. McCartney, never an admirer of Sutcliffe's abilities on the guitar, had already begun taking over bass duties. For the band, things were moving steadily ahead, but the most auspicious development was the entrance into their lives of Liverpool businessman Brian Epstein. His interest in them peaked when a young man named Raymond Jones walked into his parents' record store, NEMS, Northeast Music Stores, and requested a German import called My Bonnie by the Beatles. 
Brian promised he would try to track it down, and eventually he did. He ordered a cautious 25 copies and sold out almost immediately. He repeated the process several times and then decided to check out for himself what all the fuss was about. Somewhat against his better judgment, on Thursday, 9 November 1961, the dapper 27-year-old bachelor descended the 18 stone steps of the Cavern Club to witness firsthand this up-and-coming beat group he had heard so much about. Alistair Taylor, his personal assistant, remembered the occasion. As for their act, I didn't think they'd go down very well at the Royal Variety performance. It seemed to me like they had a permanent, long-running set of private jokes which they shared as they played. They'd crack one-liners to each other and from time to time let the front row of the audience in on it. When the girls screamed request, the Beatles shouted back, adding their own suggestions and comments. Brian and I gave a discouraged look at each other and settled down to pay attention to the music. This isn't much, I thought. For a start, it's too damned loud. And from what I heard as we crossed the dance floor, the Beatles are a bunch of five-chord merchants. Altogether, we sat through five numbers. Four of them beat song standards. Money, Till There Was You, A Taste of Honey, and Twist and Shout. I might add, however, I never heard standards played with that sort of raw excitement that the Beatles put into them. Then Paul came to the microphone and announced that they were going to play a song he had written with John Lennon, Hello, Little Girl. Brian and I exchanged a glance. So, they write their own songs as well. Brian returned to the vile and smelly club, as he termed it, several more times, and then on 3 December at a meeting at NEMS suggested to the boys that he become their manager. For some years, Brian had felt suffocated, merely retracing his father's footsteps in running the family business. As it happened, the Beatles were quietly despairing over ever breaking out of Liverpool's local beat scene. Impressed by Brian's prominent standing in the musical community, they quickly accepted. For Brian, life looked up immediately. They represented the direct, uninhibited relationships I had never found and felt deprived of. My own sense of inferiority and frustration soon evaporated because I knew I could help them, and they wanted and trusted me to do just that. Chapter 2. Don't Allow the Day. Liverpool and London, 1962-1963. The Beatles have gained immeasurably in prestige as a result of the inquiries of their manager. That they will secure a recording contract with a major British label in the future is certain. Their outlook is now more mature and professional. They are no longer only a local attraction. If it's possible for a rock and roll group to become a status symbol, then the Beatles have made it so. They are still a phenomenon, but now their appeal is legend. Kevin Compare, Bob Wooler the new year rang in with the Beatles poised on an exciting new frontier. Brian Epstein had landed them their first big-time audition with Decca Records. On 1 January 1962, the band trekked down to the studios in West Hampstead, North London, to meet amiable A&R director Mike Smith. The hour-long morning session recording on two-track mono featured 15 tracks selected by Brian as most representative of their sound. Much bootlegged today, the audition highlighted three Lennon-McCartney compositions, Like Dreamers Do, Love of the Love, and Hello, Little Girl. John thought the latter was perhaps the best from that period, inspired by the Cole Porter standard, It's De Lovely. The classic was a favorite of his mother. It's all very Freudian, he quipped. She used to sing that one, so I made Hello, Little Girl out of it. That was one of the first songs I ever finished. I was then about 18, and I later gave it to the foremost. The remaining 12 songs were all standards, including Money, That's What I Want, Take Good Care of My Baby, The Sheik of Araby, and a future fan favorite, the romantic ballad, Till There Was You, from the stage show, The Music Man. After the session, Epstein asked how the audition had gone. Smith smiled and extended his hand. We'll let you know, chaps, he said quietly. Thanks very much for coming down. Now, as almost every Beatle fan knows, nothing came of it. And Decca recording manager Dick Rowe famously remarked to Brian that groups with guitars were on the way out. In my opinion, our peak for playing live was Hamburg, George Harrison recalled in 1969. You see, at the time we weren't so famous, and people who came to see us were drawn in simply by our music and whatever atmosphere we managed to create. 
We got very tight as a band there. We were at four different clubs together in Germany. Originally, we played the Indra, and when that shut down, we went over to the Kaiser Keller and later the Top Ten. That was a fantastic place, probably the best on the Reeperbaum. There was a natural echo on the microphones. It was a gas. The Star Club was very rough. We developed quite a big repertoire of our own songs, but still played mainly old rock and roll tunes. Back in England, all the bands were into wearing matching ties and handkerchiefs and doing little dance routines like the Shadows. We were definitely not into that, so we just on kept doing whatever we felt like, and ultimately, I guess it worked out. Those early Hamburg stints honed the Beatles' edgy rock sound, but were soon abandoned when Brian Epstein took over, a move Pete Best strongly criticized. We came back playing our music the way we wanted. When Brian took us over, the image started to change. At the time, every group in Liverpool was copying our performance, mannerisms, and the material we were playing. All of a sudden, Epi comes along and says, OK, you're going to tidy this act up. I'm going to put you in suits, and you're going to play the same repertoire every night. Jerry and the Pacemakers, well known for their chart-topping Mercy Beat singles, shared several bills with the Beatles since their early quarrymen days. On 11 April, when John, Paul, and now drummer Ringo, who had replaced Pete Best, arrived in Hamburg, they were shocked to learn from Astrid of the tragic death of their one-time colleague, Stuart Sutcliffe. After a trip back to Liverpool, where he met Brian Epstein for the first and only time, Stuart returned to Germany, where his health steadily worsened. For days at a time, he would not come down from his attic studio to eat or sleep, Beatles' intimate and Stuart's girlfriend, Astrid, said. These headaches became violent. They seemed like fits. Nothing could be diagnosed as Stu continued to suffer severe headaches and seizures. My head is compressed and filled with such unbelievable pain, he wrote. Hour after hour, from screaming at the frustration, pain, and helplessness, I must try and pull myself together. I must try hard. On 10 April 1962, after a particularly violent seizure, Stuart Sutcliffe died with Astrid by his side at 4.45 p.m. He was just 21. The post-mortem revealed that the cause of death was cerebral paralysis due to bleeding into the right ventricle of the brain. According to Pete Best, when John heard, he burst into hysterical laughter, then wept like a child. I have never seen him break down in public before. He was absolutely shattered. Members of Lennon's family believe that his friend's death haunted him for the rest of his life. On 11 April, when John, Paul, and the other Beatles arrived in Hamburg, they were shocked to learn from Stu's girlfriend Astrid of the tragic death of their one-time colleague, Stuart Stutcliffe. Shortly afterwards, the band suffered yet another upheaval. In August 1962, Pete Best was abruptly sacked. Many point to his mother's constant meddling as a key factor. Certainly, she had done many positive things for the group, particularly in convincing cavern owner Ray McFall to book them into the then Trad Jazz establishment. But her role as the band's unofficial manager, to the point of overseeing their contract negotiations with Brian Epstein at her home, was seen as crossing the line, especially by the ever-adversarial John Lennon. In the end, however, it was probably Best's inferior drumming which brought about his downfall. The fact is, the protest when Pete was fired had been greatly romanticized by the press. There was very little in Best's drumming to recommend him, and many professional drummers who witnessed this little drama snickered as young girls raised a hue and cry over the loss of Pete. One seasoned Liverpool musician suggested, Pete's departure was regretted for chiefly non-musical reasons. Shortly before Best was giving his marching orders in the summer of 1962, Brian landed the Beatles a modest recording contract with Parlophone Records, a small subsidiary of the gigantic EMI, via producer George Martin. Their first formal session took place on Wednesday, 6 June, at EMI Studios in Abbey Road, London. Contrary to popular myth, this historic session was simply not another audition, but rather a recording date at which the Beatles cut demonstration lacquers of Besse Me Mucho, Ask Me Why, Love Me Do, and P.S. I Love You, which were never commercially released. Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You went on to become the Beatles' first single. Although generally considered to be a Lennon composition, John, who later referred to Love Me Do as pretty funky, conceded, Paul wrote the main structure of this when he was 16 or even earlier. I think I had something to do with the middle. 
I slagged off school to write that one with John when we first started, said McCartney. You get to the bit where you think if we're going to write great philosophy, it isn't worth it. Love Me Do was our greatest philosophical song, however. That's what we want to get back to, simplicity. You can't have anything simpler yet more meaningful than Love, Love Me Do. The Hamburg ballad P.S. I Love You was written in the form of a letter and has McCartney stamped all over it. It is sentimental and decidedly middle of the road. Perhaps someone should have asked the laid-back George Harrison if he had anything lying around that he might like to record. Some music critics draw comparisons with his own Ask Me Why, with its similar slow Latin swing, but towards the end of his life, John told interviewers it was shit. Paul was trying to write Soldier Boy like the Shirelles. He wrote it in Germany, or when we were going to and from Hamburg. On the afternoon of Tuesday 4 September, John, Paul, George, and now Ringo ducked into the bureaucratic maze of EMI Studios for an ambitious session. They balked at recording How Do You Do It, a number by fledgling songwriter Mitch Murray, but George Martin decided it was perfect and proclaimed it would place the band on the map. When I played them the tune, they were not very impressed, remembered Martin. They said that they wanted to record their own material, and I read them the riot act. When you can write material as good as this, I'll record it, I told them. But right now, we're going to record this. And record it we did, with John doing the solo part. It was a very good record indeed, and it's still in the archives of EMI. I heard it recently, and it sounds quite good even today but it was never issued. The boys came back to me and said, we've nothing against that song, George, and you're probably right, but we want to record our own material. The real gem of the day was the haunting Love Me Do on which Paul and John shared lead vocals. Engineer Norman Smith recalled the genesis of the now legendary track. After the first take, we listened to the tape. It was horrible. Their equipment wasn't good enough. We hooked Paul's guitar up to our own bass amplifier and had to tie John's amplifier together because it was rattling so loud. They were in such awe of the studio. They didn't realize the disparity between what they could play on the studio floor and how it would come out sounding in the control room. They refused to wear headphones, I remember. In fact, they hardly ever wore them. Future takes were, of course, much better, and Love Me Do eventually came together. The Beatles' first hit was released on Friday, 5 October 1962, and peaked at number 17 two days after Christmas. The record, however, represented a clear milestone to the group. Paul remembered, In Hamburg we clicked and at the Cavern we clicked, but if you want to know when we knew we'd arrived, it was getting into the charts with Love Me Do. That was the one. It gave us somewhere to go. However, by the autumn, the Beatles, while up and away, were not yet really established. The powers that be in London consider them still a haypenny outfit of untrained hopefuls. George Martin's contribution as their producer was certainly a big one, McCartney has said. The first time he ever really showed me he could see beyond what we were offering him was with Please Please Me. He said, well, we'll put the tempo up. George lifted the tempo, and we all thought that that was much better, and it was ultimately a big hit. Ever the perfectionist, Martin was so impressed with the recording that he allowed a mistake to remain in the final stereo version. Paul and John sang different lyrics on one line of the last verse. In his book, All You Need Is Ears, he wrote, It went beautifully. I told them what beginning and what ending to put on it, and they went into number two studio to record. The whole session was a joy. At the end of it, I pressed the intercom button from the control room and said, Gentlemen... You've just made your first number one record. True to his prophecy, Please Please Me officially released on 11 January 1963, shot to number one in both the New Music Express and Melody Maker charts. After nearly seven years of back-breaking, largely unrewarding, non-stop work, the Beatles were an overnight success. It was around this time that Lennon had agreed to a secret marriage to Cynthia, who was pregnant with their first and only child. I was a bit shocked when she told me, remember, John, but I said, yes, well, we'll have to get married, I guess. I didn't fight it. They were wed on 23 August 1962, with Brian Epstein as best man. Lennon's family, including Auntie Mimi, refused to attend, and Ringo was so new to the group, he was not even told about it. As a wedding present, Brian granted them the use of his flat at 36 Faulkner Street. 
John noted that it was the first apartment that he'd ever had that wasn't shared by 14 other students, girls and guys, at the art school. Brian Epstein gave us his secret little apartment he had in Liverpool to keep his sexual liaison separate from his home life. Julia Baird recalls that the Beatles took up almost all of John's time, both personally and professionally. Even after he and Cynthia's son Julian was born on 8 April 1963, it was a constant tussle between home and family. Late as usual, John would come bounding up the walls of the cottage with baby Julian slung under his arm, letting out the most ear-splitting scream imaginable. Here, Jew, take him, he said, puffing from his sprint to the door. We've got another bloody show tonight, and I'm already an hour late at getting to the station. Bye-bye, son. Be a good boy. See you all soon. Good luck. With that, he leaped into the van, and off they'd race into the late afternoon drizzle. Chapter 3. Please Escape Me From This Zoo. America and the World, 1964-1965. When we got to America, everybody was walking around in fucking Bermuda shorts and Boston crew cuts with stuff on their teeth. The chicks looked like fucking 1940s horses. There was no conception of dress or any of that jazz. We just thought, what an ugly race. It was disgusting. John Lennon. The Beatles' first trip to Paris in January 1964 produced yet another onslaught of Beatlemania outside Britain, according to their roadie Mal Evans, who recorded his impressions of the free-for-all backstage at the Olympia Theatre that broke out amongst photographers, each vying for exclusive shots of the group. Punches were inevitably thrown, and George Harrison was trapped with his beloved country gentleman guitar tucked behind his back. The gendarmes charged in, while outside fans were rammed against the crash barriers. There were riots in the streets, traffic jams, and crowds mobbing the George Five Hotel, where the Beatles were staying. One red-shirted man leapt up on stage and started dancing with John Lennon. Evans put out one massive paw, snatched him up, and discarded him into the wings. After the opening at the Olympia, they received a telegram from London, Beatles' top American hit parade. I want to hold your hand, was number one. The boys went wild, Evans observed, like school children racing up and down the corridors, hooting in celebration, and Paul jubilantly leaped on his back. It was the biggest thing in their young lives, he said. We're going through it all together. It was very exciting. By early 1964, the Beatles were cutting an unparalleled musical and cultural swath through every international city they stormed. Now as February rolled around, they set their sights on the ultimate prize, America. Capitol Records, who had nearly rejected them when first offered the group by EMI, launched a $50,000 promotional campaign to drum up interest in the USA. They plastered five million The Beatles Are Coming stickers in telephone kiosks, buses, and even public laboratories, and issued a comprehensive Beatles press kit containing wigs. J. Paul Getty was even seen sporting one, a Beatles badge, and an auto pen signed photo. The Blitz paid off, disc jockeys began to play the Beatles music, and interest swelled. Still, secretly the boys remained wary. On the flight over, Paul worried. America's got everything. Why should we be over there making money? They've got their own groups. What are we going to give them that they don't already have? On 7 February, their Pan Am jet touched down at JFK Airport and taxied to the International Arrivals Terminal, where an army of teenagers headed by around 3,000 on the observation roof awaited them. Frenzied demands of, We want the Beatles! greeted them. Paul cried, Jesus, this is fucking great! A cadre of reporters had been assigned to cover the event. Like his fellow reporters, Al Oronowitz, on assignment for the Saturday Evening Post, was skeptical. What could four young men from Liverpool have to offer the USA, the cradle of rock and roll, which had spawned Elvis Presley and, more recently, the great Bob Dylan? On the way to the Plaza Hotel, through the quarter of a million fans who lined the Manhattan streets, the Beatles witnessed the same hysteria that had met them at the airport. The police fortified the building, allowing no one to enter without proper ID or a valid room key. One upper-crust matron, horrified by the unruly exhibition, demanded to be escorted to her suite. Several famous names also checked in, hoping for a glimpse of the British sensations, while resourceful fans who had scaled the fire escapes were found roaming the 12th floor where the Beatles' entourage were staying. 
Police even found a trio of semi-nude girls waiting in the bathtubs in the Beatles' suites. Eventually, the hotel manager was forced to increase security by calling in the Burns Detective Agency. He even pleaded with the Waldorf to take the Beatles' pleas in exchange for Nikita Khrushchev, scheduled to arrive later that month. In anticipation of the watershed Ed Sullivan appearance in two days, Brian Epstein was embroiled in streamlining the Beatles' promotional arrangements with CBS executives. News mogul Walter Cronkite's daughter was the only network offspring granted access to the studio for the group's rehearsal. Talk show king Jack Parr ended a long-time feud with Sullivan when his daughter Randy pleaded with him to get her a ticket to the really big show. Meanwhile, the Beatles' personal press officer, Brian Somerville, retreated to his room in tears. He'd had it out with Epstein over the unforeseen media circus at the airport and threatened to resign. He left that July, where upon his replacement, the capable and affable Derek Taylor received the following cable at his NEMS Enterprise offices in London. Understand through West Coast sources that you plan to leave the Beatles. Stop. Can understand the traveling is most tiring and your desire to settle down. Stop. While we have no immediate openings on KLIF DJ staff, we offer you the music critic's position on the number one station in Dallas. Stop. Suggest you remain with the group until the Beatles appear in September. It will save you the moving expenses. Please advise. Signed, Charles F. Payne, manager, KLIF, Dallas, Texas. Amazingly, the cable was addressed to John Lennon, the Beatles, London. The one who quit, says Taylor, was Brian Somerville, you know, the genius behind the Beatles. I think his official reason, according to the press announcement, was that he had done all he could for the Beatles and they didn't need him anymore. He said they were ready to fly in their own, ready to fly like birds. The Beatles played their first U.S. concert at Washington's D.C. Coliseum on 11 February before 8,000 deafening fans. The next day, they boarded a train back to New York for a performance at the normally highbrow Carnegie Hall. The mushrooming phenomena did not escape the attention of Ed Sullivan, who reeled them in for an encore performance on his Sunday night variety show on the 16th. Live from Miami's Duville Hotel, the 3,500 seats were overbooked, which caused a near riot amongst ticket holders refused entry. But it drew in a staggering 70 million television viewers. Beatlemania was sweeping the nation in a way that the lads could barely fathom. Next up, the Beatles relaxed in Florida for a week. From their home base on a luxury houseboat in Miami Bay, they tried water skiing, deep sea fishing, and even attended a drive-in movie. British Prime Minister Sir Alec Douglas Holm proudly declared the Beatles our secret weapon. On the 21st, they flew back to London, and four days later they were back at EMI Studios to lay down tracks for their next album, the soundtrack to their first film, A Hard Day's Night. A week later, they went before the cameras under Richard Lester's direction to begin filming the now-classic pseudo-documentary that captivated critics and fans alike, showcasing their individual charm and acting talent. Something else, too, was brewing on the set. Following her success in Britain as the Smith's Crisps Advertisements Girl, Patricia, or Patty Boyd, was cast in A Hard Day's Night by the director. George spotted her on the first day's filming and was overwhelmed by her big blue eyes, long blonde hair, and kittenish personality. Standing around behind the scenes in her Mary Quant micro mini and pale Dolly Bird makeup, she looked the epitome of swinging London at its very best. At the end of that first day, Patty and a couple of her friends summoned up the courage to walk up to all of the Beatles except John and ask for an autograph. To an innocent like Boyd, Lennon seemed entirely too caustic to risk encountering him in a bad mood. During the next few days, George's attention was not at all on his work, and Patty often felt his eyes on her. On the second day, he invited her into the Beatles' private trailer for a cup of tea. She and her two younger sisters, Jenny and Paula, were from a steady middle-class home in the south of England, raised in a strict, though loving environment, and loyal to their men. Patty politely declined, telling George she was semi-engaged to another boy. On the third day, he tried again, this time asking her out for a proper date. Once again, she put him off. She had an old-fashioned view of romance, she said, and couldn't hurt her boyfriend with a casual night on the town. Later that afternoon, George approached her one last time, and she accepted. He remembered years later, We went out for dinner together and then drove around London talking about everything we could think of. I don't know if you could call it love at first sight, but by the end of that first week, I had already met her mum.' 
Three weeks later, we were looking at houses together, so I guess you could definitely call us a couple. Alfred Lennon, John's father, had not tried to contact him since 1945. Apparently, he had no idea about John's career until 1964, when a workmate pointed out an article on the Beatles and said to him, If that's not your son, Lennon, then I don't know what. Almost immediately, stories about Alfred were appearing in the newspapers, but he denied that he had ever sought any publicity. I never saw him until he made a lot of money and he came back, said John. I opened the Daily Express and there he was, working in a small hotel very near where I was living in the stockbroker belt outside London. Quite honestly, he had been writing to me for some time trying to get in touch, but I didn't really want to see him after what he had done to me and my mother. Originally, I wasn't going to see him at all, but he sort of blackmailed me in the press by saying he was a poor old man washing dishes while I was living in luxury. I fell for it, and I saw him, and I suppose we had some kind of relationship. That year, Mr. Lennon teamed up with record producer Tony Cartwright and cooked up a scheme to promote Alfred as a pop singer. Incredible as it sounds, they even landed a record deal with the Piccadilly label. Amid a flurry of London publicity, a lengthy press release was included with the promotional copies of Alfred's one and only single entitled, That's My Life, My Love, and My Home. 53-year-old Freddie Lennon, father of John, has made his first record. Mr. Lennon has been an entertainer in an amateur capacity most of his life. When he left the sea 12 years ago, Freddie took a job as a waiter and later worked in holiday camps at various northern resorts. He came to live in London seven years ago. Over the years, Freddie has always been interested in songwriting, but never took it seriously. Six months ago, he met Tony Cartwright, who is now his manager. Together they wrote, That's My Life the story of Freddie's life. The song was accepted by a music publisher and recorded. Naturally, as a curiosity, the record received quite a lot of airplay, and Beatle Lennon came in for a lot of ribbing in the media about it. He was livid. Strangely, he wasn't angry with his father, but rather manager Cartwright. As far as John was concerned, encouraging Alfred to make a record had been unforgivably manipulative. His father had no experience in show business whatsoever and was therefore ripe for the taking. To top it off, Piccadilly also issued publicity photos of Alfred attempting to play the guitar with his all but toothless mouth wide open in song. The sensitive Lennon was deeply embarrassed. Uncle Charlie explains. Apparently, as soon as Alfred's record started moving up the charts, Brian Epstein stepped in and somehow took control of his contract from the record company, and before you knew it, all the discs but disappeared. Anyway, Cartwright and Freddie had gone off to see John about it at Kenwood, but he just slammed the door in their faces. Later that night, Freddie rang me in Birmingham and told me all about it. I don't think he would have turned me away if I didn't happen to be with Tony, he said, obviously very hurt. Perhaps it was a mistake to ever get involved with any of this in the first place. Frankly, I was miffed at John for treating his dad like that, so I wrote him a stinking letter for him acting like such a child. His response? A totally unexpected phone call from him inviting me up to Kenwood for a visit. It's your birthday this weekend, isn't it, Uncle Charlie, he said. Why not take some time off and come see your childish nephew? After a lot of hassle with my employer, I was scheduled to work that weekend, I finally ended up going down. But John was out doing some film work with the Beatles. I spent the afternoon chatting with Cynthia, and later that evening John came home, as happy as a lark, going on about how no matter what anybody said, he really thought that deep down his dad was great. I didn't dare mention the letter for fear he might punch me in the face or something. Despite the controversy, though, Freddie was genuinely proud of John. He's a typical Lennon, all right, Freddie often told me. According to Charlie, Freddie would reminisce about their father, a well-known entertainer who once toured America as part of the Kentucky Minstrels, the talents in this family. Why, look at our dad. Mom always used to say if they could only have afforded a piano, somebody in the family would have definitely become a pianist. In June, the runaway train that was Beatlemania steamed through yet another continent. In a whirlwind tour down under, unbridled fanaticism almost turned to tragedy. 
Ella Ronowitz wrote, In Australia, the Beatles left an estimated 100,000 casualties, including a man who had an epileptic fit, a girl who burst a blood vessel in her throat from shrieking too loudly, and a dozen more who were kicked by horses' hooves while trying to crawl beneath the mounted police to get to the Beatles' car. Still, another girl suffered carbon monoxide poisoning when the mob knocked her down next to the exhaust pipe of an automobile hemmed in by the crowd. It was against this unfortunate backdrop that the Beatles headed back to Liverpool for an official homecoming. Since they last played the cavern, things had changed amongst Liverpool's youth. A young man's future was no longer assumed to be a lifetime of toil on the docks as his father and grandfather's had been. The Beatles had blazed a trail to international adventure and prosperity, followed by acts like Jerry and the Pacemakers, Scylla Black, and Billy J. Kramer with the Dakotas. There were now some 350 beat bands within an eight-mile radius, all hoping to capitalize on the Mercy Mania. For many natives, however, the Beatles were not the great liberators the young took them for. To these stalwart citizens, the boys, once the pride of Liverpool, had all but sold out, left town to chase the almighty dollar, and forgotten their roots. They were no longer fellow scousers, but cosmopolitan, snooty Londoners. The Liverpool police even recorded several death threats against the group and their families. On the plane to Liverpool on 10 July, the Beatles, aware of the controversy, were on the defensive. The way Paul saw it, the only significant change in them was that they were now richer. We think we've got something because we'd be idiots if we didn't. The danger is in the narrow-minded, soft people who will say it's gone to our heads. We've always had exactly the same kind of faith in ourselves. It's not conceit. It's just confidence. As the plane landed in Liverpool, the Beatles grew excited. A couple of fans who had won a competition to accompany the group had them reminiscing about their cavern days. Ringo raised his shirt to expose the scars from some 14 stomach operations. Paul chatted about the racehorse he'd just bought for his father's 62nd birthday. It had come second in its debut race. As the jet descended, Paul pointed out landmarks old and new. "'Look at that,' said George. "'A new estate.' Any doubts that they had been missed evaporated when the plane taxied to the terminal where a crowd of some 1,500, the allowed limit, Liverpudlians, were waiting for them on the airport roof. It's bigger than when Matt Monroe landed, Lennon exclaimed. The band piled into their Austin Princess and followed the eight motorcycle police escort into the city. A staggering 150,000 people lined the 10-mile route, cheering, tossing jelly babies and flowers, eventually spilling out into the robe to mob the vehicle, claw the windows, and throw themselves on the hood of the car. Police propelled the fans off the road and onto the curb. At the town hall, some 20,000 admirers were pressed against the barricades fashioned from wooden pilings cemented into the cobblestones. Fans hung out of the windows from tree branches and off of rooftops. No one could recall anything like it. Not even the Queen's visit could compare. In the crush of madness, some 400 were injured. Liverpool's mayor, Lewis Laplin, decked out in white tie and tails, led the boy into the town hall and up the grand staircase as the Liverpool band police played Can't Buy Me Love. Ringo danced up the steps as they were led into the impressive second-floor ballroom with its extravagant chandeliers. 700 invited guests and some 400 gate crashers descended upon the refreshments. But the moment the Beatles entered, escorted by a lone policeman, they were rushed by mass of those present who rammed them into the table, doubling them over. Mal had to come to the rescue and drag them out. His new Rolex was stolen in the melee. The Beatles were paraded on the balcony to a hero's homecoming unknown in Liverpool's history. Paul and Ringo boogied and whistled as one of their records played. As the mayor introduced them, John buried his face in the man's regalia, then gave a Hitler salute to the crowd. The mayor began his speech. I have here a letter from the orthopedic hospital, which says that when children heard Beatles songs, they took a new lease on life, and many were inspired to get up from their wheelchairs and walk for the first time. The Beatles stop was the Odeon Theater for the northern premiere of A Hard Day's Night. Once more, their car tunneled through a mass of hysterical girls, all hurling themselves at the vehicle. 
At the theater, the band opened a telegram of congratulations from Prince Philip. All this for four young men who only a year or so before had to share sandwiches in Liverpool clubs. Finally, back at the airport for the trip to London, the Beatles were corralled into an executive suite to await their flight. Thousands of the faithful stood in drenching rain for a glimpse of their new idols. They wound down with their usual scotch and coke, but John refused to touch the sandwiches that had been provided. I used to wrap them here, he explained. I worked at the airport, and I used to spit in them, wipe them in the dirt, and even cum in them. While they waited, the mayor produced photographs to be signed for his constituents. Paul and John joked, Yes, Your Holiness, we'd better sign these. Not surprisingly, Lenin got in a political jab. Yeah, Louis, I saw people in the crowd today without any teeth. When are you going to get them teeth, eh? As they boarded the plane, he took one final look at the assembly on the roof. They were getting us worried, he joked. They'll never say they don't like us here any more. Later that same month, John and Cynthia had tired of the constant intrusions by fans at their temporary home, a walk-up at 13 Emperor Gate in Knightsbridge, London, and began house hunting. They soon settled on Kenwood, a Tudor-style house in Weybridge, Surrey, with 27 rooms. They bought it for some 20,000 pounds on advice of their accountant, Walter Strach, who lived just down the road. Although their new home had several reception rooms, the family gravitated to the kitchen. Almost immediately, John commissioned designer Ken Partridge to renovate and redecorate the property at a cost of some 40,000 pounds. Partridge had done up Brian Epstein's Knightsbridge flat, and John was very impressed with the result. One thing I remember was a lovely handcrafted rocking horse John and Sin surprised Julian with a couple of months earlier, recalled Julia Baird. The only problem, he was still far too small to sit on it without falling off, so either we would have to hold him on, or better yet, we'd ride it ourselves. An impressive feature of the state was the spectacular tiled swimming pool just behind the kitchen at the rear of the house. Lennon designed it with an elaborate psychedelic eye on the bottom. Upstairs, amongst the half-dozen bedrooms, was John and Cynthia's with a four-poster bed and an ensuite Italian marble bathroom. At the time of our first visit, says Julia, John was busy with his many Beatle-related duties and finally learning how to drive. Not being able to really drive himself, however, wasn't any great impediment to him buying several fine cars. Among his collection was a matte black Ferrari, the Rolls, and a lovely all-white Mini with electric windows. Although he hadn't gotten round to taking his test, that didn't stop him from insisting on taking us all for a ride. Might be a little risky actually driving on the road just yet, John muttered, as Jackie and I piled into the diminutive two-door. Perhaps we'd be better off simply going for a little spin on the golf course. Oh, John, you can't, squealed my sister laughing. You'll be nicked. Are you kidding, said John indignantly. I'm a beetle. No one would dare say a word. Although he was obviously only kidding, it struck me that perhaps John was finally beginning to understand the unique position he was in. Off we sped, tearing into the turf with a vengeance. Up and over the hilly fairways and careening through the bunkers, we all felt happy, wild, and free. Fortunately, it was still early in the day and no one was golfing. Otherwise, we might have had the opportunity to test John's theory of beetle infallibility. That August, the Beatles returned to the USA and took the country by storm. It just couldn't get enough of them. Mal Evans liked to point out that although violence was rarely associated with Beatle tours, there was the ever-present danger that thousands of hysterical teenagers presented. At San Francisco's Cow Palace on 19 August 1964, he said, We were late in arriving, and normally I look after security, but we didn't have the time. It was the only time I'd been drinking on the job. We had three days off in L.A. partying. It was absolute chaos. Al Aronowitz, a longtime Beatles friend and now a firm Beatles supporter, appointed himself an intermediary for the summit between Bob Dylan and the Beatles. I was brokering the most fruitful union in the history of pop music. In many ways, I saw Dylan and Lennon as mirror images, personifications of hip, 
on opposite sides of the Atlantic, each epitomizing the culture of his country and each emerging as a spokesman of its culture. To me, Bob and John were brothers born of the same creative clay, both towering bastions of individuality. They certainly were both so different from everybody else as to make people take notice. To me, Lennon was Dylan's English reflection through the looking glass and across the sea in the land of the left-hand drive. As soon as I got to know John, I started telling him he ought to meet Bob. Lennon kept saying he wanted to wait until he was Dylan's ego equal. I want to meet him, but on my own terms. After many attempts, Aronowitz pressed Dylan into a reluctant meeting. On that evening, following a performance by the Beatles at Forest Hills, he and Dylan drove up to the Ritzy Hotel de Monaco on Park Avenue in Dylan's humble blue Ford station wagon, chauffeured by roadie Victor Mehmoods. The hip trio plowed their way through the crowd, straining behind police barricades and into the lobby. At the lifts, however, they encountered several burly policemen who forbade them access. Finally, Mal Evans came to the rescue and escorted them to the Beatles' suite, where hordes of photographers and reporters were camped outside, along with Peter, Paul, and Mary, and the Kingston trio, all hoping for a few moments with the occupants. Press officer Derek Taylor entertained them while they waited. After somewhat awkward introductions all around, the gathering retired to the sitting room where Dylan requested his usual cheap wine. I'm afraid all we have is champagne, Brian Epstein apologized, and sent Evans out for Chianti while Dylan began on the scotch. After somewhat awkward introductions all around, the gathering retired to the sitting room where Dylan requested his usual cheap wine. I'm afraid all we have is champagne, Brian Epstein apologized, and sent Evans out for Chianti, while Dylan began on the scotch. Eventually, the Beatles offered their guests some pick-me-up purple hearts. This was the moment Aronowitz had been waiting for. He then gestured to Maymoods, who had a stash of marijuana in his pocket, and said, Hey, let's have a smoke. To his surprise, the Beatles told them they'd never tried it. Like many, Aronowitz had assumed that the line in I want to hold your hand was I get high rather than I can't hide. They considered pot smokers to be the same as junkies, Aronowitz revealed. Like the DEA, they put grass in the same category as heroin. Now realizing that he had introduced the great Beatles to the drug, Aronowitz gave the honor of rolling their first joint to Bob Dylan. Now, Bob wasn't much of a roller, he later conceded, and a lot of grass fell into the big bowl of fruit on the room service table. Another concern was the posse of New York's men in blue prowling the corridors outside. In order to prevent the pungent odor from seeping into the hallway, the party placed towels under the doors and retreated to the far end of the room near the windows and closed the blinds. With the first joint now ready, Dylan handed it to John, who immediately passed it on to Ringo, saying, You try it first, then muttering something about Ringo being the royal taster. According to the reporter's instructions, Starr inhaled deeply and found it very much to his liking. However, he was unaware of marijuana smoking protocol and failed to pass the joint around, handling it like a cigarette, much to the disapproval of Dylan and Aronowitz, who knew how difficult it was to find such potent cannabis. Before long, everyone was in a very merry state, including Epstein and Taylor. Aronowitz said that the latter ended up the biggest dope smoker of them all. Ringo was giggling, working his way up to hysterical laughter, and suddenly the laid-back Brian kept repeating, I'm so high, I'm on the ceiling. He stood before the mirror, pointed to himself, and muttered, Jew, which had the others all rolling on the floor. Paul, not one to let such an auspicious occasion pass by, instructed Evans to fetch a notepad and jot down any nuggets of wisdom he might come up with. The next day, he checked the paper and read, There are seven levels. He reckoned that must have been a sublime reference to the world's great religions. After they met, remembered Aronowitz, the Beatles' lyrics got grittier and Bob invented folk rock. The change, according to music historian John Mark, came along with the Beatles' For Sale album, a work little recognized for Dylan's influence, despite Lennon's distinctly Dylan-esque I'm a Loser. 
In their early work, says Mark, Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison tried to emulate to some degree Dylan's writing. They had been drawn to Dylan because the words of his songs were as important as the music. It was not until Dylan introduced them to marijuana that their artistic freedom surfaced. McCartney even admitted his brassy Got to Get You Into My Life from the Marijuana Enhanced Revolver and album was not about a woman, but rather a blatant ode to the drug. We were kind of proud to have been introduced to pot by Dylan. That was rather a coup. It was like being introduced to meditation and given your mantra by the Maharishi. There was a certain status to it. In the wake of that monumental evening at the Delmonico, the Beatles shared many such moments with Dylan Thomas, as John liked to call him. The occasions were characteristically awkward, as John pointed out. We'd spend time together, but I always used to be too paranoid or aggressive, and vice versa. He'd come to my house. Can you believe that? This bourgeois life I was leading, and I used to go to his hotel. As Aronowitz noted, for two of the greatest communicators of their time, Dylan and Lennon seemed to give the appearance of being tongue-tied every now and then. Still, there were moments of great hilarity as well. One time the Beatles, Dylan and Aronowitz, spent the night trawling aimlessly around Greenwich Village, finally stopping for breakfast at 4 a.m. at the Brasserie. John pulled out a yellow toy aeroplane he'd found in Aronowitz's car, which belonged to the journalist's young son. He ran it across the table and over everyone's faces. Inevitably, during these encounters, someone would pull out a joint. Let's have a laugh, Lennon would bellow. Meanwhile, back in Liverpool, a sudden development was about to rattle Paul and change forever the dynamic of the McCartney clan. Since his wife's death, Jim McCartney had done his best to provide a stable home for his two boys. With Paul and Mike now grown up and Jim having retired and moved into Rembrandt, the elegant five-bedroom home on Baskerville Road that Paul had bought for him, the McCartney patriarch found himself lonely and at loose ends. In the autumn of 1964, Paul's cousin Elizabeth Robbins, better known as Auntie Betty, ran into her old friend Angela Williams, whom she hadn't seen since their childhood holidays at Butlins. She discovered that the energetic 34-year-old Angela, a secretary and the mother of a young daughter, Ruth, had been widowed for two years previously. Angela explained, She was thinking a young widow, active, capable, and Uncle Jim, living in complete isolation in Rembrandt, afraid to hire a housekeeper because if he even sent out laundry in those days, they used to cut up the sheets in little pieces in case Paul had slept on them. Jim was a prisoner in his beautiful new home. Betty suggested that she and her husband go out for an evening with Angela and Jim, and everyone agreed. As soon as Jim opened the door to her, Angela had an overwhelming premonition. I thought, I'm going to marry this man. After a very pleasant evening, Jim asked his date if she wouldn't mind staying on for a little while after the Robins had departed. The two talked until dawn and began a courtship. Their dates largely consisted of family gatherings centered around Jim's sisters, the kindly but timid Auntie Millie, and the gossipy, domineering Auntie Jen, also known as the McMatriarch. Both women had helped Jim bring up the boys in the absence of their mother. Breaking into this tight-knit clan was a daunting proposition, especially for a woman 28 years Jim's junior. In late November, Angela brought four-year-old Ruth to meet Jim, who was instantly smitten by her. He took her into the garden and later gave her one of the stuffed animals that fans had lavished on Paul. Later that night, he sat Angela down. I want to ask you something, he said. I think we both know where this is leading. How do you want to work this? Do you want to live with me, be employed as my housekeeper, or do you want to marry me? Well, I would only go for marriage, affirmed Angie. After all, I have a daughter to consider. Almost immediately, the phone rang. Angie, come and speak to Paul. She heard the voice of the world's premier pop idol. My dad's just told me the news. You sound nice. Are you staying the night? I'll jump in the car and be there in three or four hours. Around one in the morning, Paul sprang into the kitchen to meet his future stepmother. Is Ruth sleeping, he asked. Well, you've got to get her up. With that, the sleepy child was carried downstairs and Paul gathered her up in his lap. She took one look at him and said, You're on my cousin's wallpaper. Then she lifted up her pajama top and pointed to a recent incision from a kidney operation. I've got a scar. See my scar? 
McCartney grinned. Ringo's got lots of scars. Paul made a memorable first impression on Ruth. The next day, he swept her into his Aston Martin for a trip to meet some of the family. I remember the smell of the leather made me sick, she said. Paul was wearing navy blue pinstripe trousers, blue loafers without socks, a white t-shirt, and jacket. He had a record player in the car, and you could put three or four records on at a time. When you went round a corner or over a bump, it used to jump, and I giggled. The records would sometimes melt in the sun. I remember Paul playing a warped Elvis single, and it sounded all garbled. One day they'll make something better than this, he told me, and sure enough, a few years later, the 8-track came out, and he reminded me. See? I told you. McCartney was an alert and careful driver. My father was killed in a car crash, Ruth said, and I was nervous of anything with wheels on it. But with Paul, I felt very secure. We went around to meet the Robins. He thought it would be good for me to meet my new cousins. Kate Robbins is a talented singer, and we became really close. Paul was very conscious of visiting family when he came to Liverpool about every three weeks. He had always been a real family boy. Jim and Angela tied the knot on 24 November 1964 in a wedding that none of the McCartneys attended. I don't want this to be a bloody circus, said Jim, who wanted to avoid media intrusion at all costs. On their way to the church in Wales, Jim asked an unlikely gravedigger named Griff to be a witness, and Miss Williams became Mrs. James McCartney as the organist played yesterday. For all of the planned secrecy, word soon leaked out, and photographers snapped the newlyweds all the way from Wales to Rembrandt's back garden. When Ruth discovered she had a new daddy and a grand place to live, it was like all my Christmases had come to me at once. Later, in February 1965, Jim had the opportunity to take his bride on a belated honeymoon. The Beatles were making their second film, Help in the Bahamas, an ideal getaway spot. Arrangements were made, and the couple jetted to Nassau for five weeks in the Caribbean. As it turned out, the Beatles arrived at the exact same time. We walked into the press conference, explained Angela, thinking Paul would be smiling. But he looked at his father and said, What are you doing here? In front of a room full of people, John was obviously very embarrassed and quickly said, Hey, congratulations, you guys got married. Isn't that wonderful? Hey, let's all get together. It was John who diffused a very hostile situation. Balmy nights were spent at the hotel, swapping stories with Help's co-star Victor Spinetti and other cast members. John would hiss loudly every time Leo McKern, who played the villain, came in. To celebrate Ruth's fifth birthday, the hotel chef produced a cake in her honor. Familiar with She Loves You, he had decorated the cake with four beetle heads and the words, Ja, Ja, Ja. Apparently, yeah, 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 in his vernacular. The all-important metamorphosis of the Beatles from carefree millionaire young men to aspiring musical mystics began to unfold in the spring of 1965 during the filming of Help. Richard Lester had decided to employ local Indian musicians for some key sequences in the soundtrack and even enlisted one of Indian music's foremost composers, Pandit Shiv Dayal Batish. He was also a renowned vocalist, arranger, and conductor who had helped to popularize the emerging Indian film industry. Lester needed him to play a classical Indian stringed instrument called the veena. Soon after Batish and the three other Indian musicians arrived at London's Twickenham Studios, the cultural differences between them and the Beatles became apparent. Batish remembered, We'd barely finished tuning our instruments when George Harrison came over to us and said, you can't work all the time, mate. This is tea time. That's the rule. I was quite taken back by his remark. This was most unlike India, where once you entered the studio, you were supposed to keep working until lunchtime. Anyway, we went to the canteen and had our tea with some snacks. Back in the studio, the Beatles inspected the instruments, fascinated by the wooden peacock's head on the vena. With typical British wit, Batish noted, John Lennon praised its workmanship. In another instant, he stood near the peacock's head and pretended to lure the bird with some grain in his hand, at which all of us had a great laugh. Help co-star Roy Kinnear revealed. George seemed immensely interested in it all, and before we knew it, he had someone run out and buy him a cheap sitar from one of those Indian shops near the British Museum. They were all in a little clump plunking away. 
None of it made much sense to me, of course, but it kept Harrison happy. During the day-long session, Batiste played several cross-cultural Beatle riffs on the Vena and then said, "'Working with the Beatles not only earned us fame and popularity in the West, but also brought us great respect within the Indian community.'" Back in Liverpool, Jim McCartney adopted Ruth. "'I should be a proper dad to her,' he decided. And the family settled into their new life. Angela, who'd left her job, put her secretarial skills to work by tackling the mail that flooded into Rembrandt from Paul's fans at the rate of two huge sackfuls a day. The requests were bizarre, to say the least. "'Paul, chew this piece of gum and send it back, or have Paul smoke this cigarette and return the butt.' Someone even sent a chewing gum wrapper asking Paul to burn it and mail back the ashes." A pair of Japanese girls corresponded for over 15 years and mailed several expensive gifts to Ruth, including handmade slippers and exquisite Asian dolls. In turn, Angela responded to fans with Beatle tokens and letters, although she was warned not to. One incident made the reason for that precaution all too clear. We began receiving letters from a Denise Haynes from Texas, says Angela. As she continued to write, I noticed the postmarks were getting increasingly closer to England, at one point from Africa. One day we got a call from the Merseyside Dock Police saying, Mrs. McCartney, we've got a girl here who's stowed away on a ship and said that if we contacted you, you would receive her. Is her name Denise Haynes by any chance? Yes, are you expecting her? They put Denise on the phone, at which point Paul, who happened to be at Rembrandt, grabbed the receiver. Look, your parents must be horrified, he told her. You really shouldn't do this. No, I'm just leaving. A year later, Denise showed up on their doorstep, suitcase in hand, having traveled some 6,000 miles. The kindly Angela invited her in for tea, and she stayed until Jim motioned for his wife to get rid of her. She continued to hang around McCartney's Cavendish Avenue home and over the years wrangled her way into the family circle. She even befriended Linda and snapped photos of daughters Stella and Mary. There were frightening moments, too. On one quiet evening, Angela, Ruth, and Jim had sat down for dinner, and Paul dropped in to join them. All of a sudden, they heard a violent crash outside. The family rushed to the window to see hysterical fans stampeding towards the house. Having caught a glimpse of Paul, they had broken through the gates and were soon pounding on the windows. Angela rang the police. We need your help. They've crashed the fences and are threatening to break the windows. Quickly, she ushered Ruth upstairs where they turned off the lights and waited in the dark. It's scary to think about what would have happened had they got in, said Ruth. They would have torn us to shreds. As time went on, Angela and Ruth got to know the other Beatles. They visited Ringo at his home in Weybridge on Boxing Day 1964. Ruth recalls, I remember thinking it was the biggest house I'd ever seen. As time went on, Angela and Ruth got to know the other Beatles. They visited Ringo first in his home in Weybridge on Boxing Day 1964. Ruth recalls, I remember thinking it was the biggest house I'd ever seen. Maureen, Ringo's future wife, was so nice to me. I was running around outside climbing trees. Harrison, shy and introspective, patiently taught young Ruth Indian ragas on the piano while John taught her to ride a bicycle. Lennon came to Rembrandt more frequently than the others, and Angela remembers how everyone treated him with kid gloves because of his difficult reputation. Angela felt sure this was nonsense. On one occasion, he stayed overnight in Mike's room. The next morning, she had squeezed some orange juice and was about to take it up to John when Brian phoned, wanting to tell him that another single had shot to number one. "'Don't disturb him, love,' warned Jim emphatically. "'Just tap in his door and leave the juice outside.' Angela ignored this and rapped boldly on the door. "'John, are you up?' Are you decent, son? Can I come in? She opened the door as he leaned out of bed and fished for his glasses, 
grinning sheepishly. He was perfectly fine, Angie remembered. This fear of John, this, oh, watch out for John, he's in a bad mood, I could not fathom. Why walk on eggshells? I just couldn't see the relevance. Look, if you treat people like they're in a bad mood, then they will be. Yes, he was a tough kid, but I saw the warmth in him, and I never had any problems. When he was at the house, John would ask if he could have a cup of tea. I'd tease him, say, please. He was perfectly fine with me. Later, Cynthia confided to Angela that she was the only person John was a little in awe of. You tell it like it is, she told her. You never take any shit from him. On another occasion when they were staying at Rembrandt, Lennon and McCartney decided to go antiques hunting. They each borrowed an old overcoat and a trilby hat from Jim, tucked their hair under their collars, and bravely boarded a bus for the fourteen-mile trip to Chester. They were gone for several hours. On their return, Paul told his father and stepmother, "'There'll be a van coming soon. We bought all sorts of stuff. We even stopped at a pub for a beer and a meat pie.' They shelled out a king's ransom for a miscellaneous assortment of enormous Bibles, brass crucifixes, gilded picture frames, and cartons of dusty old books that Angela stashed all over the house. Eventually, she said, I had to hire a truck and send it all down to London. The near two-decade-long friendship between the Beatles and comedic genius Peter Sellers was forged chiefly by their similar taste and offbeat humor. In an odd twist, Sellers became the catalyst for the marriage between producer George Martin and the Beatles. In January 1962, Brian Epstein was seeking a record contract for the band, and as Martin remembers, Brian had been turned down by everybody and was desperate. So he tried to joke on the fact that he'd been told about me because I made comedy records. When the Beatles heard about it, they kind of groaned, but then they pricked up their ears when they heard that I'd made records with Peter Sellers. They were great fans of his. What really sealed the deal for the Beatles was learning that Martin had produced the comedian's popular 1960s Songs for Swinging Sellers. Interestingly, back in the cavern days, Sellers was offered the opportunity to invest in the band. Ironically, he had concluded it was just too much of a gamble. For a time during the 60s, the artist's whirlwind careers intertwined. The Beatles integrated Sellers' goon show humor into their debut film, A Hard Day's Night. Seller returned the favor by guest starring on the group's Granada TV special, The Music of Lennon and McCartney, which aired in December 1965. Dressed as Richard III, he gave a hilarious rendition of A Hard Day's Night. Tony Bramwell, the PR man for the group, observed, Sellers did his mock Shakespearean version of A Hard Day's Night, and he was stoned out of his mind the whole time. It was released as a parlophone single and got to number 14 in the British charts. I didn't know him very well, Paul admitted, but I met Peter later. He was a very nice bloke, pretty hung up, and like a lot of comedians, he really wanted to be a musician. He was really a very good drummer, and on this show he did a very funny impression of Laurence Olivier doing A Hard Day's Night. Sellers was offered Leo McKern's role in Help, but turned it down. Nonetheless, he was such a fan of the group that he had his own Beatles suit made and became a frequent guest during the recording sessions, laying down several Beatles songs himself, including She Loves You in 1965, which was released posthumously in 1981. On 28 April 1965, he also presented a Grammy to them for Best Performance by a Vocal Group. Sellers, welcome to the great Twickenham Studios, where the boys, the Beatles, are making their new film, Help. I am actually with the Beatles now to present them with their Grandma Awards, which they have won from America. I have had the singular honor, if you don't mind me saying so, of having been asked to present them. May I say? Paul. Yes, you may. Sellers. Great pleasure. Yes, yes. There are some more here. Perhaps you'd like to take one. John. Thanks, Mr. Houstonoff. Of all the Beatles, Sellers initially gravitated toward George Harrison. Later, they shared a business manager in Dennis O'Brien and was keen to launch a property development venture, but things dragged on just too long for the impatient Sellers, and he eventually dropped out. On 27 August 1969, John, Paul, George, and Ringo spent an evening in Bel Air, California, with yet another musical legend, perhaps the greatest of all, Elvis Presley. The occasion later became known as the Rock and Roll Summit, 
It was no secret that Elvis was a great inspiration to all of them. Elvis was the epitome of it all when we started, said Paul. Before we went into the studio, we idolized him. He could do no wrong, but when he went into the army, he became a bit subservient. We'd like that rebel thing in him. Seeing him in uniform, cutting his hair was a disaster for us, like the flag flying at half-mast. Lennon found his lightning rod in the snarling Presley ode to Love Gone Bad, Heartbreak Hotel. It was an experience of having my hair stand on end, he stated. We'd never heard American voices singing like that. About a year earlier, when the Beatles were on tour of America, a writer from the New Musical Express arranged for McCartney to speak with his Memphis idol via telephone. But it was Mal who got the biggest thrill. He was a longtime Presley admirer and president of his fan club in Liverpool. One day, as Evans remembered, Paul said, Hey, Mal, come into the bedroom. I've got a surprise for you. I wandered in behind him, and suddenly he's talking to Elvis. Oh, you've got a bass guitar, Paul was saying, and Elvis replied, Look, man, I've got blisters on my fingers from playing this thing. Paul saying, Oh, don't worry, that'll soon go away. By the way, Elvis, Paul says, there's a great fan of yours here. You can call him Mal. He put me on the phone, and it was, uh, 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 hello, Elvis. I was tongue-tied. He was so polite. He was fantastic. He told me if I ever needed anything, just come and see him. Brian Epstein had been trying to arrange a meeting between Elvis and the Beatles for over two years. Scheduling conflicts were blamed, but it was most likely Presley's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, making the Beatles wait for an audience with the King. We didn't really feel brushed off, revealed Paul. We felt we deserved to be brushed off. Finally, the timing was deemed right in the summer of 1965 as the Beatles were in Los Angeles on a break during their American tour and Presley was also there filming the movie Paradise Hawaiian Style. The band left their temporary home on Benedict Canyon Road in two cars, Colonel Parker, Brian, John, and Paul in one, George Ringel and Mal in the second. It was all very exciting, John recalled. We were all nervous as hell. He was a legend in his lifetime, and it's not easy meeting a legend in his lifetime. According to George, thanks for a few cups of tea, a Harrison euphemism for smoking dope in the limo, the band forgot where they were going. George quoted comedian Lord Buckley, We got to go to a native village and take a couple of peyote buds. We might not find out where we is, but we sure as hell will find out who we is. Formerly owned by 40 screen goddess Rita Hayworth, Elvis's house was built into a hillside and hidden from the road behind a massive seven-foot wall. Big house? Big Elvis, quipped Lennon as they walked down the palm tree line drive and went into the king's house at around 10 p.m. They found themselves in a darkened circular living room with a jukebox continually cranking out Charlie Rich's Mohair Sam, a Presley favorite record at the time, and the television switched on without sound, a later Lennon habit. Elvis's ever-present entourage, the corporation, as he called it, seemed to pour out of the woodwork. Neil Aspinall, also on hand, said that when Brian entered the room, Colonel Parker ordered a chair for Mr. Epstein, and about 15 people all came running with chairs. I remember when Brian told the Colonel he managed other bands than the Beatles, the Colonel was shocked. He said he didn't understand how Brian could handle more than the Beatles because it took him all his time just to handle Elvis. The sleek, Handsome Elvis, wearing a red shirt, gray slacks, and a tight-fitting black jerkin, was perched on a couch strumming a bass guitar, which Ringo found very strange. There was an awkward silence. Then Elvis joked, Look, guys, if you're just going to sit there and stare at me all night, I'm going to bed. McCartney was the first to break the ice, pouncing upon the opportunity to demonstrate a few guitar licks. That was the thing for me, that he was into the bass, so there I was. Well, let me show you a thing or two, Al. The four-hour visit was a mixed bag of highs and lows. The Beatles were suitably impressed with the giant billiard table that swiveled silently and turned into a crap table. Brian and Ringo occupied themselves with the roulette wheel in the game room, challenging Colonel Parker to some spirited competition. Harrison, meanwhile, spent the evening trying to suss out from his gang if anybody had any reefers, but they were uppers and whiskey people. They weren't really into reefer smoking in the South. The conversation, too, wasn't exactly high-octane. 
The somewhat bewildered Elvis didn't know the names of his celebrated guests, referring to each as Beetle. As Ringo observed, he was pretty shy, and we were a little shy, but between the five of us, we kept it rolling. I was certainly more thrilled to meet him than he was to meet me, I can assure you of that. Lennon spotted Presley's spanky new Rolls-Royce Phantom in the drive and told the king that he had one, too. Then they found common ground in travel stories, swapping tales of the dangers of the skies. George, who hated flying, related incidents of an airplane window blowing open in mid-flight and when an engine had caught fire. Elvis told a similar tale. I thought my number was up. We had to remove sharp objects from our pockets and rest our heads on pillows between our knees. When we landed, the pilot was ringing wet with sweat, even though it was snowing. Later, Presley introduced his teenage girlfriend and future wife, Priscilla. She wore a bizarre purple gingham frock with a huge gingham bow, the image of Barbie, as Paul put it later. Eventually, Presley called, Hey, somebody bring in some guitars, and several instruments were swiftly produced. With Presley on bass, John took up rhythm guitar while Paul and George picked up guitars too and plugged into a large bass amp. Ringo, feeling a bit left out, was consoled by the king. Too bad we left the drums back in Memphis. The world's most famous pickup band then launched into Scylla Black's hit, You're My World. Lennon reportedly grinned and yelled, This sure beats talking. McCartney seemed to recall Elvis's tape machine being switched on although no one had ever mentioned it. Journalist Chris Hutchins, who was along for the ride, took full note of the historic house band. Elvis's voice rose richer, deeper, and more powerful than the others, his leg pumping up and down in time to the beat. You could feel the magic, and he did it so naturally. Paul on the piano joined Elvis in some vocal duets, including I Feel Fine. George worked in some neat little riffs, and John even if he were just going through the motions, didn't let his side down. Around 2 a.m. the evening finish, Elvis presented his guest with a complete set of his records, and the Beatles invited him to their place the next day. But there was no follow-up. No doubt Colonel Parker didn't want the public to think that the king of rock and roll was on equal footing, or even worse, in the shadow of the Beatles. In mid-October 1965, the Beatles laid down tracks for their much-acclaimed Rubber Soul. By early November, they had finished most of the work, and on the 8th, they entered EMI Studio 2 for a vocal session for George's Think for Yourself. They were in a particularly jovial mood. George Martin, ready here then, lads. The tape is rewound. John, you'll just have to bear with me or have me shot, or we'll just have to have a go of it, you see. George Martin. I know exactly what you mean. John, mm, it could be there and it couldn't. George Martin, could be where? John, there, or it couldn't. All right, Paul, come along. Come on now. We close our, and the good things that we have, we close our eyes. I, I'm sure that wasn't the real one, but, but that'll do. If that works, I'm all for it. George, that is the one. Paul, two say will, two say won't. It's nothing like it. Let's say we think about this one. Ding! On with the jukebox to say, Sir Harry, that thing that you do, and this playback of the backing track. George Martin. Oh, you're a right particular one, aren't you, John? John. I get something in me head, you know, and all the walls in Rome couldn't stop me. Paul. Is that right, pickled onion? John. Poo, and I stink, too. I'm waiting for somebody to say something about it. Paul. It's that deodorant you use. John, tisn't. Cynthia licked it clean before we left. Here's to a prosperous pickle. Paul, do you want to fight? John, no. Paul, let's settle it in other ways. John, you play snooker? Paul, yeah. John, I don't. Play tennis? Somebody up there likes me. Paul, who is it? John, it's Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who gave his only begotten bread for us to live and die on, and that's why we're all here. And I'll tell you, brethren, there's more of them than there are of us, and that's why there are so few of us left. Paul, why such fury? John, condemn thou the torts of man. George, yeah, what is this wrath which beholds you? Paul, why such fervor? John, he called and they bloody will come. Paul, oh, I, yes, but if you look in the Bible, George Martin, are you ready, lads? Paul, Troy, it looks like supercars getting out of control, Troy. Aqua Marina, how come you fuck everything up, you do, Marina? John, 
I will be happy to see the earth disintegrated. Sometimes I feel less than useless at these sessions. I really do. Cynthia understands. I often talk to her about it when we get home. I sometimes say, you know, Cynthia, I just can't get the note. She understands a lot of things like that because she went to Bali for her holidays. Released on 3 December in Britain, Rubber Soul was certainly the Beatles' most sophisticated album to date. On the same day in Glasgow, they started what was to become their final tour of the United Kingdom. On stage at the Glasgow Odeon, their songs were, as usual, drowned out by the screams of the audience. Chapter 4. Right is Only Half of What's Wrong. London. 1966. Check revealed how fans were enraged at being kept ridiculously out of range during the 1966 tour, while the Beatles were virtual prisoners in their hotel suite and never even saw Tokyo. However, eager to boost the swinging 60s image of London, the diplomat hailed the visit a resounding success. The Beatles' typhoon swept the youth of Japan off their feet, he declared in a lengthy telegram to the foreign office. They were a five-day wonder, and a Beatles mood gripped the city. The popularity of the four young pop singers from Liverpool at its height was said to be the envy of even cabinet ministers. Still, an army of police were mobilized when fanatical opponents of the group and all that they were supposed to stand for threatened to have them assassinated. The Beatles, I am happy to say, were at no time in any physical danger in Japan, Czech wrote. He also noted that the major task faced by police was comforting the sobbing teenage girls who found the physical presence of John, George, Paul, and Ringo more than they could take. Check one praise for his lively dispatch with one official scribbling on it, This is instructive as well as entertaining. Much of Whitehall needs reminding that the Japanese are indeed human. As usual, the Beatles sang for just 30 minutes at each of their five concerts at the Nippon Budokan Hall, a venue that sparked controversy among traditionalists as the hall was seen as a shrine to Japan's war dead. The hall has occasionally been used for less lofty purposes, but never for anything so alien to the Japanese martial spirit as an electric guitar concert, says Czech. Various highly placed Japanese and foreign personalities had seen in us the only hope of obtaining tickets for themselves or their offspring. When the dust finally settled, the Beatles' frenetic Japanese tour was seen as one of the most musically sophisticated concerts that they had ever given, predicated on the songs that they chose to play, including Nowhere Man, Paperback Writer, and If I Needed Someone. All were far more complex pieces than the yeah, 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 boyish love songs they offered up at earlier venues. A pristine video of concerts filmed on 30 June and 1 July illustrates the great unrealized potential the Beatles possessed for performing accurately and convincingly even their most musically challenging compositions. Nearly a decade before Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier seized the world's spotlight in the Philippines by going toe-to-toe -to -toe in boxing's now legendary heavyweight bout, in the first week of July 1966, the Beatles experienced their own thriller in Manila. It was perhaps the most harrowing chapter of their musical life and would hasten their exit from the public stage forever. When they arrived on Sunday, 3 July, in the bustling port city, the scene was not unlike others on their worldwide tours, the airport packed with thousands of screaming adolescent Beatlemaniacs. But as the band and their entourage stepped off the plane into the suffocating Filipino heat, a glance told a very different story. The airstrip was fortified with regiments of gun-toting military police in olive-green khakis, tough little guerrillas, Harrison called them, whose morose demeanor seemed more appropriate for transporting dangerous convicts than a pop group. The Beatles had arrived in a country caught in the stranglehold of the infamous Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship and martial law. Years later, George, remember, Manila was a very negative vibe from the moment we got off the plane. Almost before they knew it, a member of the Filipino welcome party accosted them and ordered, Leave your bags here and get into the car now. Without explanation, they were swiftly driven away. Everyone had guns, and it was really like a hot Catholic guns Spanish Inquisition, Ringo later recalled. The bewildered group peered out of the black window to see on the runway their briefcases, which contained their supply of marijuana. Luckily, Neil Aspinall snatched them up and flipped them into the boot of a limousine and told the driver, follow that car. 
A short drive took the Beatles to a pier in Manila Harbor, where they were hustled from a car onto a speedboat, which was shot off to the middle of the harbor and then a yacht. The four were herded on board and locked into a cabin. George peered out of the porthole to see several armed guards roaming the decks. It was really humid and we were all sweating and very frightened. For the first time in our Beatle existence, we were cut off from Neil, Mal, and Brian. There was not one of them around, and we had a whole row of cops with guns lining the decks around this cabin we were in. Thirty minutes later, however, Brian Epstein came to the rescue with Filipino concert promoter Ramon Ramos in tow. After a prolonged, violent shouting match, the boys were finally released and taken to their hotel. Although the official word from the government had it that the Beatles were taken to the Manila Yacht Club to avoid hysterical fans, to this day, no one can explain their abduction. Marcos' power play, however, was a precursor of the nightmare to come. That morning, the Manila Times ran an article which said, in part, President Marcos, the First Lady, and three young Beatle fans in the family have been invited as guests of honor at the concerts. The Beatles planned to personally follow up the invitation during a courtesy call on Imelda Marcos at the palace tomorrow at 11 o'clock. The following morning, the four woke to a persistent banging at their door. It was the promoters, dressed in white lace shirts, accompanied by armed guards. Why are you not at the palace? They shrieked. You must all go to the president's palace now. You must be at the royal engagement. Hurry up, get along. You must not keep Madame Marcos waiting. Not untypically, the Beatles ignored these orders, especially McCartney, who escaped house arrest earlier to find a decent meal and shoot some candid shots of the shantytown just moments away that the government didn't want anyone to see. What are you talking about? No, 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 this is our day off, man. We're not going to any fucking palace. And he slammed the door summarily in their faces. When they turned on the television, however, there was a huge queue of Filipinos in their Sunday best lining the garish marble hallway of the palace. A reporter was saying, The first lady is waiting for the British pop sensation, who are slated to arrive momentarily. Still, the Beatles made little of the event. They had not been informed about any reception and believed Brian would just sort it all out. Later that day, they performed two concerts at 4 o'clock and 8.30 in Manila's mammoth Jose Rizal Memorial Football Stadium to the largest crowds in their history, a total of 80,000 feverish fans. The group was not prepared, however, for the huge throngs and suspected the promoter Ramos of deliberately overbooking and pocketing the cash. The following morning, they woke early to prepare for their flight to New Delhi and their first trip to India. The morning newspapers flashed the headlines, Beatles snub first family, Amelda stood up, first family wait in vain for mopheads. Local television ran footage of Mrs. Marcos wailing, they've let me down, with the camera panning across a presidential dining hall showing unused dinnerware being removed and the disappointed faces of the children. The Beatles found themselves in the middle of a full-blown, potentially perilous international incident. The Marcos family had issued an invitation to the Beatles for a lunch reception at the palace, of a kind that not even the highest dignitaries dared turn down. Amelda had rounded up more than 200 VIP guests from the Filipino aristocracy, politics, and business. Brian reportedly told Neil, I cancelled the thing, but apparently word had failed to reach Amelda. As a matter of policy, the Beatles hadn't attended receptions for more than two years since an outrageous 1964 incident in Washington at the British Embassy when an excited middle-aged guest clipped off a lock of Ringo's hair as a souvenir. I'm sure we were the only people who ever dared snub Marcos, McCartney later said. He considered their action a symbol of the impoverished, voiceless victims of the corrupt regime. The arrogant, Narcissistic dictator was deeply offended, and the British pop band had to pay. At the funeral, all room service was immediately cut off. The hotel staff turned openly hostile, and death threats were phoned into the British embassy. John and I were sharing a room, and we woke up and phoned down for bacon and eggs. Time went by, so we called down again. Excuse me, can we have our breakfast, Star recalled? I didn't eat for three days, remembered Aspinall. They would bring up food that was terrible. Even if it was cornflakes, you'd pour the milk and it would just come out in lumps. A harried Epstein tried to smooth ruffled feathers by issuing a public apology on TV, but his speech was scrambled by the government. 
When the band tried to make a quick getaway, they found that no taxis were outside. The Filipinos deliberately pulled the plug on their vital security detail. When they eventually commandeered a car, they encountered roadblocks at every turn as soldiers tersely redirected them away from the airport. All along the harrowing journey and -and stop-and-go morning traffic, they encountered violent mobs making menacing gestures, shouting obscenities, and even throwing bricks at the car. It became significantly uglier. At Manila Airport, the chaotic scene was designed to make the four young men sweat. The escalators had been turned off, leaving Aspinall and Evans to haul the heavy equipment up several long flights of stairs. At the check-in counter, officials tried to put the gear on another flight, Evans had to leap over the counter to sort it out. The group was then approached by a commissioner from the Filipino Taxation Authority who insisted that they could not leave the country until they had paid the appropriate tax on their concert receipts, which the promoter was still holding. Brian quite rightly said that the promoter was responsible for the levy, but after a heated argument, reluctantly paid a large sum to the man. It was anything to get the hell out of there with our lives, Evans remarked later. From there, the party made their way to the departure lounge, where hordes of frenzied citizens behind an observation balcony pounded on the glass and shouted, Down with the Beatles! Beatles go home! The soldiers began to manhandle the band, butting them with their rifles and shoving them against the walls, barking, Get over there! From there, the party made their way to the departure lounge, where hordes of frenzied citizens behind an observation balcony pounded on the glass, saying, Beatles, go home! The soldiers then began to manhandle the band, butting them with their rifles, shoving them up against the walls, barking, Get over there! Passengers awaiting other flights hissed and spit upon them. Suddenly, punches were thrown, launching a full-scale riot. In the violent melee, Ringo was dropped to the floor by a vicious blow and had to crawl to customs as he was clubbed repeatedly. A local roadie was slammed down a flight of stairs and broke an arm. Brian Epstein, who bravely took the brunt of the brutality, was struck in the face and back and sprained an ankle. When someone yelled at John, "'You're treated like ordinary passenger!' he cried back. "'Ordinary passenger doesn't get his fucking ass kicked, does he?' Beatlemania was going on all around us, Harrison said, with all the kids screaming and trying to grab hold of us, but with the adults and thugs punching us, throwing bricks and kicking us as we passed. They tried to kill us. They set the whole of Manila on us. Eventually they spotted a group of nuns and two Buddhist monks whom they cowered behind for protection. Star surmised, we thought, well, it's a Catholic country, so they won't beat up nuns. We knew not to fight back, says Aspinall. If we had, it could have been very, very bad. When they reached customs, the soldiers continued to batter them while the crowd roared approval. Evans jumped into the fray to put himself between six inspectors and his four charges, only to be mercilessly pounded to the floor. Beatles chauffeur Elf Bicknell got the worst of it, however, with a broken rib and a serious spinal injury. Only Paul slipped through unharmed. At last, the band made it onto the plane, or sanctuary, as McCartney termed it. Just when they thought they were finally out of harm's way, a call rang over the PA system. Will Mr. Evans and Mr. Barrow please exit the aircraft? The cabin fell eerily silent, all eyes on Evans and NEM's press officer, Tony Barrow. Mail said, I thought this was it. Tony and I were going to be left behind. I thought we were going to die. I'd never see my friends or family again. I remember walking down the aisle, feeling sick to my stomach and absolutely petrified. Choking back tears, I looked down at George and said, Tell Lil, his wife, I love her. When the two men finally reached the terminal, they were told that no one in the entourage would be allowed to leave Manila due to a so-called bureaucratic error. There was no official record of the group's arrival in the Philippines some two days previously. Since they hadn't officially arrived, they were now unable to leave, cited illegal immigrants. I had fantasies that we were going to be put in jail because it was a dictatorship, Star recalled. You lose your rights in a dictatorship, no matter who you are, so we weren't going to get off that plane. As the plane taxied down the runway and took off, the jeers of the crowds were still echoing in their ears, and there was speculation that the plane had been fired upon from the tree-lined runway. 
President Marcos issued the following official statement. There was no intention on the part of the Beatles to slight the First Lady of the Republic of the Philippines. A beleaguered Brian Epstein slumped in his seat, vomiting into a paper bag. It turned out that the promoter had pressured him into handing over a whopping 50% of the performance fee, in fact, a ransom for the Beatles' freedom. This didn't sit well with booking agent Vic Lewis, who instantly jumped upon him, grabbed him by the throat, and demanded, "'Where's the goddamn paper bag money?' His reaction was understandable. He'd been hauled out of bed in the middle of night and spirited off to the palace, where he was mercilessly grilled until dawn by army officers. On arrival in India, the fragile Brian, who had broken out in ugly welts, was rushed by ambulance to the nearest hospital, where he was diagnosed with mononucleosis, from which he would suffer on and off for the rest of his life. This was the beginning of the end for him. He was overcome with guilt about what the Beatles branded Brian's cock-up, his confidence shattered, and questioning his future role with them. Once safely at home in Britain, George Harrison's public comments belied the Beatles' future all-you-need-is-love mantra. He told a reporter grimly, If I had an atomic bomb, I'd go over there and drop it on them. As for the First Lady Imelda, she got her own back by telling the press, Oh, I never liked them anyway. Their music is horrible. The Beatles informed Brian that their upcoming American tour would be their last. This near-death experience in the Philippines had sent them permanently into the sanctity and privacy of the recording studio. Still, the ugly incident was not easily forgotten in Manila. If there was one thing that Marcos loved more than money or power, it was his demanding wife, and he would not allow her to lose face because of these four British upstarts. It was later revealed during the revolutionary takeover of Manila by its people in 1986 that he had secretly ordered a hit on all four Beatles in India. It was intended to look like just another of the many fatal car crashes which occurred daily on the subcontinent's dangerous roads. According to secret documents found amongst the dictator's private records after his fall from power, his intelligence operatives had called upon the services of a foreign national named Juan Dega Fernandez, who was living in Delhi, to orchestrate the plot. The plan was simple. The Beatles would be shadowed constantly in India, and as soon as they took to the roads on a sightseeing tour, which they did, a huge cargo-filled articulated lorry would ram them head-on, demolishing their rented, black American Cadillac. The driver was to be paid 25,000 rupees and would avoid injury by leaping out of the truck at the last moment. The scenario was right out of James Bond, according to both Filipino and recently uncovered MI5 documents. MI5, however, didn't find out about the plot until two weeks after the Beatles were back in London. It turned out that Marcos had eventually realized it might be too much of a coincidence for the Beatles to die violently only days after leaving Manila under such a cloud. Further, he was attempting to build a better relationship with Britain and felt his ambitions might be jeopardized if the plan went ahead. Thus, with only hours to spare, his overseas security team called off the conspiracy as quickly and quietly as it had been conceived. Ironically, when the Beatles were out and about in their Indian Cadillac, they did break down and were stranded for hours by the side of the road just outside Delhi, which would have forestalled the plot in any case. To date, there is no evidence that Mrs. Marcos had any knowledge of her husband's aborted conspiracy on her behalf. About four weeks after their traumatic experience in the Philippines, the Beatles faced another controversy when they flew to America to start their tour. It started innocently with an article published in the London Evening Standard on 4 March 1966, which saw Lennon waxing philosophical about the current state of religion. Christianity will go, he said. It will vanish and shrink. I don't need to argue about that. I'm right, and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. His remarks passed unnoticed in Britain, but were later printed in the U.S. teen magazine Datebook on 29 July 1966. And within days, radio station DJs, outraged at his comments, were banning Beatles from their playlists and conducting public bonfires of the Beatles' records. In Memphis, on 19 August, a firecracker was thrown at the Beatles on stage. It went bang, Lennon recalled, and each of us looked around, and Ringo shouted, Who was shot? in all the excitement. 
For the first time, the Beatles were playing regularly less than capacity in the United States, and they decided to call it quits by the time they reached Candlestick Park on 29 August. Boarding the plane that evening in San Francisco, George Harrison commented, Well, that's it. I'm finished. I'm not a Beatle anymore. In September 1966, while Lennon was on location in Spain shooting How I Won the War for Richard Lester, he and Cynthia rented a sprawling villa in a mirror which had once been a convent. Ringo and Maureen joined them for what they had hoped would be a serene holiday far away from the maddening crowd of Beatlemaniacs. No sooner had everyone settled in than a series of strange events ensued. The electricity went on and off for no good reason, and objects disappeared from one room only to turn up in another. One evening at a candlelit dinner in the villa's cavernous main hall, the party was suddenly spellbound by a clear, rapturous singing whose origin they were unable to pinpoint. They joined in with the angelic choir, which continued uninterrupted for some thirty minutes. It was as if someone had taken control of their voices. One evening, Maureen had the uneasy feeling that an unseen presence was in her and Ringo's bedroom. The lights were steadily flickering on and off as she fell asleep. The next morning, she woke to find the laces on her nightgown mysteriously tied in knots when she had gone to sleep with them in bows. Starr insisted he was not the culprit. It appeared that she had been set upon during the night by a mischievous poltergeist. During that holiday, the Lennons and Stars, now with George Harrison in tow, received an invitation to a health spa run by a kooky couple who believed they were in contact with extraterrestrials whose spaceships, they alleged, had landed on their property. Of course, Lennon was very keen to check it out. Upon their arrival, the hosts exuberantly ushered their famous guests to a makeshift radio receiver designed to communicate with intergalactic aliens. "'Can you hear them?' cried the pair. "'They're trying to contact us.' All the guests could make out was static. That night everyone was asked to participate in a séance. As the party assembled around the table, the so-called clairvoyant immediately informed Cynthia that she too was gifted with the power to communicate with the spirit world. As they all held hands in the darkness, it was all she could do to stop herself laughing as John tickled her fingers. As if in a scene from a bad movie, the medium began moaning and swaying from side to side. Then a voice thundered, Red Indian Spirit! Following a litany of cryptic messages and predictions, the medium's voice rumbled, Is there a Cynthia here? You must listen to her. Cynthia will lead the way. Afterwards, as the party went home, the Beatles proclaimed the episode a scam. As Cynthia continued to grin, John turned to her and joked, Whoever listens to you anyway, he must be fucking mad. Not long afterwards, Lennon wrote his melancholy Cry Baby Cry, which was released on the White Album and referred to the event in the final verse, for a seance in the dark, with voices out of nowhere for a lark. Meanwhile, McCartney decided to take a ten-day motor holiday along the Mediterranean, planning to hook up with John on location. He enlisted the ever-agreeable Mal Evans for company, and the pair headed out from Bordeaux in Paul's green Aston Martin DB6. On the French border, McCartney purchased an antique oil lamp, and Mal bought a double-barreled shotgun that didn't quite make it through Spanish customs. They traveled down through Madrid and Cordoba to Spain's beautiful coast. That particular holiday, however, soon ended when, on the spot, Paul came up with a far more exotic itinerary. "'Are you up for a safari in Kenya?' he asked Mal, who agreed enthusiastically. The car was shipped to London, and the pair hopped on a plane back to Madrid and booked a flight to Nairobi. There they found their African driver Moses in his brand-new Plymouth waiting to chauffeur them. First up was a national park. McCartney, obsessed with his new 16-millimeter movie camera, shot roll upon roll of hippos, zebras, monkeys, and other wildlife. Mal's 8-millimeter home movie of the safari is now a hot commodity on the Beatle collector's circuit. Later, the two bunked down in the park's luxury lodge where Paul played poker and had a few drinks with some rowdy British soldiers. Evans, meanwhile, made friends with a stunning cocktail waitress named Tess, whom he entertained in his suite until the small hours. The pair continued on, despite McCartney's mild heat stroke, to the base of Mount Kilimanjaro. 
On the way to their chalet-style hut, Moses had to drive down a single-lane track with embankments on either side. Suddenly, the car screeched to a halt. A massive obstacle blocked their path. It was a whacking bull elephant, cried Evans. On the way to their chalet-style hut, Moses had to drive down a single-lane track with deep embankments on either side. Suddenly, the car screeched to a halt. A massive obstacle blocked their path. It's a whacking bull elephant, cried Evans. It was a precarious situation, to say the least. They were unable to reverse with the traffic behind them. So Moses slammed his foot on the accelerator and sped around the animal before it knew what was happening. Both Paul and I were shit scared, Evans admitted. On his return to Nairobi, Mal notes that the biggest thrill of the adventure was their stay at the Treetops Hotel. It was constructed around a series of massive trees, the trunks pushing up through the middle of the rooms. It was so remote that only a Land Rover and an experienced game hunter could safely transport them there. On their final night in the Kenyan capital, McCartney decided to camp at the local YMCA. Evans ran off to buy some souvenirs and returned to find him sitting on the lawn playing his guitar encircled by dozens of schoolchildren. On their final night in the Kenyan capital, McCartney decided to camp at the local YMCA. Evans ran off to buy some souvenirs and returned to find him sitting on the lawn playing his guitar encircled by dozens of schoolchildren. Over the course of the mid-sixties, Angela and Ruth McCartney had witnessed many of the highs and lows in Paul's romance with Jane Asher. The family had first met Jane in 1964 at a Christmas dinner party at her parents' home in London's Wimpole Street. Angela described the actress as elegant and artistic, an ideal match for Paul. Jane could be a bit moody, she said, but she had a lot to contend with. She was courting a beetle and was coming up north to visit his millions of relations who came from a completely different background. We were as working class as it was possible to be, while Jane came from a very well-educated, cultured, artistic family. She changed Paul's outlook and made him see a much broader spectrum of life. In her turn, Jane taught Ruth to knit and brought her some new clothes, a kilt, a green mohair sweater, and a beautiful camel coat. Paul and Jane both delved into their genealogical histories, having their respective family charts drawn up. It turned out, while Asher's distinguished ancestors dated back to King James I, McCartney, on the other hand, descended from a long line of Irish potato farmers. He quickly rolled up his chart and tossed it under the bed, Ruth chuckled. McCartney bought his first house that year, a Georgian building in Cavendish Avenue, St. John's Wood, that he and Jane decorated themselves. Encouraged by Jane, he also bought a farm in Scotland. On Christmas Eve 1966, when the family gathered at Cavendish Avenue, Paul and Jane announced their engagement. McCartney showed off the diamond ring he'd purchased for her and announced, I've got a great song to play you. He sat down at the piano to play the only just recorded When I'm 64. Although he had written it when he was 19, he had saved it to honor his father's 64th birthday. Chapter 5. The Love Inside Us All. Inner Space, 1967. I've never really known what it's like to be a Beatle. The Beatles is something still abstract as far as I'm concerned. Other people see us as Beatles. I've tried to see us as Beatles, but I just can't. George Harrison. On 5 January 1967, at 7 p.m., the Beatles gathered at EMI Studios at No. 3 Abbey Road to work on Penny Lane, which was released as a single in February. Paul laid down vocal overdubs for the song, then set to work to create an underground tape as part of a commission for the Carnival of Light Rave, to be held at the Roundhouse on the evening of 28 January and 4 February. Psychedelic posters for the event offered music composed by Paul McCartney and Delta Music Plus. The identity of the secondary composer is still unclear. Earlier that year, underground designers Binder, Edwards, and Vaughn were promoting a light show at London's Roundhouse. The trio, whom Paul had recently commissioned to detail a piano which he uses to this very day, approached him to compose a musical piece for the event. The force behind the carnival was the brilliant Barry Miles, author of Many Years From Now, a biography of Paul and co-founder of London's hip International Times. 
Miles asked him to write a 15 to 20 minute piece. McCartney enthusiastically agreed. Now there are conflicting opinions as to whether the Beatles started work on what the press later called a tape of random electronic noises before Paul did the vocals on Penny Lane or after. Beatles author Mark Lewison has stated that it was started afterwards, but George Harrison personally told me that he had read several of Lewison's books and found them riddled with mistakes, so who knows? Paul recalled things differently. I told them, look, we've got half an hour before the session starts. Would you be into that? And we'll only take 20 minutes to do it in real time. They all agreed. The recording included four tracks. Track one, drums with organ and rhythm backing. Track two, distorted guitar and sound effects. Track three, John and Paul screaming, demented old women. Then Lennon yells, Barcelona. And McCartney, are you all right? with random whistles and gargling noises added later. Track four, sound effects, tambourine, and finally, tape echo. As the boys were finishing, George Martin came in for the evening. This is bloody ridiculous, he scoffed to engineer Jeff Emmerich. We've got to get our teeth into something a little more constructive. The composition was mixed down to mono, given to the promoters, and played at the Carnival of Light Raves two-day festival. It has never been heard since not even on bootleg. In 2002, McCartney told Rocking Vicar magazine, the tape still exists, it's very avant-garde, or as George would say, avant-garde a clue. George didn't like it, as he did not like that kind of avant-garde music. It was considered for inclusion in the Beatles anthology compilation, but Harrison gave it a thumbs down. Maybe its time has not yet come, said McCartney. Interestingly, two years later, in 1969, George released his own album of Moog-inspired squeaks and squawks with the help of surrealistic New Age composers Beaver and Krauss, entitled Electronic Sound. One man's avant-garde, it seems, later becomes another man's ganja-inspired gobbledygook. Following the phenomenal success of the Beatles' two movies, A Hard Day's Night and Help, there was great pressure for the group to star in a third. Several ideas were scuttled, including an adaption of J.R.R. R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, as well as The Three Musketeers. Then in January 1967, producer Walter Shenson contacted playwright Joe Orton with a view to engage him to produce a script. Orton was a hot property in the London theatre, and Brian Epstein, too, felt that he might be perfect for the job. Paul was also a firm fan, having invested a thousand pounds in Orton's play Loot. Orton's diary entry for 12 January 1967 tells us that Shenson had said he had a dull script and wondered if Orton might take a look at it. He agreed, and on 15 January wrote in his diary, I like the idea. Basically, it's that there aren't really four young men, just four aspects of one man. Sounds dreary, but as I thought about it, I realized what wonderful opportunities it might give. Orton based Up Against It upon a novel he had written in 1953 with Kenneth Hollywell, his lover, The Silver Bucket, and on his own 1961 novel, The Vision of Gumbold Provel, published posthumously as Head to Toe. He delivered the first draft on February 25, convinced that it would be rejected. The boys in my script have been caught in flagrante, become involved in dubious political activity, dressed as women, committed murder, put into prison, and committed adultery. He was right. The reason we didn't do up against it, said McCartney, wasn't because it was too far out or anything. We didn't do it because it was gay. We weren't gay, and that's all there is to it. Brian was gay, so he and the gay crowd could appreciate it. But it wasn't that we were anti-gay. It's just that the Beatles were not gay. Revolver, which had been released in August 1966, paved the way for Pop's most celebrated soundtrack, which underscored the 1967 Summer of Love. Recorded between December 1966 and April 1967, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band brims with artistic and technical innovation and emerged almost magically from its rapidly maturing composers. 
Revolver, which had been released in August 1966, paved the way for Pop's most celebrated soundtrack, which underscored the 1967 Summer of Love. Recorded between December 1966 and April 1967, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band brims with artistic and technical innovation and emerged almost magically from its rapidly maturing composers. Mal Evans said, The Beatles' lifestyle changed changed at the time. It was a growing up process. They experienced many different things which were included in their music. McCartney has said that the idea was born on the flight home from Kenya, following his safari with Evans on 19 November 1966. The two had certainly tossed around several ideas. Me and Mal often bantered words around, which led to the rumor that he thought of the name Sergeant Pepper, but I think it would be much more likely it was me saying, think of some names. We were having our meal, and they had those little packets marked S and P. Mal said, what does that mean? Oh, salt and pepper. We joked about that. So I said, Sergeant Pepper, just to vary it. Sergeant Pepper, salt and pepper. An oral pun, not mishearing him, just playing with the words. Then Lonely Hearts Club, that's a good one. There's a lot of that about, the equivalent of a dating agency now. I had just strung those together in the way you might string Dr. Hook and the Medicine Show. The culture of the 60s was going back to the previous century, really. I just fantasized, well, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. That'd be crazy, because why would a Lonely Hearts Club have a band? If it had been Sergeant Pepper's British Legion Band, well, that's more understandable. The idea was to be a little more funky. That's what everybody was doing. That was the fashion then. The idea was to use any words which would flow. I wanted a string of those things because I thought that would be a natty idea instead of a catchy title. People would have to say, what? We used quite a few pun titles already. Rubber Soul, Revolver, so this was just to get away from all of that. Not everyone, however, agrees with McCartney that the concept of the Beatles taking on the persona of a fictional pop band was all his. Pete Shotton has credited Mal Evans with conjuring up the idea, inventing its name, and even co-writing some of its best songs. Ringo Starr even agreed in a Big Beat interview in 1984. Paul wrote a song with Mal called Sergeant Pepper. Mal thought of the title, Big Mal, Super Roadie. The first song I ever wrote that was published was Sergeant Pepper, Evans remembered. I was staying with Paul as his housekeeper. His previous housekeepers left after Paul discovered they had written an article for an Australian magazine. At the top of his house he had a small music room, and we sat at the piano and wrote Sergeant Pepper. It was originally Dr. Pepper until we found out that that was a trade name in America, so we wrote the tune. When the album came out, I remember very clearly we were driving somewhere late at night. There was Paul, Neil, myself, and the driver, and Paul turned round to me and said, Look, Mal, do you mind if we don't put your name in the songs? You'll get your royalties and all that. But because of Lennon and McCartney, it's best that it stay that way. I'm sure you can understand that we can't really make it Lennon, McCartney, Evans. So would you mind? I didn't mind. Because I was so in love with the group, it didn't matter to me. I knew myself what happened. As with Here, There, and Everywhere, Evans remained uncredited, and although he reportedly received an unspecified royalty for his efforts, he seemed, at least on the surface, to take it all in stride. But his decision probably cost him millions of dollars over his short lifetime. As author Ross Benson has pointed out, Mal really had little choice in the matter. Evans was only a hired hand. McCartney was a prince of the new age. If the prince chose to claim it as his own, no lowly courier was going to contradict him. Interestingly, it was Mal's co-authored uncredited Fixing a Hole that garnered rare praise from music critic William Mann, who wrote in the London Times, There is hope for all those new pop genres, and Sgt. Pepper provides it in abundance. Fixing a Hole is cool, anti-romantic, and harmonically a little like the earlier Michelle and Yesterday. McCartney later recalled the laborious process of recording the landmark album. We did quite a few takes of each song, but it's just because we've changed. In the old days of Please Please Me, we went in and did it in a day because we knew all the numbers. Nowadays, we just take a song in and all we've got is the chords on the guitar, the lyrics, and maybe the tune. So we've got to work out how to arrange it. We did a lot of takes on each one. 
We had quite a lot of people on some of the tracks, and sometimes we used them, asking them to clap along in that. As the project was being put together, Evans said that with each track leading straight into the next, it was like listening to Radio London without jingles, commercials, or the DJ. Even the run-out groove between the final track and the record center is used. The Beatles came up with the idea to place a high-frequency note right at the end, which only dogs could hear. Its pitch is 18 kilocycles, far beyond the limit of the human ear. Most people can't detect sounds above 17 kilocycles. Lots of LSD-inspired thinking on that one, then. But why not something for chipmunks or otters to enjoy, chimed in Bonzo dog master Vivian Stanchel. Left out in the cold from the first true Beatles effort to be initiated and led by McCartney, Lennon felt that Sergeant Pepper signified both a creative peak for the group and, with touring out of the picture, the beginning of the end. I was in a big depression during Pepper, and I know that Paul was not. Being forced into the studio without what he considered any substantial material of his own, Lennon was obliged to knock off several songs for the new project within a short period at home in Kenwood. Being for the benefit of Mr. Kite came easy, reading like prose from an old circus poster Lennon purchased in Seven Oaks, Kent, while Good Morning, Good Morning drew its inspiration from a cornflakes commercial and the television show Meet the Wife. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds gained its fanciful title from the now famous drawing by Julian Lennon and the most significant of John's new composition, the tabloid inspired A Day in the Life. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds gained its fanciful title from the now famous drawing by Julian and the most significant of John's new compositions, the tabloid inspired A Day in the Life, was bolstered by McCartney's middle section based on their early Liverpool life together. A true Lennon and McCartney collaboration would not occur in this fashion until the roles were reversed for Paul's I've Got a Feeling, to which John added his short, repetitious piece, Everybody Had a Hard Year. McCartney was definitely reaching a new creative plateau with efforts such as Sergeant Pepper's title track, the charming Ringo vehicle with a little help from my friends, and fixing a hole. A song McCartney admitted at the time was really about fans who hang around outside your door day and night. With Getting Better, Lennon was drawing from his own experience. It's a diary form of writing, all that I used to be cruel to my woman, I beat her and kept her apart from the things that she loved, was me. I used to be cruel to my woman, and physically, any woman. I couldn't express myself, and I hit. McCartney revived the age-old When I'm 64 at the beginning of the LP, and lovely Rita was Paul writing a pop song, commented John. He makes him up like a novelist. Harrison's only contribution to the LP was the majestic and meaningful Within You, Without You, which Lennon later hailed as one of George's best songs. The Beatles also recorded only a Northern song by Harrison during the sessions, but the piece was left off the LP and was released later on the 1969 Yellow Submarine soundtrack. Harrison's heart at the time was still very much in India, as he was to relate decades later. Now when we go in, we have to start from scratch, just thrashing it out and doing it the hard way. If Paul has written a song, he comes into the studio with it in his head. It's very hard for him to give it to us and for us to get it. When we suggest something, it might not be what he wants because he hasn't got it in his head like that, so it takes quite a long time. Nobody knows what the tune's going to sound like until we've recorded them and listened to them afterwards. Through all of this, Ringo was feeling rather left out, however. With Sergeant Pepper, I felt more like a session man because we were interested in making an album with strings, brass, and complex parts. Everyone says the record is a classic, but it's not my favorite album. Evans had creative input into the equally trailblazing album sleeve with its many graphic firsts, including printed song lyrics on the back, a multicolored inner sleeve, and cardboard cutouts of the Pepper Band. He remembered. 
Paul, Neil, and I sat down to have our first discussions about the sleeve. Our first thought was that the band should be outfitted in some kind of Salvation Army uniforms. But when Berman's theatrical agency came out with materials for the costumes, the Beatles decided to shelve that idea for more brightly colored uniforms. The stripes, tassels, and lanyards were on loan from an army barracks. We hired all the brass instruments, and I spent hours polishing them up for the shoot. We also brought things from home, statuettes and ornaments to be placed on the lawn. In the far right-hand corner, I've got a little fat soldier on guard duty that's a flower vase. John had a couple of stone heads. Paul brought in a lot of instruments, and we ended up using two. It's a very personal cover. It was like building a cardboard house, he says. The supersized collage was set up behind the Beatles in their Victorian-style uniforms, wearing their MBE medals. Of the 64 celebrated figures gracing the cover, one icon was notably absent. As Evans said, Paul pointed out the one person who wasn't on the cover was Elvis. He almost punched me because we got the people together we liked. It was a family affair, and we were such big Elvis fans. An Elvis cutout was made by artist Peter Blake, but for some reason it was not included. Hitler and Mahatma Gandhi were also withdrawn. Sergeant Pepper was rush released on 26 May 1967 in the UK, although the date usually commemorated is 1 June. In the US, it came out on 2 June. Public and critics deemed it a profound revolution in recorded music. The New York Times called the album a new and golden renaissance of song. Kenneth Tynan remarked that it represented a decisive moment in the history of Western civilization. Abby Hoffman said, Upon hearing Sergeant Pepper smoking reefers and planning the revolution in my friend's loft, we were overwhelmed by their vision. An unanticipated amount of praise was also directed, too, at Beatles producer George Martin. This time we got really offended, Paul said. One of the reviewers said, This is George Martin's finest album. We got shook. I mean, we don't mind him helping us. It's a great help, but it's not his album, folks. There was a little bit of bitterness over that. I mean, a bit of help is okay, but Christ, if he's going to get all the credit for the whole album. John Lennon came under the influence of many gurus in his ten years with the Beatles, but none caused him more acute future embarrassment than one John Magic Alex Mardas, who first made himself known to the Beatles during the Summer of Love. Mardas had befriended John Dunbar of the Indica Gallery, London, who had been married to singer Marianne Faithful and moved into his modest flat in Benterick Street. It was there that Magic Alex met Lennon. He'd entered Britain from Greece at 21 on a student visa and ultimately worked as a lowly television repairman. Mardas, however, had grander visions for what he might accomplish, given the opportunity, and regularly promoted his bizarre notions to Dunbar. He was quite cunning in the way he pitched his thing, remembered Dunbar. He was a master con man. He knew how to wind people up and to what extent. He was a fucking TV repairman, Yanni Mardas. None of this magic Alex bullshit. Nonetheless, Dunbar was impressed enough by him to arrange for him to work on the lighting effects for the Rolling Stones' three-week European tour of 1967. The Stones, however, were singularly unimpressed with the results. However, Magic Alex soon found a new patron in John Lennon, who was captivated by the fantastical inventions the young man waved in front of him. The fact that none of them were real didn't really matter to John, who by that time was obsessed with LSD and all things otherworldly. Magic Alex was a Greek bloke who was a friend of John's, said Paul. He had quite a lot of knowledge about electronics. Other people, however, widely disputed his ideas and said that they couldn't possibly be done. But Alex said they could, and John believed him. Magic Alex impressed John, Harrison recalled, and because John was impressed, Alexis came into our lives. I suppose he was a rather charming fellow for a while, but he got to be very pedantic and boring as time went on. Magic Alex quickly moved to isolate John from any other major influence, including his closest friend. Such was his M.O. He was introduced to the rest of the Beatles in typical Lennon fashion. This is my new guru, Magic Alex, he announced one evening at Paul's Cavendish Avenue home. McCartney, of course, was astonished but remained open-minded. Because John introduced him as a guru, there was perhaps a little pressure on him to try and behave as a guru, Paul conceded. But I didn't treat him that way. 
To be honest with you, I thought he was just some guy who was rather interesting. He had this one idea that we should all have our heads drilled, Ringo remembered. It's called trepanning. Magic said that if we had it done, our third eye would be able to see and we'd get cosmic consciousness instantly. Mardas's interesting ideas ran the gambit from designs already in production by other research scientists to an X-ray camera which could see through walls, an artificial sun, loudspeakers made of wallpaper, and a house which hovered in the air supported only by invisible beams. Paul's pointed response was, well, if you could actually do that, we'd like one, please. One of the few to be completed was the aptly named Nothing Box, a simple plastic cube with twelve lights which flashed at random until the battery died. Harrison was typically critical of this new guru's creations and later embarrassed by their gullibility. What Magic Alex did was pick up the latest inventions, show them to us, and we'd think that he'd invented them. We were naive to the teeth and he was nothing but a con man. Towards the end of his life, George said, there wasn't anything he ever did except make a toilet with a radio in it or something like that. By the end of 1967, the ever-conniving and resourceful Alexis was living in a house John had bought for him. It was he who encouraged the Beatles to buy a Greek island during their holiday there in July 1967. Of course, it was a way for him to involve himself further in the Beatles' finances and improve the reputation of the country's military regime, of which his father was said to be a leading member. So there were political aspirations, too, held by Magic Alex. By the end of 1967, the ever-dubious and resourceful Alexis was living in a house John had bought for him. It was he who encouraged the Beatles to buy a Greek island during their holiday there in July 1967. Of course, this was a way for him to involve himself further in the Beatles' finances and thus improve the reputation of the country's military regime, of which his father was said to be a leading member. The Beatles saw the island as somewhere they could escape the pressures of life in Britain, but as Magic Alex tipped off the media to their whereabouts in Greece, their peace was limited. Magic Alex was on a roll. Once, on a trip to a remote hill village, we came round a corner to find hundreds of photographers clicking away at us, Alistair Taylor recalled. Alexis selected the island of Leslow, surrounded by four smaller ones for the Beatles, and the plan had to be realized immediately for fear of John's losing interest in it. The island's price tag was £90,000, and Alistair Taylor was given the task of purchasing it from the Greek government. It took time for the transaction to get clearance from British officials, but by then the Beatles, and John in particular, had indeed moved on. All was not lost, however, as an unexpected change in property values and exchange rates meant the Beatles ultimately made a neat profit of £11,400 on the deal. Once again, Magic Alex lined his pockets at the Beatles' expense. Back on the home front, tensions were building in the McCartney family over Paul's increasing use of marijuana. The straight-laced old-school Jim McCartney frowned upon it, but tolerated it at first because of the stress of his son's celebrity. Jim would invariably send him out to the garden or to his bedroom to smoke, worrying that the housekeeper might get wind of it. Ruth observed that when Paul was high on weed, he becomes oracle-like. He knows everything and everyone else is an idiot. If you dare to argue with him, there's a fight. To this day, Ruth associates the smell of marijuana with bad moods. Throughout 1967, McCartney also occasionally took stronger substances. On one occasion, when Angela and Jim were at Paul's home in Cavendish Avenue, Jim and Paul went to see a noted television critic. Afterwards, Jim told his wife about the experience. This guy was coming down from an acid trip, and Paul was explaining how it expands your consciousness and helps artists to open up new vistas of thinking and comprehension. I didn't like the sound of it. It's flying in the face of God, if you ask me. I think all of the boys have done it. Paul more or less told me so tonight that they have. At one point, when Paul was getting stoned almost daily, his family grew concerned over his pale, unhealthy appearance and withdrawn, irritable demeanor. On 24 July 1967, the Beatles and others took out a full-page advertisement in the Times advocating for the legalization of marijuana. His father was devastated. That really broke Jim up, said Angela. 
He wouldn't go out and didn't want me to go to the shops in case anyone asked about it. He was so humiliated that his son, whom he admired and even worshipped, who was up on this pedestal, should be tempted by such things which tempted ordinary mortals. He'd hoped Paul would become Mr. Squeaky Clean. Eventually, Jim exploded, "'Don't bring that stuff into my house!' "'Whose fucking house is this anyway?' snapped Paul. "'Well, it's in my bloody name!' Well, I paid for it, and don't you ever forget it. The vibrant but fleeting summer of 1967 marked the zenith for the Beatles' Liverpool Mafia, as press officer Derek Taylor once said of the group's inner circle. I sometimes think the people closest to them are the peoples the Beatles resent the most. We were so adjacent to the truth, to the money, so near the fame and success and all the glamour, we got to look like courtiers covered in gold dust. Did they ever think, God damn them, who do they think they are, who needs them, we're the Beatles, we are the four. Even as the four were veering off on separate paths, their tightly woven band of helpmates, Peter Brown, Neil Aspinall, Alistair Taylor, Derek Taylor, Mal Evans, and Brian Epstein, remained steadfastly at their posts. Although they all had fancy titles, their duties were infinitely broader, merging together into one job description, Beatles Confidant. All were essentially on 24-hour call with a special hotline to their bosses ready to bail them out of trouble or lend a sympathetic ear. As the suave, witty Derek Taylor said, we were the link, the pipeline, the barrier, the obstacle course to be cleared to reach the big prize. We were there because we wanted to selflessly serve the Beatles. Neil Aspinall, who had attended Liverpool Institute with Paul and George, was universally acknowledged to be the Beatles' hardest worker. As Al Aronowitz observed, the Beatles themselves will tell you if anyone deserved to be called the fifth Beatle, it was Neil. If John was the commanding officer of the Beatles, Neil was his top sergeant. John Lennon exercised his leverage over the Beatles by using Neil as his fulcrum. Both Peter Brown, the smooth quasi-manager, and Alistair Taylor, the no-nonsense office executive, were swept aboard the Beatles' luxury cruiser by Brian Epstein. They had been his assistants before he had taken on the Beatles. Taylor likened their duty to a force field that insulated and cushioned the group from the daily war zone of Beatlemania. The Beatles' late sixteen pill-popping and acid-dropping helped them to cope with the pressures of their fame, and they invited their well-paid minders to join in. Alistair remembers, Lennon spent weeks trying to persuade me to go on an LSD trip, but I never did. Both John and Derek would spend hours trying to convince me, we'll be with you, man, it'll be great. Brian faithfully championed his clients both in the press and behind closed doors. When it became clear that the media had targeted John and Paul over George and Ringo as the stars, he would have none of it. The band's songwriters, he partnered George with Paul or Paul with Ringo. When George Martin suggested that yesterday should be marketed as a Paul McCartney solo single, Brian remained staunchly loyal. That would be wrong. That would break up the Beatles. It's got to be the Beatles. According to Clive Epstein, who credits his brother with founding the Beatles era, one of Brian's brilliant parting shots was to bring in showbiz empresario Robert Stigwood on 13 January 1967 in a shocking merger with NEMS. Stigwood, who represented acts like the Bee Gees, the Moody Blues, Cream, and Jimi Hendrix, became joint managing directors of NEMS. Unfortunately, he was never to see what tremendous foresight he had, says Clive. Brian was looking for something in 1967. What he would have found had he lived, I don't know, but I believe it would have not been in entertainment. In September 1966, George Harrison traveled to India. He was already aware of the concept of mantra meditation, but became increasingly interested when he came across an album of chants by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder of the blossoming Hare Krishna movement. In Greece, in mid-1967, he and John threw themselves into chanting while yachting on the Aegean with Paul and Ringo, their wives and entourage. Before meeting Prabhupada, I bought an album he did in New York, George said. John and I listened to it. I remember we sang Hare Krishna for days with ukuleles, sailing through the Greek islands. Like six hours we sang this, because we couldn't stop once we got going. As soon as we stopped, it was like the lights went out. It went on to the point that our jaws were aching, singing the mantra over and over. We felt exalted. It was a very happy time for us. 
Even Alistair Taylor, normally rather conservative and hesitant, joined John and George in their marathon chanting sessions. Later he said to me, For me the greatest moment of the trip came one moonlight evening when George, John George and Mal and I were sitting out on the deck just above the bow of the yacht watching a glorious Greek moon. John, Mal, and I had been chanting Hare Krishna while George gently picked out the notes on his ukulele. But at last we stopped, at peace with the world, sitting with our legs crossed. We must have been there for nearly two hours with the rush and push of Beatlemania, utterly forgotten in this newfound peace and tranquility. At last I broke the silence. Just look at that moon. Well spotted, Alistair, said John. Now they won't let it go. Whenever I point out anything to them, someone says, Well spotted, Alistair. Of all the Beatles, George and Patty Harrison were the one most absorbed in cultivating their spiritual life. They were restless and unfulfilled by the glitz surrounding them. They had already endeavored to teach themselves meditation from books, but weren't really making much headway. It was Patty who first encountered the transcendental meditation movement, which made a huge impact on their lives. She remembered, I'd been trying to teach myself, but only half really doing it. One day a girlfriend told me about transcendental meditation. I went along with her to a lecture given at the Caxton Hall. Maharishi wasn't there. It was just someone talking about his work. I joined the movement then and there, but I found the lecture very dull and rather obvious. But I got all their literature, so I knew all about their summer conference at Bangor. I said yes long before George and the others had heard about it. I'd booked up weeks before. Patty found out from a friend that the Maharishi was giving one last farewell lecture tour before taking up a lifelong vow of silence, a vow for some reason he failed to keep. There is another version of how the Beatles first hooked up with the Maharishi. While almost everyone accepts Patty's sequence of events, Cynthia Lennon recalled, The Maharishi was in London giving lectures on transcendental meditation. Alexis Mardas heard about him and suggested that the Beatles go along to observe firsthand the wise teacher from India. The fact that Alexis had any influence at all over the Beatles was certainly a feather in his cap. I must admit, the best thing he ever did was point the Beatles in the direction of the Maharishi. In fact, it was the only good thing he ever did for any of the group. Unfortunately, after the Beatles got together with the teacher, Alexis realized he'd made a colossal miscalculation and publicly challenged the Maharishi in front of the Beatles, insisting that he had met him once in Greece, traveling under another name, doing something completely different. Maharishi told him that he had never visited Greece and that the young man must be mistaken. Alexis, however, stuck to his guns and goaded the old man to admit the truth. At that point, both John and Paul told him to be quiet, and later admonished him for speaking to a holy man in that manner. I know what I'm saying is true, Alexis shot back. He's just a common hustler out to get as much money off you as he can. It was the first nail in the coffin of his very profitable relationship with the Beatles. Meanwhile, Harrison alerted the other Beatles that the Maharishi was coming to London, and that they could hear him speak at the London Hilton on 24 August. They went, minus Ringo, who was visiting his wife and newborn son Jason in a London hospital, and they were impressed. Afterwards, the Maharishi met them and invited them to Bangor with him by train the next day. They agreed. That was one of the privileges of being in the Beatles. We could get in anywhere, says George. We got backstage, met Maharishi, and I said to him, Got any mantras? Give us a mantra, please. And he said, Well, we're going to Bangor tomorrow. You should come and be initiated there. McCartney remembered, he basically said with his simple system of meditation, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, no big crazy thing, you can improve the quality of your life and find some sort of meaning in so doing. Accompanying them on the mystical special, as the Daily Mirror called it, were Mick Jagger, Marianne Faithful, and Patty's younger sister, Jenny Boyd. Everyone was very excited about the prospect of spending time with a genuine spiritual master. But Bangor train station was mobbed by hundreds of screaming fans. The next day, after the Beatles had all been formally initiated, they received some very distressing news from London. Brian Epstein was dead. The fact was, there really hadn't been much room in their lives for him lately. They were all so involved in their work in the studio and were unsure of his role. After they stopped touring, he remained their manager in name only. 
Although he had an active social life, he had become lonely and unhappy. He had never been able to establish a stable one-to-one relationship and had to find affection when and where he could. He often confided to friends that he felt cursed since boyhood. Brian Epstein died alone in his bed on 27 August 1967 from an overdose of bromide mixed with barbiturates and antidepressants. An official inquest by the Westminster Coroner's Court found on 8 September that his death was accidental due to repeated, incautious, self-administered doses of sleeping tablets. Lennon later recalled, We were just outside the lecture hall with Maharishi. Somebody came up to us. The press were there because we'd gone down with this strange Indian. And they said, Brian's dead. I was stunned. We all were. And the Maharishi, we went into him. He's dead and all that. And he was sort of saying, oh, forget it, be happy. Fucking idiot. That's what Maharishi said. So we did. We went along with the whole Maharishi trip. I've had a lot of people die on me. And the other feeling is... What the fuck? What can I do? Look, I knew we were in trouble then. I didn't really have any misconceptions about our ability to do anything other than play music. I was scared. I thought, we fucking had it. A great many tears were shed by our very unhappy group that morning, recalled Cynthia. God and Christ must have been tired of hearing their names called, although they couldn't answer our repeated question. Why, Brian? Why? We all felt our world had turned upside down. We just couldn't come to terms with the fact that we had lost our dear friend so tragically. It was all too much to comprehend, without trying to invoke an answer from the only God we knew. A little later, a messenger arrived from the Maharishi's quarters inviting the Beatles' entourage to meet with him. They silently entered his flower-filled white room. Cynthia remembers he was seated in the middle of the room in the half-lotus position, with the sun pouring down through the windows upon him, filling the space with the most glorious iridescent colors. He held forth on the cosmic meaningless of the death of the body and the indestructibility of the soul. His reasoning comforted them, and he made the point that all the tears in the world could never bring Brian back, but rather hinder his onward spiritual journey to his destination. If they were joyful, the master said, Brian's spirit would be filled with joy and light. He even made them laugh. Our love for Brian, remembered Cynthia, was cemented by laughter, not tears. Then she added, although Epi listened to the boy's initial enthusiastic rantings about the Maharishi, for the first time he did not show any real personal interest in his group's activities. He nodded, smiled, and listened, but he really didn't want to become too involved. When I look back, Brian must have felt great sadness at seeing his boys take off without him for the first time in six years. He must have seen, as I did, the beginning of the end. As the Beatles emerged from having learned of Brian's death, they were pounced upon by the waiting media. Surrounded by microphones and cameras, George, John, and Ringo were forced to hold an impromptu press conference. Later on, Lennon remembered his special relationship with Epi. I liked Brian, and we were very close for years. Like I have the relationship now with Alan Klein, because I'm not going to have some stranger running things. I like to work with friends, you know. I was the closest with Brian, as close as you can get to somebody who lives a fag life and you don't really know what they're doing on the side. But in the group, yes, I was the closest to him, and I did really like him. He had hellish tempers, fits, lockouts, and he'd vanish for days. He'd come to a crisis every now and then, and the whole business would just fucking stop because he'd been on sleeping pills for days on end and wouldn't wake up or he'd be missing, beaten up by some docker down on the old Kent Road. But we weren't really too aware of all of that. It was later on we started finding out about those things. Peter Brown remembers the grim sequence of events leading to Epstein's death. Sunday at noon, when Brian's car was still in the same place in front of the house, Antonio and his wife Maria, his household staff, tried to rouse him on the intercom. When he didn't answer, they called me at Kingsley Hill, Brian's country home, but Jeffrey Ellis, one of the Beatles' lawyers, and I had gone to lunch at a local pub. Antonio then called Joanne Newfield, Brian's secretary, who called Alistair Taylor and asked him to meet her. 
By the time they arrived at Chapel Street, I was back at Kingsley Hill, and they summoned me to the phone. I told them not to call Brian's doctor, Norman Cowan, who lived quite far away, but to get my personal GP, Dr. John Galway. Fifteen minutes later, Joanne Allister and Brian Barrett, the chauffeur, were waiting outside the still-locked doors to Brian's bedroom. Dr. Galway called me and asked me what to do. I said to break down the doors. The curtains were drawn and the room was dark. In the light from the hallway, all they could see was him lying there on his right side, his legs curled up in a fetal position. Although for many years the Beatles' party line was that Epi died of an accidental overdose, which was supported by the coroner's verdict, the truth was that he had been crying suicide for months, which all of the Beatles knew. When police found a suicide note, the group's spokesman insisted it was from a previous attempt, but the officer in charge of the investigation tersely pointed out, suicides have no expiry date. In 1984, this author interviewed Alistair Taylor, who maintained then that Brian had not killed himself, and still does. Brian was a very complex man, and there's far more to it than him just being gay. He wasn't happy. Twice I had phone calls from him saying goodbye. He was committing suicide. I've often said in many ways I would have been happier if he had. I was there, minutes behind the doctor, and I want someone to tell me where it says he committed suicide. The verdict by the coroner was accidental death, and the survey confirmed it. Remember, there were only two people in that room, the doctor and myself. I've never said it was suicide. I've heard stories that there was a note found, but I certainly didn't find it. But the note does indeed exist and was found in a drawer near Brian's four-poster bed, and was shown to me by Clive Epstein in the Adelphi Hotel in Liverpool in 1984. It was well written in black ink on his monogrammed stationery, and simply read, My life has become intolerable. I am no longer of any productive use to the people I love, and I am sick of myself and my eternal loneliness. I am very sorry for any hurt I may have caused. Please, do not be hurt by this. I am tired, so tired. The responsibility for this act is entirely my own. I dearly love you all. Ever, Brian. As the media got wind of the full story, the Beatles' already difficult lives were made more so by the constant intrusions of an army of Fleet Street interlopers intent on filing their own exclusive stories. Privately, John and George and others close to Epstein were certain Brian had committed suicide. The coroner ruled that Brian had died from an accidental overdose of sleeping tablets, says Pete Shotton. John, however, remained privately convinced that, for all intents and purposes, he had committed suicide, which is not to imply the actual fatal overdose had necessarily been deliberate. Nonetheless, Brian's acute distress over his eminent breakup with the Beatles, along with his recklessly self-destructive behavior, suggested he didn't much care whether he lived or died. Meanwhile, out in Weybridge, Lennon continued to tout the Maharishi whenever he found a microphone in front of his face. In this case, journalist Ray Conley recorded what he said. We want to learn meditation properly so we can propagate it and sell the idea to everyone. This is how we plan to use our power now. They've always called us leaders of youth, and we believe this is a good way to lead. We want to set up an academy in London and use all the power we've got to get it moving for all the people who are worried about youth, drugs, and that scene. All these people with short back and sides can come along and dig it too. It's no gospel, Bible-thumping, sing-along thing, and it needn't be religion if people don't want to connect it with religion. It's all in the mind. It strengthens understanding and makes people relax. The whole world wants to relax, and people who get to know a bit about meditation will see that it's not just a fad, but a real way to calm tension. You learn about thoughts, the meaning of thoughts, how to trace your thoughts, and it's much better than acid. If Brian had been on the lectures on meditation, he would have understood. This is the biggest thing in my life now, and it's come at a time when I need it most. It's nothing to do with mysticism. It's just about understanding life. As it turned out, the Beatles were in big trouble financially. The fact was, they either had to pay over to the tax man the bulk of their earnings or invest in a business. But what kind of business? It was then and there on the vice of their accountants that the Beatles' famous Apple Corps Limited was formed. The first official Apple venture was the Beatles' ultra-hip clothing boutique in central London. 
The Beatles insisted that they wanted to retail only items that really interested them. Paul thought of selling only white things. It didn't end up like that, said John. It ended up with Apple and all these designs by the Fool and their many interesting and varied designs. In the middle of September 1967, a suitable site was found in Baker Street for the first Apple shop, and the official opening would take place on 9 November, with Pete Shotton taking time off from his Hailing Island supermarket post office complex to coordinate and manage the operation. He also had to contend with the Beatles' conflicting views on how the business should be run. One morning, remembered Shotton, Paul came into the shop and told us where to install a partition. Almost as soon as we had done his bidding, John showed up, took a good look around, and said, What the fuck is going on here? What's all that stuff there for? Well, Paul told us he wanted partitions up, I explained. Get that fucking thing out of there, John ordered. I don't want these fucking stupid partitions in here. The offending partitions were duly removed. A group of very talented young Dutch designers called The Fool were commissioned to produce a line of clothes for the shops. They were paid 40,000 pounds, which horrified accountant Harry Pinkster, who saw this as an unnecessary expenditure. The highly original group, who consisted of Barry, Yasha, Marika, and Simone, had previously worked on a rejected centerfold painting for Sergeant Pepper and completed various projects for the Beatles. But their first connection with the Beatles had come through the Saville Theater, which Brian Epstein owned. In many ways, the fool were the very epitome of the swinging 1960s art world. The artistic core of this talented collective consisted of Josie Leeger, Marika Koger, and Simone Postuma who had met in Amsterdam and briefly ran a boutique called The Trend. When they moved to London in 1966, they met Canadian Barry Finch and Simon Hayes, who ran a public relations firm with ties to Robert Stigwood and Brian Epstein. The fast-talking but lovable Finch soon became a full-fledged member of The Fool, while Hayes acted as business manager. Simone Postuma explained the group's name. It represents truth spiritual meaning, and the circle which expresses the universal circumference in which gravitates all things. After Marika met Paul McCartney in 1967, they became very close, and she began to conduct private tarot readings for the Beatles, and Paul always seemed to draw the fool card. This upset him, but Marika emphasized that the card represented an innocent, childlike quality, and Paul was inspired with a new song. I began to like the word fool, he said because I began to see through the surface meaning. I wrote Fool on the Hill out of that experience of the tarot with Marika. In an exclusive first-ever interview conducted in February 2003, Marika shed considerable light on the Fool's convoluted relationship with the Beatles and company with this author. I never debased my interest in the metaphysical by laying cards willy-nilly. I only remembered one time I had Paul draw a single card, death. It has been very significant in his life, the death of loved ones and the renaissance of his career. The fool were given tremendous freedom at the boutique, and Simone described his vision for the shop to the Sunday Times. It will have an image of nature like a paradise with plants and animals painted on the walls. The floor will be imitation grass and the staircase like an Arab tent. In the windows will be seven figures representing the seven races of the world, black, white, yellow, red, etc. There will be exotic lighting, and we will make it more like a market than a boutique. The original plan was to sell a wide range of clothing, furniture, jewelry, paintings, posters, and even the fixtures that were part of the shop. The press release termed it a beautiful place where beautiful people can buy beautiful things. The fool soon took off with Pete Shotton on a buying trip to Marrakesh, Marika remembers. Simone and I spent a lot of time in Morocco. We had connections and knew the country very well. Apple needed items other than clothes, and so we all agreed we needed to go and buy the stuff, which we did, jewelry, instruments, etc. For a time in London, the fool became almost as famous as the Beatles themselves. A 1967 article entitled Nobody's Fool put it this way. The Fool are the four exclusive designers whose most recent success is the creation of Apple, the Beatles boutique in Baker Street, London. 
Josie, or Yasha, Marika, and Simon are the designers and artists while Barry is their personal and commercial manager. The walls of their studio are strewn with Simon's bright, eerie oil paintings and involved Baroque posters and prints. Sorry silk handkerchiefs are draped over lighted lampshades and a Moroccan scarf hangs between the two levels of the large room. On one wall hang a variety of strange musical instruments. Seated behind a drawing board when I arrived was a shaggy figure with shoulder-length hair, baggy silk harem trousers, a patterned loosely fitting blouse, and silver slippers. Suddenly the door opened and the other three quarters of the fool burst in with a splash of color and a jangle of bells. The theme of our clothes is paradise like apple, began Yasha as she flopped into an overstuffed chair. It's all very natural, like nature. It is comfortable, colorful and relaxing. That is what paradise is like. Beautiful colors, beautiful ideas. It's like a fantasy, says Marika. Just like you and me, Simone from his drawing board says, we wanted an image that was distinctive, said Barry in a typical press officer voice, and he could have passed for one if he hadn't been wearing pink tights and an Indian-style green and gold brocade jacket. Yasha held up some sketches. We think eventually our clothes will be worn by everybody. People wear dreary things now because they've been available for the last hundred years. It's our designs. It was then that Yasha held up some sketches. Look, we think eventually our clothes will be worn by everybody. People wear dreary things now because they've been available for the last hundred years. If our designs had been available, they'd be wearing them, of course. We don't envision businessmen wearing these things to the office, at least not right away. What we have in mind for them is quiet velvet and lace, perhaps the more subdued brocades and silk, says Barry. Our clothes are representative of everything in the past, said Yasha, and we use influences from every part of the world. We add the spirit and trends of today, which reflect mankind. We work because we love now to do new things. It's a way of life, says Simone, now still painting. It's an emotional feeling for everything. Without love, you can't exist. The fool is the name we chose because the spiritual meaning symbolizes the truth. He was being very patient with me, as he explained, with frequent assistance from Barry. Everything comes from the light, which is truth and communication. The right combination of them gives you love. Evil, symbolized by darkness, is a product of mankind. All of Simone's pictures capture light and darkness, which is why they are so beautiful and why his art is so universal, said Marika. We are in the midst of a great religious revival, continued Simone, which has millions of followers. Today there is a new sense of brotherhood. The young want the peace that only light can bring. It was then that the telephone rang. You see, he said with a grin, the ringing bell is a sign that we speak the truth. We feel there is a certain obligation to life, a kind of responsibility to joy, and we try to live by that. It is predestined. Whilst under the Beatles' umbrella of Apple, the fool received great attention throughout London and even the world. In an article entitled A Hippie Hot Couture by Felicity Green on the flower power fashion scene, this was said, The hippie cult, like it or loathe it, is here. Compared with its baubles, bangles, beads, and bells, the quant-type miniskirts pale into establishment respectability. But where does it all come from? In case you've been kept awake at night, wondering where on earth Patty Beetle Boyd Harrison got that get-up in which he flew off to Los Angeles recently, I can now reveal the secret fashion source. It's a basement in London's Montague Square, where the founder members of the hippie hot couture hang out. Two girls, a man and a business manager, cohabit here amongst paraphernalia of psychedelia, turning out those snappy little hippie numbers for boys and girls that are being so enthusiastically received by the pop elite of Great Britain and the world. Actually doing the designing are two king-sized Dutch girls. They are Marika Koger and Yasha Lieger, both 23. Helping them along in their beaded, bobbled, and braided path is Marika's Dutch husband, Simone Postuma, who is 28 and has longer hair than either of the girls. At the moment of our meeting, he wore a pendant, a purple velvet tunic, pale yellow peep-toe sandals, and some extremely form-fitting pants in pink and lime satin stripes, blaze cut. 
The only un-Dutch member of this hippie setup is a Canadian lad called Barry Finch, who goes in for rather self-conscious hand-kissing, agrees with his Dutch chums that love is all you need, and was once a publicist for Brian Epstein's Saville Theatre. We are now, adds Simone, explaining their success in the dizzier reaches of the swinging London, personal tailors to the Beatles. We also, of course, make Patty Harrison's clothes. Yasha was wearing blue printed silk braid bound pajamas, a blouse and three multicolored unrelated prints, snakeskin thong sandals up to her knees, and an incredible freak out hairdo. Apart from designing fashion, Marika in pigtails, purple thong sandals, beads, a string of hippie bells, and a multicolored mini frock in the psychedelic manner, designs posters, while Simone concentrates on commercial art and painting. His works include oils, watercolors, a psychedelic surround for a fireplace for George Harrison, and a psychedelic piano for John Lennon. Immediate plans include writing a show suitable for all of the family, opening a shop to sell beautiful things to beautiful people, and most important of all, branching out into fashion mass production. Not just for women, shouted Marika over the Indian music on the hi-fi, but for children, too, and for men. Our things will be so beautiful that anyone who sees them won't be able to bear not having them. Oh, our prices are competitive, they said. With what, I asked. They smiled dreamily. Well, how much, for instance, was Patty Boyd's dress? Expensive, said Yasha. How expensive, I asked. Well, it's all pure silk and hand-done, said Marika, counting her beads and bells. With a delft change of the subject, Simone suggested that the whole world was not only ready, but waiting impatiently for the hippie way of life and fashion. And anyway, Carnaby Street was dead, finished, and full of cheap rubbish. If it weren't for the squares of the world, he said, there would be no problems. They wouldn't, for a start, have to repaint their front door. Marks the portals of the headquarters of London's first hippie hot coutures, The Fool. Numerous beautiful garments were created by The Fool for the grand opening of Apple. Long velvet skirts, Edwardian coats made from upholstery fabric, and other items more suitable for fancy dress parties than everyday wear. The Fool have been accused of stealing many garments from Apple over the years. To make the Apple Boutique premises stand out amongst the other drab, unadorned building of busy Baker Street, the fool planned to cover the outside walls with a swirling psychedelic mural. The City of Westminster Council refused permission for this, but the fool employed art students to paint their trippy images in rainbow colors. We had about six art students working as gophers, and we did all the painting ourselves over the weekend, Marika recalled. We did not push this mural. I clearly remember a meeting with all four Beatles in Brian's office and John on his knees begging us to do the mural. Not that anyone else objected, either. I don't know how much we were paid, to be honest with you. I never had anything to do with money. As a matter of fact, I don't even carry any change. The grand opening party was held on 5 December, nearly a month behind schedule, with the shop officially open to the public on the 7th. Magic Alex had been commissioned to supply an artificial sun for the event to light up the night sky at precisely 8.16 p.m., but it was a rather predictable no-show. Paul was at his farm in Scotland, and Ringo was filming Candy in Rome, so they both missed the grand gala which was so overcrowded with guests that a BBC commentator fainted. Early on, the shop appeared to be doing quite well as stock had to be constantly replenished. Much, though, was shoplifted by kids, and the venture nearly lost £200,000 in seven months. None of this, of course, was the fool's fault. Also, within three weeks of its unveiling, the outside mural had to be whitewashed due to complaints from other local traders and a stinging letter from their landlord, the Duke of Westminster. With all the trouble in the world, it wasn't worth fighting for, said John ruefully. Paul suggested projecting the mural on the now all-white building from across the street, but this, too, was soon forgotten. Incredibly, the Beatles opened yet another shop, Apple Tailoring, Civil and Theatrical, to be run by John Crittle, a 25-year-old designer who had previously made clothes for them, the Stones and other rock luminaries. The opening was held on 22 May 1968 at 161 Kings Road and was attended by John, Yoko Ono, George, and Patty. 
We won't really get teeny boppers here, Crittle said, because the prices will be too high for them. We're pushing velvet jackets and the Regency look, although the Beatles put forward plenty of suggestions. They have pretty far-ahead ideas, actually. We're catering mainly for pop groups, personalities, and turned-on swingers. Harrison commented to the New Music Express, We bought a few things from him, and the next thing I knew, we owned the place. Chapter 6. Across the Universe. The Beatles' Rishikesh Diary, 1968. Who was that woman who looked like Jean Simmons who kept going to Maharishi for private interviews? She must have been about 45. I was always trying to get an audience with the Maharishi, and he kept refusing. The rest of us had to wait like good American people in line to see the master walking on the pedals. John Lennon. When Ringo comes, the storm clears the passage. In the clear, Ringo comes. Maharishi. Reporter. Do you really feel this man is on the level? John Lennon. I don't know what level he's on. Born in Jalabapur, India in 1918, the son of a schoolteacher, Mahesh Prashad Varma graduated from Allahabad University with a physics degree in 1942. He soon abandoned his worldly aspirations, however, and according to his official biography, spent the next 13 years living the life of a Hindu ascetic uncovering the delicate mysteries of meditational yoga. During that time, he took initiation from his spiritual master, His Holiness, Brahmalin, Jad Guru, Sankaracharya, Brahmananda, Saraswati Maharaj, or to his followers, simply Guru Dev. Following his master's death, Varma apparently bestowed upon himself the name Reverend Maharishi Bala Brahmachari Mahesh Yogi Maharaj, an unheard of title for a mere ashram clerk. Beyond that, he publicly assumed the position of successor to his guru. Officials of the Orthodox Hindu society from which he sprang believed that he was wildly unsuited for the post as he had been born into the Kshatriya caste, warrior governmental class, and argued that he was also ineligible according to the last will and testament of Ramananda Saraswati. In 1985, Robert Kopinski, a former follower of the Maharishi, met in India with Gurudev's successor, Sri Sankaracharya Swarupanan Saraswati, to try to shed some light on the Maharishi's lightning rise to international prominence. If he is a follower of the Sanata Dharma Hinduism, he should not do what he is doing, the aged master began. This would be against the orders of his guru. Moreover, calling himself Maharishi, a great saint, is totally inappropriate. No assembly has conferred upon him that title. In the ashram he was doing the work of typing, writing, and translation. Then he became a sadhu. He went abroad, first to Singapore. The expat community there of Indians was thinking he was a disciple of Sankaracharya, and received him, bought him a ticket for the United States, and off he went. After going to America, he brought the Beatles back here. It was rumors he did inappropriate things with them, and that's why they went away. He later opened many camps and claimed he could teach people to read minds and levitate. No one, however, succeeded in learning the things he promised. He himself does not know how to practice yoga. He does not know anything about such things. He used to place a picture of Gurudev behind him, and during initiation he would have people worship it, then he would give out mantras. I have met many persons who in reality had their mantras from Mahesh, but they consider themselves to be disciples of Gurudev. But no matter whom they consider to be their teacher, because the fact is, he who gives a mantra is to be considered the real guru. If Mahesh thinks he is backed by Sankar Acharya, then it is proper on his part to tell people to take initiation from Sankar Acharya. I believe Mahesh has caused a severe blow to genuine Indian culture. Professional jealousy from a less commercially successful guru, or indeed legitimate criticism from the spiritual organization the Maharishi once represented. Cynthia Lennon comes down on the side of the old master. A decade after the Beatles met the Maharishi, she wrote, I believed then, and I believe now, that the Maharishi is a very wise and beautiful being. The press of the world took great delight in trying to belittle him, but their judgment was not founded on the experience of his teaching. 
No matter what anyone says about the Maharishi, he has always worked for the betterment of mankind, and if one can even partially succeed in a single lifetime, then as far as I'm concerned, he is worthy of praise, not degradation or insult. Whatever the case, in 1959 he traveled west and established the International Meditation Society, then known as the Beacon Light of the Himalayas. He landed in Hollywood, where he set up his own spiritual regeneration movement on a sunny summer afternoon in Sequoia National Park. To his twenty or thirty followers, the Maharishi spoke of a time when there would be spiritual regeneration centers in every major city of the world, and millions would embrace the technique of meditation. Once Maharishi was involved with the Beatles, however, he became a household name the world over. He appeared on the Johnny Carson show, exchanging roses with Merv Griffin, his smiling face on the covers of the Saturday Evening Post, Esquire, Newsweek, Life, Look, and he toured with the Beach Boys and even played Madison Square Garden. When veteran journalist Louis Lapham asked one of the guru's senior American aides about the financial side of the Maharishi's international movement, the man answered coyly, The Maharishi has a head for just about anything he needs a head for. When he was told he was sending too much money out of India, he simply set up companies in America and Switzerland to circumvent the problem. He homed in on U.S. college campuses as recruiting grounds and did equally well there. In the beginning, it cost only $35 to receive a mantra from the Maharishi, but rumor has it that he requested the Beatles to deposit some 10 to 25 percent of their annual income into a Swiss account in his name. Lennon, for one, was not having that. Bill Harry, a friend of the Beatles, has written, He seemed to act as if he didn't understand business affairs, but always had an accountant present at his meetings. When traveling, he always stayed at the very best hotels. The Beatles' aide to camp, Peter Brown, remembers his dealings with the guru. I had my doubts about the efficacy of the Beatles going off with Maharishi in the middle of the formation of Apple, particularly because of incidents which led me to believe Maharishi was using the Beatles' name for personal gain. One day I received a call from lawyers from ABC Television in America. They said the Maharishi was negotiating a TV special, which would include an appearance by the Beatles. They were calling to confirm the Beatles' cooperation. I told them in no uncertain terms that the Beatles had no intention whatsoever of appearing on the Maharishi show. Only a week later, the lawyers were back on the phone. The Maharishi was still insisting that he could deliver the Fab Four. I called the Maharishi in Malmo, Sweden, and explained the problem, but his answers were obscure and indefinite. I then decided to fly to Malmo to insist that he should not represent the Beatles as being part of his projects. The Maharishi greeted me warmly, but only giggled and nodded as I laid down the law. Later the lawyers, who said the Maharishi was still insisting the Beatles would appear, were soliciting sponsors with this understanding. I went to Malmo yet again, this time with Paul and George. We met the Maharishi and tried to explain that he must not use their names to exploit his business, and they definitely would not appear on his TV special, but the Maharishi only nodded and giggled. He's not a modern man, George said forgivingly on the plane home. He just doesn't understand these things. In Bangor, back in August 1967, the Maharishi extended an open invitation to the boys and their entourage to travel to his International Academy of Transcendental Meditation in Rishikesh, India, to take part in his advanced teacher's training program. Thus, on 14 February 1968, Mal Evans packed up the Beatles' luggage from their homes and boarded Qantas Flight 754 from Heathrow to New Delhi. John, Cynthia, George, Patty, and her sister Jenny flew in the next day. Evans recalled, traveling from London with John and George were two reporters, Robin Turner of the Daily Express and Don Short of the Daily Mirror convinced them on the plane just by chatting of the value of meditation. At 8.15 a.m. on Friday morning, George, John, Patty, Sin, and Jenny arrived. There to meet them and say hello was Mia Farrow. I'd already introduced myself back at the hotel and found out her brother Johnny was due to fly in about the same time as the two Beatles. Getting away from the airport wasn't too difficult because the press were quite polite and didn't detain anyone too long. However, the Beatles' entourage did not reach Rishikesh without incident, as Lapham remembered. 
Harrison and Lennon arrived over the weekend. The Indian press pursued them to the ashram, and there were several unpleasant incidents. A photographer was assaulted, and the editorials the next day reflected a general bitterness and dissolution. Apple bigwigs Neil Aspinall and Dennis O'Dell had come with John and George, as well as Magic Alex, Paul, Jane Asher, Ringo, Maureen, and a few members of the British press corps arrived at the Maharishi's comfortable mountain retreat late on 19 February. Across the path, a banner strung between bamboo poles bore the single word, Welcome. Just beyond where the path turned steeply upward, a stern guard stood before a wooden gate and a barbed wire fence. The buildings at the higher elevation stood amongst shisham and teak trees, but those below the gate were erected on open stony ground. Evans later revealed that the Beatles were all relieved to discover the many amenities available to them in what was literally the Indian jungle. Having heard a mixture of strange stories about the place, I think we all half expected to find ourselves living in tents with cardboard boxes for seats and tables, but we had a very pleasant surprise when we saw the high standard of the accommodations. Rishikesh is an incredible place, Harrison said. Ninety percent of the population are renunciates. Starr began to feel unwelcome on his first day, as Evans recalled. When he got the chance, Ringo told me he needed a doctor. It wasn't anything serious, but his injections were giving him trouble. His arm was swollen and painful, and he thought it best to see if any treatment was required. Our driver lost his way and led us to a dead end in the middle of a field. The press came to our rescue, as a whole stream of cars had been following us. In the end, we accepted the directions of some helpful reporters and found a hospital. A doctor assured Ringo all would be well without treatment. Everyone relaxed as the initial excitement of the trip subsided and tensions dissipated under the spell of meditation. Surprisingly, most days it was the normally sluggish John who was first up, and after half an hour's meditation, he would go for a leisurely stroll around the compound with Evans and George. We lived in one of six little cottages, Evans recalled. They had been luxuriously done out. Each one of our rooms was neatly furnished with twin beds, new rugs, dressing tables, shelves and cupboards, a bathroom, and toilet and shower facilities. The water supply broke down from time to time, both hot and cold. Surprise, surprise, not a single creepy crawly thingy in sight, so much for all the soft rumors that we'd heard in London before we set off. The Maharishi was a wonderful teacher, says Cynthia. His lectures were humorous, enlightening, and provided truly halcyon days. John and George were in their element. They threw themselves totally into the Maharishi's teachings, were happy, relaxed, and above all, found a peace of mind denied them so long. Harrison recalled that quite a lot of what the Guru said went directly into their music. There was a lot of things that was actually stuff the Maharishi had said, like the song, Come on, come on, you know, come on, come on, it's such a joy, whatever that song was, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. Well, apart from the bit about the monkey, that was what the Maharishi used to always say, Come on, come on. McCartney, too, became absorbed in the master's philosophy, but Starr didn't like the food or the insects and complained that the stifling midday heat stopped him from meditating properly. Ringo, an only marginally interested convert, found some of the curry dishes a bit hot, said Evans, too many spices. So when I went into Delhi, I collected a good supply of eggs so that we would have plenty of alternative fried eggs, boiled eggs, poached eggs, you name it. To eat communally overlooking the Ganges was a far cry from bacon and eggs in Surrey, Cynthia recalled. A wooden trellis canopy over the dining area entwined with creepers sheltered us from the weather during the first weeks of the cold and rain. Although our diet in India contained no meat, none of us suffered. The simple life suited us all. We thrived and began to evolve more as individuals without all the stress and pressure. Lapham remembered his initial impressions of the entourage and the lousy food. The Beatles first appeared towards the end of lunch and the beginning of tea. Dressed in romantic combinations of mod and Indian costumes, they came as a group, accompanied by their wives, also in vivid trailing silk. They moved slowly, their heavy golden chains and pendants swinging against their chests, and the girls, all of whom had long blonde hair, evoked images of maidens rescued from castles. 
Collectively, they looked like characters from a strange and wonderful movie as yet unseen. They sat in a row on one side of the table, and Paul McCartney said he'd had a dream to Annalise Braun, an elfin woman to whom everyone applied on such matters. He explained that in his dream he'd been trapped in a leaking submarine of indeterminate color. When all appeared lost, however, the sub surfaced in a crowded London street. Annalise clapped her hands like a child, seeing its first snowfall. How very nice, she said, wondering if McCartney understood. He smiled and said he didn't think he quite got it. Why, she said, it's the perfect meditation dream. The voyage is the submarine, she interpreted, as the descent towards pure consciousness through the vehicle of the mantra, the leaks represented anxiety, and the emergence in the street indicated a return to normal life, which was the purpose of all good and true meditation. The other people present applauded, and in the ensuing silence at the far end of the table, I heard somebody say, I'm sure it's Wednesday, but they're trying to convince me that it's actually Sunday. Another of the lauded pop star elite to join the Beatles on their pilgrimage to inner peace was the Scottish singer-songwriter Donovan. He remembered a happy time full of promise, and the youthful hope that was taking place on that lonely mountain was somehow of near universal importance. One night we were in the Maharishi's room, he said. The Maharishi was sitting on the floor cross-legged. There were four Beatles, Mia Farrow, Mike Love of the Beach Boys, and myself, and there was a sort of embarrassed silence. I think we didn't quite know what we were expected to say or do, because this sort of thing was obviously all very new to us. To break the mood, John went up to the Maharishi, patted him on the head, and said, "'There's a good little guru.' It worked. We all laughed. That gesture was very typical of Lennon, because he always said and did exactly whatever he felt. A sparkly young nurse from the USA was at Rishikesh at the same time, more to hang out with the Beatles than for the wisdom of the Maharishi. Meditator Mike Dolan recalled, My next-door neighbor in the ashram was a feisty New Yorker in her late twenties whom I will call R.B., she was perkily attractive, very funny, and at times combative. She would interrupt Maharishi with pointedly uncosmic questions during his lectures. She was, as a lot of people on that course, a recent convert to meditation, one of the sudden influx of Beatle fans. It seemed to hit her all of a sudden that this technique was more of a part of a greater Hindu tradition than she had ever expected. She was having trouble as the lectures delved more and more into Vedic philosophy. I believe she felt deceived by the movement. She was friendly, but soon became very negative towards meditation in general. She wanted so badly to just go home, but her plane ticket was dated for the end of the three-month course, so she was forced to stay at the ashram for weeks. R.B. soon found a friend, however, in Magic Alex. She soon stopped attending the lectures weeks before, and she stayed in her room with Alex as he made plans for his revolutionary power pack. I could hear them through the thin wall huffing and puffing away as they practiced their asans late at night. It most certainly behooved R.B. and Alex to get out of Rishikesh, but he couldn't leave without losing face. Magic was under some pressure from his friend's bosses to actually produce something. If he were to stay in Rishikesh, he would be exposed as a fraud. The familiar smell of happy herbs would sometimes waft out of the open door, and their behavior was becoming notorious, especially with the older establishment meditators like Walter Koch, Nancy Koch, and the newly arrived president of SRM, the Spiritual Regeneration Movement, Charles Lutz. One of those who perhaps went a little too far with her cosmic homework was Prudence Farrow, Mia's sister who was spending hour after hour, day after day, alone in her cottage, apparently in deep meditation. Now this was all well and good for the more seasoned practitioner, but not for a rank beginner. Her concerned friends decided that something had to be done. All the people around her were very worried about the girl, said Lennon, so we sang to her. The spiritually polar opposite to Farrell was the always affable Jane Asher. Canadian ashram inmate Paul Saltzman remembered. Jane was the warmest, most emotionally open of any of the famous folks who spent parts of each day sitting outside at the table overlooking the Ganges and the town of Rishikesh far below. Now that the whole world knew where the Beatles were, fan mail poured in, and some lucky correspondents actually received a reply. I found a copy of this letter from John to a fan in a diary while researching this book. 
Dear Beth, thank you for your letter and kind thoughts. When you read that we are in India searching for peace, etc., it is not that we need faith in God and Jesus. We have faith in them. It is only as if you went to stay with Billy Graham for a short time. It just so happens that our guru or teacher is Indian, and what is more natural for us to come to India or his home. He also holds courses in Europe and America, and we will probably go to some of them as well to learn and to be near him. A newspaper cutting from the now long-defunct Dehradun Dispatch was with the letter. A meditation celebration. Meditating with the Maharishi had its lighter moments for the Beatles. Rishikesh, you'd be forgiven for thinking every day's a birthday for the Beatles, but no Beatle has ever had quite such a birthday party as George Harrison's 25th, which he celebrated during his meditational sessions in India. Apparently George hadn't given much thought to his birthday, probably thinking it would be spent in meditation, but the Maharishi, a quiet expert in showmanship, had some surprises up his sleeve. He had the assembly hall decked with everything colorful that could be found, flags, curtains, yards of silk, so that it looked more like a theater than a scene for a party. The timing of the fair was beautiful. When everyone was seated, the Maharishi entered with his priests and sat cross-legged on a deerskin rug beneath the portrait of his guru. A real Rishikesh rave-up followed, with the chanting of hymns and the waving of burning oil lamps. Fashion note for would-be meditators, the shoeless beetles and their girls were resplendent in raja coats, saris, and silk trousers, all looking very tanned and dressed up for the occasion. A sort of say-it-with-flowers ceremony followed. Firstly, the Maharishi garlanded George, then George returned the gesture. Then the whole audience garlanded both George and Patty with floral sprays of yellow marigolds, yellow apparently being an auspicious color for the event. George carried on from there by garlanding the necks of his fellow beetles and their wives. When it came to Mal Evans, however, chaos developed. The garland around Mal's neck caught on one of George's, leaving them twisting and wriggling around the stage to free themselves, the whole place roaring with laughter. Mike Love, leader of the Beach Boys, who was in the audience, was then asked up on stage to speak about meditation. Finally, the Maharishi gave George his birthday present. It was a plastic globe of the world, a simple present, but actually full of meaning. The globe had been fitted so that the map of the world was upside down. This is what the world is like today. Upside down, the Maharishi announced solemnly. It is rotating in tension and agony. The world waits for its release and to be put right. Transcendental meditation can do so. George, this globe I am giving you to symbolize the world today, I hope you will help us all in the task of putting it right. Accepting the globe from the Maharishi, George immediately turned it over so that the map was right side up. I've done it, he shouted, and was applauded with laughter for his quick wit. Everyone finally moved outside for a fireworks display, and as the Maharishi left, the beetles bowed and folded their heads, murmuring, Namaste. A long-lost diary, written in Hindi and Nepalese by one of the sannyasis or renunciates, His Holiness Ravinda Damodar Swami, a younger godbrother of the Maharishi, was given to me in Rishikesh. The humble document throws considerable light on events. A note. The diary was written in Indian-tainted English. Wednesday, 2 p.m. This afternoon, Maharishi held a press conference below gate. In the morning, boys set up asan and antelope skin. For the reporters, they spread mats. Walking slowly, followed by two monks, he came from the hill carrying marigolds. The taller monk held an umbrella over his head, shading him from the sun. The pressman asked him about the difference between his teachings and Vedic renunciation. Plucking petals from a flower, Maharishi said that Vedanta and yoga had been misinterpreted for many years. The tall monk held the umbrella, raising and lowering it as the photographers stood up to take pictures. The smaller monk squatted at Maharishi's feet, holding out the microphone of his tape recorder. A man who came from South India asked if he could read a poem. Maharishi nodded, and the man read in Tamil. When he finished, he kissed Maharishi's feet, saying in English he hoped to sit at the Maharishi's feet in heaven. Maharishi asked if anyone had seen the article about him in Life magazine. 
Nobody had seen it. Too bad, he said. Huge picture. Although there were many questions from reporters, I thought to write down only a bit of what was said. Reporter, what success have you had here in India? Maharishi, the Indian people are poor and lazy, and meditation will give them the energy and drive to work harder and better themselves. Reporter, but surely poverty is not a simple matter of laziness. Maharishi, with meditation they will overcome their poverty. Reporter, what do you think about American young people? Maharishi, they should stay at school and obey their parents, and they must obey the leaders of their country who are more informed and qualified than they. I disagree with nuclear disarmament, but feel America was right to be in Vietnam. Friday, 11 p.m. I don't like the Greek, Mardas. He doesn't care for meditation or Gurudev. He only cares beetles and girls. He drank wine and gave to others. He has a girl in his room. Behind the back I saw him make funny faces at Maharishi. No one laugh. He also eats chicken, which is against the rules of Rishikesh. How he got it, I do not know. During lectures he does not come or just pretends to listen. He does not meditate. He is a bad influence on all Westerners. He is a very, very bad man. Maharishi also doesn't like him, but he cannot do anything because he is the beetle's good friend. He tried to touch one Indian lady who ran away. Only I saw. He is bad. Saturday, 9 a.m. Nice meeting with all at camp and Gurudev. Maharishi makes everyone laugh. He likes Ringo very much. He says Ringo is always in meditation, but the others too much brain in the way. Ringo goes by feeling and heart. Wife is also nice. She is a very good artist. Boss Beetle John is funny, but sometimes mean to his wife, who is a nice lady. George is my favorite. He is the most kind to all. I do not know his wife, but she smiles and is polite. Donovan is also good, but smokes cigarettes. I tell him no, but he says he cannot stop. Meditation will help him. Sometimes Paul talks mean with George. He is clever, but over smart. He wants to be the boss of the Beatles, I know. He also a funny man and writes good songs. The girl Jane seems afraid of India. She is quiet. Maharishi tries to encourage her, but she has no real interest, I think. Today we will walk by the river together, all the Westerners and Guru Maharaj. I must go to Rishikesh for sweaters for the Pharaoh sisters. They complain of cold mornings. Bananas, mangoes, agabati, and tea also not to forget. Sunday, 2.30 p.m. I visit Maharishi's house for kitchen work. He tells me of all of the Beatles George's most advanced, and this is his last life. He also says John has many more to go and must not give in to his weakness for women or it will ruin him. I will have to work quietly while he takes a nap, something I have never seen him do. John, Paul, George, and Ringo went to Rishikesh hoping to further their studies in meditation and relieve the demands of fame. In the long run, however, the journey was far more valuable to John and Paul in terms of their songwriting and forthcoming album. Even with meditation on their minds, the Beatles were never without their music. John, Paul, George, and Ringo went to Rishikesh hoping to further their studies in meditation and relieve the demands of fame. In the long run, however, the journey was far more valuable to John and Paul in terms of their songwriting and their forthcoming album. Even with meditation on their minds, the Beatles were never without their music. John and Paul came with their Martin D-28 acoustic guitars, and George instructed Mal Evans to go to Ricky Rahm's in Connaught Place in Delhi and buy him the finest instrument in stock. Popmaster Donovan, too, became an important, if unacknowledged, musical presence for the Beatles, giving them valuable feedback on the constant flow of fleeting ideas and co-authoring some central elements to their new music. His first major contribution was to teach Lennon a distinctive guitar-picking style. Once John had mastered it, he passed it on to George. It proved a valuable tool for John, who wrote Dear Prudence and Julia utilizing it. Dear Prudence was written for Prudence Pharaoh. When she went over the top with her meditating, as Lennon later put it, he and George were elected to coax her outside, and John wrote the song. Prudence remembered George telling her that John had written a song about her, but I didn't hear about it until it came out on the album. I was very flattered. It was a beautiful thing to have done. 
Her sister Mia remembered that in response to several frightening emotional responses which occurred during the long hours of meditation, Maharishi appointed sets of team buddies to look out for one another. Prudence buddies were George and John, and they took their responsibilities seriously. Every morning and most afternoons they met in Prudy's room, where they discussed their respective lives, the meaning of existence, and who the Maharishi really was. Before they left the ashram, Lennon and McCartney wrote the song, Dear Prudence, for my sister. Dear Prudence, won't you come out to play? Dear Prudence, greet the brand new day. I guess I thought it was really nice, but I didn't really know that they were going to put it on an album or anything, said Prudy. I didn't really think about it. It wasn't anything in my mind. Then much later, after India, I heard people saying that there was a song. I was really grateful that it was something so nice. I just wanted to meditate as much as possible, Prudence told me. It was a special time and such a holy place. One night when I was meditating, George and John came into my room with their guitars singing Ubladi, Ublada, Life Goes On. Another time, John and Paul came in singing Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the whole song. They were trying to be cheerful, and it was so sweet of them. I was grateful, but I wished they'd go away. At first, I don't think they realized what the training course in meditation was all about. They were just having fun. They didn't quite understand until later. In John's mind, Julia was a song about two people, his late free-spirited mother Julia and Yoko Ono. Leonard had first met Ono at an exhibition of hers at the Indica Gallery in London, 1966. By the spring of 1968, he had begun to exchange passionate letters with the Japanese-American artist. He was interested in producing an album by Yoko. I was in India meditating about the album, thinking about what would be the best LP cover, when it suddenly hit me. I thought, aha, naked, so I wrote Yoko with a drawing. This idea went on to become the cover of their first collaboration, the infamous Two Virgins. John snapped the photo himself in Ringo's basement apartment in London. In Julia, Yoko was the ocean child, the meaning of her name in Japanese. The reference to seashell eyes is lifted from Cahill Gibran's poem, Sand and Foam. The song is the only number in the entitled Beatles catalog performed entirely solo by Lennon. Paul first showed John the chorus to Ubla Di, Ubla Da in Rishikesh, and the two played the chorus over and over while McCartney wrote the lyrics for the convoluted storyline. The title phrase was Yoruba, for life goes on, and was first tossed at Paul by Nigerian conga player Jimmy Scott in London. Although Scott later played congas on an early version of the song, his relationship with McCartney was not always cordial. He believed he deserved a small cut of the song's royalties, having written the catchphrase. Paul was angered by the British press for taking Scott's side and complained to the other Beatles in 1969 about a particular article. It just says, currently Lennon and McCartney are doing quite well out of a riff they borrowed from Jimmy Scott. Ubladi Ublada, which is topping the charts. Cunts. I mean, you haven't got a riff when you say, hello, that's the riff I got off Jimmy Scott. These two words, you know, fucking hell, you'd really think we'd taken his life. It's not as though he wrote the song. Subsequently, McCartney bailed Scott out of jail via Apple man Alistair Taylor. The musician had been arrested for failing to pay alimony, and eventually the pair were reconciled. Meanwhile, Richard Cook's visit to his mother Nancy in Rishikesh inspired in Lennon the continuing story of Bungalow Bill. Mother and son went off on a tiger hunt, and afterwards Cook explained to John and Paul why the animal had been killed. It was either the tiger or us. The tiger was standing right in front of us. This became the lyric, If looks could kill, it would have been us instead of him. To John, the song was a sort of teenage social commentary and a bit of a joke. Today it's a sneaky anthem for animal rights. But it was written at a time when such matters were thought either eccentric or foolishly sentimental. Meanwhile, Donovan had his eye on Jenny Boyd, Petty Harrison's younger sister, and wrote Jennifer Juniper for her. But she wasn't really interested in him and spent a lot of time with John. He was suffering from insomnia and turned to songwriting to get him through the hot nights. His compositions, such as I'm So Tired, reflected his often dark, surly moods, Jenny remembered. When I was at my lowest, he made a drawing of a turbaned Sikh genie holding a big snake and intoning, By the power within and the power without, I cast your tonsil lighthouse out. 
Sometimes, late at night, I can still hear John singing those sad songs he wrote during those long, lonely evenings. Lenin was aware of the irony in trying to ascend to God through meditation while producing suicidal songs. It was that period when I was going through what's it all about. Songwriting is nothing. It's pointless. I'm not really talented, and I'm shit. I couldn't do anything but be a beetle, and what am I doing about it? The self-doubt that had manifested in the Sergeant Pepper period remained. The Maharishi told him repeatedly that the ego could be a positive force if kept in perspective, but he believed that I'd really be destroyed if I was paranoid and weak. I couldn't do anything. Your blues reflected this. Here Lennon's loneliness and despair were real, not masked by third-person imagery. A parody of the emerging English blues scene in London, your blues was about the end of his marriage. He also came up with a statement against the Vietnam War, a song called simply Revolution. I still had this God will save us feeling about it, that it's going to be all right. That's why I did it. I wanted to say my piece about revolution. He originally envisioned it as a faster number, but when he took it into the studio, it was slowed down and usable as a single. The initial recording, though, formed the basis of two songs on the Beatles' White Album, Revolution No. 1 and Revolution No. 9. The original faster version was later used as the B-side of the smash, Hey Jude. Lennon was frustrated by not having a piano on which to compose, even though his skill on the instrument was limited. However, several of his newest songs were piano-based, including Hey Bulldog, Across the Universe, and Cry Baby Cry, which had been in his head for months. It had come from a TV advert, Cry Baby Cry, Make Your Mother Buy. In India, he reworked the idea on acoustic guitar and added several new lyrics based in part on the nursery rhyme, Sing a Song of Sixpence. He used a similar source for What's the New Mary Jane, a wild Lennon Magic Alex collaboration which drew from the A.A. A. Milne poem What is the Matter with Mary Jane. Later, the song, an unmelodious number featuring Yoko's wailing vocals, caused tensions between John and Paul, and the latter did not participate in the recording. It was summarily dropped from the White Album, and Lennon attempted to recycle it as a Plastic Ono Band single, but it remained unreleased until the Beatles' anthology in 1996. Inspired by Chuck Berry's Back in the USA, McCartney composed the clever story of a Cold War spy returning home from America and back in the USSR. One morning at the breakfast table, he sang it to Mike Love, who suggested mentioning girls from various parts of Russia, such as the Ukraine, Georgia, and Moscow in the lyrics. Love's presence at the ashram perhaps sparked in Paul the idea of using a Beach Boys-style harmony in the recording. McCartney's Martha My Dear was made up of two pieces, Martha My Dear and Silly Girl. It's about my dog, he said in 1968. I don't ever try to make a serious social comment, so you can read anything you like into it, but it's really just a song. It's me singing to my dog. Sitting on the roof of one of the chalets, Paul introduced the chords of Rocky Sassoon to John and Donovan. All three, equipped with their acoustic guitars, composed the lyrics, and McCartney wrote them down. He changed Sassoon to Raccoon for a more cowboy-sounding name and likened the song to a one-act play. I don't know anything about the Appalachian Mountains, cowboys, and Indians or anything. I just made it all up. At this point, Paul only had the melody of I Will. In McCartney's words, it was a sort of smoochy ballad that was entitled Ballad until suitable lyrics were found. He tried writing some with Donovan using Maharishi-inspired imagery, but in the end adopted his own straightforward love lyrics, which he finished on his return to England. I don't think I helped with the lyrics at all, says Donovan. He is very productive and will always take over writing in a jam. I may have helped him shape some of the chords and encourage the imagery from tunes that I wrote in India. The descending movements of my songs may have encouraged Paul to write somewhat differently. Wild Honey Pie, meanwhile, came from a spur-of-the-moment sing-along at the ashram. Two other acoustic-driven numbers, Junk and Teddy Boy, ended up on his first solo album, McCartney. Lennon also wrote the plaintive Look at Me, which he kept for his own Plastic Ono Band album. He also produced two throwaways, as he termed them, which found their way onto the medley on side two of Abbey Road. 
Mean Mr. Mustard, a song inspired by a newspaper article about this mean guy who hid five-pound notes, not up his nose, but somewhere else, and Polythene Pam, about a girl who dressed in polythene, although she didn't wear jackboots and kilts. I just sort of elaborated, perverted sex in a polythene bag. I was just looking for something kinky to write about. Monkeys mating in the open inspired Paul's Why Don't We Do It in the Road?, That's how simple the act of procreation is. We have horrendous problems with it, and yet animals don't. Lennon's Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except for Me and My Monkey was just a nice line which I made into a song. It was a reference to his new relationship with Ono, with filler line from the Maharishi's Daily Lectures. Some of these same words form the basis for McCartney's Cosmically Conscious, which was not released until it closed off his 1993 album, Off the Ground. According to Mal Evans, he turned up in one of Paul Dreams and Rishi Cash saying, Let it be. McCartney was struck by this and wrote a song around the phrase in late 1968 at home in Cavendish Avenue. Driving around London one afternoon, he asked Evan if he minded that Brother Malcolm be changed to Mother Mary. Mal had no objection. Paul, however, occasionally slipped in Brother Malcolm during the extended get-back rehearsals of 1969. In his own recollections after Evan's death, McCartney said the source of his inspiration was a dream about his mother Mary. Many evenings in Rishikesh were spent in a large hall where the Maharishi would sit on a platform to lecture, and occasionally many concerts took place. At one point, Paul, George, and Donovan composed a spontaneous tribute to him. When the sun is tucked away in bed, you worry about the life you've led. But there is only one thing to do. Let the Maharishi lead you. The song then ended with a quiet incantation of Maharishi. The Maharishi's lively lectures were another source of inspiration for the new Beatles music. A talk on nature motivated John to write Child of Nature, a song much like Across the Universe, with its wistful poetic lyrics. When he became disillusioned with the Rishikesh experience, however, he changed the setting from Rishikesh to Marrakesh. The song was abandoned and never seriously rehearsed, but it resurfaced with new words on John's 1971 Imagine album as Jealous Guy. Paul was inspired by the self-same talk to write Mother Nature's Son at his father's home Rembrandt, combining the Maharishi's wisdom with childhood memories of bicycle rides in the English countryside. The only thing about this one, however, is that it says, Born a poor young country boy, and I was born in a private ward in Walton Hospital, actually, so it's a dirty lie. The last thing George Harrison wanted to do in Rishikesh was write, and he admonished Paul for even thinking of the next album, tentatively entitled Umbrella, at this point, and then later, A Doll's House. He wrote a verse for Donovan's Hurdy Gurdy Man, which was eventually left off the final recording. When truth gets buried deep beneath a thousand years of sleep, time demands a turnaround, and once again the truth is found. He also wrote Sour Milk Sea, later recorded by Apple artist Jackie Lomax, in about ten minutes. Even though I was in India, I always imagined the song as rock and roll. That was the intention. He began the sleepy long, 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 but finished it later in England, using chords from Bob Dylan's Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands. Literary influence was the key to George's work in this period, and most of his White Album contributions came from his reading in England. His major composition in India was Dara Doon, co-written with Donovan, about a sleepy mountain town some 25 miles northwest of Rishikesh. He attempted to record it during sessions for All Things Must passed, but it remains officially unreleased. Maureen and Ringo were the first in the Beatles' party to leave on 1 March. If anyone thought that he was leaving so early because he was now anti-meditation, Ringo dispelled the idea when he reached Britain. The Academy is a great place, and I really enjoyed it a lot. I still meditate every day for half an hour in the morning and half an hour every evening, and I think I'm a better person for it. I'm far more relaxed than I have ever been. If you're working very hard and things are a bit chaotic, you get all tensed up and screwed up inside. You feel as if you have to break something or hit someone. But if you spend a short time in meditation, it completely relaxes you, and it's easier to see 
your way through problems. If everyone in the world started meditating, the world would be a much, much happier place. Despite all the high times and good vibes and great material, Paul and Jane left the ashram next. Arriving home on 26 March, McCartney remembered, I gave myself a set period, and then if it was going to be something we really had to go back to India for, I was thinking of going back. But at the end of the month, I was quite happy, and I thought, well, that'll do me, this is fine. If I want to get into it heavy, I can do it anywhere. That's one of the nice things about it. It's like you don't have to go to church to do it. You can do it in your own room. Canadian Paul Saltzman felt that Jane Asher might have encouraged Paul's decision to leave early. Cynthia Lennon seemed the most pleased by the Maharishi's plans for the future of his worldwide meditation organization. Jane was the least impressed. She was less interested in the Maharishi and meditation and more interested in traveling with Paul to see the Taj Mahal. And then came great controversy. Nearly every afternoon, Maharishi sent for me to come to his bungalow for a private talk, remembers Mia Farrow. From the start, he had been especially attentive to me, and I responded with wary resentment. Not only does he send for me every single day and not the others, I complained to my sister, but also he's giving me mangoes. To the best of my knowledge, he has not given a single mango to anyone else. Prudence said the problem was me. Many details of the Beatles' visit to Rishi Kesh and the events that led to them leaving so suddenly are still uncertain. The Pharaoh Maharishi story is the most popular, but it doesn't really quite ring true. Mia Farrow was just 21 when she married Frank Sinatra and was an insecure, emotional young girl from a troubled Hollywood background. Like the Beatles, she was thrust into the spotlight at an early age and was still quite inexperienced despite her position as a Hollywood ingenue. It was after her unhappy two-year union with Sinatra that she and her sister went to the Maharishi. For years, when she was asked whether the rumor that he had made a pass at her was true, she did not answer. But when she published her autobiography, What Falls Away, in 1997, she confirmed, half-heartedly, that something happened. Now we will meditate in my cave, said Maharishi, and I followed him down some deep wooden steps into a dark, humid little cellar room that smelled of sandalwood. It was my first time in his cave. There was a small shrine with flowers and a picture of Gurudev, Maharishi's dead teacher, and a carpet on which we settled ourselves in the lotus position to meditate. After twenty minutes or so, we were getting to our feet, still facing each other, but as I'm usually a little disoriented after meditation, I was blinking at his beard when suddenly I became aware of two surprisingly male, hairy arms going around me. I panicked and shot up the stairs, apologizing all the way. I flew out into the open air and ran as fast as I could to Prudy's room, where she was meditating, of course. I blurted out something about Maharishi's cave and arms and beard, and she said, It's an honor to be touched by a holy man after meditation, a tradition. Furthermore, at my level of consciousness, if Jesus Christ himself had embraced me, I would have misinterpreted it. So what was, in fact, the genesis of the final split between the Beatles and the Maharishi? Mike Dolan insists that when SRM founder Charles Lute learned from ashram insider Nancy Cook that the Maharishi was making plans for a film with Apple, Lutz boarded the first Delhi-bound plane he could find to put the brakes on the scheme as he already had an agreement with the guru to make a film about him and musician Paul Horn. The company he formed, Bliss Productions, was in danger of losing the star of their movie, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. The Beatles were under contract to make yet another movie Movie with United Artists, and thus couldn't have appeared in Bliss Productions' epic. Also, Lutz apparently was annoyed that the Guru was spending so much time with the group. Some say that it was the nurse from New York who became close to the Maharishi, and not Pharaoh at all. Mike Dolan has said, I was very aware that especially back in 1968 there was a knee-jerk reaction to disbelieve this young woman and stab her with her own sexuality. For the nurse's part, she had a fixed ticket home and just wanted to get the hell out of there. R.B. eventually rather mysteriously got another earlier flight, but at what price? Did she back up Magic Alex's stories about the guru screwing and thus ensure the final betrayal of the Beatles' faith? To date, there have been three literary accounts of the event, by Mike Dolan, 
Cynthia Lennon, and Nancy Cook, all of whom saw Magic Alex as the bad guy. Both he and Lutz wanted to get the gullible yet immensely powerful Beatles out of the Maharishi's orbit so that Alexis could regain his influence over them and Lutz could win back the attention of his guru and get his movie made. Ironically, they both failed. Dolan remembers the final split between the Maharishi and the Beatles. On the morning of 12 April, I was awoken by Rajendra, a senior Maharishi liaison to all Western disciples. It was still dark in the very early dawn. I was to go down to the dining area and find the cooks to make tea for some guests who were leaving. It was a little startling to see Cynthia, Patty, Jenny, and R.B., the New York nurse, standing around in the cool morning air. Sitting in the open dining area in deep conversation were John, George, Alexis, and Rajendra. Cowboy Tom, R.B.'s ex-boyfriend, sat to the side. All were dressed in stylish pop star attire. I noticed that Cynthia had been crying. Nobody looked happy. Patty and Jenny smiled meekly. Rajendra, a lovely man, wore the gray ashen mask of the defeated. I noticed Maharishi sitting alone on a rock just outside his garden. The rain from the night before threw up a light mist, giving the scene a theatrical effect. Rajendra told me something had happened. There had been meetings all through the night that John and George were upset and Alexis were insisting that they all leave. Rajendra was giving the job of transporting them all to New Delhi and they were very upset when they got into several taxis. The girls sobbing were still trying to persuade them to reconsider that they were fighting back tears as they drove away. They started filming the Maharishi movie that very morning. There was a big hullabaloo about him trying to rape Mia Farrow or trying to get off with her or some other women. Things like that, Lennon later said. And we went down to him, and we stayed up all night discussing whether it was true or not. And when George started thinking that it just might be true, I thought, well, it must be true. Because if George is doubting it, then there's got to be something in it. So we went to see the Maharishi, the whole gang of us, the next day. We charged down to his hut, his very rich-looking bungalow in the mountains. And I was the spokesman, as usual, when the dirty work came. I actually had to be the leader, whatever the scene was, when it came to the nitty-gritty, and I had to do the speaking, and I said, we're leaving. Why, he-he, and all that shit? And I said, well, if you're so cosmic, you'll know why. He was always intimating, and there were all his right-hand men intimating that he did miracles. He said, I don't know why, you must tell me. I just kept saying, you know why, and he gave me a look, like, I'll kill you, you bastard. He gave me such a look, and I knew that when he looked at me, because I'd called his bluff, and I was a bit rough on him, I must admit. To this very day, many of those who were there do not believe that the Maharishi ever made a move on any of his female followers, including Mia Farrow. That list included George Harrison, fellow meditator Mike Dolan, Nancy Cook, Paul Horn, Jenny Boyd, Paul McCartney, and Cynthia Lennon, who later denounced the man she believed was the culprit. The finger of suspicion was well and truly pointed at the man who had given us all so much. Alexis and a fellow female meditator, the nurse, began to sow the seeds of doubt in very open minds. Meditation practiced for long periods renders the meditator truly sensitive. Alexis's statements about how the Maharishi had been indiscreet with a certain lady gathered momentum. All, may I say, without a single shred of evidence or indeed justification. It was obvious to me that Alexis wanted out, and more than anything, he wanted the Beatles out as well. A night was spent desperately trying to sort everything out in their minds, what to believe, Alexis and this girl's accusations, or their faith in the Maharishi. The following morning, Alexis set the ball in motion by ordering cars to take us all to the airport. While we were seated around the dining room table waiting for the Maharishi and conversing in whispers, nerve ends showing, the Maharishi emerged quietly from his quarters and seated himself not a hundred yards from our agitated group of dissidents. One of his ardent followers asked us to please talk things over properly with the Maharishi. The Maharishi was sitting alone in a small shelter made of wood with a dried grass roof. They stood up, filed past him, and not a word was said. The journey away from my personal Shangri-La was miserable. Although John wasn't as glum as I, he was worried. 
Although he had gone through the motions of rejecting the Maharishi, he was very nervous about the situation. The final Beatles song composed in India represented for John the entire Rishikesh experience. Maharishi, what have you done? On the long drive back to Delhi, he thought of calling it simply Maharishi, until George observed, you can't say that, it's ridiculous. He suggested the title Sexy Sadie, which John later viewed as a cop-out. The Rishikesh experience was over, and the Beatles had left with a bad taste, as Lennon put it. They came back, though, with a treasure trove of new material, but John emphasized that it could have just as well been written in the desert. Still, the time spent in Rishikesh represented the last spurt of creativity in Lennon during his time with the Beatles. Over the next two years, he regularly tapped into his 1968 pool of songs. Whatever the Maharishi was or is to the world, the Beatles' time in India prompted a flood of wonderful, enduring work. At home, undeveloped musical ideas sprouted and the White Album was born. The experience was still in John's mind a decade later when he wrote two songs for an unperformed play. The Ballad of John and Yoko, the first, and the Happy Rishi Kesh song is a satirical piece that makes light of the meditation and mantras that promised all the answers. Of special interest is its coda, which, in sharp contrast to the title, is reminiscent of the lyrics of Your Blues, I feel so suicidal, something is wrong. In the second tribute, India, John remarks that he left his heart in England with Yoko. It touches upon his search for answers in India, but recognizes that the truth will not come from Rishikesh, but is already in his mind. Today, alive and well in a sprawling monastery in the Netherlands, the Maharishi, now well into his eighties, continues to oversee his ever-expanding worldwide conglomerate of real estate holdings, schools, and clinics worth a reported $3.5 billion. What strikes you is his energy and vitality, says Martin Smeets, a former local mayor and an occasional visitor to the 90-acre compound from which the guru seldom strays. You get the impression he's still at the forefront of all these global activities. He introduced meditation to the West and made it mainstream, says Deepak Chopra, who was Maharishi's top assistant for some nine years, yet he never took anything too seriously. We called him the giggling guru. During his last days, George Harrison visited the Maharishi for solace and advice, and vehemently insisted in the Beatles' anthology that the guru had never been anything but a sincere spiritual guide, a genuine inspiration, and a lifelong celibate. Recently, even Paul McCartney and his new wife Heather have made secret visits to another of the Maharishi's homes high in the Swiss Alps. Ringo, too, professes only fond memories of the Beatles' time at the feet of their first guru. That the Maharishi brought them a measure of much-needed inner peace and planted in them a lifelong ideal of spiritual enlightenment independent of the material body is sure. Always laughing and happy as he taught the 5,000-year-old art of Vedic meditation, the Maharishi did more good than harm in his mission to transcendentalize the world. As Cynthia Lennon said, the fact that he tried so hard for so long makes both his life and mission an unquestionable success. Chapter 7 Mother Superior Jumped the Gun, Ascot, Henley, St. John's Wood, and Surrey, 1968. I know John thinks we hate Yoko and that we're all a bunch of two-faced fuckers running around behind his back, sniveling and bad-mouthing her. Sticking pins in our homemade Yoko Ono voodoo dolls. But you know and I know what's happening, and that's not happening at all. No one in this building hates her. Hate? That's a very strong accusation and an extreme assumption. I can't say I blame him for thinking that sometimes, but the reason he feels that way is because we don't love her. Derek Taylor 1968 was a turbulent and eventful year for all of the Beatles, both personally and professionally. Together, the Beatles launched Apple Corps Limited. Sgt. Pepper won four Grammy Awards. The National Theater produced a play based on John's book in his own right. Apple took over offices at Three Several Row near Piccadilly. The Apple Boutique closed. The Beatles' authorized biography was published, and the White Album was released. 
But this was only what the eye could see. Internally, the beetles were slowly coming apart. Was it simply as John once suggested that wedding bells were tolling the end of their remarkable time together? Or perhaps George and Ringo were tired of being bargain basement beetles. Their work continually shifted to the back burner in favor of Lennon and McCartney's compositions. Maybe it was the continuing effects of their drug-taking. Some suggest that the constant demands of fans, fame, media, and big business eroded the fragile foundations of the magic that made up the group. Perhaps it was a subtle combination of all of the above that pushed the four to find success on their own terms and in their own time. Cracks in the Lennon marriage had been visible for some time and were very clear to one newcomer to the family. The previous year, Alfred Lennon had presented his celebrated son with the disturbing news that he planned to marry a 19-year-old Beatles fan, Pauline Jones. I was really terribly shocked when he first rang to tell me the news, remembered Charlie Lennon. I said, what? Isn't one fall in marriage enough for you? Do you have to go out and do the same thing again, and with a younger girl at that? Freddie, however, was adamant. He would marry the former Exeter University student, and hopefully, if John and Cynthia were willing, perhaps they might employ her as their personal assistant. John wanted to please his father as far as he could, so that was what happened. Life at home with the Lennons in their Weybridge mock Tudor home, Kenwood, was fiercely guarded from public scrutiny. At least, it was until late October of that year when Pauline Jones was installed at the Surrey mansion to do secretarial work and help with Julian. She noted that John was definitely the king of his castle. As he shuttled around the house in his socks, he was condescending to Cynthia and everyone else. His day started around noon when he wolfed down a breakfast of mushrooms on toast that Dot the housekeeper placed before him. Then he would isolate himself for the entire day at work at the piano. During the evenings, during the evenings Lennon would gather in the drawing room to listen to music and pass joints around. Lennon played benevolent dictator, manipulating the course of the conversation but holding his guest in rapt attention. On one rare occasion, he and Pauline sat down to watch a television documentary on heroin addiction. As the junkies told their stories, Lennon remarked, It must be fucking terrible to end up like that. An ironic statement, considering that he was soon to be entrenched in his own battle with the deadly drug. Pauline was struck by the overwhelming sense of foreboding and loneliness in the house. A narrow staircase which led to the upper floors was creepy, especially when one of John's cats, who congregated in the attic, jumped out and scampered down. The cats were allowed to run wild throughout the house, and the black Wilton carpet on the ground floor was ruined by their urine. Pauline's room was in the attic next to the one where Lennon's recording equipment was stored and which served as his painting studio. The Beatles' gold discs were tossed carelessly about in it. The real tension between John and Cynthia added to the heavy atmosphere. Essentially, as Pauline witnessed, they went their separate ways. If one came home late, he or she would sleep in the guest room. Their rather rare conversations together took place in a study over a drink. John would park himself in a velvet armchair, restless and edgy. You're getting pretty fat, aren't you? He would snipe at his wife. Cynthia would remain coldly silent. For all her obvious devotion to hearth and home, however, Cynthia was rarely at Weybridge. She frequently went clubbing with Patty Harrison or the singer Lulu and her boyfriend Maurice Gibb of the Bee Gees. The next morning, Cynthia would spill the details of her evening to Dot, John's father, however, deemed it quite inappropriate for his daughter-in-law to be out unescorted in the middle of the night and once reprimanded her. John found out about this, which led to a great row between him and his father. If you can't learn to keep your bloody mouth shut, he raged, the feud between us will be on again and we'll see what Fleet Street makes of it. During her two months at Kenwood, Pauline looked after five-year-old Julian. He was a bright little boy who loved to burst into the room and pounce upon her. Like his father, Julian was bossy among his playmates, which was fueled in part by the constant fawning of guests. Cynthia, perhaps, in deference to John, chose not to overtly discipline him. Pauline, however, wouldn't stand for it. Once, when Julian told her to shut up, she smacked his bottom. 
Mrs. Lennon came in just in time to see her do it and shot her a frigid look, but said nothing. During the Beatles' drug-taking days, Cynthia feared for her son because of the rather suspect company her husband often kept. Marijuana smoking and LSD tripping attracted rather unsavory hangers-on who attempted to tap into the Beatles' coffers. The police once tipped off the family about a kidnapping plot. For weeks, Cynthia zealously watched over her son, who had round-the-clock armed guards, and the police kept vigil outside his school and at Kenwood's heavy iron gates. Each night, John would check and recheck the window locks and those on the glass patio doors. Ten years later, his second son, Sean, also faced the threat of abduction from an extortionist claiming to belong to a Puerto Rican terrorist organization. As for his father's marriage, Lennon had this to say. At 56, my father married a secretary, who later did some work for the Beatles, and ultimately they had two children, which I must admit was rather hopeful for a man who had lived most of his life as almost a Bowery bum. The working arrangements between Pauline and the Lennons, however, was fraught with difficulty from almost the very beginning, and after just two months, John dismissed Pauline. He wanted his aging father to be happy, however, and generously bought him a flat near Kew Gardens, London. In addition, he arranged for Freddie to furnish his new home courtesy of Apple, as well as establishing a generous weekly payment to him of thirty pounds to offset expenses. Eventually, the couple moved to Brighton, where John agreed to cover their living expenses in a lovely flat near the sea. Their children, David and Robert, were born in 1969 and 1973. Only David ever met his famous half-brother, once in 1970. Since then, the two boys have never been heard from publicly. As the Lennons' marriage eroded, so too did John's feeling for Yoko Ono grow. By the spring of 1968, John Lennon was besotted with his new girlfriend. The two were inseparable, which was not lost on either the ravenous British media or poor Cynthia in suburban Surrey. Ono possessed just the offbeat charisma Lennon had previously believed beyond the scope of any woman. Cynthia, for all her virtue as a loving wife and caring, attentive mother, admitted that, at times, I did give a very boring, practical impression of being just an ordinary housewife instead of a swinging, extroverted pop star's consort. John claimed that he drew from Yoko the intellectual challenges he had previously only encountered from a man, as well as the insight and intuition that he himself possessed. I've never known love like this before, he proclaimed some months later, and it hit me so hard I had to immediately halt my marriage to sin. I don't think that this was a reckless decision at all, because I thought very deeply about it and all the implications that would be involved. When we are free, and we hope that we will be within a year, we shall marry. Of course, there is no real need to marry, but there's nothing lost in it either. Some may say my decision was selfish. Well, I don't think it is. There is something else to consider, too. Isn't it better to avoid rearing children in an atmosphere of a strained relationship? My marriage to sin was not unhappy, but it was just a normal marital state wherein nothing really happens and we continue to sustain it just for the sake of so doing. You sustain it until you meet someone who suddenly sets you alight. With Yoko, I really know love for the first time. Initially, our attraction was a mental one, but it happened physically as well. Both are essential in the union, but I never dreamed I would marry again. Now the thought of it just seems so easy. Cynthia remembered. I didn't blame John or Yoko. I understood their love. I knew there was no way I could ever fight the unity of body and mind that they had with each other. Their all-consuming love had no time for pain or unhappiness. Yoko did not take John away from me, because he had never really been mine. On 11 May 1968, John and Paul flew from London to New York to join Peter Brown, Neil Aspinall, Magic Alex, and the other directors of Apple for the official opening of the Beatles Holding Company. In a five-day PR blitz arranged by the firm Salters and Roskin, there was a press conference at which Lennon made several disparaging comments about the Maharishi and talked about his ambitions for Apple. 
McCartney chimed in whenever John said something he probably shouldn't, a skill in which the media-savvy Paul excelled. The aim of this company isn't really a stack of gold teeth in the bank, Lennon ventured. We just want to help people who want to make a film about anything, so they won't have to go down on their knees in somebody's office. Probably yours. After appearing on The Tonight Show with John, Paul disappeared into Manhattan to meet up with a young blonde photographer he'd met at the Bag of Nails Club in London on 15 May 1967. Her name was Linda Eastman. She had approached him and slipped him her phone number. Although Lennon and he were staying at the St. Regis Hotel, he decided to meet her at attorney Nat West's East Side apartment, afraid that if they went to the hotel they might be photographed together, the result of which Jane Asher might see in London. For the next several days, the couple stayed in the flat, and Paul looked after Linda's little daughter, Heather, while she went to a photo shoot at the Fillmore. Several weeks later, on 21 June, McCartney was back in the USA, accompanied by Ron Cass, to attend the annual Capitol Records convention in Los Angeles. None of the other Beatles would ever have considered attending such a publicity-seeking event, but Paul excelled in such situations. After a showing of a specially made film about Apple, he spent the afternoon shaking hands with everyone in the room. He was staying in a three-bedroom bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and that evening he entertained several young women there. Jimi Hendrix's occasional consort, the super groupie Devon, had one bedroom, and a popular young Hollywood actress another. Cass, who was sharing the bungalow with Paul, referred to the interlude as the Paul McCartney Black and White Minstrel Show. That Sunday morning, Linda Eastman rang from the lobby. Cass asked Devon and the starlet to pack up and leave. They paraded out in tears, past Paul and Linda, who were talking calmly together in the living room. The next day they went sailing with John Cayley, an executive at Warner Brothers. On the point of flying back to New York with Cass and Paul, Linda almost got everyone busted. She was carrying two kilos of grass, some acid, and a bag of high-octane cocaine, when due to a security alert, everyone had to be searched. Cass, in a skilled last-minute maneuver, kicked the bag under a row of chairs in the VIP lounge, thinking that the matter was resolved. However, after the search, Eastman made a beeline back to the lounge to retrieve her bag. Throughout her decades-long marriage to McCartney, Linda would perpetrate several more such drug-smuggling adventures. Paul first met New Yorker Francie Schwartz in April 1968 when she approached him at Apple with an idea she had for a film. Paul first met New Yorker Francie Schwartz in April 1968 when she approached him at Apple with an idea she had for a film. Paul was upset with John for bringing Yoko to the studio the night before, so he grabbed the nearest, weirdest chick he could find, which was me, said Francie. It was like saying, okay, if you're going to bring a weird chick, then I'm going to bring a weird chick. Thereafter, she moved into Cavendish Avenue for a time. She recalled a telling visit to Liverpool when McCartney took her to meet his family. Paul, according to Francie, introduced her to his family as Clancy, because he didn't want to say Schwartz, an obviously Jewish name. Perhaps Paul was worried how his family would react to his having a Jewish girlfriend, though it must be said that he clearly had no such concerns when it came to his future wife, Linda Eastman, who was also Jewish. The visit was uncomfortable for Schwartz for other reasons, too. Angela and Ruth McCartney were on a plane en route from Austria to England, chatting with the drummer of the Bee Gees, when they saw a newspaper article saying that Jane Asher had appeared on the 20 July Simon D. show, announcing that she had broken her engagement to Paul. Later, mother and daughter phoned home to ask Jim if he knew anything about it. Actually, Paul's here now, and he's got somebody with him, Jim spoke gruffly. That girl who used to work at Apple. When Paul's stepmother and sister came home, Francie was still at Rembrandt. Francie hung around for a day or two with Paul, and he basically ignored her, Angela remembers. She was like a spare part. She'd just stand there, and he'd go out in the car and not even speak to her. He brought her home, and then she was an embarrassment to him. I felt sorry for the poor kid. He actually took her out to Auntie Ginny's one night because Jin said, Look, you brought her here, son. You can't just ignore her. I remember Paul said to her, I'm going to Auntie Jin's. Do you want to come? That was the only interaction between them. After that, we never saw Francie again. Yet another example of McCartney's apparent eccentricities became evident in other anecdotes Francie told. Francie remembers... 
That night, all of these cousins and friends showed up. Paul was very disturbed because when he got drunk, I mean really falling down drunk, he got really upset. He was in a bar that was paid for by him, I guess. One of the cousins had asked him for some money way back when. They purchased a pub, and it was like a hangout, and these were very down-to-earth people, I must say. I didn't have a problem with them, but I was somewhere else, and someone came up to me and said, Hey, Clancy, you better take Paul out of here. He was behind the bar with his back up against the wall. His face was really red, and he was practically in tears. He was way out of control, too much scotch, and I said, Come on, babe, let's get out of here. Everybody was sort of frozen, and we went out into the street, and he literally fell to his knees and was pounding his fists into the cobblestone, saying, It's just too much. They don't treat me like I'm me. They treat me like I'm him, and I'm not him. I'm me. I said, What do you mean? He said, It's the money. I've given them all this money. I said, How much? And he said, oh, About 30,000 pounds, which then was about $100,000 or something. I thought, Well, that's not a lot of money to him. Then I understood what upset him so much. They were all afraid that if they were straight with him, they were canted with him in any way. If they said, hey, you're acting like an asshole, he would demand the money be repaid or something. He's very conflicted about money, which stands to reason because he was raised very poor. His father made 12 shillings a week working in a cotton mill. He still has the fear that it can always be taken away. That was one aspect of his personality. I felt bad for him, and it wasn't pleasant. Another example of McCartney's inner conflict became evident in other anecdotes which Francie told. The fan mail was delivered to the house in sacks as Apple knew John and Yoko were living there with us. Paul never paid any attention to that mail. I never, ever saw him open even a single piece of it. But because John and Yoko were subject to a lot of bad press, hate mail, and so forth, they didn't understand why people were reacting like this. It's because they were in love and it was so powerful. It was such a merger, a meeting of souls. Anyway, that morning it was late. I walked into the living room, and they had taken their mail into their room. I noticed this envelope in the mantel above the fireplace. It was just a note. It had no postmark, and it was typed. To John and Yoko, it said. John took it down and opened it. I didn't understand what it was doing there. He opened it and showed it to me. It read, You and your Jap whore think you're hot shit. John was wondering who would do something like this. He was extremely hurt. Yoko didn't think about what it meant to her, only how hurtful it was to John. Paul walked in, saw the expression on John's face and on my face, and said in his most cute Liverpudlian accent, Oh, I see, I, I just did that for a lark. Paul walked in, saw the expression on John's face and on my face, and said in his most cute Liverpudlian accent, Oh, I just did that for a lark. I think that was as close as he could come to expressing his great envy and jealousy of Yoko. The truth is, Paul McCartney has twice been widowed. The first great love of his life was John Lennon, and the second, Linda. And now they are both gone. But when it happened, it felt like betrayal. For me, that was the end of the partnership. Meanwhile, Paul and Jane's often turbulent five-year relationship was about to come to a very acrimonious end. In July 1968, returning from an extended Old Vic tour of the provinces, Jane turned up unexpectedly at Cavendish Avenue. Now, one of the Beatles' loyal groupies, nicknamed the Apple Scruffs, was waiting outside and buzzed Paul to alert him, but he was preoccupied and brushed her off. Jane entered the house and climbed the stairs to the bedroom that she and Paul shared. Thinking he was asleep, she gently knocked on the door. McCartney leapt up as though he'd been hit by an electric cattle prod. Who's there? It's Jane, silly. As Paul hurried to the door, Jane peered into the bedroom and spotted Francie Schwartz standing awkwardly by the bed, dressed in the oriental silk dressing gown Jane had given Paul for Christmas. The circumstances were uncannily similar to Cynthia Lennon's discovering of John and Yoko in their Weybridge home. Yoko was wearing a dressing gown that John had given his wife. As Paul groped for words, a shattered Jane raced downstairs, out of the house and out of McCartney's life forever. Meanwhile, back at Rembrandt, McCartney was showing his softer side. When Angela's sister May fell ill, he offered to send a private ambulance to drive Edie, their mother, to Rembrandt so the family could look after May. 
During Edie's visit, Paul spent time with her in the back bedroom where she was staying. One morning, Edie complained, I can't sleep. This bloody blackbird in the dead of night, cheep, 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 it sings all sodding night. According to Ruth and Angela, a few nights later, Paul went into Edie's room with a tape recorder. Meanwhile, back at Rembrandt, McCartney was showing his softer side. When Angela's sister May fell ill, he offered to send a private ambulance to drive Edie, their mother, to Rembrandt so that the family could look after May. During Edie's visit, Paul spent time with her in the back bedroom where she was staying. One morning, Edie complained, You know, I can't sleep that bloody blackbird in the dead of night. Cheep, 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 it sings all soddy night long. According to Ruth and Angela, a few nights later, Paul went into Edie's room with a tape recorder. He held the microphone outside the window and recorded the bird. Ultimately, says Angela, the tune Blackbird was written, which incorporated that recorded bird song. It makes me very happy. Paul was very good to my mom. He even dedicated an unreleased recording of the song to Edie, a recording which this author retains to this day. McCartney often worked late into the night and invariably woke up the family to listen to his latest masterpiece. One was She's Leaving Home. I wept when I heard it, Angela admits. It was such a beautiful song. I thought of it in terms of how I would feel if Ruth ever left home. Another time he got us up in the middle of the night to hear Norwegian Wood. He was very proud of it, although it was mainly John's. It was a great song, but it didn't mean anything to a lot of us. He told us that it was based upon a real experience of John's. Ruth was the inspiration for Paul's golden slumbers. The seven-year-old was at the piano one afternoon practicing a lullaby, Hey, you're butchering that bloody song, Paul called. What are you doing in there? He sat down beside her at the piano, staring at the sheet music, which he could not read. It might as well have been in Chinese, joked Ruth. Anyway, we ended up learning to play it together, and he said, That's nice. What's it called? I said, uh, Golden Slumbers. It is well known that Paul wrote Hey Jude for another child, Julian Lennon, when John left Cynthia for Yoko. Angela added, When Sin came home from holiday and found Yoko sitting at her kitchen table wearing her bathrobe, Paul evidently felt some responsibility. John wasn't taking care of her, so it was his job. He apparently brought a single red rose and then drove out to where Cynthia was staying and asked her jokingly to marry him. Ruth recalled when Paul first played the 1968 hit Hey Jude to his family. We were all looking at each other like it was the Emperor's new clothes. It was a good song, all right, and then it went into all this na 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 oh, it went on for hours. When Paul pressed Angela for her opinion, she told him, All that repetition at the end doesn't really cut it. Take it out. Of course, that was the biggest selling record they ever had. So after that, he'd always say, Just ask Ange anything you want to know about our music. If she hates it, it's sure to be a hit. Another tale told by Francie Schwartz and Alistair Taylor relates to Paul's attempt to publicize Hey Jude by using the old Apple Boutique as the backdrop. It all started with a phone call to Taylor at his home on 7 August 1968. Hey, why don't we use the Apple Boutique to promote Hey Jude? But it's empty, replied Taylor. What are you thinking? No, we won't do anything except paint Hey Jude in huge white letters on the front window. It'll be like a big poster on one of the busiest streets in the West End. I'll get mail and a mate, so tomorrow's rush hour will stop in front of it. Hey Jude, the Beatles' new single. Taylor rang round several local shops and had the necessary materials sent to the Baker Street shop. There was Paul, myself, another guy, and Francie Schwartz. This really did seem like five minutes' work until McCartney had another idea, Taylor remembered. It was too simple just to paint the words up in the window. We were going to have to paint the entire window, then wipe out the title. My arm was aching after half an hour, so we knocked off, had a scotch and coke, then went back to it. Paul wanted Hey Jude on the front window and the title of the flip side, Revolution, on the side window. They finished in the early hours of the morning. A little later, the police came to Apple HQ to report that during the night, the window of the Baker Street Boutique had been smashed. 
The culprit was a middle-aged Jewish death camp survivor who had been driving past the shop just before dawn. He'd had a drink and the words, Hey Jude, had taken him back to the 30s of Germany. The Nazis had written Jude or Juden in big white letters on houses and businesses owned by Jews as an open invitation to smash them. Just seeing Hey Jude there on the window was enough to trigger his old anger, said Taylor. He threw a soda siphon which had been in his car through the window. We thought, we'll try to keep this one out of the papers if we can. To her credit, Francie was unwilling to be anyone's doormat, no matter how celebrated they were. She soon decided her relationship with Paul was going nowhere and that she wanted out. I got sick or I had the flu or something. I was run down, never sleeping more than two hours at a time. I was emotionally spent, and he nursed me. He fed me this hot milk spiked with gin. I was passing out in bed, and as he was tucking me in, he said, Look, I'm really sorry, but as soon as we finish this album, I'll take you up to Scotland to the farm, and we will rest. So I fell asleep thinking, Hey, maybe he will turn out to be a decent guy after all, and he really is going to try and have a relationship. The next morning I was better and my fever had broken, so I stumbled downstairs. There he was, like a mean school teacher, and he said, When are you leaving? Look, I don't like your accent. I don't like your lips. When are you leaving? So I thought, this is it. I can't live with these 180-degree turnarounds. I can't live with this schizoid Gemini bullshit. So I said, I'll go home tomorrow. I said, just get me the money for a ticket and I'll go, okay? I went into the kitchen to call my mom, and he came up behind me, rubbed up against me, and put his arms around me and said, Don't cry. I'm going out for a while. Will you fix me dinner? Out went Francie, and in came Linda, both intelligent, accomplished women. Although McCartney had always been keen to be involved with films and composing scores, the idea had never really occurred to George Harrison until his new friend, director Joe Massot, began pre-production on a film called Wonderwall and invited him to write, arrange, and supervise the recording of the soundtrack. Massot remembered, at a happening led by the fool, Simone Postuma, Mareika Koger, Barry Finch, and Yasha Lieger, I asked them if they would paint the Wonderwall set, as well as design some clothes for actress Jane Birkin. I also invited them to appear in the party scene in the film. At the opening of the Beatles Boutique on 5 December 1967 were the Stones, Traffic, Clapton, The Who, Girls, Girls, and Yet More Girls, a real 60s event. Simone Postuma introduced me to George, who was very much into the Indian music, learning how to play the sitar and sarod, a twelve-string instrument very difficult to master. I had various choices. The Bee Gees were interested in doing something and came down to Twickenham to see me. It seemed the movie created a real vibe as Graham Nash from the Hollies also wanted to join in. George told me he had been working on Magical Mystery Tour, but that it was really Paul's project. He said he would like to do something solo. I told him that he could have a free hand to do anything he liked musically. That was what interested him in the picture. Harrison came down to the studio the following day to see the rough cut. In my enthusiasm, I began to wax lyrical about filmmaking, saying the studio is only the factory, assuming in my innocence that George was a complete novice. He smiled knowingly and took it in good heart. After all, he was the veteran of two major films, countless television appearances, and, of course, studio recordings. George proceeded to take notes and timings by watching the whole picture on a moviola. With his unique status as a Beatle, Harrison was given freedom to accomplish the soundtrack in any way he chose. He decided that half of the music should be Western and the other half Indian. At home at Kinfons, he made what Mel Evans called tape-recorded outlines. When he got into the studio, however, there were significant communication problems because he could neither read nor write music and had to whistle and hum what he wanted the session men to play. Evans reported, sometimes a short bit of music was needed. George would say, now give us a bit of happy banjo picking. He listened and then redirect the musician by adding, no, what I want is something more like this, and he'd hum a few bars. After several weeks, the Western music was almost complete, and just after Christmas, Harrison decided to move to Bombay to finish the project. To accomplish this, EMI London got in touch with EMI Bombay, and tickets for George, Neil Aspinall, and Magic Alex were booked on Air India for Sunday, 7 July.
The journey itself was tortuous, with prolonged stops in Paris, Frankfurt, and even Tehran. Shambu Das was waiting at the airport for them and soon got down to organizing the Bombay sessions. He was Ravi Shankar's right-hand man and almost never gives interviews, but during the mid-80s he spoke to me. George wanted to do the Wonderwall soundtrack and requested some help as he wanted to record it almost entirely in India. I was taking care of all of the musical arrangements. I personally played sitar on Wonderwall and a few friends of mine played other Indian instruments too. George and I were consulting a lot in those days, just throwing ideas back and forth. Anyway, we recorded for almost an entire week, and while he was there, he started to use his hands to eat, like we Indians do. Naturally, the bigwigs at EMA Bombay were delighted to have the world-famous George Harrison recording with them and kept dozens of India's top musicians in an adjacent room just in case he decided he needed something from one of them. After we'd finished Wonderwall, George decided it would be a pity not to make extra use of all these great Indian players, recalled Evans, so we taped large groups of them, up to ten at a time, and made recordings which George wanted to use on the next Beatles album. In fact, none of these ideas were used by the Beatles except in the backing for the magnificent B-side to Lady Madonna, The Inner Light. It was now obvious that India had penetrated deep under George's skin. It showed in the way he ate, dressed, talked, worked, and thought. His passion for the culture, philosophy, and more importantly, the religion of India sparked off a worldwide interest in gurus, mantras, sitars, and Indian fashion, which soon became mixed with the hippie culture, part of the fabric of today's multiculturalism. On 15 May 1968, George, Paddy, Ringo, and Maureen all flew to the south of France to attend the premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. They stayed for days, meeting the press, and enjoying Harrison's first solo success. As for the much-publicized romance between John and Yoko, signs of trouble soon began to appear. In late May 1968, an audio tape was recorded on which the insecure Lennon grilled his new lover about her sexual history. In it, Ono rambles on about her two loveless marriages, one to a Japanese composer and New York filmmaker Anthony Cox, whom she had used, she said, to further her career. Lennon demands to know every detail of her past erotic encounters. He even pushed her to compare the penis sizes of her lovers. Poor Tashi, the Japanese violinist, was apparently cursed with only a small purplish organ. But I'm not one of those women, she is quick to add, who's always sizing up pricks. Ono then went on to discuss an affair she had with her husband Anthony's best friend while he was staying with them. She tried to justify it by telling John she felt very vulnerable following the birth of her child, Kyoko. I just needed some consolation and a good lay. I was just using Tony. I was becoming a fucking prima donna. I had no inhibitions at that time. He was living in the same flat with us. How long was it before you made it with him, John asked. About a week, Yoko answered. John was also keen to explore her admitted attraction to members of the same sex. They discussed being aroused by models in television advertisements, and John remarked that Yoko got the same buzz from them as he did. She suggested that if they were to bring in another woman into their relationship, she would worry that John might fall for her. John fired back, Sounds like you're more worried that you might, if you're more attracted to women. Lennon asked Ono about her brief relationship with a roommate at Sarah Lawrence, with whom she shared a house. Yoko insisted that she had only been going through a phase of curiosity and experimentation. I was probably just flattered that a woman loved me, she explains. John persisted the relationship was as important as any she'd had because you're more interested in women than in men. When Yoko declared that she was only a spiritual whore, John snapped, No, you're a physical whore, too. In an attempt to defend herself, Ono claimed that, in fact, she rejected most men. I'm pretty particular, not like you who's so undiscriminating. Well, Lennon snapped, undiscriminating is your version of what I was from what I told you I did. He then asked her about an affair she'd had with an art teacher at an Ivy League college. I was objective, she says, so he's pretty good, but it was just sex, isn't it? He was just on the level of a chick you would lay. To which John replies, art teacher, 
That's a pretty good fucking gig, isn't it? Apart from going into it for the money, they know they can also make the students. The Beatles went back into the studio on 30 May, but questions remained as to what their schedule would be and how many tracks would make up the new album. We're just recording until we're finished, says McCartney. We have the studio booked for a couple of weeks initially, and then we'll just go from there. We might record all 30 songs and pick 14 or so for an album, or it could turn out to be two albums, or maybe even a three-pack. Harrison was in favor of issuing multiple albums. I suppose we got a vague idea of the overall concept of the kind of album we wanted to do, but it takes time to work that out. We could do a double album, I suppose, or maybe even a triple. There's enough stuff there. In fact, the first triple album to be issued was Harrison's All Things Must Pass in 1970. The Beatles began taping 18 tracks of Revolution in their first session. With Ono now central to Lennon's life, she too was there, which compromised the privacy of the recording studio. After an introduction to the personnel at Abbey Road, she remained by John Sides for the remainder of the Beatles' recording career. At one session on 4 June, Ono taped an audio diary on a portable cassette recorder. In it, she voiced her innermost thoughts and opinions on those around her and the state of her often paranoid, increasingly obsessive relation with John Lennon. Not to be outdone by John, Paul invited Francie to attend the session. When she arrived at about 8 p.m., she found the Beatles standing around a piano, with Yoko sitting about 20 feet from them in a corner, whispering into a microphone. The first words she uttered became the prevailing motif of her stream of consciousness soliloquy. "'John, I miss you again already. I miss you so much,' she said breathlessly, although they had not been apart for five minutes." In her summary of the day's events, she mentioned that John had told her that the as-of-yet untitled Two Virgins album would have to be issued under her name only or under a pseudonym and suggested Doris and Peter. Either idea is terrible, Ono believed. She preferred the idea of a limited edition release given privately to friends, but was convinced that it had to be publicly released in the long term because the message is going to be so beautiful it's going to light up the world, especially with the two of us naked, taken with a fisheye lens and all that. Just the message is beautiful. Ono was dead against using fake names in the record, not only because she disliked the sound of Doris and Peter, but also because John and Yoko had real name value. There's a dream to the name that has to come across, too. Ono could not understand why John's name should be removed from the project, when its release would potentially be more harmful to her. I just can't imagine what it's going to be like, but it's going to be hell for sure, like the female fans would all hate me or something. If I can get over this scary feeling, I know everything's going to be all right, she continued, and confided that her paranoia and fearlessness stemmed from her relationship with John. It seems almost unbelievable, and yet there's no way of turning back. Every day I think, oh, it can't be. I'm not going to miss him at all. She characterized their relationship as one that could only exist maybe once every two centuries or so. It's amazing. The only time I remember my promiscuity is when I feel so insecure. I have to bring that out in me to protect myself. Her apparently prime concern, however, was with Lennon's long-suffering wife. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. Cindy's coming back, maybe. I'm not sure if we're going back to Weybridge or we're going to stay here in town. Then her mind strayed to her daughter. I'm very worried about Kyoko. Yoko had just received word that her estranged husband had left for Paris with the child. I hope she doesn't resent me when she gets older. After a brief pause, her thoughts were back with Lennon. I wish John was in me right now. Sex, in other words. Reaching each other and giving something, and the fact that you gave me your sperm. I don't know. Probably at some time of your life you had a situation where you became scared of a straight relationship, of giving to each other, and instead of giving to women, you'd rather spit on a sky or shoot it to the sky kind of thing. Then Yoko further analyzed her situation. When I used to like somebody very much, I was too shy to tell them, and then it's easier for me to make it with someone. I don't love and imagine I'm making it with a guy I like. Each time I make it with you, I want you, and I want to express my want for you. 
I'm making a fantastic effort because playing straight is so difficult, so embarrassing. I wish I could get rid of that paranoia and like relax rather than think every day that this is the last. Yoko then noticed that John had stopped playing and remarked on his appearance that made a connection between his handwriting, his state of mind, and his marriage. All your letters are leaning backwards, which means tremendous insecurity. But today I've seen all your letters leaning forward. Leaning backwards handwriting is typical of a terrible, insecure high school girl. It's very rare to see it in a man. John's insecurity and paranoia came from a single source. I really think that had a lot to do with her, your marriage. Seems a long relationship like that would screw somebody up. Lennon became curious as to what Ona was talking about at such length. He wandered over and asked, I'm just saying how I miss you, Yoko replied. John answered into the microphone, Well, ladies and gentlemen, I also miss her, and it's a terrible feeling, all alone in a crowded room. John then answered into the microphone, Well, ladies and gentlemen, I also miss her, and it's a terrible feeling, all alone in a crowded room. Once Lennon had gotten back to work with McCartney on Revolution, she talked about Paul. He was now being very, very nice to her, having overcome the initial embarrassment, and was readily chatting with her about Apple. I feel like he's my younger brother. I'm sure that if he'd been a woman, he would have been a great threat, because there's something definitely very strong with me, John and Paul. Ono saw the other Beatles neither as a threat nor as important. With Ringo and George, I just can't communicate. I'm sure George and Ringo, they're very nice people. That's not the point. The threats to their relationship as Yoko saw them were almost too much for her to bear. At least if I knew I had another week with John. The situation almost reminds me of the war when I used to carry a poison cyanide pill thinking that any minute I might have to die. But the depression was fleeting. It's amazing what John did on Revolution with his voice. It's really beautiful. It's so sexy, too. And now he has his blouse off. He only has his undershirt on. I think he looks too sexy, really. John is such a genius. I almost get jealous of his talent. I was never jealous of any artist. I almost feel like kneeling down and kissing his feet. Lennon left the studio for a long time, and Ono worried that he was checking up on Cynthia. He's been with her for over a decade, and they have a child, Julian. I don't know what to make of it. Either he had a terribly weak character, or he was very much in love with her. I just got so jealous, I almost think I'm going to go insane. Over the next few days, Lennon worked on the lyrics of Revolution, changing the words slightly, particularly the line, When you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? Politically sensitive, he was still unsure if he wanted to be counted in or out, but on Revolution 1, he settled for both. For effect, he recorded the final vocal laying flat on his back with a boom microphone positioned directly above him. Peter Brown remembers because it was that he was so stoned on heroin. The Beatles turned next to recording Starr's first solo composition, a bouncy country and western tune brought to the studio with the curious working title of This Is Some Friendly. Curious, because in 1963, when the song was first being written, Ringo had called it Don't Pass Me By. Early takes featured Paul and Ringo laying down piano and drums with a sleigh bell added to the mix. Starr manually double-tracked his voice while McCartney added a new bass track to the recording. They took time out on that afternoon, 6 June, to record an interview with the BBC's Kenny Everett, in which Lennon remarked, We've just done two tracks, both unfinished. The second one is Ringo's first song. We're working on that one at this very moment. He composed it himself in a fit of lethargy. We've got to a stage with one where the next bit is the musician's, so we'll have to write the musician's bit. With Don't Pass Me By set aside for the day, Lennon began working on an intense sound collage that became Revolution No. 9. Often cited as a John and Yoko composition, it has long been unacknowledged that, with the exception of Paul, the other Beatles also contributed to it. Decades later, Harrison recalled, Ringo and I compiled that. We went into the tape library and looked through the entire room, pulled several selections and gave the tapes to John, who cut them together, the whole thing. Number nine, 
number nine is because I pulled a box number nine, some kind of educational program. John decided which bits to crossfade together, but if Ringo and I hadn't gone there in the first place, he wouldn't have had anything. The next day, George and Ringo left for the USA, so it was up to John to complete the sound effect tapes while he continued to search for new effects in the Abbey Road Library and his own collection at home. While Lennon was in Studio 3, McCartney recorded Blackbird in 32 takes in Studio 2 and finished mixing it into mono in a single six-hour session. The singing Blackbird on the recording was called from the tape Volume 7, Birds of a Feather in the Abbey Road Sound Effects Collection. This, of course, is at odds with the idea that Paul recorded the Blackbird sounds out of the window in Rembrandt. When George and Ringo returned from America, Paul left, and the three remaining Beatles finished Revolution 9, occupying all three studios at Abbey Road to accomplish the marathon task. John was really the producer of Revolution No. 9 tape operator, Richard Lush recalled, but George joined in that night, and they both had vocal mics and were saying strange things like the Watusi, the Twist, El Dorado. Lennon's off-the-wall prose consisted of such lines as his legs were drawn and his hands were tied, his feet were bent and his nose was burning, his head was on fire, his glasses were insane, this was the end of his audience. Random phrases were later interjected into the mix. Onion soup, economically viable, financial imbalance, with Harrison saying quietly, El Dorado. To top things off, George and John whispered into the microphone six times, There ain't no rule for the company freaks. Later, Lennon remarked, He hit a light pole, so he'd better go see a surgeon. Must have been hit between the shoulder blades. Anyway, they gave him a pair of teeth, which wasn't any good at all, so he joined the fucking Navy and went to sea. It was a week before Paul listened to the results. And, as Richard Lush noted, I know it didn't get a fantastic reaction from McCartney when he heard it. The reunited foursome then began a series of rehearsals to perfect the rhythm tracks, a method that became an integral part of the Get Back sessions. The first song done in this way was Lennon's Everybody's Got Something to Hide Except for Me and My Monkey, which was initially recorded sans any title. Its upbeat tempo contrasted nicely with what was the album's finale, a wistful Lennon ballad, Good Night. Written for five-year-old Julian and pegged as Ringo's contribution, John worked extensively on it, providing a warm electric guitar while Starr improvised a charming introduction on each take. The unscripted bits made the timing of his vocal entry a little difficult, with lines like, Come along, children. It's time to toddle off to bed. We've had a lovely day at the park, and now it's time for sleep. Producer George Martin made copies of the finished Take 15 to create an orchestral score in accordance with Lennon's instructions. In the end, none of the early takes, instrumentation on vocals for Good Night, were used in the final recording. McCartney was eager to record Oublady Oublada, which went through two remakes over the course of a week. The first version contained sax, piccolo, and bongos, the latter supplied by none other than Jimmy Scott. Engineer Jeff Emmerich recalled, There was one instance just before I left when they were doing Oublady Oublada for the umpteenth time. Paul was recording the vocal yet again, and George Martin made the remark about how he should be lilting on the half-beat or whatever, and Paul, in no refined way, said something to the effect of, Well, then you come down here and sing it. Getting back to Ringo's song, the musician's bit was finally added to Don't Pass Me By with Jack Fallon, a former booking agent for the group, playing a rambling violin overdub. The mono mix was to contain an extended ending featuring additional fiddle playing. I thought they had enough, so I just busked around a bit, said Fallon. I was very surprised that they kept it in. It was pretty dreadful, really. Rehearsals and laying down the bed tracks for John's magnificent Cry Baby Cry came next. It was during this time that the atmosphere became so taunt that engineer Jeff Emmerich quit the sessions. He did not work with them again until 1969. I lost interest in the White Album, said Jeff, because they were really arguing amongst themselves and even swearing at each other. I went down to the studio to explain it to the group, and John said, Look, we're not moaning and getting uptight about you. We're complaining about EMI. Look at this place, Studio 2. All we've seen is bricks for the past year. Why can't they fucking decorate it? With a new engineer, Ken Scott, filling Emmerich's role, the Beatles set about recording several long, slow versions of Helter Skelter. 
Take three lasted 27 minutes, 11 seconds, the longest recording the group had ever committed to tape. It drew its length from extended instrumental passages and off-the-cuff jams and featured a superb McCartney vocal backed by bass, heavy guitars, and drums. Meanwhile, John vented his angst against the Maharishi and Sexy Sadie and briefly demonstrated to Paul his original version for the song, You Little Twat, Who the Fuck Do You Think You Are, Oh You Cunt? Paul advised him that this approach did not make the piece more sympathetic to its composer. Yoko offered her opinion on the Sexy Sadie recordings during playbacks. Yeah, said Paul. You mean we can do it better? John cut in. Well, maybe I can. Harrison had yet to bring in one of his new songs for consideration, but eventually on 25 July he submitted While My Guitar Gently Weeps. I worked on that song with John, Paul, and Ringo, he said, and they were not interested in it at all. I knew inside of me it was a nice song. Take One was recorded on the first day, featuring an overdubbed organ near the end, and was released three decades later on the retrospective Anthology 3. On yet another session, Harrison wanted a particular atmosphere to record his lead vocal for Not Guilty, as engineer Ken Scott remembers. George had this idea he wanted to do it in the control room with the speakers blasting to get more of an on-stage feel. We had to monitor through the headphones, setting the monitor speakers at a level he felt comfortable with so it wouldn't completely blast out his vocals. Acetates were eventually cut, but Not Guilty progressed no further and was not slated for inclusion on the album. George recorded the song for his 1979 George Harrison album, and the superlative Beatles version, with a verse edited out, was officially released on Anthology 3. Ron Richards, another producer at EMI, noted on 22 August that Starr in particular was getting rather fed up with the sessions. Ringo was always sitting in reception waiting, just sitting there or reading a newspaper. He used to sit there for hours waiting for the others to turn up. Starr was also tired of sitting through endless sessions and having to deal with the ever-tense atmosphere. I had to leave, he reflected later. I thought the other three were together and I wasn't with them. I was separate. I was feeling down. Also, I thought I wasn't playing right. But I went round to each one and said, Look, I've got to leave. I can't make it. But then each one I went to said, I thought it was you three, and I was on my own. Lennon recalls, Ringo quit because he felt he was no longer necessary in the group, and nobody knows what they're doing. Francie Schwartz was very much around at the time. Ringo was just having a blast to get a song on the album. He was so happy, and nobody fucked with it very much. I was there for part of the drum track because I remember that night Paul interrupted him and got in Ringo's chair and did the drum riff. The tension was so thick you could really cut it. It showed so little respect for Ringo. Paul's rationale was that he wanted to make the product as good as possible, and he considered himself more sophisticated musically. But that's Paul and the force of his personality. Eventually, that led to Ringo's quitting. That was really through the night. Franco Zarelli, Twiggy, Justin, Lulu, Davy Jones, it was like a mob of people in there. It got bad. But it was also their own fault, because they weren't getting along with each other, so it was all kind of like, what the heck, we might as well let other people in and see if we can get back to the fun times. Because it was rapidly becoming hard to work, each night there were discussions. Paul almost wanted the album to have a booklet and each song a photo. I remember him saying, Oubladi Oublada was a story, so they would take a picture of a dirt road that looked like Jamaica, and there would be a Desmond, a black guy in a flashy suit who looked like a trashy lounge singer. He had a lot of ideas, but John didn't really give a shit about that kind of stuff, so there was conflict. Ringo was under Paul's direction, always telling him how to play. Now, Ringo is the nicest person on earth, but he had pride. So for Paul to tell Ringo how to play, that created a great deal of tension. While Ringo was away, the remaining three decided to record the haunting Dear Prudence at Trident Studios, taking advantage once more of the eight-track machine available there. They recorded each instrument over and over again, with each successive attempt being wiped. This technique led to Dear Prudence having only one take. Once again, Paul played the drums in Ringo's absence, and Jackie Lomax, whose album was also being produced by George, joined in on backing vocals. 
Back at Abbey Road, the Beatles had an eight-track machine installed so that George could fashion a backwards guitar solo for While My Guitar Gently Weeps, though those overdubs were never used. After Starr eventually returned, Paul worked with he and John to complete his ballad, I Will, lapsing into brief jams or improvisations between the 67 takes, including a short piece, Can You Take Me Back, a portion of which found its way onto the album following Cry Baby Cry. For the session on 18 September, McCartney wanted to create a spontaneous tune. We thought, why not make something up? So we got a riff going and arranged it around this riff. For the session on 18 September, McCartney wanted to create a spontaneous tune. We thought, why not make something up? So we got a riff going and arranged it around this riff. The song was Birthday, and after that they laid down the rhythm track. Everyone went to Paul's house on Cavendish Avenue to watch The Girl Can't Help It, a 1956 film starring Jane Mansfield. Vocals for Birthday featured not only John and Paul, but also Yoko and Patty singing back up in the chorus. Harrison's superlative Piggies was recorded the next day, with Chris Thomas supplying the harpsichord and John the sound effects taping of Grunting Pigs. Before taping began, George debuted another composition, Something, but it was not recorded for another year. John's Happiness is a Warm Gun in Your Hand, the last three words were dropped from the title, was recorded over three days. They all said it was about drugs, Lennon later remarked, but it was more about the history of rock and roll. Smack dab in the middle of the sessions for the White Album, McCartney decided to go off for a weekend in the sun in Sardinia with a comely barmaid that he'd met in London named Maggie McGivern. He'd met her while making the rounds of the exclusive private clubs that catered to the rich and famous in the London pop scene. Alistair Taylor received a phone call on Friday morning telling him to find Maggie and invite her along as his companion. I've lost her address, Alistair. I'm sure you can take care of it for me. Pick her up around midnight. When Taylor arrived at the club, he was dismayed to find it closed, but luckily met an employee who told him where Maggie lived. He drove through Chelsea and pulled up in front of a tall building. When he rang the bell, a beautiful blonde woman appeared. "'Are you Maggie McGivern? asked Alistair. "'Yes. Do you think you might like to come down here for a moment? Paul McCartney has sent me round to collect you. You're off to Sardinia this weekend for a holiday together.' "'Great,' she said. It wasn't the way most people get dates, but of course, Paul McCartney was a member of the greatest rock and roll show on the planet, and pulling girls wasn't ever really a problem. Several years later, Maggie remembered the weekend in a brief online interview. Paul was a very interesting man. He was obviously very used to getting his own way, however, which is reasonable. Actually, we had a really good laugh. Though nothing really came of the relationship, I have fond memories both of Paul and a very special time in my young life. On Friday, 18 October 1968, at around 11.30 a.m., while John and Yoko were living in Ringo's basement flat at 34 Montague Square, they were busted for drug possession by Sergeant Norman Pilcher. The Stones, too, had been busted earlier in 1967. Their drug-taking had widely been reported in scandalized tones by the news of the world, and it was probably inevitable that the establishment would take action. But 1968 was a different story altogether. It was clear the Beatles were no longer the lovable mop tops they once appeared to be. Pilcher's motives for producing such a high-profile case were his own. But it seems clear that the word still had to come from somewhere higher up than the London drug squad in the case of both John and George. There is some speculation that these two were, in the minds of many, the most radical Beatles with Harrison's weirdo Hare Krishna religion and Lennon's penchant for revolution. A previously unseen police case file reveals not only the police view on the bust, but also the particulars of the case against John and Yoko. I said, we are police officers and we have a warrant to search the premises for dangerous drugs. Open the window and let me in. Lennon leaned on the window, preventing me from opening it, and said, I don't care who you are, you're not bloody well coming in here. D.S. Pilcher then left me, and I heard banging coming from the front door. Lennon moved away from the window, shouting, All right, I'll open it. I opened the window and entered the bedroom. Lennon said, Oh, well, you're in now. Item seized from the scene. Statement of Michael Ansel, M.A. Occupation of witness. 
senior scientific officer. On the 22nd of July, 1968, I took possession of the following sealed items. Description, one binocular case containing binoculars and an herbal mixture. Result of analysis, 12.43 grams, 1.918 grains of cannabis resin. Description, one tin containing herbal mixture. Result of analysis, traces of cannabis resin. Description, one envelope containing herbal mixture. Result of analysis, 1.77 grams, 27.3 grains of cannabis resin. Description, one cigarette case. Result of analysis, traces of cannabis resin. Description, one box containing a vial of brown tablets. Result of analysis, three Omnipon tablets containing a total of 30 milligrams, one and a half grain morphine. The couple were taken to Marleybone Police Station on 18 November at around 1 p.m., charged and then released on bail. On 28 November at Marleybone Magistrates Court, they pleaded guilty to possession of cannabis resin and were fined 150 pounds plus court costs. John was afraid that Yoko, who held an American passport, would be deported and also pleaded guilty to a charge of obstructing the police in the hope that Yoko would be exempted from any legal liability. The event was so upsetting for both of them that Yoko miscarried her baby, ending up in Queen Charlotte's Hospital, London, where John camped out next to her bed in a sleeping bag. The drugs found in Lennon's possession on that occasion constituted a minor misdemeanor, especially by today's standards, but there is strong evidence that John and perhaps others close to him were using heroin. Although Lennon only admitted to sniffing a little when we were in real pain, the Beatles' taste for heroin went well beyond experimentation. From the recollections of Paul McCartney, Hare Krishna houseguest Don and Jaya Das, Yoko Ono, and John's aide Frederick Seaman, it is now clear that between 1968 and early 1971, and possibly longer, John Lennon was a full-blown junkie. It was a very intense period, remembers McCartney. John was with Yoko and escalated to heroin and all the accompanying paranoia. He was putting himself way out on a limb. As much as it excited and amused him, at the same time it secretly terrified him. Don't let me down was a genuine plea. Don't let me down, please, whatever you do. I'm out on this limb. I know I'm doing all this stuff. Just don't let me down. It was saying it to Yoko. I'm really stepping out of line on this one. I'm really allowing my vulnerability to be seen. So you must not let me down, please. I think it was a genuine cry for help. It was also a very good song. Paul continues... For us, John being on heroin was a fairly big shocker for us because we all thought we were far-out boys, but we understood we'd never gone quite that far out. On another occasion, McCartney recalled the ill effects of heroin on his partner. Unfortunately, he was drifting away from us at that point, but none of us actually knew it. He never told us. We heard rumors, and we were all very sad, but he'd embarked upon a new course which really involved anything and everything. I was really very frightened of drugs, says Paul. Having a nurse mother, I was always quite cautious. I did some heroin with Robert Fraser and some of the boys in the Stones, and I always refer to it as walking through a minefield. I was lucky because if anyone had ever hit me with a real dose, I might have become a heroin addict. Robert Fraser once said to me, there's no problem with heroin, even if it's addictive. You've just got to have a lot of money. The problem is when you can't pay for it, which, of course, is absolute fucking bullshit. Eventually, of course, Lennon saw that he had to kick heroin. This led to several unsuccessful attempts at withdrawal, including a stint at the London Clinic for four days detoxification. Upon discharge, he went on to methadone in an effort to wean himself off the drug, but his fame made it difficult for him to check into a hospital as someone on... The staff would surely tip off the press. Fortunately, Lennon managed to keep the matter out of the press, but not from the other Beatles. Paul, for one, was very concerned and annoyed that John could be so stupid as to involve himself in such a potentially lethal pastime where so many around them had already killed themselves. George, too, was aghast, as he had adopted a Hare Krishna lifestyle which eschewed drugs. When John moved to America in September 1971, he had still not abandoned the drug completely. According to musician Jesse Ed Davis, author Albert Goldman, and several members of Lennon's staff, he enjoyed it off and on for the rest of his life. Chapter 8 Good evening and welcome to Slaggers. 
Central London, 1969. I was very disappointed in 1969 when suddenly everybody starts kicking each other and stabbing each other in the back after the whole love generation. Where did they go? Where are you? Suddenly it all became this hate and deceit. George Harrison We started Apple like a toy because we weren't businessmen, and we didn't know what was involved. We started this great empire thinking we could do whatever we felt like with it, but it ended up that we couldn't. We had to go in. So what we're really doing now is paying for when we played about. We used to keep everybody on forever because they were mates. They never did their jobs. Now if they can't do the job, they have to leave, which is fair. If you don't do your work, then you've got to go somewhere else. This isn't a playground. Ringo Starr In many ways, 1969 represented the Beatles at their best and at their miserable worst. It was an intense time for all of the group, with not only a lot of band stuff happening, but myriad solo projects as well. Personally, it was a time of change. Paul and Linda married, as did John and Yoko. George worked with several artists, both as a producer and anonymous sideman, while Ringo stepped out as a charismatic, capable film actor. Abbey Road was recorded and released. Lennon founded the Plastic Ono Band and played for Peace in Toronto as the death knell sounded for the Beatles as a musical collective. In January, the Beatles were hard at work recording their new album, Get Back, later retitled Let It Be. They had agreed to allow themselves to be filmed for a documentary directed by American filmmaker Michael Lindsay Hogg, which later became the film Let It Be. Drawing largely on tapes and notes made by Apple gopher Kenny McCain and given to this author, these excerpts gave a rare insight into the inner dynamics of the Beatles at this time. Wednesday, 8 January 1969 I don't care if you don't want it on your show, I don't really give a fuck, George caustically pronounces as he introduces his latest composition, written the previous evening, to Ringo, having just arrived at Twickenham, I Me Mine is complete lyrically and musically, though elements of the song would change when it was finally recorded later for the Let It Be album. Harrison's mood improves as he begins to discuss John's 1969 diary, a comical little book passed out to friends. It's really too much, George laughs. It's just his diary filled in for the year. It starts, got up, went out, came home, went to bed, and then Saturday night is, got up late, went out, came in, fucked the wife, went to bed. Harrison eagerly talks about television the night before, revealing how it inspired I Me Mine, a moving diatribe against egotism. There was some science fiction thing on, but then suddenly it turned into all this crap about medals and things. That's what gave me the idea. Because suddenly they were all coming into a ball. I think it was Austria, and they all had their medals on, some music was playing like a three-fourth time thing. I had that in my head, just the waltz thing, and it fit I mean mine. There were no words to it. Harrison ponders aloud whether the line, flowing more freely than wine, is grammatically correct. With Lennon recently arriving, Harrison mentions a recent newspaper article. Legalize pot, he reads. It's less harmful than alcohol, yet the penalty is up to 2,000 pounds and 10 years in prison. Just think of it. John's reference to the article later in the session, Queen says no to pot-smoking FBI members, found its way into both the Let It Be LP and film. While a new PA is being installed, a short conversation takes place regarding Lennon's addiction to heroin. Also discussed is his ability to come up with new material. The two speak in almost comical tones, but the issues they discuss are far from their typical laugh-in style repartee. Paul haven't you written anything else? John, no. Paul, we're going to be faced with a crisis, you know. John, when I'm up against the wall, Paul, you'll find I'm at my best. Paul, yeah, but I wish you'd come up with the goods. John, well, look, I think I've got Sunday off. Paul, yeah, well, I hope you can deliver. John, I'm hoping for a little rock and roller. Paul, I was hoping for the same thing myself. As the session winds down, Lindsay Hogg rants away at length, discussing ideas for the proposed upcoming live show, until the Beatles finally give up and jokingly agree with everything he says. 
Yes, all right, just shut up, Lenin humorously retorts. Michael doesn't heed his advice and says that he wants to put up posters around Twickenham advertising the live date as 20 January 1969. John, perhaps more realistically with the state of the sessions, predicts that the date to be the 19th of February, 1982. Michael then becomes a bit too familiar and refers to Paul as darling. McCartney answers back with lovey. I was brought up in California, you must forgive me, offers the embarrassed director. The new Beatles LP is still very far from becoming a reality, though Lennon explained its concept earlier in the day to George Martin. Well, it's a very small LP with a large hole in the middle and a picture of your behind and the label saying, George Martin presents. Thursday, 9 January, 1969. The Beatles conduct extensive rehearsals for Get Back. Most of the lyrics to the songs at this stage are largely improvised, although John and Paul try and organize the words a bit. As McCartney groped for the song's lyrics, he opened a kind of Pandora's box when he referred at length to the political hot potato of Pakistani immigration into Britain, as well as the sensitive issues of Puerto Rican immigration, Native Americans, and the emerging gay movement. On the surface, the lyrics could be interpreted as racist, but Paul was clearly liberal in both his politics and lifestyle. He was certainly being ironic or even condemning the archaic ideas by playing devil's advocate. At any rate, a tape of that long-ago session survives. The excerpt, taken from Roll 97, Camera A, Slate 184, recorded on 9 January 1969, shows that the bouncy tune was originally entitled No Pakistanis or Commonwealth, and Paul sings, while he is trying to come up with suitable lyrics for the new melody, Dowdy came from Puerto Rico, and he joined the middle class. Where I come from, we don't need no Puerto Ricans coming from another land, so get back. Get back to where you once belonged. A man came from Puerto Rico, came to live in New York amongst the Puerto Rican class. Get back, get back to where you once belonged. Albert Domore was a Puerto Rican. Don't need no Puerto Ricans in the USA. Get back, get back to where you once belong. Albert Domore was a Puerto Rican. Don't need no Puerto Ricans in the USA. Get back, get back to where you once belonged. Suddenly there is Pakistanis all over the land, taking the English jobs, riding on the buses, man. Get back. Get back to where you once belonged. Sidi Abomai was a Pakistani, but he came to leave his home. All the people said, we don't need Pakistani, boy. You better travel home. Get back. Get back to where you once belonged. Louisa was the one who thought she was a woman, but she was another man. All the friends around her said she's got it coming, but she gets it while she can. Get back. Get back to where you once belonged. John, we don't want no black men. Don't dig no Pakistanis taking all the people's jobs. Get back. Get back to where you once belonged. All the folks around said partly a Mohican. Get back. Get back to where you once belonged. Sidi Abome was a Pakistani living in the underground. All the folks around don't need no Pakistanis taking all the people's jobs. So get back. Get back to where you once belonged. Friday, 10 January 1969. For the first verse of Get Back, Paul sings about Tucson, Arizona, and California grass in the first person, quickly coming up with characters such as Sweet Loretta Marsh, later to become Martin, and Joe, although they have a difficult time coming up with a last time for the latter. John and Paul trade several ideas in search of a Western-sounding name, Carson, Williams, Dandy, while Paul finally settles for Jojo Jackson. The second verse retains the Pakistani immigration theme, although they now realize that their new characters do not fit the storyline. The California grass is a bit daft. We'll straighten it out later. McCartney is having difficulty singing over the two guitars and asks George to play only on the offbeat. Harrison grumbles that perhaps they need Eric Clapton, who will obligingly play whatever he is told. John and Paul both affirm that they need only George. McCartney then argues with Harrison over a chord in the chorus, which Paul thinks is passé and they have used before, comparing it to drainies, drainpipe trousers. George disagrees and says that they are only chords and that some songs suit songs better than others. 
Paul envisions John and George each taking a solo during the song and an abrupt ending featuring feedback from Lennon's guitar. He also suggests changes to Ringo's drum intro, and even George, who has remained mostly quiet during the rehearsal, pitches a few ideas. McCartney reiterates his desire to keep things simple and plays bass riffs from Long Tall Sally and the theme from the Beatles cartoons as examples. A riff in Get Back reminds John of Perry Como's Catch a Falling Star, and he sings a few lines. Leonard observes that they have never learned so many new songs at one time. McCartney suggests moving on to Two of Us, which John mockingly calls his favorite. The tune is much harder at this point, featuring electric guitars with a galloping guitar rift entirely different from the gentle acoustic arrangement it will receive once the sessions move to Apple Studios on Savile Row on January 21 is complete. Paul remarks, It's a bit faceless. John agrees and suggests they record a demo and give it to the new band Grapefruit, new Apple recording artists. This does not occur, but another group, Mortimer, will go on to record the song. Monday, 13 January, 1969. Star wonders whether they actually have enough footage for a documentary, and Michael replies that if they are allowed to show everything, then yes, but if they are hiding, then all they have is a few days' footage wherein things didn't quite work out. Paul arrives and sorts out some photographs by Ethan Russell, and Linda comments about how great John looked the previous day. Michael asks who he was wearing, and Paul laughs why Yoko Ono, the celebrated Japanese actress. What's wrong with him? He won't sing the words, McCartney growls as they listen to the Arthur Conley cover of Oobladi Oblada. Paul and Ringo remark on how cover versions of the song always leave out bra and life goes on. McCartney says he prefers the Bedrocks version. He mentions that the first record he ever bought was Bebop Alula, and how Lonnie Donegan's Rock Island line didn't really move him enough to run out and buy it. I liked it, but I thought it was a bit too British. McCartney hopes to finish off some lyrics and rehearse the unfinished tunes, but Starr questions the point, with Harrison still absent. Lennon, typically, is still at bed and home. Neil Aspinall mentions how the previous day George requested a meeting with only the four Beatles present, and everyone agreed. But Harrison didn't really believe that John would show up without Yoko. They'd go on to discuss John and Yoko's relationship, and Paul believes they are quite serious about what they are doing, but wishes he would write with John without Yoko. They go on to discuss John and Yoko's relationship, and Paul believes they are quite serious about what they are doing but wishes he could write with John without Yoko present. He finds it especially difficult to start from scratch on a new song with John and Yoko, mentioning he begins on a Yoko beam, writing about white walls just to get the two interested. I give them too much credit for what I think they'd like, Paul said. Linda says Yoko did all the talking at the last Apple meeting. She was speaking for John, and I don't think he really believed any of it. Neil comments that it could never be a serious meeting with Yoko there, as it would just turn into a circus. Once again, they bring up the last meeting wherein George walked out. Michael then suggests drugging Yoko's herbal tea to get a moment alone with John. Paul criticizes Hogg's use of quick cuts in The Who's performance in the Rolling Stones show, The Rock and Roll Circus, telling him he prefers long shots and studies of a subject. He suggests the Beatles documentary should be built up like a Picasso painting, with the songs being the artwork, but Michael expresses a profound dislike of the idea, viewing it as too much like Andy Warhol. Paul disagrees, but in the end, his ideas for the film are never used. As Harrison has walked out in disgust, McCartney assumes that he will ultimately be back, but Lennon wonders what to do in case he doesn't. Paul can only say that that would be a new problem because John still wants the four Beatles together, but he mentions George as becoming less satisfied with the group. To Lennon, the mystique is all but gone in the recording, their music no longer containing the creative surprises for them it did in the days of Revolver. John says he prefers the Beatles' songs individually with each tune authored separately. Still, he somehow finds the final production unsatisfactory. McCartney expresses the sentiment that he often hesitates before presenting the other Beatles with new material because he knows at least one of them will not like it, so this inhibits him. The Beatles then return to the studio to rehearse a frantic version of Get Back. Paul settles for the moment on the lead character's name being Sweet Loretta Marvin. 
McCartney works further on the JoJo verse and then decides to call it a day. He asks Michael to cancel their performance scheduled for 18 January. As proof he will be returning the next day, Lennon leaves his favorite guitar behind, and Paul too promises to leave his cherished Hofner bass. McCartney then does a posh voice and bids farewell. And so I'd like to say to the cast of this production, good night and thank you very much for having us. It's been wonderful working with you. I know it's been wonderful working with me, but it's been wonderful working with you too. Which way did John go? Tuesday, 21 January 1969. With George now back in the fold, sessions for Get Back resume and move to the new makeshift Apple Studios in the basement of Savile Row. The Beatles, and John in particular, are taken back by an article in the Daily Sketch entitled The End of a Beautiful Friendship, which dealt with George's unexpected departure on the 10th. John tells Dennis O'Dell he wants to sue, and is especially upset over the inference he and George almost came to physical blows. It's never got to that except for a plate of dinner in Hamburg, says John, who laughs at the unrecorded memory. He has different feelings, however, towards Harrison's photo, which accompanies the article. The picture's great. Yeah, George Harrison, the sane one, speaks out. With Harrison temporarily out of the room, John parodies George's departure for Ringo. I quit, says John. Starr asks him to repeat himself, and Lennon reiterates that he is quitting. Ringo replies, yeah, well, you're going to have to fight me first. After a good bit of recording and indeed rehearsal, their current list of songs are contained on their lyric sheets, then read aloud by Paul. After a good bit of rehearsing and recording, their current list of songs, as contained on their lyric sheets, is then read aloud by Paul. All I Want Is You, Dig a Pony, The Long and Winding Road, Bathroom Window, She Came In Through the Bathroom Window, Let It Be, Across the Universe, Get Back to Where You Once Belonged, Two of Us, On Our Way Home, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, I've Got a Feeling, Sunrise, All Things Must Pass, Sunrise, All Things Must Pass, I Me Mine. Among the eleven compositions, seven belong primarily to Paul, with John and George having only two each. The title Sunrise catches both Harrison and Lennon by surprise. McCartney explains that it is, in fact, Harrison's All Things Must Pass, which wouldn't receive a serious rehearsal in any of the Apple session dates. John is relieved by the revelation. You threw me there. I thought I was away a day you learned a fucking tune. By the spring of 1969, it was clear the Apple experiment was failing. The first casualty had come about the previous year. Things had been heading downhill as management of the Apple boutique changed hands. Former theatrical director John Linden took over from Pete Shotton, but was soon replaced by Caleb, a tarot reader known only by his first name. He had been assisting decision-making at Apple through denovation, but he had tired of making record chart predictions for the staff and left. Considerably less successful than the several new artists signed to Apple Records was Apple Electronics, headed by Magic Alex. Mardas was paid 40 pounds a week, plus 10% of the profits made on any of his inventions. I'm a rock gardener, and now I'm doing electronics, said Alexis at the time. Maybe next year I make films or poems. I have no formal training in any of these, but that is irrelevant. Magic Alex invented electric paint, Ringo remembered. You paint your living room, plug it in, and the walls light up. We saw small pieces of metal as samples, but then we realized you'd have to paste sheets of steel on your living room wall and then paint them. One invention he had was amazing, said George, a small square of metal like stainless steel with two wires coming out of it to a flashlight battery. If you held the metal and connected the wires one way, it would very quickly become so hot you had to drop it. If you reversed the wires, it got cold as ice. Mardas was given a rented garage in Boston Place in which to work, but though the Beatles often visited him, there was never really much to see. I'm trying to remember why we even bothered getting involved now, McCartney admitted. Much to their dismay, Alexa's workshop fell victim to a mysterious fire before any of his inventions could be properly presented, and thus he remained in their favor for the time being. 
When they wanted a new studio in the basement of their Savile Row offices, naturally, Alexis was commissioned to pull it off. He took to spying on the experts and visiting George Martin at Abbey Road. There he observed the techniques and technology being used, while denouncing it as profoundly out of date. I found it very difficult to chuck him out, says George Martin, because the boys liked him so much. Since it was very obvious I didn't, a mitre schism developed. When the Beatles finally left Twickenham Studios to begin recording Let It Be at Savile Row in 1969, they discovered the truth about Alexis's state-of-the-art recording studio. Harrison later termed it the biggest disaster of all time. Alexis didn't know the first thing about putting together a studio— and it showed. If you'd had a few Revoxes, you'd have done better, said John Dunbar, on seeing the many pricey purchases Alexis had made at Apple's expense. He'd charge them thousands of pounds and then buy the stuff secondhand. He had installed 16 small speakers to mimic a 16-track studio. The room was without soundproofing, and the recording console was installed behind the building's central heating unit, rendering any recordings useless because of the constant hum. To top it off, there were no ports connecting the studio to the control room, so it was impossible for sounds emanating from the microphones to reach the mixing desk. Everything was dismantled, and the Beatles asked George Martin to borrow a four-track mixing console from EMI. He was so annoyed that they hadn't listened to him and had fallen for Alex's promises that he left much of the day-to-day -day work to engineer Glyn Johns. All in all, things at Apple were not going well. It wasn't me who wanted to do Apple, recalled George. Paul decided to do Apple and was aided and abetted by John. Of course, it was a good idea, but it wasn't really subtle enough. Shouting to everybody about what you're going to do before you even know yourself what you're doing isn't really that smart. On the heel of Paul's breakup with Jane Asher, then Francie Schwartz, Linda Eastman was on the scene, but the ever-secretive Paul kept her tightly under wraps away from his family until well into 1969. One day, when Jim called Cavendish Avenue, an unfamiliar female voice answered. Then Paul was on the line. "'Oh, that's Linda,' Paul said, obviously not wanting to discuss her. Soon afterwards, a reporter telephoned Rembrandt informing the McCartneys that Paul was planning to marry Linda the next day at London's Marleborn Register office. Shocked, Jim telephoned his son. Afterwards, he told his wife, Angela, Paul's getting married tomorrow. He meant to tell me, but he said he was too busy. Apart from Mike, the obligatory Mel Evans, and Peter Brown, no other family or friends attended the ten-minute ceremony on 12 March. A few days later, Paul telephoned his father to say that he and Linda, with his bride's seven-year-old daughter Heather, were coming to visit. Heather blew in like a tornado. Hang up my coat. I'm the boss of the dogs, she told Ruth in New York cabbie dialect. Once Linda was ensconced in the family, she insisted that Rembrandt must be immediately redecorated. She then hired a regime of top designers and painters from London and put them in a local hotel for the three months it took to complete the job. The new Mrs. McCartney ripped out the elegant carpeting and curtains and installed a loud green and red plaid. The wallpapers would be replaced with the finest silk. I want the walls to be covered with the colors of Delcy tissue. Since that company was unknown in Great Britain, Linda ordered a box from America. Still, the pinks weren't quite pink enough and the blues were rather too blue, so it had to be done over and over again. Linda was meticulous and demanding. By the time it was finished, it looked like a padded cell, Ruth joked. Angela was pressed into service to buy a special split mattress for Paul and Linda, which allowed each side to move independently. The newlyweds installed an antique bed they'd bought from a second-hand shop, which was heavily infested with woodworm. When Angela tactfully suggested treating the bed, a shocked Linda protested, Oh, Ange, don't fuss. They've got a right to live, too. One room Linda didn't touch, however, was Paul's. It was kept almost as a shrine. Surprisingly, the furnishings were quite Spartan, except for McCartney's prized Hofner base. There was also a blinking road construction lamp. He ripped off one of those hazard lights from the motorway, Ruth laughed. They dumped it in the back of the rolls and put a coat over it as it wouldn't stop blinking. You could see the bloody thing flashing through the curtains. Dad used to have a fit. 
As Angela observed to me in 1994, Linda was everything to him, photographer, business partner, trusted friend, mother of his children, and psychological nursemaid. Paul seemed to need someone to hide behind. First it was John, then Linda. This could be why he insisted on Linda becoming part of Wings against all odds. One of Linda's quirks was noticed at a McCartney family party. She always noticed she had a drink in her hand, but never really touched it. Oh, I'm tipsy, she would gush. Oh, God, I'm so drunk. Angela spotted her pouring a drink into a potted plant. Presumably, she reflected, that was to assist people to let their guard down and not be aware that she was watching them. On another occasion, Linda, Paul, Jim, and Angela were going out for a drive. Paul got into the driver's seat, and Jim went to the passenger side to get in next to his son. Hey, out of there, Linda bellowed. Get in the back. Shocked, Jim protested. But I always sit in the front when Angie is driving. Well, you don't sit in the front with Paul. Get in the back, Linda repeated sternly. I'm sitting with my husband. Look, Dad, what you don't understand, that's all well and good in Great Britain, but in America it doesn't quite work that way, Paul explained. Linda's my woman, and she wants to sit up front with me. You just get in the back. McCartney often displayed his generous and charming side to his family. One day, not long after his wedding, he took Linda, Ruth, and Angela in his roles for a sightseeing tour of Liverpool. He pointed out the site of the Casbah, the Liverpool Art Institute, the Beatles' boyhood homes, and the Anglican Cathedral. There he introduced himself to the archdeacon, and they climbed to the tower for a breathtaking view of the city. Finally, they stopped at 10 Matthew Street, the famed Cavern Club. At three o'clock in the afternoon, the place was deserted except for the cleaning woman. Hi, I'm Paul, he said as the employees marveled in awe and delight. This is Linda. She's an American. Do you mind if I show her around? Paul sat his wife and stepmother and sister on some wooden chairs in front of the famous stage. Ladies, the show's about to begin, he bowed and took the stage. He did this charming song and dance routine, said Ruth. Then he said, and for my next trick, and sat down at the drum kit to play a cracking drum solo. He moved on to an upright piano in the corner and sang a little song for Linda. It was like this amazing private concert. It was great. For George and Patty Harrison, life in Serene Esher was good. They had many close friends, exciting careers, and, of course, each other. Patty's sisters often came to stay for weeks at a time and kept her company when George was recording. Later they had a small boutique in Kensington Market called Juniper in honor of Donovan's Jennifer Juniper. For George and Patty Harrison, life in Serene Esher was good. They had many close friends, exciting careers, and, of course, each other. Patty's sisters often came to stay for weeks at a time and kept her company while George was recording in London. Later, they even had a small boutique together in Kensington Market called Juniper in honor of Donovan's Jennifer Juniper. When George was at home, he took an active interest in the garden. He and Klaus Vormann even painted a swirling psychedelic mural on the outside wall of the house, as well as one of his many cars. Some days, when there was no pressing engagements, George would take out his antique ivory pillbox and pick out a small, pastel-colored tab of LSD and quietly trip out. Wandering through nearby Claremont Park, he would sink into a dreamy haze of warm sunshine and good vibrations. Other times he and Patty would stay in, and after a hearty home-cooked meal, quietly pass the time with friends, smoking strong black Moroccan hashish or drinking vintage wine. As a hippie, George Harrison maintained exacting standards. The beginning of the end of the Harrison's Esher period came early in the evening of 12 March 1969, when Petty answered a knock at the door and found half a dozen policemen outside. "'Drug squad, madam,' announced D.S. Pilcher. "'We have a warrant.' Immediately, several constables and a couple of drug-sniffing dogs began their search of the long, low house. "'I think perhaps I should ring my husband,' said Patty calmly. She darted into a nook between the sitting room and the study, then dialed the Beatles' secret number at Apple. George spoke to his wife, hung up, and told Apple fixer Peter Brown what was happening. Brown rang Martin Polden, one of London's top lawyers. Meanwhile, George telephoned Pete Shotton, who lived nearby, and asked him to go over and stay with Patty until he could finally get there. Prior to that, the charming Mrs. Harrison tried her best to entertain the police by playing them Beatle records and even serving tea. 
When Harrison arrived some time later with Derek Taylor, he found at least ten police cars and a black Maria outside of his house. Everything was in an uproar, Shotton remembers. The coppers had tipped over virtually all the furniture and were tearing through the cupboards when George suddenly burst in. Everything came to an immediate halt. Just what are all these men in silly felt hats doing in my fucking home anyway, giving all my friends bad vibes, shouted George. Mr. and Mrs. Harrison began, Pilcher. I am charging you with the illegal possession of cannabis resin. I'm afraid I must ask you to both come down to the station for questioning. Harrison inquired if they had actually found any, or if they had supplied their own. And you needn't have turned the whole bloody place upside down, either. All you had to do was ask me, and I would have shown you where I keep everything. They were then taken to the cars, the police so close to George and Patty that they could hardly walk. Look, I'm not going to run, cried George. Go on, give us a little room, will you? Before anyone knew what was happening, a photographer jumped out of a nearby hedge and popped off a series of flash bulbs in George's face. Harrison dropped to the ground, then bounced up and charged after the cameraman with the London drug squad hot on his heels. I'm going to fucking kill you, you bastard, he bellowed. The photographer dropped his Nikon and never stopped running. George stomped on it, wrecking it, before the police restrained him. At the Esher police station, George and Patty were charged and subsequently released on bail. The couple were then driven home and got changed for a party given by London artist Rory McEwen at his studio in Chelsea. They arrived fashionably late and were greeted by their host, who steered them in the direction of his other celebrated guests, Princess Margaret and her husband, Lord Snowden. "'Guess what?' said George sheepishly. "'We've been busted. Sergeant Pilcher and his goons planted a big block of hash in my bedroom.' "'How terrible,' said the princess sympathetically, herself a seasoned secret pot-smoker. "'Do you think you might be able to get the charges dropped?' asked George." Oh, I don't think so. It could become a little sticky. Sorry, George, she said. As if all this wasn't awkward enough for the princess, Patty's youngest sister, Paula, strolled up and offered Her Royal Highness a joint. Shortly thereafter, the princess left. Nineteen days later, at Esher and Walton Magistrates' Court, the Harrisons pleaded guilty to unlawful possession of cannabis resin. The magistrates, the magistrates find the Harrisons each 250 pounds plus costs. They were allowed to keep an ornamental Native American pipe that had been confiscated in the raid. As he left the court, George told the reporters outside, we hope the police will now leave the Beatles alone. Shortly thereafter, George found the house that he came to love dearly and remained his home for the rest of his life, Friar Park, on Paradise Road, at the upper edge of Henley-on-Thames, Oxfordshire. His friend, Samashundar Das, remembers it is sorely neglected just after the Harrisons moved in during 1970. In those early months at Friar Park, we all crashed out in sleeping bags. There were a hundred rooms, no heat, no furniture. On those early mornings when George returned from all-night sessions, we all piled into the kitchen. The only warm room in the house, he and his rock and roll sidemen alive with some new tune hatched that night. Hey, what do you think of this one, Shama Sundar? We call it My Sweet Lord, Hare Krishna. John and Yoko were married in Gibraltar on 20 March 1969 in a quiet civil ceremony attended only by Peter Brown, who acted as his best man. Their honeymoon was spent first in Paris, then Amsterdam, where, like many newlyweds, they went straight to bed. Except that John and Yoko invited the entire world to attend by holding a nearly week-long peace protest starting on 25 March. They held a second bed in for peace in room 1742 at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel in Montreal. From 26 May to 2 June 1969, they met with the media, advertising world peace. It was a surprisingly effective stunt in a world torn apart by the war in Vietnam. Amongst the many celebrity guests who dropped in were Tommy Smothers, Timothy and Rosemary Leary, and little Abner cartoonist Al Cap, an irascible old character with only one leg. From the moment John and he met, sparks flew. After a heated argument, Cap stormed out of the room and John sank down in the bed, scratching his beard and saying to no one in particular, What a fucking asshole. So much for the meeting of two great minds from the pop culture arena of the late 1960s. 
Despite his well-known public persona as a wise-cracking, freaked-out peace politician, John often used his status and sexual charisma as a weapon to express anger and resentment against those he identified as having hurt him. For example, as I revealed in my book Lenin in America, John had a meaningless fling with Linda McCartney. As the late Harry Nielsen once confided to me during a telephone interview in May 1986, It wasn't Linda John wanted to fuck, it was Paul. He sought a perverse empowerment by adding friends and colleagues' spouses to his long list of sexual conquests, including Mal Evans' wife Lil and even Maureen Starkey in 1967 on a lonely beach in Greece while the Beatles were together on holiday. John's indiscretions were potentially catastrophic to the Beatles' delicate infrastructure. Although it is uncertain how many others ever knew about these liaisons, several people close to him did, including Harry Nielsen, Derek Taylor, Mel Evans, and latter-day Lennon aide in New York, George Spearin. According to Spearin, Lennon revealed the details of two encounters with Linda. John told me not to ever tell anyone, Spearin ventured to me, to this author. John told me not to ever tell anyone, Spearin ventured to this author. But he told so many people, it didn't seem to me as if confidentiality were really too much of an issue. Actually, he seemed rather proud he'd gotten one over on Paul by screwing his old lady. Asked why John would ever risk so much for a quick lay when he was still basking in the glow of his marriage to Yoko Ono, Spirin replied, John told me many times he regretted marrying Yoko within just days of their marriage. Suddenly, he said, in John's mind, the charming, coolly artistic geisha was gone, and in her place stood a bossy, take-no-prisoners, aspiring pop diva. Lennon felt trapped. He'd burned his bridges with Cynthia and Julian, and also strained his partnership with the other Beatles through his relationship with Yoko. His public image had plummeted. He told me Linda was always after him, and even admitted it was him she fancied in the beginning, not McCartney. House in Abbey Road, Spearin confided. The second was in the back of his white Rolls Royce around the corner from EMI Studios in late 1969 during sessions for Abbey Road. The car apparently had a bed in the back, black windows, and very good locks, Spearin chuckled. John told me that one evening as he was watching TV, Linda wordlessly slipped into the back seat and gave him head before Paul even knew she had left the studio. Yoko, John told me, was at home in bed with the flu. How reliable a witness is Spearin? Well, it's true that Lennon sometimes sat in his car between McCartney's long, laborious musical overdubs. His chauffeur, Anthony, would park at a discreet distance from the studio to avoid the hordes of silly young girls who would invariably turn up whenever a real live beetle was sighted. John used to tell me that while he liked Linda well enough for her upfront American personality, he was never really interested in her, despite her constant come-ons. He once told me that he thought Linda was a nymphomaniac and that he'd heard from people around town she once allowed herself to be gang-banged while traveling on the road as a photographer with Cream in 1967. We should remember, of course, that this was the swinging 60s and attitudes towards sex were far more liberal than they are today. Once again, the Beatles trudged back to the studio in July 1969 to wind up their final album, Abbey Road. Although they set aside their acrimony long enough to complete it, the tension between them was at an all-time high. One evening, John, George, and Ringo were gathered at the studio for an important all-night session, but Paul did not appear. Three hours later, John was pacing outside, looking in the direction of the McCartney home. Suddenly, George came out to tell him that Paul was on the phone. Minutes later, John burst out of the studios and raced down the street towards 7 Cavendish Avenue as he flew over the gate and pounded on the front door. Minutes later, John burst out of the studio and raced down the street towards 7 Cavendish Avenue. He flew over the gate and pounded on the front door. As Paul opened it, John shoved him aside and marched directly into the house. "'What the hell do you think you're doing?' yelled Paul, bursting in on Linda and me. "'I told you on the phone I was having a special dinner with Linda. I told you I wasn't coming in tonight.' "'You just decided to fucking blow us off,' roared John. 
You knew long before today that we had this session. You never had any intention of coming in. We all came in from the country to do some tracks, but you didn't even think to pick up the phone and save us a wasted fucking trip. Not to mention the money down the fucking drain for the studio. You've got a lot of bloody nerve, man. Listen, he blazed. I don't cancel fucking bookings for anniversaries with Yoko. Who the fuck do you think you are to inconvenience us in this way? In his rage, Lennon spotted a painting he'd done for Paul hanging on the wall. He yanked it down and stuck his foot through it and then stormed out with a barrage of expletives. A week later, the four Beatles assembled in Lennon's ground floor office at Apple for a late afternoon business meeting. The air was filled with hostility. Finally, Linda, who was pregnant and still outraged over the episode at the house, laid into John about his boorish behavior. In retaliation, he leapt to his feet and charged towards her, fists raised. Paul jumped in between them and physically restrained John. Ringo was appalled and stood mutely to one side, and George, who was embarrassed and wanted no part of the skirmish, moved to the opposite end of the room. Paul grabbed Linda, and they made a swift exit, followed by George and Ringo. It was some four hours later before Lennon, still visibly upset, was seen leaving the building. One of the things that had been taken away from John when he became a Beatle was the pure joy of performing as a musician whenever he felt the urge with whomever he wished to play. On Friday, 12 September 1969, he was in his office at Apple when he received a phone call from Canada inviting him to play solo at the Toronto Rock and Roll Revival. Fortunately for the promoters, he was in just the right state of mind to agree. He summoned Mal Evans into his office to get the ball rolling. Mal remembered, I overheard John saying he'd been asked to appear at a rock and roll show in Toronto. I paused only to grab a handful of leads and a couple of dozen plectrums. Then John mentioned he hadn't gotten anyone to play with. It didn't take long to get a hold of Klaus Vorman and Alan White, Alan Price's ex-drummer. They both immediately agreed. John particularly wanted Eric Clapton to make up the foursome. But we couldn't get a hold of him at home or at any of the clubs. We telephoned until 5.30 a.m. the next day. Our plane was due to take off at 10 a.m., and by 9.15, most of us had arrived at the airport. Then John turned up with Yoko and told us it was all off because they had not been able to reach Eric. Shortly thereafter, we learned that Eric had finally surfaced and would be able to make it. Hertwood Edge in Ewhurst, Surrey, recovering from a night of non-stop partying and hadn't heard the phone. Just before he gave up on his all-night search, Terry Doran, George's personal assistant, sent a telegram to Eric's house. It had been opened by Clapton's gardener, who woke to tell him about the concert. Mal continued, As Eric couldn't make it to the airport, we cancelled our flight and rebooked for the 3.15 p.m. flight from Heathrow. Everyone arrived, everyone being the Lennons, Eric Kloss, Alan White, Anthony Fawcett, John and Yoko's assistant, and Jill and Dan Richter, who have been putting all of John and Yoko's recent activities on film. That's when it hit me. None of these people had ever played together before. John obviously thought about it, too, because he and Eric walked down the aisle to the back of the plane after a quick snack to have their first rehearsal. John, Yoko, Eric, Kloss, and Alan had to work out the songs they were going to perform and also run through them together. A big bundle of sheet music had been delivered to London Airport that morning, and they played through dozens of numbers, pointing out the ones they knew pretty well. They eventually managed to settle on eight, which probably would be okay, provided they got a bit more time to rehearse before they actually went on stage. In the end, the performance was at least a moderate success, and was later released on Apple as Live Peace in Toronto, Plastic Ono Band. Although George Harrison, the quiet, deep-thinking Beatle, was hardly the Beatles' principal heartthrob, he was lusted after by cores of Abbey Road groupies, determined to add him to their list of superstar conquests. This made for many intense rivalries, spearheaded by a fiery Puerto Rican replica of Patty named Alfie. The sultry, aggressive beauty seduced George one night with a bottle of champagne, but it was the founder of the Apple Scruffs, Carol Bedford, a tall, leggy brunette from Texas, who caught George's eye and briefly, in 1969, his heart. 
For several months, he engaged the Texan in long conversations at the studio, at Apple headquarters, even in his car about Eastern philosophy. Mal acted as a go-between, passing notes and messages to Carol about when and where she should meet up with George. At the annual Apple Christmas party, George pulled Carol into a cubicle off the dance floor. He smiled, putting his face close to mine, recalled Bedford. His right hand stroked my left breast and hesitated on the nipple. I'll always be with you, he breathed. We're part of each other. I wrote a song about us the other day. It goes like this. I, I, I love you. You, you love me. We're together always. We're in each other. On another occasion, he arrived unannounced at her Abbey Road flat. He went in and wrapped his arms around her. Then Carol took his hand, and they made their way to her tiny bedroom. He looked very shy, she remembered. I thought he just wanted to hug me as he had when we arrived, but he kissed me. Needless to say, I happily responded. Not long afterwards, Carol received a visit from Evans, who came with a proposal. George, he said, wanted to arrange for her to live in Los Angeles, where he would rent an apartment for her. She pressed him for details. He can't take you to places out here, Mel pointed. He'd like to take you out to restaurants and places, but of course he's married. He explained that George was waiting for the right time to seek a divorce, and until then he could not be seen with other women. Carol, however, had no desire to be a kept woman. I'm no one's mistress, she told Evans brusquely, not even George's. This was great news to Mal, as he then swept her onto his lap and began to kiss her, but she would have none of it, and ordered him out of her flat. Soon afterwards, she put her Beatle days behind her and went on to become a successful record company executive. On December 1, 1969, Ringo Starr gave a most unusual interview to lineup host Terry Bilbo. He talked to him in a tiny rowing boat on the Thames. The sound of the wooden oars hitting on the side of the boat can still be heard on the tape. Although Ringo was meant to be plugging his film The Magic Christian with Peter Sellers, the conversation ranged much more widely, to the bemusement of Bilbo. I really can't believe this is the only planet with anything going on, said Starr. There's a law of averages. There's 50 billion planets in the solar system, but that's only in our solar system. There's millions of other solar systems. It occurs to me that there's got to be somebody else out there. George has a theory where, like Mars, we say there's no one on it, but there is someone on it because it's just in another time dimension we can't see. Also, it's like Earth. There's another race going on here as well, for which time is just slightly different. So where all our houses are, there's other things as well. But in this other time, we're like theirs, so everything is like one thing. There could be a hundred races living on just one planet, which is fantastic. I really think it could be like that, because we don't know much about time in respect to it being different from our time. Starr then talked about the various dimensions possible within the impossible sphere of existence in which we all find ourselves. We know there's three dimensions, and there's theories about a fourth dimension, but there could be fifty dimensions. We're just not bright enough to catch them all. In America, there's a guy who's building a time machine, Ringo continued enthusiastically. You just get in and press a button, open the door, and you're somewhere else. But purely in time, this guy's building it on instructions from another planet. You hear all these weird stories about spaceships landing, UFOs which they keep trying to squash. I mean, how many sightings are there? All of these people can't be wrong. Now this time machine is really being built. I believe it could happen. I can't put it down, but I really think it's possible. This is exactly the kind of charming unpredictability in Ringo and the other Beatles that made him so widely appealing. Certainly Frank Sinatra and Fabian never talked like this. Still, these were the days of consciousness expansion. John Lennon had made up his mind some time ago that the Beatles were over, although he kept the news within the group's inner circle. Mal Evans remembered what happened on 20 December 1969. All of them left the group at one time or another, starting with Ringo, but the real ending was when John came into the office and said, The marriage is over. I want a divorce. That was really the final thing. That's what really got to Paul, because I took him home and I ended up in the garden crying my eyes out. 
Although the collapse of the Apple business empire would legally spark the group's split, the four individuals involved were more than ready to move on, as evidenced by the solo albums they released. George's Wonderwall, Ringo's Sentimental Journey, Paul's McCartney, and John's Freaky Quartet, Unfinished Music, One and Two, The Wedding Album, and the Plastic Ono Band's Live Piece in Toronto. In the old days, Paul and I would knock off an LP together, Lennon has said, but nowadays there's three of us writing equally good songs and needing that much more space on an LP. The problem is, do you spend a good three or four months making an album and maybe we only get two or three tracks each? That's the main problem. Certainly, he was also feeling very stifled. What is there really left to sing about? On Abbey Road, I sing about Mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam, but those are only bits of crap I wrote in India. When I get down to it, I'm only interested in Yoko and peace. I don't write for the Beatles. I write for myself. While the four agreed to keep quiet about the pending split, an awkward situation confronted them concerning Paul's solo album, McCartney. He wanted the release date to be set for April, but Alan Klein blocked this as 17 April was when Let It Be was scheduled for release. Tempers flared and Ringo was sent in to mediate. At Paul's Cavendish Avenue home, Paul finally went over the top. He went completely out of control, prodding his fingers in my face saying, I'll finish you all, you'll pay. He told me to put on my coat and get out. Whether he was wrong or right, I felt that since he was our friend and that date was of such immense significance to him, we should let him have his way. As expected, John was livid, accusing Paul of staging the announcement to coincide with his album release to cash in on the expense of the other three. The Beatles were my fucking band, he said later. I put the band together and I took it apart. Shortly after the split, George Martin said, People talk about the breakup of the group as though it was a tragedy, which is nonsense. They don't say it's as expected John was livid, accusing Paul of staging the announcement to coincide with his album release, to cash in at the expense of the other three. The Beatles were my fucking band, he said later. I put the band together and I took it apart. Shortly after the split, George Martin said, people talk about the breakup of the group as though it was a real tragedy, which is nonsense. Look, it's amazing to me, human nature being what it is, that they didn't break up earlier under the strain of superstardom. They were living in a golden prison all the time and not growing into individual lives. Now they're living as individuals and enjoying it. And I say, good luck to them. In the face of the public shock and outcry, John downplayed the whole Beatles phenomena. Whatever wind was blowing at the time moved the Beatles too. I'm not saying we weren't flags on the top of the ship, but the whole boat was moving. Maybe the Beatles were in the crow's nest shouting, Land Ho! or something like that, but we were all in the same boat. Most significantly, the breakup of the Beatles marked the end of the Lennon-McCartney partnership. The blow of their professional severance notwithstanding, it was perhaps even sadder on a personal level. The friendship of the young men, who had bonded together through music and the loss of their mothers, had ruptured into bitterness and acrimony. At the time of their split, the Beatles had sold over $200 million worth of records worldwide. They earned Grammys, Oscars, Novellos. They'd been film stars and filmmakers. They'd gone from being teenage heartthrobs to MBEs, and their music had been hailed as the best since Beethoven's. It was no surprise that they were eager to get on with their separate lives. What more could they ever accomplish together? And yet, although they had found other partners, and each would work with a succession of talented new collaborators, none would recreate the magic that was the Beatles. This was, after all, a partnership for the ages. Chapter 9. Heads Across the Sky. New York, Los Angeles, and London. 1970-1979. All I'm doing is acting out the part of Beatle George. You just do what you can. Even if it's been a beetle for the rest of my life, it's still only a temporary thing. We're all just characters in the same play, aren't we? And he's writing the script up there. George Harrison, 1970. In January 1970, 
John was perhaps hoping to impress his wife with his love of children, and so produced an audio tape of her daughter Kayoko singing and storytelling. By the spring of 1970, the Lennons' marriage had become so fragile that they agreed to undergo primal therapy as described in The Primal Scream. Psychotherapist Arthur Jonoff's basic premise centered on revealing the repressed fears and pain of childhood by reliving those experiences and thereby exercise them by engaging in a primal scream. After undergoing several sessions at home in England in April, the Lennons flew to Janoff's Primal Institute in Bel Air, California, for four months' intense counseling. In an unheard tape made during the therapy, Yoko was clearly frustrated and disillusioned. To her it seemed to be doing more harm than good. According to Ono, Janoff blamed John's secret battle with impotence on her because she treated her husband like a big baby. She even suggested that the program might have been responsible for perpetrating John's innate chauvinism and blatant inconsideration of his wife, society from which she can only escape by becoming butch. I'd rather be a bachelor, she declared on the tape. I refuse to be a woman in the sense of what society expects. If that's being a lesbian, then society is making me one. I have the choice of becoming an incredibly neurotic masochist who doesn't accept women or becoming a normal person who doesn't accept these masochistic traits. If I am frigid from the treatment of society, then society is responsible. What seemed to be a relevant factor in her distress was her resentment of John's near-mythical hero-like status. Even Janoff had fallen under the spell of the John Lennon fantasy, as she termed it. On the tape, she complains that while John can compose a song that sells itself, her own projects, which required a more intensive marketing effort, are all but ignored. The fact is, Yoko was concerned that primal therapy might encourage Lennon's bad behavior rather than curb it, and that her husband was enjoying the shrieking, weeping, and rolling on the floor that hallmarked the treatment. Later, John categorized primal therapy as the ultimate fix. On 10 April 1970, newspapers around the world reported that Paul McCartney had declared the Beatles would never work together again. Almost the entire youth population of the world was in shock. A week later, the contentious solo McCartney album was to be released over the strong objections of the other three. George recalled the controversy. As a director of Apple, Ringo had to sign a letter he wrote with John ordering Paul not to release the McCartney album on a day which would conflict with the issuance of the next Beatle LP, Let It Be. When the letter was finished, Ringo volunteered to deliver it as he didn't want Paul to suffer the indignity of having it handed to him by some impersonal messenger. He gave the letter to him and said, I agree with it. Then he had to stand there while both Paul and Linda screamed at him. When he finally returned, he was so drained his face was white. The point is, we're writing too much to put it all on one Beatles record anyway. Later that same day, George spoke to Paul from Apple. It was not a happy conversation. He came on like Attila the Hun. I had to hold the receiver away from my ear. I don't want to say anything bad about Paul, he laughed, but I can be egged on. On the very last day of the year, McCartney filed a lawsuit in the London High Court seeking dissolution of the partnership of the Beatles and Company and the appointment of a receiver to handle the group's ongoing business affairs. While the world was devastated by the Beatles' split, insiders like Alistair Taylor were really not all that surprised. If you weren't there, you can't begin to understand the pressure. I don't give a damn how many books you've read or people you interview. I can't convey to you what it was like. I was close to them, and even I was under pressure, and I was not remotely in their league. It was unbearable, and they just had to do something. Imagine, you can't walk down the street. You can't get out of a car. You can't do anything without being torn to shreds day in, day out, night in, night out, year after year. The extended dissolution of the Beatles' partnership snaked slowly into 1971. On 19 January, the case came before the court but was adjourned for some 30 days. McCartney, hidden behind a beard, appeared on 26 February to testify. The others were heard only via written affidavit. By 12 March, the judge ruled in Paul's favor. 
At the end of April, Lenin, Harrison, and Starr abandoned their plans to appeal against the decision, and a receiver was appointed to control the finances of their publishing firm, Macklin Music. He would act in that capacity until 31 December 1974. Signifying an end of an era, the official Beatles fan club closed its doors forever on 31 March 1972. Exactly a year later, the Beatles' management contract with Klein expired. Suffice to say, it was never renewed. To no one's surprise, on 2 November, Lennon, Harrison, and Starr sued Klein and his Abco company, claiming gross misrepresentation. Klein countersued. From there, the Ritz flew back and forth, eventually culminating in a settlement with the final dissolution of the Beatles' partnership on 9 January 1975. During the summer of 1971, Jim and Angela McCartney, along with Ruth, drove up from Campbelltown to visit Paul and Linda at High Park Farm on the Mull of Kintyre. Following the 12-hour drive, they were unceremoniously ushered into a garage for the night. Jim and Angela had a mattress on the concrete floor, while Ruth had a makeshift bunk bed and the blanket that belonged to Jim's racehorse, Drake's Drum. Dinner with Paul and Linda was likewise an adventure in roughing it, as Angela explained. One night we were all having dinner under a glass skylight, and several flies buzzed around and fell into the milk jug. Jim, who was very fastidious, suggested getting some fly killer, to which Linda replied, Oh, don't be so fussy, Jim. They're all God's creatures. The McCartneys were notorious, too, for their odd eating hours and Spartan fare, often leaving family and friends to fend for themselves. Angela was forced to stock up on chocolate, hiding behind the barn to eat it. Paul and Linda's brand of light hospitality was well documented by many visitors to the farm, including members of his own band, Wings. Another day, Paul and the heavily pregnant Linda took Angela and Ruth for a walk across the fields. Another day, Paul and the heavily pregnant Linda took Angela and Ruth for a walk across the fields. Toddler Mary was wrapped inside Paul's jacket as her parents smoked a joint, passing it from one to the other. Then Linda put it to Mary's lips and jokingly cooed, Come on, baby, come on, puff for mummy. Around this time, during the recording in Manchester of the album Paul made with his brother, which was backed by his newly formed band Wings and entitled McGear, the McCartneys came to stay at Rembrandt for some three months. A typical day in the life of the McCartneys went something like this. Paul and Linda would get home from late-night recording sessions during the small hours and scurry into the children's room, waking them up. Hi, we're home, Linda would bellow. Hugs and kisses for Mom. Mommy loves you. Then in the next breath, now go back to sleep. Angela was often expected to look after Heather, Mary, and Stella until Linda got up around two o'clock in the afternoon. On one occasion, Linda made bacon and eggs, brought the frying pan into the living room, and dropped it on the carpet. They would leave wet towels on the bed, soiled nappies, dirty underwear, and dog shit on the floor for Angela to clean up. They were pigs, stated Ruth quite simply. The children enjoyed playing in the master bedroom, which Angela had redecorated in white. One afternoon, Angela went in to find them drawing with crayons all over the wallpaper and furniture. Hey, girls, you mustn't do this, she admonished them. I'll get you some coloring books and paper to draw on. The children enjoyed playing in the master bedroom, which Angela had redecorated in white. One afternoon, Angela went in to find them drawing with crayons all over the wallpaper and furniture. Hey, girls, you mustn't do this, she admonished them. I'll get you some coloring books and paper to draw on. At that point, Linda charged in, Oh, Ange, let them be. I'll buy you more furniture if you really want it. Don't inhibit them. You're always saying, Don't do this. Don't do that. You're going to give them a complex. Just let them be. The privacy-obsessed Linda apparently thought nothing of freely intruding upon others. Angela liked to keep her diary and handbag in the kitchen drawer. One morning, Linda popped into the kitchen and breezily announced, Hey, Ange, I see you're due to start your period today. I beg your pardon, Angela murmured, shocked. Oh, yeah, I was reading your diary last night. There's some pretty interesting stuff in there. From then on, Jim's wife locked her personal possessions in her bedroom. Angela could never really relax, says Jim McCartney's wife. Despite her best efforts, she could never win. 
She once accepted a ticket to an early wing show, not imagining that she would have to seek approval for such an outing from her stepson. When she returned home that night, she overheard Jim on the phone, No, son, I'm not going to get rid of her. She's a good woman, and I love her. You can't tell me to do that. I'm old. I'm ill. She takes care of me. No, son, I won't do it. Then he told his wife, Paul's really mad because you went to that show and hadn't been invited. Why on earth was Paul McCartney so threatened by the woman who had given his father so much happiness and stability? In late 1971, Paul and Linda were up at the farm in Scotland. One evening, Jim telephoned them. Heather answered and told them that her parents were out in the field, adding, I think they've had a fight. The following day, Jim rang again. This time he spoke to Linda, whose voice was taunt and drained. Paul's not here. As a matter of fact, he's been gone a couple of days. I don't know where he is. She asked him to let her know if Paul called him. Three days later, McCartney turned up at Rembrandt, looking rough and unshaven. He muttered a quick hello and walked past his stepmother, looking very guilty. Later that day, Linda rang and Paul took the call upstairs. He had a long conversation with his father, then informed the family that his wife was coming the very next day with Mary and Stella. Linda duly arrived with the children, two large dogs, and tons of luggage. When she came to the door, Angela told this author, she looked just awful, shocking. I put my arms around her and said, you poor little thing, and we both cried. She said she was all right and let's just forget about it. Obviously, I wouldn't dream of asking her any questions. What the hell it was all about, I will never know. But when people malign Linda, I always say, look, her life can't be easy. She was up there bewildered and alone with the kids in such a remote place. It's unbelievable, really. By the mid-1970s, Ruth was now in her teens and started dating. The young men would arrive at the McCartney home, and if Paul was around, they would often be subjected to an intense interrogation. By the mid-70s, Ruth, now in her teens, started dating. The young men would arrive at the McCartney home, and if Paul was around, they were often subjected to a rather intense interrogation. On one such occasion, he said to a boy, "'Now, son, just what are your intentions towards my sister? Look, you lay a hand on her, mate, and I tell you, the poor guy, Ruth said. We went to the fairground, and he threw up. In 1975, Ruth, now 15, was attending stage school and developing into a gifted dancer and choreographer. Mike McGeer had co-written a song with Paul called Dance the Do, which was about to be released as a single. It came out on 4 July and showcased on a special for Granada Television. Ruth showed him a routine she'd worked up using Russian Cossack moves. Hey, that looks like fun, he said. Let me talk to the producers about using your idea. They decided to go ahead with Ruth as the lead dancer, a coup that meant she would be eligible for an equity card and her first professional fee of 50 pounds. Ruth entered the secret code on the iron gates and went inside the house. Linda was upstairs, but Paul met her in the corridor between the kitchen and the dining room. Ruth was unprepared for what happened next. Instead of congratulating her, an angry McCartney put her straight on the reality of the situation as he saw it. That Granada was using her and Mike because they wanted Paul to appear on one of their shows. Pointing out that she was just a kid, he insisted that she only got the job because of him. Ruth raced out of the house, tears streaming down her face, her profound upset increased by having to run the gauntlet of fans hanging around outside. Her stepbrother had succeeded in stripping her of her fragile self-confidence. It was only when Mike told her that she shouldn't let Paul get the better of her that she was persuaded to go ahead with the show. McCartney's conflicted attitude towards his family wasn't restricted to his stepsister. When Angela's sister May died suddenly, her friends were invited to the house to support her. As it happened, that day Paul and Linda were heading up to Liverpool. One of the Beatles' iron rules was, no guests when we come to visit. When they arrived to find the others gathered there, Paul exploded to Angela. Listen, this is my fucking house. Don't ever forget, I put every fucking crumb of food into your mouth and your kid. If it wasn't for me, you'd be out on the bloody street. When Auntie Millie intervened, Paul lashed out. You keep out of it, Millie. This is my fucking place. I paid for it, and I feed them all. So shut the fuck up. 
In the mid-70s, Jim was unable to afford the upkeep on Rembrandt, which he sold back to Paul and settled into a bungalow on Beverly Drive, half a mile away. By now, Jim suffered from crippling arthritis, and his health was rapidly deteriorating. Even when Jim's family was no longer at Rembrandt, Linda and Paul made it their first stop whenever they came into town. The first thing they did, says Angela, was come over to his dad's to pick up the keys and some milk. Linda would then go into my freezer and take things. Oh, you've got those little chicken pies. I'll take some of those if you don't mind, Ange. The next day, Linda would invariably ring up and say, We're leaving. You can come round and clean up now. Angela had no option but to pick up the rubbish and strip the beds. More often than not, she'd find the frozen foods melted, still in the plastic bag. As 1976 unfolded, Jim McCartney became something of a recluse, not caring to go out or invite anyone to the house. During his final weeks, he told his wife, I'm a creaking gate. Promise me you'll never let me finish up in a hospital bed. If I look up and see a sea of faces looking down at me, I'll hate it. So promise me, please, that when the end is near, you'll let me die peacefully in my own bed. No sooner had he said this than his sister-in-law Joan, married to his brother Joe, appeared on the doorstep, suitcase in hand. Hi, Anne, she announced and barged in. Millie, Jin, and I have worked it all out. We're going to take turns staying with Jim to give you a hand. Although Angela certainly knew they meant well, she resented them taking over in her own home, telling her how to look after her husband and mostly ignoring Jim's wishes. She told Joan tactfully, I appreciate your motives, I really do, but I don't want you to stay every night and give him the idea that he's not got much longer and that the family is starting to gather round the bed. Let's play this the way Jim would want it. Believe me, everybody's welcome, but please, only one at a time. Nevertheless, during the final weeks of his long illness when he was lapsing in and out of consciousness, Jim was admitted to a nearby hospital for tests. Paul helped lift his father into the car and drove him to the hospital. There he gathered Jim into a wheelchair, pushed him up to his room, and helped him into bed. They were both very tender, emotional, and tearful with each other, Angela recalled. We all had to leave so that they could begin the tests, and Paul and Linda had to get ready for their flight. As we drove home, both of us were very quiet all the way. I remember just outside the house, Paul squeezed my hand and said, I'll never forget what you've done for my dad. Once inside, Angela retreated to the kitchen to cook breakfast. Paul went into the dining room, sat down at the piano, and the long and winding road wafted through the house. Angela and Ruth were overcome with emotion. Jim used to say how much he loved that song and how it reminded him of the drive up to Scotland. To this day, when I hear that song, it upsets me because it reminds me so much of my poor Jim. Five days before Jim's death, Cynthia Lennon called in to see him, and family friend Billy Hatton of the foremost as well. Paul spent a lot of time alone with his father, then Linda and the grandchildren came in to kiss him. On 18 March 1976, Jim McCartney died at home from complications of arthritis. After he had drawn his last breath, Mike's little daughter Abby said, Look, Poppy's stopped. Angela immediately rang Paul, who was at a press conference at the Royal Garden Hotel, to promote his forthcoming tour with Wings. Are you sure, he said. All right, I'll call you later. I'm in the middle of this thing here. And went back to finish the conference as if nothing had happened. Other than Mike, no one in the family came to the house. The clan was freezing Angela out, probably because they felt they had been shut out of Jim's final days. Still, Angela was determined to rise above such pettiness and offer Jim's brother Joe something belonging to his brother as a keepsake, like a scarf or an umbrella. No sooner had she put down the phone than Joan arrived with Millie's huge blue suitcase to raid Jim's wardrobe. That night, Mike convinced Angela and Ruth to call in on Millie. "'What are you doing here?' Millie snorted. "'I don't want anything to do with you.' and I'm not coming to the funeral. Other friends remonstrated. Please, Millie, the poor woman just lost her husband. But Millie hissed. She wouldn't let us near him when he was dying. No family, 
Not even Paul, who was rehearsing in Paris for the Wings Over America tour, came to Jim's funeral. However, Paul issued Angela with specific instructions. Do some nice flowers from me and Linda and little posies from the children. To make matters worse, the notorious British press painted Angela as having married Jim only for his money. During the funeral, she spotted an old friend and was caught by a photographer in a smile of surprise. It was published in the Liverpool Echo, bearing the caption, Angela McCartney smiling at her husband's funeral. To offset the day's disheartening events, a beautiful bouquet arrived from George Harrison and Ringo Starr. Also enclosed was a generous check for arthritis research. Thinking of you too, Ange and Ruth, love George and Ringo. It was only later that night when Angela switched on the radio and heard Mike McGear singing The Casket that she collapsed in grief. As quickly as Angela and Ruth entered the family some twelve years before, they were abruptly cut off. The annual allowance Paul paid to his father due in April did not arrive. When Angela swallowed her pride and offered to help Linda with some bookkeeping, Linda was amazed at their situation and immediately wrote them a check for £3,000. In a desperate attempt to make ends meet, Angela and Ruth formed a management agency with pop singer Gary Glitter as their main client. A series of disastrous business decisions followed, and Angela had to sell their bungalow for considerably less than it was worth. Later, they were evicted from their small flat and forced to live in an empty office building in King's Lynn near Cambridge, sleeping on the floor. Eventually, Angela had to apply for help from social services. When she handed in her papers, the clerk spotted the signature and asked, "'Well, aren't you Paul McCartney's stepmother? Why isn't he helping you?' Angela replied curtly, "'Because he apparently chooses not to.'" With no other option, Angela and Ruth sold off their prized personal mementos, such as tickets to Beatle premieres, gold discs, autographed concert programs, all of which Angela inherited on Jim's death. Angela also sold Paul McCartney's birth certificate, which exploded into a media nightmare and infuriated McCartney. By 1972, Maureen Starkey was deeply disillusioned with her husband's lifestyle and the constant demands and disappointments of being married to someone so famous. She had been in love when she married Richie and remained so for several years. Now, rightly or wrongly, she was sure Richie was seeing other women, so there was no reason why she shouldn't find someone else herself. Her affair with George Harrison was over, and she was restless, unhappy, and insecure. Unsure whether to end the marriage, take the children and move on, or stay and live her own life, she drifted from day to day, drawing and taking photographs. Ringo was, of course, generous, allowing his family carte blanche to buy whatever they wanted, but it was not enough. For several months, Starr had been working on an ambitious documentary about the career of his close friend, T-Rex star Mark Bolin. Filming for which started on 18 March, Maureen was the project's unofficial still photographer and soon developed a sisterly relationship with the dark-haired glam rocker. For his part, Ringo was not only producing and directing the film, Born to Boogie, but also intimately involved with the editing. In a bid to relax, he partied with the crew, which isolated Maureen even further from him. According to a family friend and co-worker, one evening, Bolin rang the house, needing to discuss something with Starr. He was out, so Mark and Maureen chatted together for a couple of hours and then agreed to meet at the Dorchester for drinks the following evening. Maureen arrived at around seven and met Bolin in the bar. Hey, Mo, he said and embraced her. Let's get a drink. Two hours and several champagne cocktails later, he got up and led her out to the parking lot where he kissed her. Maureen reciprocated. Within the hour, they were at Bolin's place making love. At just after two, Maureen dressed and drove home to her three children. The next time Maureen saw Bolin was at the London premiere of Born to Boogie on 18 December. Hugs and kisses were exchanged all round, and Bolin said nothing about their night of passion. In fact, he spent the evening talking to Ringo and Mal Evans. 
Maureen was relieved. She had worried that Starr might spot the attraction between her and Bolin. In 1977, Mark Bolin died in a car accident. Both Ringo and Maureen attended the funeral. When John and Yoko moved to the USA in September 1971, they continued their flirtation with left-wing politics. In a 1973 letter to a magazine, they aired their grievances against the rumors that the Beatles might reunite. Entitled, News That We Can Do Without, the piece was written in John's hallmark, through the looking glass style. Although John Yoko and George and George and Ringo had played together often, it was the first time the three ex-Beatles had played together since they last played together. As usual, an awful lot of rumors, if not downright lies, were going on, including the possibility of empresario Alan D. Klein or Abco playing bass for the other three in an as-of-yet untitled album called I Was a Teenage Fat Cat. Producer Richard Perry, who planned to take the tapes along to sell them to Paul McCartney, told a friend, I'll take the tapes to Paul McCartney. The extreme humility that existed between John and Paul seems to have evaporated. They've spoken to each other on the telephone and in English. That's a change, said a McCartney associate. If only everything were as simple and unaffected as McCartney's new single, My Love, then maybe Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis would be reunited with the Marx Brothers and Newsweek could get a job. Yours up to the teeth, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. During the 1970s, assembling three Beatles in a room was a formidable task, but the circumstances in March 1973 forced a meeting. John, George, and Ringo met in the Grand Capitol Records Tower in Hollywood to discuss the Beatles' latest release. The compilation, to be titled The Best of the Beatles, was separated into two albums, which bore the uninspired names 1962, 1966, and 1967, 1970, and would later be known simply as the Red and Blue Albums. They had been generated as response to the forthcoming bootleg release, Alpha Omega, which within weeks would be blatantly advertised for sale on American TV. The three men had come to discuss the album's postponement. All four Beatles, especially Lennon and McCartney, disliked the hastily assembled track selection and quick mixes. Unfortunately, thousands of copies of the albums had already been shipped to warehouses and were awaiting distribution. They accompanied Precious Little during their meeting, but John and Ringo later attended a screening of Last Tango in Paris, starring Marlon Brando. With them was Richard Perry, Ringo's record producer. George had already seen it. Starr had already begun recording his Ringo album at Sunset Sound Recorders Studios in Los Angeles. After his arrival there, Harrison dropped in to observe the proceedings. I'm knocked out by what you've done, he said enthusiastically after listening to several tracks and offered to play on the album. He returned for the next day's session, adding backing vocals behind Ringo's lead. The next day, 13 March, John and Yoko appeared. Three of the Beatles were reunited in a studio. Harrison contributed a song, Sunshine Life for Me, Sail Away Raymond, and John brought I'm the Greatest, which he had intended for Imagine, but dropped from the final selection, fearing that it was based on the famous Muhammad Ali line. However, he viewed it as a perfect vehicle for Ringo, and changed the lyrics slightly to suit his old friend. At this point, the Beatles were on much friendlier terms. I've talked to Ringo a lot recently, said Lennon, because he's just moved into my house in Ascot, which is nice because I've always got a bedroom there. I haven't talked to Paul since before he did that last tour with Wings. I heard Red Rose Speedway, and it was all right. Richard Perry recalled that the session with John, George, and Ringo appeared just like that. With no planning, the three ex-Beatles recorded one of John's songs. Everyone in the room was just gleaming. It was such a universal gleam being with the Beatles. A high-quality tape of the song circulating amongst collectors runs at just over 18 minutes and features numerous false starts with Lennon trying in vain to determine a definite tempo. 
In addition to these complete takes, later that year John recalled, The three of us were there, and Paul would probably have joined us if he were around, but he wasn't. I got a call from Ringo asking me to write a track, so I did. It seemed the natural thing to do. For the track, I was on piano, Billy Preston on organ, Ringo drums, George on guitar, and Klaus Vorman on bass. Also present was keyboardist Nicky Hopkins, who was quick to downplay rumors of a Beatles reunion when news of the sessions leaked to the media. All it was was the people turning up, which happened many times before in England. For example, Ringo worked on George's upcoming album, and Harrison helped out on my own forthcoming LP. McCartney, meanwhile, made his contribution to Starr's project back in London. The others did some tracks in Los Angeles, and then the material was brought over for me. I worked on a track called Six O'Clock, so in a way, there's been some... Well, I'm happy to play with the other three, and I'm sure they are too, if it's physically possible. But more important for me is Wings, because I really get turned on by new ideas. Although this was to remain the very last collaboration between all four Beatles on one new album, they were still open to the possibility of future projects. There's always a chance, John said. As far as I can gather from talking to them, nobody would mind doing some work together again. There's no law that says we're not going to do something, and no law that says that we are. If we did something, I'm sure it wouldn't be permanent. We'd do it just for the moment. We're closer now than we've been for a long time. By March 1974, the stage was set for what would become a final, short-lived Lennon-McCartney reunion. It had taken four years for the deepest wounds to heal, as John put it, after all the infighting in the press and sometimes not-so-subtle attacks on each other in their solo music. Calling for a Beatles reunion at this point was wildly premature, but nonetheless, three-quarters of the former group somehow found themselves together in Los Angeles. John had recently become estranged from Yoko and fled with his lover May Pang to confront his self-destructive tendencies during what he called his lost weekend. He stayed briefly at the home of record executive Harold Cedars, where Starr reintroduced him to Harry Nielsen. In 1968, John playfully named Nielsen his favorite American group. Nielsen had become a friend when his Beatles melody, based on You Can't Do That, was first brought to the attention of Derek Taylor in 1967. While John was in L.A., Nielsen encouraged his alcohol-fueled antics, which rose to a climax on 12 March when the pair were thrown out of the Troubadour Club for heckling the Smothers Brothers. While he was escorted to his car, John said to a parking attendant, Don't you know who I am? I'm Ed fucking Sullivan. It was clear that the Lennon-Nielsen act needed a creative outlet. And fortunately, John realized this. His current rock and roll oldies project had ground to a halt when the album's eccentric producer, Phil Spector, disappeared with the session tapes. When John rented a luxury beach house in Santa Monica with May Pang, it quickly became a popular rendezvous for musicians and celebrities alike. Amongst those participating in the regular Sunday night sessions were Nielsen, Ringo, Keith Moon, and Klaus Vorman. John came up with the idea of producing a Nielsen album, focusing on covers of their favorite songs. He had written a new song, Mucho Mungo, which he knew would suit Nielsen's vocal style. Nielsen, though, was having problems. He'd lost his voice. I don't know whether it was psychological or what, Lennon recalled. He was going to doctors and having injections, and he didn't tell me until later that he was bleeding in the throat, or I would have stopped the sessions immediately. But he had no voice, so what do you do? May Pang concurred with his assessment of Nielsen's health. He lost his voice in early 1974, just before working on Pussycats. He'd get acupuncture during the day and would drink and abuse himself by night. He hemorrhaged in his throat and didn't tell anyone. I don't think his voice was ever back to the greatness he had, but it was close. Harry always lived close to the edge. As the decade unraveled, Harrison steadfastly put his Beatle days behind him and got on with life, renovating Friar Park, writing and producing his own music, and of course chanting Hare Krishna. 
By late 1974, his well-known Krishna consciousness aspirations had led to a serious collaboration with Ravi Shankar on an album of Indian classical music with just a touch of pop, rock, and fusion. Entitled Shankar Family and Friends, here was the popular beginning of New Age world music, the creation of which was, in large part, due to George. The LP's only single, I Am Missing You, Krishna Where Are You, failed to register on the charts, as did the album, but served as one of the anthems for Harrison's musically controversial 1974 Dark Horse Tour, as well as attracting praise from Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada himself. In the late 1970s, Harrison received a call from his old friend, the musician Gary Wright, who invited him down to his villa in Portugal for a few days. George accepted, jumped into his Mercedes, and took off through the front gates. George Harrison's deep faith was to sustain him in the best and worst of times in his life. By the end of 1975, the Beatles' devoted minder Mal Evans, now aged 40, was pretty much a broken figure, lost in the fading afterglow of the most famous band in history. Since the group split, he'd worked on and off for all of the Beatles, assisting on sessions and running errands. But it was mainly George Harrison who went out of his way to find work for him, even appointing him to oversee daily operations at Friar Park. He had most recently given Mal a small role in 1974's Little Malcolm and His Struggle Against the Eunuchs, his first film, which was based on the 1965 David Halliwell stage comedy. Evans also co-wrote a song with Bobby Purvis, which was to be used in the movie Lonely Man and performed by Splinter, a two-man group he had discovered and signed to George's Dark Horse Records. Evans also discovered Badfinger in a Swansea pub. They were then known as the Ivies. The film was a disappointing adaptation of the play and never went further than a few festival showings, and Splinter, despite George's involvement, went down as a mere footnote in pop history. Essentially, since 1970, Evans had been abandoned by his erstwhile employers and moved to Los Angeles. He was reduced to scratching around in the record industry for meager freelance production jobs for which he was ill-qualified. On the surface, he seemed much the same, telling friends he had many big-time irons in the fire, spreading the word that he was producing the group Natural Gas, fronted by Badfinger guitarist Joey Molland, which he proclaimed as the next big thing. At Beatle conventions, he was often the key speaker and enjoyed cult status amongst hardcore fans. On the dais, he could relive the glory years, and it was painfully clear that he had never moved on. It's like being a Beatle for a weekend, he gushed to fans. The Beatles are my favorite subject. I could live on it. It's better than food and drink. I keep in touch with all of the Beatles, and we reminisce about the past. It's like, let's go down memory lane together every time we meet. George and Ringo were in town very recently, and we went over a few times and hung out. I was just speaking to Paul, who was in town over the weekend. I shared the Beatles as a whole entity. I also shared trips with them individually. It's always, hey, remember this, remember that? Oh, it's nice. But in truth, contact between the four Beatles and Evans was minimal. He was no longer an integral member of their circle, and it deeply hurt. Soon there were disturbing signs that he was heading for a breakdown, even as he boasted on L.A. radio about his big-time publishing company, Malcontent Music. He was forced to admit that his client list consisted of only me. One comment was particularly revealing. I've never had to do anything for myself in the past. Working for a Beatle was always doing something for somebody else. I can always cope with somebody else's problems, but doing it for yourself is a bit difficult. His personal life, too, was increasingly shaky. His longtime wife, Lil, was talking of divorce just before Christmas. As America's overblown bicentennial year opened, he was finishing his memoirs for the publishing giant Grosset and Dunlop. The working title was Living the Beatles Legend, although he wanted to call it 200 Miles to Go, signifying the distance from Liverpool to London. The book at the moment is my whole life, he said. I want all four Beatles to love it. My life's dream will be realized if they want to ring me and say, I love what you're doing. I'd never put you down, Starr said. 
But look, if you don't tell the truth, there's no use in doing it. You, Mal, of all people, have got to tell it like it was. Earlier that year, Evans had obtained written permission from all four of them to use their names in the book. Lennon wrote to him, I've been dying to read your diary for the last thousand years. Make a buck, but don't buck it. And Paul said, Sure you can do your book, as long as you tell him how lovely I am. He signed off, You great big poofter. Interestingly, the other two Beatles took a much more formal approach. Harrison's reply led like a legal brief. This is to confirm our conversation that you have my approval to use my name and likeness in relation to your forthcoming project. Starr, despite his advice to Evans to tell the truth, was the only one of the four to express concern about the content. I wish you great success with it, he wrote. I would, however, like to read the book before it's published. What might have he been worried about, and what unhappy truths might Evan have exposed? The end of the project, however, had a devastating impact on Evans. In writing about those years, Mal could keep his treasured memories alive, but the final draft closed the chapter of his life and really kicked in. Once the former Liverpool telecommunications worker had jet-setted around the world with the biggest musical sensation of the 20th century, he'd acted in films, held a prestigious job at Apple Corps, and lived on lavish expense accounts. Now he was existing in virtual obscurity, scraping by, too proud to ask his former employers for help. It was as if putting the final touches on the book took away his purpose in life. Like so many others cast adrift in the entertainment industry, Evans eventually turned to barbiturates, alcohol and dope, to escape the pain of obscurity. Observers noted that when he was drunk he often griped, No one loves me for me. It's only because I work for those bloody beetles. A lot of people try to use you, but every now and again I meet someone who likes me for myself, and it makes it all worthwhile. On the night of Sunday, 4 January, 1976, a deeply despondent Evans at home in his motel apartment at 8122 West 4th Street in L.A. snapped. First, he phoned his writing collaborator, John Hornerly, imploring him and editorial assistant, Joanne Leonard, to make certain the manuscript was delivered by its 12 January deadline. Hornerly rushed over to attempt to calm him, but was apparently unable to do so. They went to a bedroom where Evans picked up a thirty thirty rifle, which Hornerly later insisted was unloaded. They scuffled over it, but Hornerly, only half Evans' size, was unable to take it from him. Evans' live-in girlfriend, Francine Hughes, rang the police and told them, My old man has a gun. He's taken Valium, and it's totally screwed up. Next, Evans allegedly ordered Hughes and her young daughter out of the apartment at gunpoint. Shortly thereafter, four police officers arrived. David D. Crampa and Robert E. Brannan cautiously went upstairs. Mal was reportedly clutching the lever-action rifle as the police surrounded his home. Telephone records indicate that he made two calls during the standoff, one to an unknown L.A. exchange and the other, lasting just under a minute, to John Lennon's apartment at the Dakota in New York. That call, a possible distress signal that might have proved pivotal in the outcome, was apparently not put through to John. "'Police officers!' came the shout from the hallway. Give yourself up. No, Evans screamed. I'm not coming out. You'll have to blow my fucking head off. The officers kicked in the door and stormed the room. Drop the gun, they demanded. Evans on the bed, cornered and desperate, leveled the barrel at the police. They had no choice. Four shots rang out. One hit the side of Evans' nose, another his lower leg. Lieutenant Charles Higby of L.A.'s Robbery and Homicide Division then fired two fatal shots to the chest, dropping him to the floor in a shower of blood and bone. The police claimed that Evans' weapon was loaded with five rounds of ammunition, one all ready to go in the firing chamber. In a drunken stupor, Evans became uncontrollably violent, attempted suicide, then pointed the rifle at an officer who shot him six times in self-defense four bullets hitting him. Some accounts even insist that Mel was brandishing only a harmless air pistol. 
The following day, Francine Hughes sought refuge at Harry Nielsen's home. She blamed herself for the tragedy, saying Mal had been drinking heavily. He probably doesn't even know he's dead wherever he's at, she groaned. In the aftermath, Francine's claim that Evans had been drinking and flipped out on drugs was disputed by the post-mortem, which showed the alcohol levels consistent with one drink and a moderate amount of Valium. It has been suggested that Evans goaded the L.A. police into suicide by cop. If Brian Epstein was the fifth Beatle, Evans' lawyer John Mason said, then Mal was the sixth. Evans' body was cremated in Los Angeles on 7 January. Harry Nielsen and several other close friends attended. Later, Paul blamed Francine Hughes for Evans' death because she had panicked and called the police. Mal got shot by the L.A. police. It was so crazy, so fucking crazy. Mal was a big, lovable bear of a roadie. He'd go over the top occasionally, but we all knew him, and we never had any problems. The LAPD weren't so fortunate, however. They were just told he was upstairs with a shotgun. They ran up, kicked the door in, and shot him. His girlfriend told them, he's upstairs, he's a bit moody, he's got a shotgun and some downers. Had I been there, I would have been able to say, Mal, come on, now don't be silly. In fact, any of his friends could have talked him out of it without any sweat because he was not a nutter. But his girlfriend, she was an L.A. girl, didn't really know him very well. She should not have rung the cops, but that's the way it goes, I guess. A thump on the door. Where is he? Where's the assailant? Bang, 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 bang. They don't ask questions in Los Angeles. They shoot first. The final insult was that Evans' ashes were lost on their way home to Britain. John quipped to Peter Brown that Mal's remains probably ended up in the dead letter office of the post office. Although it was said John exploded into hysterical laughter when he first heard of Evans' demise, Harry Nielsen claimed that John later broke down in tears as he had when he heard of his mother and Stuart Stutcliffe's death. His off-the-cuff verbal reaction to the news said it all. Jesus, man, my God, America is so fucking quick with the gun. Mal had no real life after the Beatles. He had no art to fall back on, no real future as a producer or anything. But he was the perfect fucking roadie, and he was my friend. When he was shot, murdered by the cops, I felt like smashing my fist through a fucking goddamn window or something. Mal was the last fucker to ever hurt anyone, even though he certainly could have had he'd been so moved. He was a gentle giant. His heart was as big as the man. I'd seen him in L.A. towards the end, but every time I asked him, he just said he was okay. Obviously, we know now he wasn't. But what are you going to do? He stayed with me for a while in a madhouse I had at the beach with Keith Moon, Harry Nielsen, and Klaus Vorman. He was a very proud guy. He wouldn't take any money from us, so we'd all try to find odd jobs for him after the split. Still, it wasn't the same as being an important cog in a famous functioning group. He was alone, even though he had a so-called girlfriend. I'm sure it must have been very hard for him to even come to me as a slight indiscretion occurred on my part with someone close to him, and that really hurt him a lot, all of which made me feel doubly terrible when he died. Mal was easy, man, too fucking easy. Sometimes even his best friends took advantage of that fact, or shall I say, especially his close friends, most of all. I'm sorry, Mal. I miss you with all my heart. Harrison later reflected, Mal was killed by his own despair and loneliness. The LAPD was only the weapon. Mal's personal pain and disillusion were the trigger. As far as I'm concerned, it was suicide by cop that really killed him. It's very, very sad, because we all loved him so much. He loved his job, he was brilliant, and I often regret he was killed. To this day I keep thinking, Mal, where are you? If only he was out there now. He was such good fun, but he was also very helpful. He could do anything. He was very humble, but not without dignity. It was not belittling for him to do what we wanted, so he was perfect for us because he was exactly what we needed. Some two decades later, in 1997, Mal Evans' widow Lil, 
then 60, approached Sotheby's auction house with Paul McCartney's handwritten lyrics to With a Little Help from My Friends. She was working as a secretary when she discovered them amongst her late husband's papers. They were valued at $100,000. When Paul heard about it, he immediately sought a high court injunction to block the sale. As he saw it, the lyrics had never really belonged to Evans, who had simply kept track of them as part of his official Beatle duties. This text was only picked up by Mel, he claimed. It ought to have been returned to its rightful owner. There is no question they ever belonged to anyone other than the Beatles. Lil quickly drew public sympathy when she was interviewed by the BBC about her plight. I don't know why he would want to do that. It wouldn't be for the money, as he lets other people sell, so I don't know why he would want to try and stop me. McCartney's spokesman, Jeff Baker, quickly issued damage control. He pointed out that Paul had twice offered to help out Lil, but she had declined. I don't wish to cause any trouble for Mrs. Evans or her children, whom I remember fondly, said Paul, but I do feel strongly that these original manuscripts should be returned to their rightful owners. When the press took Lil's side, however, McCartney retreated from his position, dropped the legal action, and said he wanted to reach an agreement with Evans' widow to make sure that she was taken care of. It wasn't the first time that Lil had dipped into her estranged husband's effects to make some quick cash. In 1984, she auctioned a 1960 Hofner Senator acoustic guitar that John Lennon had given him. She even provided a letter to her from George Harrison, saying it was one of the first guitars of John's going back to Liverpool. The instrument sold for some $15,000 at Sotheby's, and today might be worth as much as $1 million. Interestingly, in 1998, a notebook containing lyrics including those to Hey Jude and the original cover designs for the Sgt. Pepper album went to auction. The notebook had been compiled by Evans and was relayed to Sotheby's by an anonymous vendor. It fetched an impressive $160,000. Stephen Maycock, Sotheby's rock specialist, said, The notebook is one of several items from the collection of the late Mel Evans. It is the ultimate memento of the group's career and documents the integral role that Mel played in the heart of the Beatles' organization. As for Evans' memoirs, George Harrison hinted to me in 1983 that due to legal entanglements, they would never be published. Were certain parties paid to bury the revelations Evans had suggested the Beatles might get mad about? An old publishing friend, Matthew Martin, was involved with the book and was called to the editorial offices of the publishing house some days after Evans' death. There, several editors found a large box containing original Beatles memorabilia, several pages from Evans' memoirs, and even a dummy copy of the book, complete with a provisional cover. Having realized that the book would now never be published, the firm didn't know what to do with the material and called in Matthew Martin for his advice. There were letters from the Beatles to Evans, handwritten lyrics, friendly postcards, many unpublished Beatles family photographs, and, of course, a small portion of the manuscript. Attempts to contact anyone from Evans' estate failed. In the meantime, an employee called an unnamed Beatles insider and informed them about the treasure trove. The insider contacted a Beatles lawyer who used various legal maneuvers to assert that the contents of the box were the exclusive property of unnamed parties within the Beatles' camp. The box was then subsequently handed over to the lawyer. As a memento, however, Matthew Martin kept the dummy for the book and has it today as a souvenir of what would have been a Beatles authorized biography. This new information, of course, clashes with other reports that Evans' book was finished, or very nearly at the time of his death. Perhaps the reason that the book was never published was that it had not, in fact, ever been written. Chapter 10. The Love There That's Sleeping. Home. 1980-1995. How many Beatles does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is four. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Whatever history thinks, that's what it was. George Harrison What a great time it was, and how close we all were. We tend to forget that. We did live in a box, and saved each other's lives. 
Ringo Starr. The year 1980 proved fateful for everyone in the Beatles' orbit. January marked McCartney's notorious Japanese drug bust, in which he was jailed for possession of marijuana, then deported. According to Fred Seaman, Lennon's personal assistant, John followed the story with gleeful relish, asking Seaman's father to buy all of the British newspapers so that he and Yoko could share a good laugh over Paul's predicament. I can just picture him sitting in a bare jail cell, John said. They've taken away his shoelaces and his belt so he won't hang himself if he becomes despondent singing yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. It was John's theory that Paul subconsciously wanted to get busted to show that he was still a bad boy. The same year also brought an end to Wings, fueled by co-commander Denny Lane's bitter defection over money disputes. The grounding of Wings ended an astounding chapter in pop history. Over the group's decade-long career, they had sold more records than even the Beatles. November marked a new beginning for John, with his first release in five long years, the melodic yet challenging Double Fantasy. He had hit 40 and was finally at peace with himself, which showed in the McCartney-style themes he took on in his music of home and family, displaying a tender, even sentimental side of his nature. Of the first hit single from the LP, Just Like Starting Over, he remarked, that's what I'm doing. It took me 40 years to grow up. I'm saying, here I am. Now, how are you? How's your relationship going? Did you get through it all? Wasn't the 70s a drag? Well, here we are. Let's make the 80s great. I never could have written starting over in 1975. I'm finding myself writing like I first used to. These past five years have helped me liberate myself from my intellect and my image of myself. I could write again without consciously thinking about it, which was a joy. This is like our first album. It's fun to be rocking and rolling now, but if it gets not to be fun, I'll just walk away, because I know now that I can. According to Fred Seaman, even ten years after the collapse of his partnership with Paul, John was still taking up the gauntlet his former partner had flung at his feet. After years of lying dormant, John's competitive nature had been aroused, he said. As long as Paul kept turning out mediocre product, John felt justified in keeping his own muse on a shelf. But if Paul were actually writing good music, John felt compelled to take up the challenge. It was a conditioned reflex, nurtured during years of friendly and later fierce rivalry in the Beatles. John told me Paul was the only musician who could scare him into writing great songs and vice versa. That was the nature of their relationship, a creative sibling rivalry. Shockingly, on 8 December 1980 at 10.49 p.m., John Lennon was brutally cut down outside his Dakota apartment by a faceless punk with a cheap charter arms revolver. Mark David Chapman a troubled drifter from Hawaii, had lain in wait for the former Beatle the entire day, even asking Lennon to autograph a record album when he left the building earlier that evening. When John and Yoko arrived home that night from a recording session at the record plant, the former security guard stepped out of the shadows and fired five hollow-point bullets into Lennon's back. John was rushed in the back of a patrol car to New York's Roosevelt Hospital, where doctors cracked open his chest to perform open-heart massage in a desperate, last-ditch attempt to save his life. But the impact of three of the hollow-point bullets that found their mark had shattered his heart beyond repair. The beloved musical icon was pronounced dead at 11.35 p.m. McCartney was overcome with grief. He gathered his family close and cried for days. We just couldn't handle it, he confessed. I talked to Yoko the day after he was killed, and the very first thing she said was, you know John was really fond of you. The last telephone conversation I had with him, we were still the best of mates. He was always a very warm guy, John. His bluff was all on the surface. He used to take his glasses down, you know, those granny glasses, and say, It's only me. They were like a wall, you know, a shield. Those are the moments I treasure. 
Starr heard the news while on holiday in the Bahamas with his future wife Barbara and immediately chartered a jet to fly them both to New York, where he went to the Dakota to offer his condolences to Yoko and Sean. A mass of weeping, almost hysterical fans were waiting outside in an echo of the days of Beatlemania, reaching out to touch him. But Starr wasn't ready for his grief to become public property. Harrison was at home asleep when the phone rang in the middle of the night. Before he touched the receiver, he felt something must be wrong. It was his sister Louise, still living in America. George prepared himself for what he was sure must be bad news. That afternoon in London, Derek Taylor wandered over to Apple's last sorry incarnation on St. James Street to sit with the company's managing director, Neil Aspinall, and wait for the calls to flood in. After a couple of hours of painful reminiscence, they parted and Derek took a cab to George's London office. There he summoned up the courage to ring Harrison. George, he said. I don't know, maybe you should make some kind of a statement, just to get the bastards off your back. I can't now, the reclusive guitarist replied. There was a long pause. Maybe later. The line went dead. Taylor hung up and lit a cigarette. He knew that the longer George waited to speak, the worse it would be. Less than an hour later, he rang George again. This time, Harrison agreed to help him formulate a press statement. After all we went through together, I still have great love and respect for John. I am shocked and stunned. To rob life is the ultimate robbery, taken to the limit with the use of a gun. It is an outrage that people can take other people's lives when they obviously haven't got their own lives in order. After phoning the copy through to all of the major London news agencies, Taylor caught the train home to Brunden Mills, his simple country home in Suffolk. He stared out the window and, like millions of others around the world, asked himself, Why? That morning in Chester, John's sister Julia Baird heard the terrible news. Around eight o'clock I thought I heard a very light tapping on the front door and rushed to investigate. It was one of the neighbors who came to tell me that my cousin Leela was on the phone. We'd only had just bought the house and decided not to rush right out and have a phone installed. Leela, I thought. What on earth does she want at this hour of the morning? I dashed across the street and ran to the phone, but strangely stopped just short of actually picking it up. It was just a feeling of dread. Hello? I finally stammered. Leela, what is it? Then you haven't heard the news yet? she asked. No. What is it? Are your kids all right? Julia, she continued. It's John. I'm afraid he's been shot. I was stunned. Although I hadn't seen him in years, the words cut through me. She had to repeat it several times before I slowly began to pick up the thread. Well, is he all right? I asked. No, Julia. He's dead. Are you coming over then? I said trying to hold back the tears. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm coming straight away. Just sit tight until I get there. All right, I promised, trailing off into nothing as I placed the receiver slowly back on the cradle of the phone. Leela and I sat together in the kitchen talking of old times. Do you remember that secret special whistle that John always had to call for his mate Ivy through the gardens, and how he loved fishing for salmon with Uncle Bert when he visited Mater in Scotland? So many special memories, so much tears and laughter. I had lost my only brother, and I was simply numb. None of my children ever really knew their uncle, and that was a very great shame to me. To them, their Uncle John was simply one of the four smiling faces staring up at them from the cover of a Beatles LP. Now, of course, it was forever too late, a reality that I struggle to accept to this day. Many people have asked me how I feel about the fellow who killed my brother. All I can say was that it was a cowardly act, obviously carried out by someone with a very, very sick mind. Still strangely, I don't particularly feel any great hatred for this mixed-up American madman. As the years roll by, 
I become more and more convinced my brother was truly one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. Eventually, I could see him branching out even further, not only as a musician, but perhaps as an author, poet, painter, or even philosopher. Several other people close to Lenin were besieged by the press in pursuit of their thoughts and feelings on the tragedy, especially Mimi and Cynthia. Both women were overcome with grief and only reluctantly consented to talk about it after it became apparent that it would be easier to do so than to refuse. Since his mother died, John always looked upon me as his mum, said Mimi. There was never any possibility he would be just an ordinary person. He'd have been successful in anything he did. He was always just as happy as the day was long. I will never recover. Cynthia stated, Despite the fact that we were divorced, I continue to hold John in the highest regard. I would like to talk to you about John, but I know that if I tried, the words would not come out. It's very, very painful. By 1980, George was feeling that the time was right for him to record yet another album, and thus he gathered together an array of old friends, Ringo, Alaraka, Ray Cooper, Herbie Flowers, Willie Weeks, Al Cooper, Jim Keltner, and Tom Scott, and began sessions at Friar Park for what would later become Somewhere in England, the album he submitted to Warner Brother Records in Los Angeles some months later consisted of eight new tracks as well as two standards, Baltimore Oriole and Hong Kong Blues. The cover showed Harrison's profile merged with a satellite shot of a cloudy Great Britain. The executives at Warner Brothers were not impressed with either the music or the art and rejected it. In the end, four tracks were deleted, Flying Hour, Lay His Head, Sat Singing, and Tears of the World, and in their place, four new songs were added, Teardrops, Blood from a Clone, That Which I Have Lost, and All Those Years Ago. Reluctantly, Harrison contacted photographer Carolyn Irwin to put together an alternate cover. The album was released in June 1981 and spawned two singles, Teardrops and All Those Years Ago, George's touching tribute to John. Recorded at Friar Park Studios, all those years ago was originally intended as a vehicle for Ringo. After Lennon's murder, however, George rewrote it to include references to the tragedy. On the spur of the moment, he decided it would be perhaps fitting if he were joined on the session by Starr and McCartney, who immediately agreed. It was the one and only Beatles reunion of the new decade. Produced with the help of George Martin, the song included backup vocals by Linda McCartney and Denny Lane, who later claimed that he was not paid for his work on the session. The song rose to number two in the charts and today remains a popular jukebox choice in North America. Lane remembers the top secret sessions. The last time I was at George's, Paul and Linda were also there. Paul had a way of coming in and taking over and making everything a bit edgy. Everyone was uptight. When he and Linda left, however, the atmosphere suddenly changed and became more relaxed. Everyone seemed to physically go and start enjoying themselves. Paul thinks he's easygoing, but he doesn't trust people, and it shows. George, on the other hand, was a nice guy as long as you kept things light, non-invasive, and never brought up the Beatles unless he clearly wanted to talk about them. During his thirty years in Henley, he made friends with anyone who was friendly to him, and didn't hesitate to get involved in local issues, such as the closing of a local cinema to make way for a supermarket. He also attended sponsored walks in aid of cancer research and other official openings. As a child, his son Danhi played hockey with a local team, went to state schools, and was brought up and behaved like other children his age, despite his background. Unlike Ringo and Paul, who have actively collected Beatles memorabilia for years, George's home showed little evidence of his celebrated past. As a friend recalled, there are also several gold and platinum records in the video room. When I go up there, we just talk. It's a laid-back, normal evening. George is very much into car racing and has numerous videos of rallies. He loves it. 
George is interesting and very unaffected. He has a great sense of humor, and he's very calm. Occasionally, he wears the odd, expensive jacket, but in general, he could just be anyone. Since about 1969, Beatles bootlegs have spun their way around the globe. Snapped up by collectors, these unauthorized compilations show how the Beatles worked together and what they produced that they chose not to share with the world. Over the years, with the advent of digital technology, the quality and content of bootlegs has greatly improved. Now rare CD bootlegs are available online and from small record shops on both sides of the Atlantic. But how did this apparently top-secret material ever get out of the studio in the first place? Surely the guardians of the Beatles' cultural legacy spent millions on keeping all of the Beatles' priceless tapes secure. Two trusted employees of Abbey Road were ultimately responsible for the unauthorized release of part of the Beatles' unpublished catalog in the highest digital quality. In the late 60s, when radio DJs obtained copies of the early Get Back Acetate, an entirely new industry in the non-stop demand for Beatles recordings was established, bootleg LPs. Early Beatles boots lacked outtakes. Although one or two leaked out on an acetate or obscure radio broadcast, the majority of bootlegs surfacing in the 1970s contained recordings, the DECA audition, various BBC broadcasts, or the occasional get-back outtake. This, however, changed when EMI decided to dig deeper into its extensive vaults. In 1976, when the Beatles' nine-year recording contract expired, EMI took a hard look in the archives for material that might be used on new releases or reissues. Several more outtakes were considered, but instead the public were fed reissues, rock and roll music, rarities, the Beatles' UK singles, and one live Beatles album, Live at the Hollywood Bowl. One album of outtakes nearly reached the printing stage to be entitled Rarities 2, but it shrank first to an EP, then a single, and then finally disappeared altogether after John's death in 1980. The story picked up again when one of EMI's young balance engineers, John Barrett, became seriously ill with cancer and underwent prolonged treatment. As Abbey Road studio manager Ken Townsend recalled, John asked if there was anything he could do to keep his mind occupied. My suggestion was that he listen through every Beatles tape and log all relevant details. He produced a wonderful catalog with all the information color-coded with an attention to detail which was really quite incredible. In 1982, Townsend, with Barrett, attended the annual Liverpool Beatles convention to promote the release of Brian Southall's book, Abbey Road. There, the pair revealed many of the secrets of the Abbey Road archives. Barrett's notes enabled them to answer specific questions about the group's marathon recording sessions. Coincidentally, that year, the control room of Abbey Road Studio 2 was in need of an overhaul, and it was decided to allow the public inside for a tour between July and September 1983. Visitors were treated to a 90-minute audio-visual presentation, The Beatles at Abbey Road, which featured many previously unheard outtakes and remixes spanning the Beatles' career. Barrett sifted through the archives and selected possible tracks for inclusion. In some cases, he even made tape copies of entire sessions. U.S. collectors, smuggling in a Sony cassette recorder, captured the show in stereo, and the recording was promptly released to a bootleg double album, The Beatles Live, at Abbey Road Studios. Barrett kept his tapes until his death in 1984, when they were sold privately. The possibility of a Beatles reunion had been discussed on and off since shortly after the group had split in 1970. Apple's managing director Neil Aspinall was asked to sift through the archival footage of the band with a planned cinematic documentary entitled The Long and Winding Road. Due to legal entanglements, however, the project was set aside, but revived again in 1980, as evidenced by a 28 November affidavit signed by John Lennon as part of his legal deposition against the producers of the Beatlemania stage show. He stated, I and the three other Beatles have plans to stage a reunion concert. The performance was to be in support of the films, slated for release by the mid-80s.
With Lennon's death, the project was shelved once again. But in 1989, McCartney stated publicly that he and Harrison might be composing some new music for the film. With Lennon's death, the project was shelved once again. But in 1989, McCartney stated publicly that both he and Harrison might be composing some new music for the film. George accused him of sparking reunion rumors merely to promote his own upcoming tour. He also pointed out that he and Paul hadn't written together in some 35 years. Why should they start now? Interestingly, it was George himself who in the end was responsible for getting the project off the ground. When rock legend Roy Orbison died, leaving Harrison's pickup band of pop superstars, the traveling Wilburys, one Wilbury short, George proposed recruiting the long-dead Elvis Presley to fill in. They could tap into the King's unreleased demos and add their own material to the mix. In fact, Presley was never a real option, but George was on to something. What about using John's demos instead and resurrect the Beatles? Perhaps Yoko might part with a few of her husband's many demos. I know Yoko had some bits and pieces of tapes because she'd been doing things on her own, Paul later remembered. So I rang the other guys and said, look, if we could get hold of a cassette of John's, if there's something interesting around, would you be up for that? I went over to Dakota, sat up late, just jawing, drinking tea, and having fun and stuff. Ono played him several tapes, which included Free as a Bird, Real Love, and Now and Then. It was really emotional. I warned Ringo to have his hanky ready when he listened to it, so I took the tapes back, got copies made for the guys, and they liked it. Early in 1994, the remaining Beatles confided to a few friends that they were developing a surprise multimedia extravaganza, which would chronicle the band's history on record as a television series and even a tell-all book. The New York Times got wind of the plan and broke the story that the Beatles would be adding vocals and instrumentals to a John Lennon tape. In January, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio, when Yoko was attending because her husband was to be inducted as a solo artist, Ono passed a pair of cassettes to Paul, not missing the irony of the gesture. I did not break up the Beatles, she said, but I was there at the time. Now I'm in a position to bring them back, and I would not want to hinder that. The Threetles, as they were called in the press, got to work immediately, meeting up at McCartney's Sussex studio in a converted windmill. They quickly discarded a track called Grow Old With Me, which had already appeared on John's Milk and Honey album, and turned their attention instead to his 1977 Free as a Bird, a haunting yet hopeful ballad, said to have evolved from his frustrating immigration battle. I fell in love with it, said Paul. I would have loved to have worked with John on that. I like the melody. It's got very strong chords, and it really appealed to me. He envisioned the rework as, of all things, a 1940s lushly illustrated George Gershwin tune. Fortunately, the austere Harrison disagreed, and they maintained the simplicity of John's original demo. As it stood, the song was musically incomplete and required additional lyrics, another historic undertaking that marked only the second collaboration of McCartney Harrison. Not since 1958, in spite of all danger, had the pair composed together. It proved at times a push-and-pull undertaking, Paul admitting to a certain competitiveness between them, which had emerged from Harrison's success as a solo artist. There were one or two bits of tension, he stated. George and I were vying for the best lyrics. I don't think that's really such a bad thing. It was only like a normal Beatles session. You've got to reach a compromise. For Ringo Starr, the experience was bittersweet. It was emotional. He wasn't there, and I loved John. We had to imagine he'd just gone for a cup of tea, or that he was on holiday, but he was still here. That's the only way I could get through it. The trio spent the better part of February honing the song, then took an extended break. It wasn't until 22 June that they assembled again at Paul's studio, but the session was aborted after reportedly they fooled around with the McCartney classic Let It Be and yet another Lennon demo. Due to time restrictions, the Beatles decided they needed a change of scenery. The next day, accompanied by their wives, they arrived at George's Friar Park Studios. 
That afternoon was captured on film for the television series with a two-camera setup. During a chat in Harrison's prized garden, the three reminisced about their 1968 trip to Rishikesh. George picked up a ukulele, played Dara Dune, and I Will. Awash in the sentiment of the good old days, the trio again toyed with the idea of recording Paul's rock lullaby, Let It Be, to John's memory. But they agreed that, without him, it would be a hollow gesture. Starr noted that it was challenging to turn the demo into a real Beatles track, even with the help of Jeff Lynne as producer, but concluded that they had all done a stellar job. I think John will love it when he hears it. The Threedles tramped into the studio twice more in 1995, on 20 to 21 March, and again on 15, 16 May. They reportedly tackled yet another track Yoko had passed to them, but it didn't really have a title, Paul said. You know it's true, it's up to you. That beginning was great, but then it just goes a bit crummy. We all decided it's not one of John's greatest songs. Producer Jeff Lynn agreed. The one we tried was either called Now and Then or Miss You. We had a go at it, but there were a lot of words which hadn't been completed. It was one afternoon messing with it. It was a very sweet song, a sort of bluesy ballad. It was suggested, too, there was yet another song the trio worked on called All for Love. Rumor had it that this was yet another McCartney-Harrison collaboration, but this time from scratch, and the 1996 issue of Beatles Monthly proclaimed the work had been completed on this new Beatles song. Serious Beatle watchers, however, doubted. In the first place, no one in the group's camp had even mentioned the existence of a new song, and neither did Jeff Lynne, present for all of the recording sessions. Also, how could there be a true Beatles track without John Lennon? Meanwhile, with little fanfare, the resurrected Beatles debuted for December 1995 with the release of a single, Free as a Bird. Paul was defiant in defense of their accomplishment. People said we shouldn't do it, but that kind of focused us a bit. I thought, well, we'll fucking show you. We pulled it off. That's the thing. I don't care what anyone says. We work well together, and that's the truth of it. Ringo chimed in. This project has brought us together. Once we get the bullshit behind us, we end up doing what we do best, which is making music. Predictably, George had a more philosophical take on the experience. We've now had long enough to let all the bad vibes go down the river and under the bridge, to get together again in a new light. This has been a good thing. It's like going full circle. Julian Lennon heard Free as a Bird for the first time when he was in New York visiting his brother Sean. It's a great song. I love it. Although I must say I find it hard to hear Dad's vocals. The fact is, the anthology series itself, though, did not command the kind of ratings that they had expected. After the first installment was shown on TV, they dropped off dramatically. To make matters worse, the release of the band's mediocre second comeback single, Real Love, all but flopped. Apparently, the public was saying, let John rest in peace. The ever-hopeful McCartney still hoped to do more in the same vein, or even venture into a genuine Threetles project, but George slammed the door on the idea. We always said the Beatles were four of us, and if ever one of us wasn't in it, then it's not really the Beatles. And the idea of having John as the singer on the record works, well, then it is the Beatles. There was talk about us doing some stuff on our own, but I have no desire to do a threesome. Starr agreed. It felt very natural and was a lot of fun, but emotional too at times, very emotional. But it's the end of the line, really, for the Beatles. There's nothing more that we can do together as a group. Chapter 11. It Don't Come Easy. Resolution, 1996-2003. George gave his life to God a long time ago. He wasn't trying to hang on to anything. He was fine with it. Sure, nobody likes to be ill and nobody likes to be uncomfortable. But he went with what was happening. Olivia Harrison. The 90s claimed many within the Beatles' inner circle. On 7 September 1997, the band's charming press officer, Derek Taylor, died at 65. His lifetime indulgence in cigarettes, drink, and drugs contributed to his unsuccessful battle with cancer. McCartney offered public condolences to Taylor's wife, Joan, and their six children. He was a beautiful man. It's time for tears. Words may come later. 
Taylor had been close to George more than any of the other Beatles. Taylor had been closer to George than any of the other Beatles, and the guitarist went out of his way to find work for Taylor in later years, giving him a large role in the publicity and the promotion of the band's successful retrospectives, The Beatles Live from the BBC and The Beatles Anthology. Although he had worked long and hard on behalf of all the Beatles' personal and professional projects for over three decades, only George attended his funeral. By the close of 1995, it seemed things couldn't get any better for the McCartneys. Paul was basking in the afterglow of the successful Beatles anthology, and Linda's photographs taken during a 1967-68 session with the Grateful Dead had been made into a photo film. The McCartney offspring, too, were thriving, particularly Stella, who was already a force to be reckoned with in the fashion world with her own label. Then, on 8 December, during a routine medical check, a malignant lump was discovered on Linda's breast. Ten days later, she checked into London's Princess Grace Hospital for an operation to remove the growth and some surrounding tissue. Afterwards, Paul gave a cheerful thumbs-up to reporters and deemed the operation 100% successful, thank God. Doctors told her just to get some rest, were very optimistic about the future, and for the moment, everything goes on as normal. However, over the next year, Mrs. McCartney dropped out of sight. Even a close friend and neighbor observed that she hadn't seen Paul's normally gregarious wife in months. Eventually, the press uncovered the truth. Linda had been undergoing twice-weekly chemotherapy treatments for nearly a year, double the normal course for breast cancer patients. The McCartneys responded that the doctors wanted to be sure that they got it all. Nearly a year later, on 23 November 1996, Baker promised that Linda would be on hand for her photo exhibition entitled Roadworks at the National Museum of Photography, Film, and Television in Bradford. It will mark her return to public life, he said. But she did not appear. Rumors circulated that she had been receiving an intense form of chemotherapy in Los Angeles, a regime so potent that some 5% of recipients died from the toxic chemicals alone. On 11 March 1997, Linda too was not able to be present at Buckingham Palace when Paul was knighted by the Queen. Ever the polished showman, he smiled broadly to reporters and fans and did not reveal the real reason why his wife could not attend. On 11 March 1997, Linda was not able to be present at Buckingham Palace when Paul was knighted by the Queen. Ever the polished showman, he smiled broadly to reporters and fans and did not reveal the real reason why his wife could not attend. Later that year, it looked as if Linda might have turned a corner. She contributed vocals to several tracks on Paul's well-received Flaming Pie CD and was even well enough to shoot promotional photos for that album and for the CD of his symphony, Standing Stone. In the winter of 1998, during an upbeat chat with OK Magazine in the kitchen of the family's rambling Sussex farmhouse, Linda discussed her multiple projects. She was compiling a fifth cookbook, putting out a new line of soya-based yogurt desserts and working on a meatless baking that apparently cooked, sizzled, and tasted very much like the real thing. She talked proudly about rescuing cows from slaughter and saving some 60 beagles destined for cosmetic industry experimentation. Things soon, however, went from bad to worse. In a last-ditch attempt to save Linda's life, doctors at New York's Sloan Kettering Cancer Center began an aggressive high-dose chemotherapy, administering huge amounts of toxic drugs designed to wipe out the cancer cells. A bone marrow transplant was scheduled to follow. However, by March 1998, the cancer had spread to Linda's liver, and a transplant was no longer an option. Later, Paul commented, we knew it was coming, but we tried to pretend that we didn't. I cried a lot. In early April, the doctors gave him the final grim prognosis. I knew a week or so before she died, he acknowledged. I was the only one who knew. I didn't tell her because I didn't think she'd want to know. The McCartneys were reported to be on holiday in Santa Barbara, California, when Linda's condition suddenly took a turn for the worse. On 17 April... The immediate family, including Stella, Mary, and James, gathered at her bedside. 
Paul cradled his dying wife in his arms. "'You're on your beautiful stallion,' he whispered, "'and it's a fine spring day. "'We're riding in the woods, the bluebells are all out, "'and the sky is clear blue.'" Age 56, Linda McCartney slowly passed away. Her body was cremated after a simple family-only ceremony. The extended family was not informed of her death until some 36 hours after it had occurred. Even her friend Carla Lane was taken by surprise. I only found out the cancer had spread to her liver when I spoke to Paul on Sunday. He was surprised Linda hadn't told me, but she really didn't need to say anything to me. Linda had no idea things were so bad, nor did anyone else, said Jeff Baker. I don't know the precise details of where the funeral took place, but it was decided by Paul and the kids they just wanted to be alone. In April 1996, George Harrison went on a pilgrimage of all the Vaishnava holy places in India, accompanied by Mukunda and Shama Sundar, his Hare Krishna friends. He passed through Delhi, then braved the rigors of the accident-strewn Agra Road and headed for Vrindavan, a two-and-a-half-hour journey. He checked into the Pritu Ashram run by Pritu Das, then performed Parikrama, a ritual devotional circumambulation of the holy place. He checked into the Pritu Ashram run by Pritu Das, then performed Parikrama, ritual devotional circumambulation of the holy places, including the site of Radha and Krishna's Rasa dance, the sacred Yamuna River, and Prabhupada's private quarters at the ancient Radha Damodar temple in the heart of Seva Kund, considered by devotees the spiritual hub of the universe. On entering the temple's modest stone courtyard, George took off his shoes as is customary. They were almost immediately stolen by one of the scores of Vrindavan's bandit monkeys who lie in wait on rooftops and in trees for unsuspecting pilgrims to put down a pair of sunglasses, a camera, a bottle of water, or whatever, which they then remarkably hold for ransom. Harrison offered them a bottle of pure mineral water, which was duly accepted. The shoes were then dropped onto the cobblestones below. Well, there's no way he's going to be able to get that cap off that bottle for a drink, George joked. Don't be so sure, said Mukunda. Some of these monkeys in Vrindavan were great yogis in their last life. In 1993, George attended the 25th anniversary celebration of the Hare Krishna movement's first trek into Britain at the Bhaktivedanta Manor in Radlett, north of London. He sat in a circle leading the chanting with his old friends Guru Das, Shamasundar, Mukunda, and Malati Devi Dasi, amongst many others. The evening of 30 December 1999 was pleasant for the Harrisons. George had been to visit his brother Peter and his wife Pauline, who was making plans for the next day's New Year's Eve Millennium Party, complete with fireworks and celebrity friends. Around midnight, George settled in to watch a movie with Olivia and then locked up. The couple had gone to bed at about 2 a.m. At 3.30, Olivia was awoken by the sound of breaking glass. She woke George. Somebody's in here. I heard a window smash. Thinking that perhaps a chandelier had fallen, George fumbled for his boots, tossed on a jacket over his pajamas, and began to make his way to the hall. He smelt cigarette smoke, looked down over the banister, and saw a shadowy figure. You get down here, the man bellowed, adding cryptically. You know what it is. The man, around six feet tall, wearing blue jeans and a black leather jacket, had a mass of long blonde hair. George called the housekeeper and told her to ring 999, while Olivia alerted the rest of the staff on the intercom. His mother-in-law and Donhi were sleeping in another wing, and Olivia was close by, so Harrison didn't think twice before he went downstairs to confront the intruder. The man was holding what appeared to be a pole and a knife with a long blade. He saw the man pace frantically from room to room, and hoping to confuse or distract him, George yelled, Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! This enraged the man, who lunged up the stairs waving the weapons. George took him on, and a ten-minute struggle ensued throughout three rooms on the first floor. Olivia appeared on the scene and hit the intruder in the groin with a brass poker, whereupon he grabbed her by the throat. She twisted free, and the struggle moved into the family's meditation room, then towards the master bedroom. The attacker saw that the much older Harrison was tiring and plunged the knife deep into his chest. 
In desperation, Olivia grabbed the leaded Tiffany table lamp and struck their assailant's head. He grabbed the cable, so he hurled it at him, finally felling him. Then he appeared in the room, and they managed to hold the man at bay until the police arrived. When Thames Valley detectives stormed the house at 3.30, they found the man slumped on the landing. He had dropped the knife and surrendered. George lay on the floor, holding a towel to his chest, drifting in and out of consciousness, as Olivia knelt next to him. Minutes later, paramedics arrived to find Harrison laying on his back, with his son crouched at his side. It was later reported that Donny kept his father conscious and alert. "'Stay with me, Dad,' he pleaded. George, feeling his life ebbing away, told his son, "'Donny, I'm going. I'm going. I love you, Donny.' Hare Krishna, and closed his eyes. As the ambulance whisked the former beetle off to the Royal Berkshire Hospital in Reading, the intruder, now in handcuffs, grunted to police, You should have heard the spooky things he was saying as he was going, the bastard. I should have got the bastard better. He added, It's all in the book of Exodus. He got very close tonight. At the hospital, doctors gave George a tetanus shot intravenous antibiotics, and a host of powerful painkillers. His most serious injury was a punctured lung, which collapsed, and he was fitted with a chest drain. Harrison was found to have at least ten wounds, including three to his chest. A major chest wound required some six stitches to close it. The blade had just missed the artery that connects the heart with the brain. Fortunately, Olivia had escaped serious injury, but was treated for a skull laceration and minor cuts. Doctors praised her bravery. As one family friend put it, Olivia gave him a good clocking and probably saved George's life. According to her friend, London fashion designer Elizabeth Emanuel, she's fit and strong. I imagine she'd be very brave in those circumstances. She's quite a tough lady." According to a close family friend, the police arrived in the nick of time. I don't think Olivia or George could fight much more if he attacked them again. You have to remember this bloke was incredibly pumped up with adrenaline. He was out of control while George was half asleep. The police soon learned that his name was Michael Abram, and he came from Merseyside in Liverpool. The 33-year-old former gardener and television advertising salesman was an unemployed father of two. As the investigators dug deeper, a sinister portrait emerged. After the birth of his second son, Abram had begun to smoke cannabis, then graduated to heroin. Drugs destroyed the family. He thought he could control it, but it was only a matter of time before it controlled him. Abram had sought treatment at various Liverpool drug clinics. His neighbor, David Blackburn, observed, I used to see him going over to the chemist for his dose of methadone every week. He used to muck about with kids on the estate, but you could tell he wasn't normal. Family members later confided that Abram thought John Lennon was a prophet and Paul McCartney the devil. He talked more about Paul than George, Linda Abram said. He identified with George Harrison because of my sweet Lord. He played it over and over. Her son believed he was on a mission from God. He said it was too late for his generation, but not for the children. It was his task to save the children from drugs and witchcraft. Sixteen hours before the event, he'd been picked up on a security camera in Liverpool. Abrams was last spotted about 6 p.m. in his favorite haunt, the bow and arrow. Before leaving, he remarked to a patron, I've got things to do. George was released from hospital in the evening of New Year's Day. He arrived at home to welcome old Monty Python friend Eric Idle for an extended visit and security was stepped up with security guards and dogs. It was reported that George had hired two former SAS soldiers to guard the house. Michael Abrams' trial for attempted murder began at Oxford Crown Court on 14 November. Olivia and Donny attended, but George was absent due to illness. The proceeding opened with the Harrison's account of the event, which was read aloud to the jury. According to Dr. Philip Joseph, Abram saw himself as the fifth Beatle. He remembered John Lennon once said the Beatles were more famous than Jesus, and that upset him. He thought the Beatles had gone too far. Abrams believed that the four men had entered into a demonic conspiracy with George as its central evil figure. 
He could see how all roads were leading to George Harrison, who was carefully instructing the others how to possess people, said Joseph. Things had deteriorated in the young man's life when he had a fight with his girlfriend and moved out of their flat. His life was falling apart. He was living in squalor, Joseph explained. He was looking for meaning, but was preoccupied by his mental illness. He believed his girlfriend had stolen 80,000 pounds from a drug dealer, masterminded by George Harrison. The idea had come to him from George's 1987 solo hit, Got My Mind Set on You, with the lyric, It's Gonna Take Money, A Whole Lot of Spending Money. Eventually, Abrams wrote an apology to the Harrison family, which too was read aloud in court. I'm writing this letter in the hope it might be passed on to Mr. and Mrs. Harrison. I wish to say how sorry I am for the alarm, distress, and injury I have caused while I was ill. I have seen many doctors prior to the attack, and I was never told I was suffering with schizophrenia or any mental illness. I thought my delusions were real, and everything I was experiencing was some kind of witchcraft. I know that Mr. and Mrs. Harrison fought for their lives on 30 December 1999. They must have been terrified by the lunatic in their house. I am deeply embarrassed and ashamed about the terrible thing I did to George Harrison. I feel very guilty about it, but I can't turn back time, and all I can say is that I'm very sorry. But I hope people may understand what happened to me and appreciate that it was not my fault. Physically, yes, I did it, but I was not in control of my mind at the time. The jury, instructed by Judge Michael Astill, had reached their verdict within an hour of leaving the courtroom. Not guilty by reason of insanity. Michael Abram was remanded to the Scott Clinic for an indefinite period. Judge Astill deemed the attack horrifying and stated, he will be held without time restriction, his release contingent upon approval by a mental health tribunal. The Harrison family, however, was far from satisfied. Donhe stood outside the courthouse and read the following statement. Michael Abram was acquitted by a loophole in the law. We shall never forget he was full of hatred and violence when he came into our home. The prospect of him being released back into society is abhorrent to us. We hope the authorities will act with the utmost responsibility in avoiding it in the near future and allow us to be consulted before reaching such a conclusion. Still, there was even greater heartache looming in the Harrison's future. While tending to his beloved garden on 22 July 1997, George discovered a hard, discolored lump on his neck. Within a week, under the alias of Sid Smith, he entered Princess Margaret Hospital in Windsor. In a ten-minute operation, a sample of lymph tissue was removed and sent for analysis. On 2 August, Jeff Baker issued an upbeat statement. George is absolutely fine. There is no reason he shouldn't be. He's had a quick operation for a small lump on the outside of his neck. Although the nodule was widely reported as benign, Harrison soon checked into Britain's leading cancer hospital, the Royal Marsden, to undergo two courses of intense radiotherapy. I was very lucky, George said later, because it didn't go anywhere. All it was was a little red mark on my neck. Maybe I'll record a track called Radiation Therapy. It wasn't until about ten months later that a very different story rumbled through the Thames Valley. On his show, American shock jock Howard Stern probed Ringo about recent newspaper reports that George was battling cancer. No, he had a problem with cancer, Starr replied, but he's had it removed. Finally, in June 1998, Harrison responded to the intense media interest in his condition. I'm not going to die on you folks just yet, he said. I'm very lucky. He referred to his years of chain smoking and added, I gave up Siggy's many, many years ago, but started again for a while, then stopped in 97. Lucky for me, they found this nodule, which was more of a warning than anything else. There are many types of cancerous cells, and this was very basic. Eighteen months later, he disclosed that the cancer cells hadn't been limited to his throat. I had a piece of my lung removed in 1997. For the moment, though, things looked fairly good. Harrison's follow-up screaming, performed at Minnesota's Mayo Clinic in January, gave him a clean bill of health. 
On 10 January 2001, Harrison celebrated a personal musical milestone by re-releasing All Things Must Pass to mark the 30th anniversary of the acclaimed 1970 three-album set. It was remastered by producer John Astley with a few new songs of the previously unreleased I Live For You, Two Demos, Beware of Darkness, and Let It Down, a karaoke-like version of What Is Life, plus a new take on his 1970 smash, My Sweet Lord, which he reworked with Donhee and the sultry singer Sam Brown. Promoting the album, he even agreed to a global online chat on 15 February. One cyber fan asked if Paul McCartney still got on his nerves. George quoted Sir Frank Crisp, "'Scan not a friend with a microscopic glass. You know his faults, but let his foibles pass.' He then added a 21st century caveat. I'm sure there's enough about me that pisses Paul off, but I think we've grown old enough now to realize that we're both pretty damn cute. It was during this period, too, that he recommitted himself to his Hare Krishna faith, encouraged by Shamasundar Das, the young man who had first introduced him to A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada at Tittenhurst Park Estate on 11 September 1969. I spent some time with George this summer, the American-born Doss said in an interview. George has reached a very high level of spiritual development, I'm happy to say. He chants Hare Krishna every day. He's totally serene and has accepted his life as it is. He's actually achieved a much higher level of self-realization than I could ever hope to imagine. He's peaceful and serene to a degree that is very rare, and at such a young age... Bhaktivedanta Swami benefited him so much. Das also remarked that George was thinking of buying a small island off the coast of the highly Hindu-populated Fiji, but abandoned the idea when the political situation on the main island became increasingly unstable. His dream of a utopian Hare Krishna community was dropped. By the spring of 2001, Harrison's world was rocked yet again, when his lung condition erupted into a life-threatening crisis. On 21 March, he checked into St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota, affiliated with the Mayo Clinic. The following day, he underwent a four-hour operation to remove a large cancerous growth from his left lung. The operation was successful, and George made an excellent recovery, said his lawyers. He's in the best of spirits and on top form, the most relaxed and free since the knife attack on him in 1999. He is now enjoying a holiday in Tuscany. Although all things must pass away, George has no plans right now and is still living in the material world and wishes everyone all the best. God bless and not to worry. The tongue-in-cheek statement, however, was in fact authored by the sly Harrison himself. Sometime later, when Harrison was told by doctors in Switzerland that the cancer had moved to his brain, he was content to forego any further treatment, withdraw from the world, and prepare himself for death by completely giving himself over to Krishna. In fact, when Harrison was told by his doctors in Switzerland that the cancer had moved to his brain, he was content to forego any further treatment, withdraw from the world, and prepare himself for death by completely giving himself over to Bhagavan Sri Krishna. At the time, the Vedic scholar Stephen J. Rosen, a passing friend of George's, said, That's a very mature spiritual sentiment when you learn that death is near and you resign yourself to that. Krishna enables one to face death gracefully. A devotee knows what to do at the time of death, how to focus one's mind and heart on God. I know George is aware of this, as we've discussed it. Shortly before his death, George paid a final visit to the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, then well into his eighties in Holland. The old master tried to give him courage and hope, comparing his sick body to an old coat with holes in it. He said he was happy that George would soon discard that garment and put on a new one. It was reported that George was only just strong enough to attend Donnie's graduation from Brown University and cope with a visit from Paul McCartney in May. The July news from the clinic was anything but promising. A hospital spokesman said on behalf of Dr. Cavelli, George was here in May and June, 
and he has not recovered, but he is not my patient any more. These grim words forced Harrison to engage once more in off-the-cuff damage control. I'm feeling fine, really, and I'm really very, very sorry for any unnecessary worry which has been caused by the reports appearing in today's press. Please do not worry. As the summer waned, Harrison made a final pilgrimage to India, to the holy city of Varanasi, also known as Benares or Kashi, considered sacred to all Orthodox Hindus. There he spent time chanting in local Krishna temples, bathed in the Ganges, an age-old ritual in preparing for death, ultimate rebirth, and hopefully final release. In Benares he bumped into an old Hare Krishna friend, Sachi Nandana Das Brahmachari, on the stone steps of an ancient ghat where the old, sick, and dying come to make their peace with their preferred image of God. The old American monk instantly recognized George despite his emaciation and the long gray chudder around his neck. After the two men greeted each other, they sat together for about twenty minutes and talked quietly about the holy art of dying. A few days after George died, the monk sent this author a long email. He told me that after he and Harrison had parted, he hurried back to his small room in one of the Dharmashala pilgrim ashrams that line the river and wrote down what he could remember of what he said and his final impressions of Harrison. As far as one can reach the goal of true spirituality within the body, I'm certain George has found it. I'd seen him last in Vrindavan in the spring of 1995, and he was pretty much the same cheery image of a man I'd known since the early 70s. But here before me now was another George, his closely cropped white hair framing those deep brown penetratingly truthful eyes that always struck me upon seeing him. I was shocked at how small and thin he was. I remember noting the bones in his elbows and knees protruding from his taunt, slightly scaly skin as he entered the holy waters for the traditional dipping down seven times in submission to our holy mother Ganga. At first he didn't recognize me and made only the traditional namaste gesture and answered back Hare Krishna when I approached him. In fact, I had to reintroduce myself twice before he fully understood who I was. George and I were never great friends, but I'd walked with him once or twice on an early morning japa stroll in Vrindavan and had eaten with him maybe two or three times along with a group of other devotees in Krishna's dusty cow town outside of Delhi. To be honest, I hadn't even heard he was sick. I'd known, of course, that he had been stabbed at his home in Henley, but I had no clue how bad he really was. Seeing him, of course, I instantly knew both his material body was almost finished and why he was there. Hare Krishna, he said to me again, placing his small waxy hand on my shoulder. How are you, Prabhu? I asked. Fine, fine, he whispered obviously trying to keep the always fragile peace of the bustling Benares riverside mornings. Let's sit down, I said, steadying him gently as we sat on the slippery steps only two or three feet from the rapidly rushing river. I do not recall seeing either his wife or his son any time near him at that point. I think he wanted to be alone, making his formal prayers to his God. I don't have much time left, he told me. I didn't really understand whether he was alluding to his own imminent demise or the fact that I might be simply bothering him. He then quickly continued, I did this to myself, you know, with the smoking, the boozing, the women. I couldn't even keep a vegetarian diet once I started seriously following Formula One circuit around the world. Everything Prabhupada warned me against, everything he so patiently taught us by example. Trying to think of something halfway intelligent to say, I stumbled. Don't you see, George, everything you did has made you who you are now. Prabhupada knew how weak we all were. He said many times, even the simplest rules he gave us, we would never be able to follow once he left. Prabhupada's gift to us wasn't the rules and regulations of Krishna consciousness, but rather a deep insight into ourselves, the door to a higher consciousness, the possibility of a life deeper, richer, and broader than the one our parents lived. It was never a guarantee. I'm not afraid, said George, 
looking straight and deep into my eyes. Not even the pain. I'll tell you something, man. I've never had to rely on faith in my spiritual life because I know, I've always known since I was a kid, that God is real and we are an intimate part of him. Maybe one of the reasons I wasted so much time was because I was so sure of an afterlife. Now I see it just made me smarmy and preachy. I could have done so much more than I did, helped so many more people understand. But part of being a beetle was having the whole world thrown at you, and whatever you wanted, whenever it came around. For a long time I fell into the trap. I became smug. When I was with Ravi Shankar, I was a sort of all-purpose Hindu, thinking Shiva, Durga, Krishna, Rama are all one. But when I was with Prabhupada, I understood and accepted that Krishna was truly supreme. I'd hang out with my muso friends in London, and it would all somehow just slip away into whatever party was happening. Again, I argued. But it all brought you here now, to a really good place. Look, 99% of the world thinks they are their bodies. They have only one life and need to screw out every last bit of enjoyment they can. But you were too hip for that, man. I come here every morning, George, and I see a lot of highly advanced souls, a lot of very purified, renounced, almost egolessly invisible beings on these old stone steps, men and women on the thinnest strings between life and death, completely transcendental to their own personal drama. They have achieved the goal. I see you like that, I said, choking a little bit on the pure emotion of the moment. George immediately raised his hand and rebuffed me. I see these people too, but believe me, I'm not one of them. Prabhupada once told me, time doesn't make saints, only old men. I've tried, but mostly, to be honest with you, I feel I've failed. I failed Srila Prabhupada, failed my family, failed the people that looked up to me, and failed Krishna as well. I smiled. That's exactly the way you should feel, George. Prabhupada said that the moment anyone feels himself spiritually advanced, they're finished. All I can tell you is that what I see, and I've been a devotee for almost thirty years now, living here in Benares for the last four, I see a heart empty of ego and pride, and after everything you've been given and accomplished, that seems almost superhuman to me. Anything I have, countered Harrison, by his darting eyes seemingly wanting to end the somewhat embarrassing conversation, is simply grace. It's nothing I've earned, won, even achieved, but whatever spiritual consciousness I do have or have managed to hang on to is simply a gift of grace. It's the only thing I have and the only thing that I'll take with me. But I'm grateful for it. I don't even worry about my family, really. I know Krishna will take care of them. Just one more thing, George, I said, rising from my kneeling position on the cold, mossy stone steps of the Ghat. There are tens of thousands of souls all over the world who first heard of Krishna and yoga from you, and that changed their lives forever, too. When Prabhupada was alone without resources, you helped him. There are many, many people out there today who are inspired to spiritual life by your example. What did Prabhupada say? Whatever a great man does, common men will follow, and by his actions all the world pursues. Haribo, brother. I squeezed him gently around the neck. He put his hand on my knee and patted me and silently looked out over the rolling Ganges now strewn with swifty floating floral offerings with lit camphor sticks stuck in the middle of these floating prayers. I walked away, stopped to look back just once. What I saw was what I saw every day, an old yogi saying his prayers, worshipping the river, making peace with himself and God, understanding who he once was in this world, amongst all the retired Indian civil servants and doddering primary school headmasters, jarred me a little, but that was just the drama of his life, and it was clearly almost over. George then slowly disappeared, like so many I'd seen before, into the river and into himself. Sometime later, I'd heard he'd died somewhere high in the Hollywood Hills, 
As far as I could see, death had very little hold over George Harrison. To paraphrase one of the sonnets of William Shakespeare, For I shall feed on death that feeds on men, and death once dead, there's no more dying then. Clearly, Harrison slowly had been killing the death within himself for years. It was the art of dying he sang about on all things must pass, and he achieved it with my guru, Srila Prabhupada, being the only other living soul I've known to beat death at its own game. Harrison's health declined throughout the autumn, and Olivia was desperate for a way to extend her husband's life or at least lessen his severe pain. After hours of Internet research, she was led to Dr. Gil Lederman, who performed experimental cancer treatments at Staten Island University in New York. At the end of October, George and his family flew to the USA for him to try Dr. Liedemann's non-invasive procedure known as fractinated stereotactic radiosurgery. After a frame had been attached to the head, focused beams of radiation were aimed directly at the tumor, zapping it with such precise accuracy that the surrounding healthy tissue suffered only minimal damage. The beams were also rotated around the body, enabling the tumor to be attacked from all directions. Although the treatment boasted a 90% cure rate for brain lesions, it could not halt the metastatic speed of the cancer's primary source, the lung. In cases like Harrison, the treatment only served to relieve the severe pain of the final stage of cancer. As one male nurse observed, George appeared very frail and gaunt when he entered the hospital in a wheelchair. It was shocking to see him that way after thinking of him as so young and vital for all those years. Dr. Liedemann described his patient's final days at the hospital as quiet and dignified. George was very different from many people in that he didn't have any fear of death. He felt life and death were part of the same process. When he was stabbed in his home two years ago, he got up with the knife having been in his chest and went to the balcony and cried Hare Krishna. He was always a very religious man. I think he will remain a legend. I believe for generations people will talk about George Harrison and his music. At the beginning of November, the public realized the end was near when Paul and Ringo gathered at his hospital bed. Afterwards, McCartney told the press, the best thing for me was seeing him and for a couple of hours laughing and joking and holding his hand. Afterwards, I'd realized I'd never held his hand before. We'd been to school together, we'd got on buses together, and we didn't hold each other's hands. It was great moral compensation. He was rubbing his thumb up and down my hand, and it was very nice. George Harrison and McCartney had their differences over the years, but these, thankfully, were all settled when George looked up at Paul and said quietly, None of that matters anymore. For Ringo... It was an especially wrenching time, laced with bitter ironies. His only daughter, fashion designer Lee Starkey, aged 31, was in Boston's Bingham and Women's Hospital, fighting her own battle with brain cancer for the second time. She was reportedly receiving radical radiation treatment for a secondary tumor. Finally discharged from hospital on 10 November, George and his family flew to Los Angeles on the evening of Thursday, 22 November, from JFK aboard a private jet owned by actor Jim Carrey. George almost died on the way. He was lying in a hospital bed, fitted into the aircraft by the aviation firm after they removed several rows of seats. Every move he made was excruciatingly painful, and at times he even hallucinated. He did not want to return to Friar Park because he knew the media vultures would be lurking outside the gates awaiting news of his death. His body would have to be taken out in a hearse or an undertaker's van, and he didn't want that photograph to be his epitaph. In a last-ditch attempt to buy himself a little more time, Harrison endured a taxing course of chemotherapy at the UCA Medical Center in Los Angeles. I don't think he'd ever have an unrealistic perception of his grave condition. George Harrison is a very spiritual person. He believes death is an integral part of life. I doubt he'd be inclined to fight death. On the 29th, family and a few close friends gathered at his bedside in a private estate in the Hollywood Hills. In addition to Olivia and Dani, Ravi Shankar, his wife, their daughter Anushka, and Hare Krishna friends Mukunda and Shamasundar were there. 
George drifted in and out of consciousness as he chanted Hare Krishna, Anushka later remarked. We used to say that Uncle George was more Indian than an Indian. He chanted Hare Krishna, he said, because it helped him to see God. Ravi noted, George looked so peaceful, surrounded by love. He was a brave, beautiful soul, full of love, childlike humor, and a deep spirituality. Finally, in the early afternoon, just two hours after the two Hare Krishna monks had left, George stopped chanting and whispered that he was taking his final breath. Paul McCartney later described it as a golden moment. He died at 1.30 p.m. on 29 November 2001, as he had lived, in touch with his higher power, the Lord Bhagavan Sri Krishna. In the minds of those closest to him, he had finally gone home. Typically, Harrison had left strict instructions for what was to happen after his death. The first stop was the Hollywood Forever Funeral Firm. Production director Annette Lloyd recalled, We received the first call about 20 minutes after Mr. Harrison's death. All they told us was that a VIP had died, and they didn't give us the name. Two members of our staff at the home proceeded to the address given. It was at this point they found out it was George Harrison. Before the body was taken from the home to the doctor's office, the family and staff and security team joined hands and said a prayer around him. That was the only instance I know of any kind of informal, very brief prayer. The flower garland body was transported to George's doctor's surgery, Olivia and Donny following in a separate car. There the doctor signed the death certificate. It was later revealed that the Harrisons had opted for a direct cremation, without ceremony, chapel, or even a coffin. His ashes were then put into an urn. Despite worldwide speculation that Harrison's ashes would be strewn in India, at Friar Park, or even in Liverpool, the official export license for them, issued to the family in Los Angeles, listed George's permanent address as his Swiss villa and the final destination of the ashes. Vedic scholar Rosen said, in the Hare Krishna tradition, the body is quickly cremated, so there are no subtle aspects of the being hovering by its remains. The living entity is then able to go back to Krishna, because the body is completely finished. The music on which George was working until he died was finished by Donhi and Jeff Lynn and released on Dark Horse Records and EMI on Tuesday, 19 November 2002. Entitled Brainwashed, it was recorded under the working title of Your Planet is Doomed and Portrait of a Leg End. The album featured 11 new compositions. After Harrison's death, rumors circulated about his will, drawn up four months earlier. When details were finally revealed on 29 November 2002, it appeared that he had outwitted everyone, including the tax man. His estate was valued at over 99 million pounds, but was reduced to 98 million pounds after expenses. Although the document listed his address as Switzerland, it stated that he was a British subject, and thereby his affairs would be handled under British law. Of his many properties, including his Maui bungalow, the Swiss villa, and his beloved Friar Park, were said to be worth 15 million pounds. The bulk of his wealth had been accumulated from royalties occurring from his 1970 hit My Sweet Lord and the 1979 Monty Python classic film Life of Brian, which had started his successful career as a film producer. Noticeably absent from George's will was any bequest to the Hare Krishna movement. For months it had been assumed that he would bequeath a tenth of his fortune to the faith he had embraced. Krishna disciples were quick to point out that he had already donated generously during his lifetime to the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. They vowed to create a memorial garden to him in Mayapur, north of Calcutta. George left his entire fortune to Olivia and Dani. He placed the estate in trust, and with the many sizable charitable donations he had made earlier, he bypassed inheritance tax. Harrison was determined that the taxman would not collect one for you, nineteen for me, as his biting lyric ran. The will further granted Olivia and Donhi the power to transfer funds from the trust as they saw fit, and the freedom to purchase homes 
anywhere in the world. Ringo Starr has returned to the pure joy of making music and touring the world with his all-star band. He continues to delight audiences with an eclectic mix of his own greatest hits and those of his musical colleagues. Of course, all of his childhood dreams of stardom were fulfilled in the years of Beatlemania, and those who know him say that apart from his easy-going good nature, he is deeply spiritual and harbors no illusions either about his glorious past or his responsibilities as a concerned citizen of the earth. Liberal in his politics, kind and compassionate by nature, he is quiet about the causes he generously supports. The loss of John and George weighs heavily on Ringo, but inspires him to live each day in as uplifting a way as possible. It seems somehow fitting that this icon should be one of the last men standing from the magical time that spawned not only the Beatles, but also the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, Woodstock, and a generation of turned-on, spiritually conscious rock and roll seekers. It was not without good reason that one of Ringo's most recent albums was called Vertical Man. In the end, when the Beatles and their original fans had all grown up and moved on, there was only the music, a living legacy of the genius of four young men from northern England. There was in them that most elusive and special of all gifts, pure magic. Although it can be marketed, managed, even bought and sold, magic can never be manufactured. It is a gift from God to the artist and the artist to his audience. Finally, when the songs have all been sung and the composers silenced by time, it is the magic within the infinity of musical possibility that will draw people together, the spark of a fire bigger than we will ever know. De studio in levende lijven. Uh, dat zeg ik dan wel in levende lijven, maar de Beatles die zijn hier nog niet. En van die gelegenheid kunnen dan de hier aanwezige tieners, teenagers mag ik misschien wel zeggen, uh, gebruik maken om de Beatles allerlei vragen te stellen. Het is namelijk zo dat de Beatles zijn dus in een andere ruimte. Ze kunnen jullie zien, ze kunnen jullie dus ook horen. En uh, ik dacht het is een unieke gelegenheid om alles maar te vragen aan de Beatles wat je wil. Wie zou er iets willen vragen? Helemaal er bovenop, dan moet je wel even gillen. Of de Beatles verliefd zijn, dan wil je ook nog weten natuurlijk op wie. Of de Beatles verliefd zijn. Nou, Berend Boudewijn, mag ik er even bij ondertussen? Berend Boudewijn zit in de andere ruimte bij de Beatles. En die uh, kan misschien die vraag wel eens even herhalen. Beatles zijn jullie verliefd? Hier in de foyer aan de bar achter mij zitten ze dan echt, de Beatles. Yeah, first of all, you introduce yourselves. George so, Harrison, Paul McCartney, John Leffer, Jimmy Nichol. The question we just had from one of the uh, people in the audience is, were any of you in love? Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's married. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Does that put you in an exceptional position? Oh, Being married? Sunday, yeah. It's Sunday. <laughs> Do you want to get married, the others? No, I don't like marriage. Why not? No good, no good marriage. It's good. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. It's when I've got some more money. Cost money to get married? Well, you need a bit, don't you? No. To marry? You need a new suit and half and that. Did your wife expensive? <laughs> quite, quite. Yes. How much did she cost when you bought her? Uh, she was about 50 pounds in Nairobi. But she was second hand, <laughs> wasn't she? <laughs> was, she was she second hand? How dare you? What did he say? Herman, nog een vraag, Gert. Ja, uh, hier is een jongen die wil daar meteen eigenlijk op aansluitend. Ja, Hoe vinden de Beatles de Hollandse meisjes? Um, well, yeah. uh, what, what do you think of Dutch girls, as far as you've seen them? Any views? Very good, yes. Very good? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Hmm? Why? What did you say? Why? Why are they good? Yeah. Well, all girls are good, actually, you know, but I mean... What makes a girl good? <laughs> What makes a girl good? I don't know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm just helping it. <laughs> ja, Berend. Berend. Ja. Die meisjes doen alles om bij de Beatles in de gunst te komen. Uh, u moet eens kijken, ze hebben zichzelf in geweldige Beatlejurken gestoken. Uh, dat kun... Ja, ga staan, ga eens even staan. En daarachter staat er nog een. Dat zijn uh, dezelfde meisjes die vanmorgen in Volendams kostuum... Uh, bloemen hebben aangeboden. 
Uh, the Beetlejuice. same ones who were on the costume this morning. That's quite a change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this, this, this Beetle dress. I think uh, this one. This one, I think. Yeah, it makes money for you. No. No, it's uh, the other one's a bit old-fashioned, isn't it? Like yeah. the clogs. This, this thing with the clogs. If you were a girl, you were not a Beetle, would you wear a dress like that? Well, the girls look better, don't they, than they did this morning. You're right. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Next question, please. Zij de liefde voor de Beatles. Ze kent geen grenzen, want er is zelfs een meisje hier helemaal uit. Waar kom je vandaan? Bangkok. Ga jij eens even staan, dat iedereen je goed kan zien. Oh. Zal ik even gaan zitten? Ja. Waarom, waarom kom je helemaal uit Bangkok voor de Beatles? Komen ze toch ook in Hongkong? Uh, niet dichterbij. Nou, maar ze komen niet te Bangkok, geloof ik hoor. En is Hongkong niet dichterbij Bangkok dan uh, Hillegom? Misschien wel, maar ik ken niemand in Hongkong. <laughs> hier wel? Ja, zeker. En heb je contact met ze gehad? Heb je gesproken? Jazeker. En vallen ze nu tegen of vallen ze mee? Nee, ze vallen wel mee hoor. <laughs> Mag ik jou dan een vraag stellen? Vind jij de Beatles zonder Ringo de Beatles? Nee, maar zeg dat nou maar niet tegen die andere jongen. <laughs> Goed, dankjewel. Dankjewel. Uh, wie had er nog een vraag? Jij? Nou ja, ik wilde dus vragen of de Beatles buiten dus Engeland of in Engeland zelf nog bepaalde favoriete bandjes hebben, zoals Swing Blue Jeans, Dave Clark 5, Fred in the Dreamers of zo. Ja, ja. Iets van die naart. Dus. Ja, ja. Well, you, you heard the names they mentioned. Whether you have any favorites in England uh, with the new band? Searchers. Searchers and the Rolling Stones, would I? Thank you. Jij had nog een vraag, helemaal uit Bangkok, nog een vraag. Nee, ik had een vraag. Oh, zei ja. Ik had een vraag of uh, Jimmy het moeilijk vond om die rol van Ringo zo ineens over te nemen. Ja. <coughs> You're on, Jimmy. Well, what do you find it difficult to take over the role of Ringo? Uh, no, not really. No. <laughs> as far as Ringo, I can never, um, I can never make up for what Ringo is, you know. How, how I just try. Um, until next Thursday. Next Thursday. Yes. So you're sort of understudy. Yes, I am. You think it's a great break? Oh yes. Hey, okay, nice. Treating you good? <laughs> no. <laughs> how is Ringo, by the way? He's he's get, I think he's getting better. Yeah. Oh, we're off. He's ill. <laughs> 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 Uh, ik wilde graag vragen of ze die opname met uh, Tony, Tony Sheridan in uh, Amber, Amber. Of, dat ze ook, of dat ze ook een Beatle opname hebben. Ja, heb je dat gehoord, Berend? Ja. Die opname die ze dus jaren geleden gemaakt hebben in Hamburg in de Twistkelder met Tony Sheridan. Of dat dus ook echte Beatle opnames zijn, wat zij daarvan denken? Do you consider that the record you made with Tony Sheridan in the Star Club in Hamburg, do you consider that the real Beatle record? No, no, because most of them Tony Sheridan sings. You know, so it's not. And they were made three years ago, anyway. I don't think they're very good records, anyway. And You've improved. A bit. I hope so. You've changed. Changed. <laughs> Wouldn't say improved. We've improved, yeah. You think that that, that the style and in, in, in taste will will differ? Ballads will come in. Or... No. Well, they, they always, they always have get a good ballad sometimes. Would you sing with a big band without the guitars? No. You wouldn't. No. People don't like the guitars. You quit. Yeah, yeah. Probably. That's, that's, that's a question that people always ask you: What happens when you when you quit and how long it will go on? We have a big holiday when we quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bernd. Here. Yeah. Of the Beatles have more instruments to play than just guitar and drums? Whether you play any other musical instruments beside the guitar and the drums? Yeah. Uh, I play mouth organ. Mouth organ. And a little piano. And a little piano. And a little banjo. I play. A little piano, it's about that big, <laughs> very little piano, and uh, <laughs> with what finger? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we can all play little bits of other instruments. You, you write your own songs. We hebben een, uh, oh. een, een maandagvraag eigenlijk zou ik het willen noemen. Het gaat geloof ik over de was. Kom eens hier, jij had iets, een heel praktische vraag. Hè? Uh, wie stopt hun sokkels op reis heen? <laughs> Who mends your stockings when you're on journey? All your stockings, yeah. socks, socks. socks. <laughs> no, um, we don't. Nobody. Just have them washed. <laughs> no holes in them. No. no nylon. nylon. <laughs> <We're> good. <laughs> That's a commercial. <laughs> All right. Next uh, question, please. Do the Beatles nog een sport? Of zou ik nog een sport doen? That's another brilliant question, whether you <laughs> indulge in sports. No, just swimming, water skiing, oh, ah, yes. Oh, makes me oh. Makes hell you? I say sport makes me ill. Sport makes you ill. Makes yeah. me ill, too. Yeah. What, what makes you ill? Uh, uh, sleeping. Sleeping. And eating. We go fishing and cycling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Ja, dat hysterische gedoe dat dus altijd bij een Beatle optreden behoort te zijn. Vinden zij dat een bepaald nodig? Of hebben zij een bepaalde voorkeur voor een rustige publiek? Ah. I'm translating the question. Ja, yeah. dat moet je wel weer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whether you think that the hysterical public is necessary for your act? Not necessary, but it helps. You know, it gives a good atmosphere. We we all love it. Do you think it when is hysterical? Because there's some is. Some no, is. but it's nice when there's a lot of noise it's going atmosphere. on. It's like a football match. Mm. You know, when there's a lot of noise going on, it's it's good. It's a good feeling. Go. Gold. But yeah. why is it always the girls? The more girls are interested. In Paris. Well, that's because yeah. we're fellas, you know. If it was all boys, there'd be something funny. Weer is hier een brandende vraag naar voren gekomen over dat zwemmen, of ze dan een badmuts dragen. This is a very great question. Uh, Van een meisje, hoor. From a girl, whether you wear something on your head when you're swimming. No. 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 It's, it's wet. It's wet. Oh, wet. Yeah. Same as everybody else is. Uh, it's real. Iemand anders vroeg of de, de aankomst die dus hier in Nederland uh, hun te beurt viel overal gelijk is. Recht meer vanaf. Dit is another question whether the, the um, there was any difference in the reception you received in Holland from the reception in other countries. No, well it was different, different language. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But it was a great. We had a bit of a fight. Fight with who? The press. The press had a fight with the police. Yeah, that that was the that only was difference. A bit different. The, the reception board. The reception from all the, you know, the, the teenagers and things was great. Yeah, teenagers. Very good. Very, very good. good. <laughs> weer de vraag waar ik wel eens uh, moeite mee heb gehad. Ik heb namelijk, uh, afijn, je hoort het wel. Ik heb namelijk diezelfde bewering alles gedaan. <coughs> uh, wat betekent het woord Beatles nou precies? Kever of uh, of beat? Uh, veel succes. Yes. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. Of het ritme wil zeggen dus de beat of kever. The exact meaning yeah. of the word Beatle. Who explains? Yeah, it's cave. Kafer. Kafer. That's, that's Beatle. Kafer in England is Beatle. Only oh. with double E, B, E, E, T. And then it's B, E, A, T. Oh, you get it? That's it? Good. Dan is er een vraag van iemand, Berend, daar kan ik namelijk niet bij komen met het microfoon, maar uh, die wilde graag weten wanneer het, uh, het hele beeld van de, de tienermuziek, van de popmusic gaat veranderen, of dan de Beatles meegaan. He, dat zij dus als dus op een gegeven ogenblik Big Band helemaal in is, gaan ze dan bij een Big Band zingen en uh, gaan de gitaren dan aan de kant. I, I think that I'm more or less asked is whether you will go along with any change in taste. Uh, no. Well, you, you never know because we have well, we gone along with anyway, with, with, with Yeah. We don't notice that ourselves, but people always say that we've changed a bit. We can't notice it, so we probably will change a little. But, we wouldn't um, play trad. We music. wouldn't do anything drastic, like you say, with a big band or anything like that, because we don't enjoy that kind of music. You just do this kind of music because you enjoy it. Because we it. like it. Well, that's, you know, that's the main reason. If we didn't, we'd give up tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So right, it's, right. it's not for the money. You well, well, we played for five or six years without money. With no you money. put it off. Is there nog een vraagje? Voor uh, Ringo eigenlijk, hè? Beatles, willen jullie veel goed aan Ringo doen? Oh, this girl. <laughs> Meer de groeten dus. Do en er was er nog één vraag van hier. Wanneer gaat het nou eens beginnen? <laughs> wanneer, de Beatles, wanneer de Beatles nou eens gaan beginnen? Nou, je ziet, ze zitten daar enorm gezellig. Uh, Herman, uh, vraag maar of, ze, of de zaal daar uh, bereid toe is. Ja, uh, zou iedereen uh, het leuk vinden wanneer de Beatles nu hier binnenkwamen? Let's meet the Beatles. I've got Paul and, and John. John. And Paul's talking to George and Ringo. Well, I said in my intro, and you were listening to it, that there have been a lot of changes since this time last year. Mm. Well, we've seen them, you know, we've seen you making films and doing all sorts of marvelous things, but what have the changes meant to you? Um, 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 uh, nothing really. I think the main changes are, are in people's attitude attitudes to you. How? I don't know. Um, but it's it's people who change rather than you. You know, we feel exactly the same, really. Got a new suit, though. <laughs> but you've made a film since then. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. just finished it. Yeah. Uh, Why did you make a film? Well, it's a logical step, isn't it? And it, I believe it's quite lucrative. I believe. Anyway, someone asked us. You know, yeah, we were asked to do it. And we said, yeah. 
and Alan Owen wrote it, and we changed it, and we're all everybody's happy. It's called happy. A Hard Day's Night. Hard Day's Night. At your local night. cinema now. Not now. Not, not now. now. Soon. Did you prefer this time last year, or do you really like no, the like, time? I like whatever's happening at the moment. Yeah, there's, there's good in both of them. For the stages. You know, it was great then. And it's, it's lovely now. Not Despite different. whether people are rude or not. Oh, I think yeah. that. Mm. What do you think about people who maybe, you know, didn't like you then or said something nasty or just didn't bother about you then, but are terribly nice to you now? Well, we didn't bother about them then. You know, and we, we don't, don't bother, bother about, about them now. now. <laughs> do you know something? Well, I believe it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> what difference is there since last June up to now? What sort of things have happened to you since then? The main difference is that we've got more money and uh, less time to ourselves. You know, everything's speeded up and we're just running around like mad. And which of the two do you, would you prefer to have? Well, more money or less time? More money and less time, <laughs> I think. If you ever manage to get away from the crowds, what sort of things do you like to do? Um, sleep, uh, see films, Go to nightclubs, drive my car, and that's it. Play records, watch TV. What sort of records? Just ordinary things. What sort of records do you like doing? Uh, to listening to all, well, all my records are sort of American ones. People who you probably haven't heard of. Thank you. Arthur Askey, <laughs> Bert Sweden. <laughs> Do you find any difficulty in keeping up your public image, just... No. What image? It's our image is just us, you know, yeah, as we were. We Shana didn't Bruce. try and um, make an image. It just happened, and so we don't have to keep it up. We just remain ourselves. Don't we, Ringo? Well, aren't we do, I mean. We <laughs> don't the other two are worried about it. <laughs> you write very good songs. Oh, don't oh, you? Thank you, uh, thank you. How do you write songs? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we just depend. Sometimes we write them on old pianos and anything that's lying around, you know. Old yeah. tramps. <laughs> Doesn't do the piano into... any good, does it? <clears throat> no, it's murder getting into the recording studio. I've got a song, <laughs> George, on a great big piano. <clears throat> but uh, guitars and things, you know, normally we sit down and try and bash one out or anything. But uh, then again, there's no formula, because he can come up with one one day completely finished. We still say we both wrote it, though. When did you start right. writing songs? I was about two, I think. <laughs> I wrote, pass me the bread, mother. <laughs> like that. No, no, it's more like about, when you were about... About 13 or 14. Yeah. When I got a guitar. Writing them seriously. Oh, what's the one you wrote? Down at the <laughs> <laughs> We have funny songs, then. Mine was, I lost my little girl. Did you know each other when you were 13? Yeah, yeah. that's when we met. Really? Yeah. Tell us about the music. At Wilton Village Fate. I was playing at a garden fate in the, oh, the village where I lived, or playing just outside what? Liverpool. Just playing. playing with a group. In a group. No, the skipper group. And he came along and we met. And I knew one of his mates, you know, Ivan, was in person. A mutual Very mate. Complicated. A mutual mate of ours. And he introduced us and things. In those days, had yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In those days, has your attitude to fans has your attitude to fans changed since then? No, no, there's just more of them to watch. But they all scream when they're listening to you. To yeah, but we you. love that, you know. Do you we, really? Yeah, really, because it, like uh, in Edinburgh, you know, it, I mean, you know, it's Glasgow tonight. Um, Yesterday, last week. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I've lost track of time. Anyway, the atmosphere in the theatre, really, it's marvellous. You know, it must come. I will do. I'll try to come. Good. John, about your book. Uh, John. How did you go about writing this book? Uh, well, a sort of pen and paper and that. Mm. Oh, that's about and it. words, too. Uh, I just sort of wrote it, you know, the hobby. Is this a stage that you went through, writing in this sort of garbled language that you have got out of now, have you? No, there's a lot of it. I can't <laughs> <deal with it. laughs> well, either more polite or more rude, you know, yeah. from one extreme to the, to the other. Where's he gone? <laughs> Class. Oh. What's the most interesting person that you've ever met? I should say, who's the most interesting person you've ever met? Um, John Lennon. <laughs> George? Um, Harry Seacombe, I think. Oh. Harry Seacombe, yeah, he's great, I like him. Is that the kind of person that you like? Yeah. Have you ever been frightened of your fans? A time um, when they've really frightened you? Only... Paul's frightened me a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Only times when... Uh, 
getting in and out of places when there's thousands of them all together. But when you usually only meet about the most six or seven, you know, if you were sort of running along the road, mm. and then there's not enough of them then, is there, to sort of you don't, make you fly? You don't mind that too much? No. Yeah. Do you never feel lonely sitting at the back? No, 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 I, that's where I am, you see. The drummer should always be at the back. The drummer right, should be heard and not seen. <laughs> Ringo, how do you feel about sitting, playing on stage and being showered with things like jelly babies, boots, girls, things like that? Um... Well, I'm lucky being at the back, you know, <laughs> the other three have it worse than I do, but uh, it's a, sometimes it's, it's a bit of a drag. It's not much fun, actually. <laughs> you know, no, it's your first Yeah, because yeah, if actually we've had things hit us in the eye, which mm. very hard. and if you're listening, don't throw them in your eye, it's dangerous, <laughs> you know, bad, you get it Hello, eye. boys, how are you doing? Hello, Hello chef. Hello. How are you doing? You can get up now. I Thank pronounce you your man and wait. <laughs> What did you think of your wet welcome today? Very good. I thought they were very nice coming out in all that rain. Yeah, it was great. Did it's you enjoy the rain? Oh, yeah, well, well funny seen seen standing the there in your new coat. <laughs> <laughs> seen as they got so, so you know. Yeah. We didn't mind. We'd like to pay a tribute for you for uh, coming on the open cut uh, in, in that cut round because uh, the kids have been waiting all night and they appreciate it. Well, they deserved it, didn't they, waiting all night? Yeah. I hope you were wearing oh, drip-dry clothes, were you? No, we just do. We thought it was going to be sunny. Uh, <laughs> George, yeah, yeah. Yeah. who selected the names of the Beatles and yeah. how did you derive this particular name? Was well, it was Lee, the, uh, instead of John Beatles. got the name Beatles. Uh, in a very A-E-A-T-L-E-S. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that makes a film of Can't Act, you know. <laughs> Are you individually millionaires yet? No, that's another lousy room, I wish we were. Brian Epstein a millionaire? No, even he's not one, poor fellow. He's Where does all the money go? Well, a lot of it goes to Her Majesty. <laughs> <laughs> She's a millionaire. <laughs> Isn't it a bit disconcerting when you go on stage and uh, do your numbers and all nobody hears them because all the girls are screaming? Well, it's usually adults who don't hear them. You know, like in Hong Kong, the, in the paper it said, the Beatles fought a losing battle against the screams. Now, compared with other people, they were quite quiet. You know, they were yeah. still shouting. And most of the kids could hear it, but adults went out thinking, I couldn't hear a thing. Are you very conscious of your responsibilities? I mean, teenagers dwell on your every comment and action. Do you feel very responsible towards this? No, we just... Uh, behave as normally as we can, you know, we don't feel as though we should preach this and tell them that, you know, let them do what they like. Right? You know, we, we, we never used to believe yeah. it when in the, old, in the old days we used to open a magazine and it'd say, uh, so-and-so doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't go out late. We used to do a yeah. to do them. <laughs> It's funny. So, I mean, you know, we just act normally and just hope that other people don't think we're a bit funny. Now, you say you act normally, but how can you? How can you when you're getting so much money, when everywhere you go, people are crediting around, you can't normal. see anything? Well, you know, I mean, normal in, in the, as in the environment. As we can. In the environment that it surrounds you, like, like well, you're not just normal as you right. can't, don't you? <laughs> that. Correct, right, correct, correct, right. Plus, the original record, after about eight years, coming back and topping the uh, charts around the world. Well, it hasn't topped the charts around the world yet, have you? I think it's sold a lot here. Sold a lot here, but I doubt. I don't think it's selling very well. If it does, we're glad. That's what we like. Rock and roll. That's how it starts again. Goody goody. And also, you've brought back Dave Matthews and Bill Wilson. Yeah, Bill Wilson. 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 It never gone off people like that, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee. Little so you've more or less revived rock and roll? Well, you know, revived interest in, in, in the beat music, that's all, really. Yeah. How do you fellows feel about the sort of music that people like 10, 12, 15 years ago, uh, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, this type of music? Yeah. Do you like it or do you only like rock and roll? No, but that's not the point. You know, you know. Recently, Errol Fitzgerald's done. Errol, 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 Errol Fitzgerald uh, did "Can't Buy Me Love." Mm -hmm. Have yeah. you heard it? Well, but she did it like Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah. yeah so, so you know, the, the, it doesn't to do it like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> 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 this would be a great <laughs> couple to <laughs> see your voice. When yeah, but I mean, you know, it flatters, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, it, it, jazz it, flat. You know, it doesn't necessarily <laughs> have to be jazz. Right. Because it's one of our songs, you know, we don't reckon we write jazz. What she sort of did it with the jazz. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Yeah. Right. You just don't not, only like uh, the modern. We like modern all kinds of music. Uh, you know, whatever appeals to us, if it's good music for us. And if what? Good? I just got know. lost again. Do you find much uh, <laughs> jealousy amongst other groups in England about you? Not, Never across it at all? not really, because most of the top groups out there are friends of ours, so there's none of that. You know, the, the jealousy is only something they mix up in the papers. You know, obviously they've got to keep the sort of thing going. And then, so all the groups that are anything out there are sort of best mates. Here, so and if any of them don't like us, then they don't sort of tell it to our faces. Anyway. <laughs> what's we'll just say behind our backs. <laughs> what's your favourite entertainment medium? What, what do you like, best theatre or uh, uh, television? Or? I like. Uh, Films. Oh, no. 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 He's going but straight. He's going straight. You, uh, uh, no, you, you right don't mean for, you mean for yeah, us? For the Beatles, yes. Oh, I thought you meant for uh, when watch. we're watching, having <laughs> been no, entertained. No. Oh, well, I don't know, really. I think live shows are pretty good. But they're all, they're they're all good because you've got to change. Yeah. So that's Not the best thing again, you know, all of them together. No, right. Is it true that uh, you originally uh, auditioned for two record companies before you were finally signed by EMI Records? Yeah, uh, yeah. we made tapes for Decca and I think... And Pi. And, and, uh, yeah, but we in didn't fact, actually go to Pi. In fact, yeah. EMI turned us down, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> they did? Yeah, first oh, of all. you may laugh, you may laugh. <laughs> but Don't blame them after hearing the tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and then George Martin, he, he from EMI, he decided to sign us up just himself, you see. I think I've got all the songs on. <laughs> how many records? Have, have you got any idea how many records you have sold? 
around the world? No, yeah, I have just a rough thing. idea. Blast. I asked our publisher for, to give me an idea. Last I heard it was around mm. about 30 million. Oh. 30 million? Oh, yeah. I don't understand. So <laughs> complaining, but no. you know, it's always raining. Who has yeah. a Jago now? It's Paul, isn't it? No, it's George. George. No. You won't yeah. read music? I gave it no, no, none of us. <laughs> comics, we've got a comic. <laughs> You're talking about how you do like to be entertained. How do you like to be entertained? What's your buzz from Tom Films, films, films yeah. shows, <coughs> nightclubs, cabaret, and things like that. Any you can go to a cabaret with that. Yeah. Means mob. Yeah, well, don't like people don't walk around in mobs, you know. Is it true <laughs> you, you can go <laughs> outside? I know, but I mean, if you go to a nightclub, you're not going to bump into 500 kids, are you? This you nightclub know, in Liverpool, know. the Blue Angel, is that a nightclub you can sort of go to and relax? It was when we were up there a lot, you know. I don't know. All, all, a lot of places in Liverpool have got sort of... Commercialised. <laughs> Commercialised, so that people come from all over the place to have a look at them, you know, so I don't know, no, I haven't been for years. Have you played the cannon at all, then? I haven't played that for, I don't know. Oh, oh. This might be a good one for you to answer. Oh, wow. uh, did you people want to come to Australia? Really? But they're not booked completely without our knowledge. We're told that there's a possibility you might be going here or there, and if we wouldn't, didn't like it, we'd say. No, so you did. Because after X time, we said, yeah, because you know it's the place to go. Well, great. Now, what was your Darwin it? reception like, by the way? It's very good. We, we didn't yeah, know it was, it was three in the morning, <laughs> I think, and we didn't know it until we got about an hour away from it. So apparently the press in Darwin Pardon Pardon all day. Apparently, <laughs> no, I think they guessed. Only some fella said that the police have been trying to keep it quiet here all day. Look, the BOAC spokesman said... Advertising again. <laughs> said that it, it wasn't definite, but there was a slight He's possibility. He's been trying to get one in for hours. Can I now? Here he is now. Ah. Fellas, did you enjoy doing the uh, Shakespearean excerpt in your TV show? Yeah. Mm. What? Except he made us rehearse for days. Oh. And we still got it wrong. <laughs> would, you, would you like to play legitimate Shakespeare? Yeah. Uh, I'll stand it. <laughs> Did you like the costumes? Yeah, yeah they bad. were good for laughs. Mod. What this lantern that <laughs> the owner of Moon present. Yeah. 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 You've been liking a lot with the Max Brothers. Do you find us a couple? Do you dig this sort of thing? Well, it's a couple. We're not for the half. Yeah, they're funny, aren't they? <laughs> when are you going to play the London Palladium? Oh, we don't know. Would you like to? Oh, we've done it. We've done it a couple of times. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know nothing or anything See? about. What's the no, group you play with say. in England, Jimmy? Huh? What's the group you play with in England? Well, I've played with a lot of groups in England. Just before I left, I was playing with a rhythm and blues band. You were the Blue Flames, weren't you, for once? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, only for a matter of days. Only <laughs> <laughs> till Friday. I only knew that I was doing this on Wednesday. You know. Does so Brian Epstein manage you? I don't really know. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> you know it if he did. <laughs> Jimmy, what was your first reaction when you were told that you were going to play with the Beatles? I couldn't believe it, really. Did you have to, um, to get their style? No, we only rehearsed about five or six numbers, which took up an hour, and then... And away you went? Yeah. If one of them stopped being a Pretty frightening? The first show was very frightening, yeah. Mm. But uh, they reassured me. But he did grand. He did a grand job. job. He yeah. did that. Grand Thanks, job. lad. Right. George, if one of you stopped being a Beatle, what do you think you'd do? Um, I think I'd train elephants in the zoo. We <laughs> <laughs> could I supported that you're the, you're the keen businessman of the group. Is that right? Well, uh, yes, that's what he said on the paper. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I've never heard of it. There's a new one on me. <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know. I'm do you have a contract yet. to remain together as a, a group known as the Beatles? In other words, do you have contracts between yourselves? Well, we've well, got a partnership. Is there some sort of that's contract? That's what you mean. No, uh, what I meant oh, was you mean possibly personally, could just George suddenly decide to leave the Beatles group. Could you do that? I think he could. Well, uh... Of course he could, because, I mean, we would stop him. No, you know, he'd have to leave, but even we'd have to keep him, uh, you know, Stand struggling. I think there is a contract. <laughs> 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 yeah. the con there is a contract between the four of us, but <coughs> if I wanted to leave, then they wouldn't try and stop me, and, or they wouldn't sue me, I don't think, would you, <laughs> Now, now no. apparently you earn many, many thousands of pounds a year, but how much money do you actually get to spend from your manager? Well, we don't get money from him, we get money from our accountant, you know, all our money goes to him. Are you on a regular him. basis? Yeah, well, we don't hardly need anything, you know, because most things are sort of paid through the company, you know. We just hardly spend anything in cash, just cigarettes and things, and even that. 
just they bought by our road now. It's just the, you know. <laughs> we get a, a certain amount a week, and we've, we, you know, we've got at least half of it left. In what about clothing? Week, it's it's also come from the accounting show. No. <coughs> well, sometimes. Yeah, well, know. usually we get our tailor to, you know, we order a few suits or how many we want, and then he'll send the bill into the company. Because it's much easier for, for him to do that as well, and it's easier for us. Well, you've got now, two suits. This leads me to the <laughs> next question. Now, on stage you all dress literally the same, but off stage I notice even here that you're all dressed uh, mm. quite uh, different. Now, is this, this also uh, something uh, you make up yourselves? Or? No, you don't want to. I mean, originally we didn't dress the same. Who decided you from leather to nanny suits? Uh, it was, I think we decided, I think well, we he, he tried to persuade us. Because when we went down south, after, it was all right in Liverpool around there, but as soon as we went anywhere else in sort of jeans and leather jackets, they sort of didn't want to know, you know, because they wanted everybody in grey suits doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you're single chaps. You know how they do it. You're single chaps really don't have any firm plans uh, to get married in the next year. No, I don't like the idea of marriage. It's a bit uh, frightening. Why is that? Tell us more about that. Oh, it is, isn't it? And we're all trying to save up a bit before we get married. <laughs> Did you enjoy your holidays to uh, Tahiti and the Caribbean, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we met one of your... <coughs> Some fella came swimming behind me saying, you're having a good time, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> saying I've come all the way from Sydney. Yeah, as if it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you split up and take your holidays? Like? People like them. It makes it harder for people to press yeah. to catch us up. Before. If we all got together, it's a cinch, you know, going to an airport. And anyway, besides all that, Paul and Ringo fancied going to wherever they went. And didn't really? you ask him something about Liverpool, though? That wasn't the question, was it? Well, uh, I said, yes, he did. Uh, you coming from Liverpool, yeah. what sort of idea do people in Liverpool yes. have about Australia? Sorry. He was right. There's a theory that uh, you're almost as popular with adults as you are with teenagers, and that when teenagers find this out, that they will probably lose interest in you. Do you think that's true? Yeah, well, mm. it's, 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 Maybe. I'm not saying a word. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? A couple of photographs recently came from America showing all of you, I think uh, it was George and Paul, when I saw, swimming, but uh, both photographs in different places showed you with shirts on. Now, is this a regular thing to swim with a shirt on? Uh, I think we were, we were only yeah. posing for the press, and we weren't really swimming. Oh, I see. We're just we just standing in the water. Uh, Only we're actually swimming, as it were, with shirts. Because right. we always wear skin overcoats when we're swimming. White skins with <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <now. laughs> John, what do you attribute to something like Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock? You've written a record after about eight years coming back and topping the uh, charts around the world. Well, it hasn't topped the charts around the world yet, has it? Well, I think it's sold a lot here. Sold a lot here, but I don't think it's selling very well. It's sold a lot. We like rock and roll. That's all we start again. Goody goody. It also you brought back in England with the Beatles. The advent of the Beatles. People like Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard have once again become big names, haven't they? Yeah, but there were there were always groups of people who liked them. You know, especially in places like Liverpool, there were always staunch groups of fans who who've never. People behind yeah, me saying, you're having a good time, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. Saying I've come all the way from Sydney. Yeah, as if it was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you split up and take your holidays? People like them. <laughs> it makes it harder for people with the press to catch us up. Before. If we all got together, it's a thing to go to the airport. And anyway, besides all that, Paul and Ringo fancied going to wherever they went. And and I don't know what happened to us. We just Somebody have. just gave us the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and we just ended up there. When Jerry and the pacemakers are out here, they rubbish the Australian beer. If you had a go at Australian beer, you'd be trying to... I'm not keen on I beer. I don't like any beer. beer. What, what are you like? Scotch and Coke. Scotch and Coke, yeah. Teenage Scotch. Is, is that a drink that's uh, drunk a lot in, in England? No. I don't we know. got in, in Germany because we didn't like German beer. Apparently the real ones, rum and Coke. That's the one that everyone knows. Oh, right? yeah. Well, uh, someone gave us Scotch. <laughs> they like all it. drink it in Tahiti, we found out. Oh, yeah. That's the best of them. Normal drink. Well, it's got some coke. But it's cold, I think. It's got some coke. When you work, it's true that you have a lot of coke. Thanks, Dave. You drink a lot of coke. Yeah. Well, you know, just cold drinks. And it happens to be lemonade, it doesn't matter. How did you feel before we showed you? Still nervous? Yeah. It's all motion on the show, where it is and what it is. How big it is. Yeah. Well, it's just a new place. You know, yeah. Yeah, even if it's, it can be a small show and a very new place and you still get very nervous. You get nervous on the, the most ridiculous of things too. 
the, the Mersey Beat Awards. Tell me about, we've got what we've got an award from uh, a Liverpool paper, the Mersey Beat. And, you know, it was only, quite a, it was only quite a small thing. Uh, it's quite a small thing. The award giving compared to some of the big shows we've been doing, but we were all nervous. Well, 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 Mm, Wind and fire, economy, yeah. Pardon? No, but I mean, it, it just happens. It's just the way people can be just so odd. I mean, it's only since the First World War I read, the all went round like that, because he cut in a biddy that was in the trenches, that's what I read. Before then, he all had it long. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right, that's right, right after all. Don't believe it. I do. Sure, but I not believe Not my dad, it. it's a good excuse. <laughs> not my dad. dad. See, my world. dad's got no biddies. <laughs> no, he hasn't. He's got yours. <laughs> Which one, yours? <laughs> Your dad's a bus driver, isn't he? George? Well, he was. He was. He's got yeah. a gold plate in full. <laughs> What do your family think about all your things you can? Well, naturally they like it, and they're all proud, and, you know, just like if you had a son, what, what was a Beatle, or even if you didn't... You know, you're you bound to like it more than the other people. You look very close together, isn't it? Yeah. All fellows who work so close together so often and stay and travel together, you must have an occasional argument. So, how do you work it out of your system apart from going away on holiday? Well, it's usually two, two against one or three against one. We <laughs> never have a serious <laughs> argument. Or whoever can shout loudest is another one. <laughs> it's reported that the Rolling Stones is a bit of Well, it's untrue. Sometimes I'm losing that report. Oh, yeah. Uh, they Dave Clark good. was bigger than us last year. They're big, you know. And Brian well, pulled them on to the floor. Well, records things like that. It's true, you know, they're not big enough for the big. But they wouldn't have the uh, the teenage crowds gathering wherever they appeared. The people would have. They, they well, you know, they're, 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 they're big followers in Britain. Popular. This all hacks back. Don't make us uh, release as many singles. I mean, a lot of people say the Beatles are slipping because their record's number 15, but they forget it's already sold about three minutes. Yeah, I mean, right? that, that, that yeah. happened with our second record. I know the third one from ECU, yeah. you know, because it sold more than two seasons, they went out quicker. Or something like that. I mean, well, that's it then, you know. I mean, they've done it. Every single we've made, that's it. You know, so you just give up. Yeah, and also, uh, the thing about the records now is that they have an awful lot of advance. Is it? Oh, it's it's <laughs> okay. They have a lot of advance uh, sales, so they they come in the first week very high, and then sell for about two weeks, and then sort of go out very quickly. They've sold an awful lot of records, but it's still uh, to people who don't know about the record business, it looks a bit off, you know. Nothing. Did you read the comments that Hal Wallace, the American producer who produced your Presley film, said about you in a recent uh, no, what did he say? interview? He sort of referred to you as four unpalatable men, you know, shaggy sort of creatures. No cows said that. No cows said that. Some of the nose of it. <laughs> do you, would you look upon this as jealousy, uh, mainly because well, you're not American, know, because you're not American? No, it's basically, you know, to some people, we've got nothing to be useless to everybody to like. You've got to have somebody knocking you up, so people think they are. Oh, what's he knocking them for? They're all right, don't yeah. you? You know, it's, it's good when people knock you. It doesn't matter, you know, there's, there's nobody that everybody likes. You've got a lot of um, songs up your sleeve that you haven't recorded, yeah. haven't been published, <laughs> quite naturally. But um, do you still keep writing songs, that's the thing? Yeah. We've yeah. Enough to well, buy, but, um, but no, but the old songs, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, most of them aren't very good anyway. You know, they were when we were really starting off. One or two, Love Me Do was an old song. Do yeah. you have Which, any individual ambitions to be uh, more than a member of the singing group of the Beatles? No. Mr. No. How many people travel with you? Uh, depends so, where we're going. Three, three. Now we've got three people. We've got uh, a fellow who looks after the equipment and our road manager. And then we'll we've road. got Mr. Epstein's personal assistant here, Derek Taylor. Correct. That's that Correct. in there. Correct, Derek. Yes, yeah. 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 Does <laughs> anybody advise you about what sort of songs to record or to release? No. Uh, no, our A&R man advises 
if, when when we've made uh, say two tracks, <coughs> he he advises us as to which is uh, the more. But it's normally we agree amongst <laughs> ourselves. To and, and has George and, and Ringo ever tried to compose songs? Yeah. Yeah. George is. I thought it was almost <laughs> fallen the Well, it is. Uh, they, I mean, they've written every song we've ever recorded except one. <laughs> Giants. Uh, uh, they've written every song we've ever recorded except one. <laughs> and I wrote that one. <laughs> when Brian Epstein fact, took over managing you, how did he first promote you? How did he first start promoting you? Well, uh, <coughs> when he first started handling us, he wasn't a manager, you know, in show business. He was a director of his father's business. Tell me, fellas, one last oh, question. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> One last question. Do you enjoy being the Beatles, the Beatles, as much as you did a couple of years ago? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a different way of talking. It's still not. Well, that just about sums it up. And that's yeah. the end of our yeah. uh, cover cup, oh. uh, which was inside oh, yeah. what is usually the dining room. Like it. Oh, 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 it. Oh, 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 right off the bat. Bye, everybody. We'll say a very good afternoon. So, bye. So, are these all recordings or are uh, they live? Next one here, that one are uh, new film. Oh, yeah, that's the best. They treat you in America very well, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you play the kind of music you want to play or the kind of music you think people want to hear. No, we've been playing this kind of music for about five, six years, something like that. It's just rock and roll, you know, it just happens to be right. Well, what do you think made the difference that suddenly put you up above the other group? We got the record contract. <laughs> <laughs> this is the film Beatle Magnus, isn't it? No, it's no, not it's called not that. Called That's it. another story. Mm -hmm. there. Hard, hard Day's Night. Hard night. Day's Night, it's called. Are you satisfied with the finished product? Well, it's as good as anybody that, that makes a film we can't act, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you fellows feel about the sort of music that people like 10, 12, 15 years ago, uh, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, this type of tune? Do you like it or do you only like Lock and Roll? No, but that, it's not the point. You know, you know. recently Ella Fitzgerald's done... Errol. 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 Uh, did Can't Buy Me Love. Mm -hmm. Have yeah. you heard it? Well, she did it like Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, well, she, so, you know, the, the, it doesn't... do it like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> 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 this would be a great <laughs> couple of to your voice. When yeah, but I mean... Do you find much jealousy amongst other groups in England about you? Not in the at all? Not really, because most of the top groups out there are friends of ours, so there's none of that. You know, the, the jealousy is only something they mix up in the papers. You know, obviously they've got to keep the sort of thing going. And then so all the groups that are anything out there are sort of best mates. Here, so and if any of them don't like us, then they don't sort of tell it to our faces. <laughs> what else just stay behind our backs? <laughs> What's your favourite entertainment medium? What, what do you like, best theatre or uh, uh, television? Or? I like uh, films. You don't mean for you mean for yeah, us? For the Beatles, yes. Oh, I thought you meant for uh, when watch. we're watching, having <laughs> been entertained. No, uh, oh well, I don't know really. I think live shows are pretty good, but they're all they're all good because you get a change. Yeah. So that's oh, the best oh. thing again, you know, all of them together. Oh, right.
Is it true that uh, you originally uh, auditioned for two record companies before you were finally signed by EMI Records? Yeah, uh, yeah, we made tapes for Decca and I think and Pi. And, uh, yeah, but we in didn't fact, actually go to Pi. In fact, uh, EMI turned us down, first of all. Uh, <laughs> they did? The oh, you yeah. may laugh, you may laugh. <laughs> but Don't blame him after hearing the tape. <laughs> <laughs> and then George Martin, he, he, from EMI, he decided to sign us up just himself, you see. I think I've got all the songs on. <laughs> how many records? Have, have you got any idea how many records you have sold? <laughs> around the world? No, uh, I have just a rough thing. idea. Last, I asked our publisher for, to give me an idea. Last time I heard it was around about 30 million. Oh. 30 million? Big, eh? I don't understand. It's all <laughs> complaining, but no. you know, it's always raining. Who has yeah. a Jaguar now? It's Paul, isn't it? No, it's George. George. No. Do you want to read music? I gave it a no, no, none of us. Comics, we've got a comic. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, did you enjoy doing the uh, Shakespearean excerpt in your TV show? Yeah. Mm. What? Except he made us rehearse for days. Oh, and we still got it wrong. <laughs> would, you, would you like to play legitimate Shakespeare? Yeah. Uh, I'll stand it. <laughs> Did you like the costumes? Yeah, yeah they were good for that. Mod. Okay. This lance <laughs> doth the own of moon present. Yeah. 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 You've been yeah, liking a lot of well. the Max Brothers. Do you find this a compliment? Do you dig this sort of thing? Well, it's a compliment. Well, not for the half. Yeah, they're funny, aren't they? <laughs> Jimmy, what was your first reaction when you were uh, told that you were going to play with the beat? I couldn't believe it, really. Did you have to um, do much rehearsal with the boys to get their style? No, we only rehearsed about five or six numbers, which took up an hour and then... <laughs> Away you went? Yeah. It's frightening? Pretty eh? frightening? The first show was very frightening, yeah. Mm. But, uh, they reassured But well, he did grand. He did a grand good. job, he yeah. did that. Grand yeah. job. Thanks, lad. All right. George, if one of you stopped being a Beatle, what do you think you'd do? Um, I think I'd train elephants in the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite yeah. reported that you're the, you're the keen businessman of the group, is that right? Well, uh, yes, that's what they say on the paper. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I've never heard of it. There's a new one on me. <laughs> And maybe, I don't know. <laughs> the next question, now, on stage you all dress literally the same, but off stage I never see them here that you're all dressed uh, mm. quite uh, different. Now, is this, this also uh, something uh, you make up yourselves? Or? No, you don't want to. I mean, originally we didn't dress the same on stage anyway, but that just had to come. But you don't want to go around looking the same all the time. We do quite often, because we like the same kind of clothes, you know, so we tend to come out sometimes all right. in the same kind of gear, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and he's a criminal. Correct. <laughs> 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 It's to be stupid all going on with a big B on our back. Did you enjoy your holidays to uh, Tahiti and the Caribbean, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we met one of your... <coughs> Some fella came swimming behind me saying, you're having a good time, <laughs> didn't it? Yeah. Then I've come all the way from Sydney. Yeah, as if it was my fault. <laughs> Why did you split up and take your holidays? Like? People like them. It makes it harder yeah, sure. for people the first yeah. to catch us up before. A couple of photographs recently came from America showing all of you, I think uh, it was George and Paul, when I saw swimming, but uh, both photographs in different places showed you with shirts on. Now, is this a regular thing to swim with the shirt uh, I think we were, we were only yeah. posing for the press and we weren't really swimming. Oh, I think. We just we just were just standing in I don't think we were actually swimming, as it were, with shirts. I thought right. you might have been trying to be a white skin. Because we always wear overcoats when we're swimming. Right. White skins with white skins. Sometimes, Which one? Oh. Your dad's a bus driver. Well, he was. He's got yeah. a gold plate in his <laughs> <laughs> What a day it was at Adelaide Airport. Arriving to meet the citizens were John Lennon, two other Beatle regulars, and Jimmy Nichol. Oh, Jocelyn P. Come on, come on. And now for their first press conference, a television conference in South Australia, the fabulous Beatles. Welcome. Welcome, boy. Thank you. Hello, John. Johnny. Hello. Hey, John. Paul. Hello. Hello. Hey, Paul. Hello. John again. Hello. 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 George. Oh, how are you? <laughs> how are you? Hello. How are you? George. Hello, George. Hello. 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 Welcome. Hello. We're out in the tabulator. Hello. 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 Whatever happened to Derek Taylor? We now have to turn our backs to the multitude. 
Oh. Well, fellas, tell me, what did you think of the Adelaide reception? That was great. The best Bumbers. ever. Was it, was it like what I mentioned to you on the plane it would be? Yeah. It was better. <laughs> better than yeah. That. Was it like anything you've ever had before? No. no we've never done one, one of those drives as well. It was marvellous. How would it compare with the ones in the United States when you arrived at different places? It was there? bigger. It was you know, bigger. There more people there. Do you, you think it was very well conducted? Yeah. Yes, so everybody was well behaved. You know. Did you get a fright uh, at all at, a outside fright, the town no. hall? Shock. You know, there's so many. Do you ever get this feeling that maybe someone's going to sort of try and knock you off or something? I had a feeling might have got shot. Because yeah. it's the first time being sitting in the back of a car waving, you know, just like... You took a lot of shots, I noticed, in the car, George. Yeah. Yeah. Going You're a very keen photographer, George. In fact, you all are, aren't you, fellas? Yeah. Mm. He's the most. We have to drive his camera out. Uh -huh. What was it you dropped off the balcony for? That was uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> no. He means it was him who dropped something off. No, it was it? It, no, man. You dropped it. <laughs> oh, I was joking. Oh, oh, I was joking. Oh, oh, yeah. I was the airport was closed. The kids couldn't get close to the plane. I didn't think it mattered now, with them all being able to see us anyway along because the Because they saw us better than, I think, by lining the road. They yeah. saw us better than if we'd have just... Jim, come here, Jim. Yeah, what, Jimmy? Yeah. Here he is, Jimmy. It's hey, Jimmy Nichols. Oh, Jimmy. 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 Drama for a guy's star. Tell me, what did the Lord Mayor say to you? Uh, he said it was very nice to have us here, and he was all pleased and have a drink. And what did you say to the Lord Mayor? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be here. What did you drink? Rum and coke? Uh, no, no, just coke, coke actually. Just coke. Coke. Yeah. Yeah. Fellas, a few questions that we didn't get down to yesterday. Um, how long do you rehearse a new number for? When you make up a new number, how long do you rehearse it for? Sometimes it takes an hour or two. Isn't it? Normally with new numbers, uh, we, just we don't rehearse them until we record them. John, with these tapes that you wore today, did you sort of, um, did you pick one of these up in Amsterdam or something? No, it? the first one we saw was in Amsterdam when we were going through these canals. Some lad had one on. And uh, we couldn't get any. No, we could get one which wasn't the right colour, green. So, <laughs> yeah. We had four made in Hong Kong copies of this one in different materials. Correct. John, I, uh, being a little older than you for a good-looking gentleman, just a little older, just a little older, as a matter of fact, I, w I will remember the launching of uh, Frank Sinatra and Johnny Ray and Elvis Presley. And yes, <laughs> very good tonnage, but this, this, to my mind, is unprecedented by uh, virtue of the uh, fantastic build-up and the um, publicity and all the press agents, and I'm not detracting in any way from the talent that you obviously have. How much Thank do you attribute to Brian Epstein and his public relations men? And how many are well, there, to your knowledge? We've never had more than one PR oh, fellow with us, ever. There's a rumor it, about it. And he's only, he's only got one, Brian's only got one for each artist he's got. So they have their own, you know, and they don't work together. And we've only ever had one, and, and most of the time we didn't have one till about six months ago. But Jimmy. even so, a lot of the success is due to Oh, yes. You know, is it... Oh, oh, I'll give you that. Yeah. Jimmy, do you think I that Brian Epstein's going to wave his magic wand at you sometime and uh, include you as a fifth Beatle? Or a stand-in drummer for Ringo permanently? That I don't know. Jimmy, you, you've played with uh, many, many groups indeed. Would you like to tell me quickly? I know it must be at least a dozen. Yes, I've played with um, uh, Cyril Stapleton, yeah. Oscar Raymond, Billy Fury, John Brown, um, Francis Bain. Francis Fay. <laughs> Gordon. Georgie, Georgie Fay. What happened yeah, to Georgie Fay? Fay. Yeah. Pardon? With Francis Fay. What happened there? Don't ask him personal <laughs> questions, Ernie. <laughs> no, you went to play the drums, didn't you, Jim? No, I didn't go down to play the drums. I went down to, uh, you know, enjoy myself. Yeah. And how and, did you get uh, on stage? Hmm? How did you get up on stage? Did she call you up? Well, as soon as I walked through the door, she was just finishing her act about ten minutes you know, to what, um, the latter part of her act, and she said the Beatles are coming because everybody turned round. And uh, she invited me back to the dressing room where we had... Oh, a he drink. didn't tell us about that, did he? Where we had a what drink, you do? know. And then the second show, um, I did the whole lot. She gave you um, something in return, didn't she, Jim? A little... She hasn't given... She hasn't given me anything yet, but she's going <laughs> to. She's going to give me all her albums, and also she's having a sweater made for me. Uh -huh. oh. Tammy, having played with all these bands, what, what's it like being suddenly thrust in with the Beatles? Oh, <laughs> at the end, you know. <laughs> Do you have any trouble getting the same Beatles, Lancaster? Um, I 
I do my best. Ah, oh, Have you ever, ever been involved in any zany publicity stunts? No, yeah. we'd never have to, actually. You know, there's sort of oh, yeah. anything that's a bit zany. You would usually happen. Some of us first starting off, we were trying to think of them. Yeah. We didn't have a manager or anything, so we were just sort of sitting around thinking of ones we could... Uh, one, we were going to try and get one of us to jump in the Mersey and swim it. None of us could None swim that far. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. And any the Mersey. Saying it. It was, um, it's true, John. It's true. Oh, it's clean, it's I remember when I was five. <laughs> I I'll jump in and I'll swim the Mersey. They weren't with me. I'm a liar. I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what have been your most exciting moments in show business, individually, George? Uh, uh, I can't remember. There's so many. You know, it's... Ever since last September, you know, everything's been exciting. I think uh, when we got to America, we found that they'd gone potty. <laughs> and when we got back to Britain last October, we'd been touring Sweden. And when this Beatlemania thing started, you know, we didn't we didn't hear about it because we were away. And we just landed in London. Everybody was there smashing the place up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was good. Look, fellas, in your, you, you had this uh, talent, of course, uh, potential talent some years ago, but in your wildest dreams, did you ever anticipate that you would reach the stage that you have reached now? No. You know, nobody imagines anything oh. like this. What, what about your act tonight at the um, ah. Centennial Hall, your concert? <laughs> How long will it last tonight? Your, your own particular segment. Well, 30, 30, 30 minutes, minutes each. Each house. Is only one house? Thirty minutes each. And are you constantly changing your your act, or is it? We uh, change it according to each sort of uh, sometimes city or state, or depending on what records are most popular. We usually change the order because they've only got the same amount of records released in uh -huh. each place anyway. What about when you played the um, Royal Variety performance last year for Her Majesty? Uh, same act as always. Yeah. Mm, I think we had two jokes in that one because. The, People weren't screaming so they could hear what we were saying, you know. <laughs> That's the only difference. And it was short as well. You oh, were telling me, I think it was uh, George on the plane coming down from Sydney. I asked, uh, had you ever thought of playing in pantomime as a group, the Beatles? But you do, did do a special show. Well, yeah, we, we didn't like the idea of doing a pantomime. So uh, we did our own show, which was more or less like a pop show, but we kept appealing every few minutes, dressed up, uh, you know, from <laughs> laughing, doing all... No, we laughed, mind you, we were. Do you do comedy sketches on stage at all in any touring shows in England? No, 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 no. for Christmas shows. And we've done a couple of sketches in TV shows. Uh, Are you been nervous before any shows? Yeah. All of them, all of them. Yeah. Are you ever, ever troubled with, um, you know, the hordes of screaming fans outside the hotel or where you stay uh, for sleeping purposes. Can you sleep through all this sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. They never stay there all night screaming. Yeah, I've never known. Well, them. last night they're up till about midnight, you know. Well, well I mean, I don't even dream of going to bed for a while. Are you ever scared of being hurt by something over in the museum? Have you never been hurt? You don't. Well, that's why right. we're not scared, because we've never been hurt. Uh, you know, maybe if we had... We'd be a bit worried about it. In South Australia, not only teenagers go wild over each other, but maybe you noticed uh, today coming in from the airport that um, a heck of a lot of uh, adults, especially yeah. uh, grandmas. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's it's great. Great. the same in England? Well, I've never seen so many grandmas at once. You know, you can get a couple. <laughs> one, if there's a bunch of them, one sort of say, isn't it? You know, by the time we've gone then. They all seem to know. That. You seem to be all very attentive. You, you can see what's going on. I noticed uh, behind you in the car that you could sort of follow everything that was going on, people with uh, mm. different posters. So you sort of, you're really looking at the people, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're very aware of everything around you. Yeah. Well, I think you've got to be, you know, hope you might get shot. <laughs> <laughs> How many people do you think? Can we have the first question then, please? Right. <laughs> doesn't matter. I like to come back as a tree. Does it? <laughs> well, I would, you know. <laughs> yep. Uh. Yes? We can't play it. We can't, we can't play it. I mean, we don't really want to, you know, we want to play our stuff. Yes? Yes, 
Down there, lady. Each of you make films alone individually, like John has just been offered a part alone in a film for the first time. Yeah, that's it. You just repeat it. Yeah, but it's still not going to help, actually, because we've still got too much noise in the room, actually. I mean, the, the question is that John is making a solo film. Will each of the other Beatles follow suit and make solo films, right? It depends if uh, anybody asks us to do something and if we think it's worth doing. And if we'd like to do it, you know, there's a possibility. <laughs> Next question, please. So you get, you get yes? a few offers from Walt uh, Disney now. Yeah. <laughs> this business with your remarks you seem to have obsessed you so much. Do you figure a big tempest over nothing or a lot of foolishness? Well, it's, it's not over nothing now because it is something. But there, there weren't as many people upset as I was led to believe. I'm not so seriously upset. Do you figure that this is one of the reasons you haven't been drawing as well on this trip? Nothing to do with it. Pardon? I don't think it's anything to do with it. I don't think we're drawing any less than we expected, whether this had started or not. Yes. Not really. Do you gentlemen care to comment on the fact that the Ku Klux Klan is one of the pictures tonight? Because <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's nothing to say about them. Yes. Uh, John, are you writing a book of children's stories? I've thought about it, you know, but uh, they don't always turn out like children's stories, you see. So when I've got <laughs> enough that are like children's stories, I'll stick them together. And the other ones won't be for children. Are they the same style? I suppose so. I can't do it any other way so far. Yes. Mr. Lennon, have you met James Joyce? Yes, since. <laughs> Well, that that is the one of the most stupid versions of it. Is that? I mean, <laughs> that's not a publicity stunt at all. No. They don't need that publicity. Not like that. Can I add to that 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 uh, article was originally published in England last March? So it's nothing to do with the, you know pre tour. Yes. I would like to ask Mr. McCartney, I understand that they have uh, set aside some time during this American tour for a vacation. What are your plans for that? I didn't know we had actually, but, <laughs> but uh, you got four days off. Well, you know, just sit around and swim and sit around. What would be your favorite part of the country in which to take Well, I think, I think we'll be in uh, Los Angeles for it, and that's nice and sunny. Gentlemen, what is the idea of the yellow submarine problem? Um, what do you say? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I, I don't know, I was going to sleep one night and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a children's song like the children's songs you used to have? Which In the old get. days. <laughs> you know, like sort of and it was nice. That is John's background. That you barking, know. that's John me, barking, yes. barking, yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Yes. What do you think of Prime Minister Wilson's stabilization song? <laughs> what policy? Don't think much of it, but good luck to him if he can do it. <laughs> what policy? Stabilisation for the pound policy. Yes, Mr. Harrison, uh, we have seen some trends in your music, especially since the guitar, to, uh, to get away from from the usual sounds and, and beat music. Do, do you see a trend in the, in the whole field of beat music, and if so, which way is this trend going? Well, I don't know. It depends on the people making the music. I can only talk for myself, and myself is very interested in Indian music, and I like to continue learning it and using it in our music. <laughs> um, well, I've tried singing some of my stories, but it doesn't work. I could, I've thought of it, you know, it might work one day. But I tried it, you know, somebody said that, so I went home and sang a bit of the book and it was soft. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Time Magazine wrote some uh, sinister meaning into uh, the song Norwegian Wood. <laughs> exactly what it says in the lyrics, which is nothing. <laughs> yeah. Gentlemen, you could consider going to entertain American groups in the other I wouldn't like 
have to go near Vietnam. <laughs> Nothing to do with us. <laughs> Very bad. Uh, John, on August the 23rd, uh, this is your 50th anniversary. Is it? Thanks. Uh, you're also appearing <laughs> at uh, Shea Stadium now. How do you feel about appearing with your wife? Uh, well, I mean, anniversary is just another day, really, you know. Yes. I'd like to ask what's the same question. The question is George. How do you feel about being white for value? Well, you know, you just get used to it, don't you? No, I don't know. You know, we just did that photograph because we had a photographic session and the photographer said, put this meat on you. And we just sat there and he photographed us and they said, well, that'll do for the American album cover. So we didn't we didn't complain, you know, and then everyone else complained. So we said, terrible, <laughs> terrible idea. We didn't sure. like it enough to support it. If it had been a better photograph of the same subject, we might have stuck up for it. But it was a lousy photograph anyway, really, and the photographer knows it too, so he won't be hurt, you know. But it wasn't your idea. No, no, no. It, was it wasn't just, a very good one. We just go along with that. Oh, stuff. A bit unsubtle. How'd you choose with a minor automobile accident? Fine, thanks, how's yours? I've seen a I've seen a similar version to what you're talking about in a paper. Uh, well, if it makes other people feel better, it'll make me feel better. Good, thank you. Right. Double think. <laughs> To anyone, are you going to do a tour of England this year? Probably, yes. Um, I'm sorry, oh, Ringo, you're going to speak. No, I nearly spoke. <laughs> Why are you going to do I'll just take the photos. Because it revolves. <laughs> <laughs> we all hope you'll be around for a while, but what happens when the Beatles are no longer the Beatles, John? We'll just be four people. Four a bit strange, but yeah. Any plans to work or just. Well, this is work, isn't it? I mean, after this is over. Yeah, we'll, well, do you know. we'll work together musically, at least, probably, for quite a bit. You've got to do something. I'd like to direct a question here to uh, John and Paul. Have you ever thought of writing for a uh, musical Broadway musical? We thought about it. And if you did, what type of Okay. <laughs> All Broadway musicals are the same. Fun. Especially the baritones. Yeah, come on, George. Come on. Well, I wouldn't. Al I wouldn't allow him to write a Broadway musical. No, we. I don't think we've thought about it. We've never got down to it. The only thing is, if we did. No, we probably would never get that. I don't know. I don't fancy it anyway. No, if we did one, we'd try and. The only thing is, it's difficult trying to think of something that isn't 50 years out of date, like most of the others. Fun? Go on. Sorry? Well, you know, um, a song like Hello Dolly could have been, uh, even though it was good, nothing I guess, it could have been a hit 50 years ago. You know, it was in the 50 years ago style. And it's... Uh, 50? Yeah, I think so. And it's a bit silly making musicals of that era now. It should be up to date. Gentlemen, what, what have you found to be the biggest drawback in being the Beatles? Uh, interpretations of what you say. <laughs> I don't know, it just came into my head. Yes. I'm fine. No, I'm, you know, same old two stone five. <laughs> no, I'm just fine. I'm just resting. It just means what it says, you know, it's a story. When somebody else makes up a story, nobody goes into it and says, you know, he's against everything in the world. If you make up a story, it's just a story. But when you write a song, it seems to take a lot of Anyway, that was just a story, that's all.
and it means he's not a very successful vicar yet. <laughs> yes. John, what do you think of Bob Dylan? I think he's good. They always have, you know. You know, we've never believed the myth of the Beatles as being like four little puppets. Now, we don't believe that. It's so, I mean, you know, we'll just be the same people as we've always been. That's all. Um, I have read conflicting reports about your next movie, and uh, you might have answered it earlier, but I didn't get too well at first. Do you still want to do a western? Oh. No. 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 No, that's out. It's been out a long time. It was... No, I mean, that's nothing to do with it. It was just this. We just suddenly decided it was the wrong way, going the wrong way in films, doing a big western. No. no. Same category, really. Possibly. An epic. Mm. Yes, the Bible. <laughs> Who would you like as a group you like in the world? Oh, oh it's a hard one, isn't it? We <laughs> met a lot of people, you know. Reporters. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, many uh, prominent church leaders say that the church is an institution, an organization is going to die or completely change. Uh, is this the type of thing you had in mind, or do you think this is going to happen? I think that's it ought to happen, or it should happen, or it will change the wrong way for them. What? Well, you, you know. It should happen. Though. It should happen. It should change, you know. But it changes. And or it's else. good that they've noticed. I'd like to take the last three questions. First one. Yes. There's quite a lot, you know. We. There's no reason for us to hate other groups or be jealous of other groups in the same way from, from their side of it. You know, so we all get on very well. No one's jealous. We all sell records. Yeah, yes. yeah we talk about it. Will you incorporate more and more ethnic sounds into music such as Israeli, Rodeo, and Hebrew? Yes. 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 Well, we're not running around looking for sort of little ethnic things from different countries to bring into the music. We just happened across Indian music accidentally, as it were, you know, and that we took an interest in it. But we won't be, we, it's possible, you know, but we haven't thought of that. Yes. Recent, recently, have you seriously considered breaking up? No. That's what you mean by breaking up. You know, we haven't actually thought, you know, the time has come for us to break up, but we've realized the possibility of you know, are breaking up as an actual sort of natural progression. Because we can't go on forever like this, so we've got to think now and prepare for, you know, if it did happen. Which it should, you know. It's got to sometime. Realistically, then, you are considering an actual progression. <laughs> yeah, how yeah, long well, it'll I mean, take, you know, we nobody We can't knows. consider it any other way, because it's, you know, it's not going to go any other way. It's going to progress and <coughs> just end up as something. And, uh, you know, we think about it now so that we're not at a loss when it does happen. Pardon? Uh, four days after I get home from this tour. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> September the 5th. Fourth, September the 5th. Yeah. Gentlemen, other than John Lennon, do you think Mr. Lennon's religious comment has anything to do with your audience attendance? No. 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 I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what he thinks about religion or what any of us thinks, really, to us. It happens to matter to other people, you know, and we've, we've, we've learned that bit. The audiences are not little, you know. I don't know what papers you're reading, but, you know, ask the promoters what tickets are selling. The audiences are big and fine enough for us. This must be the last question, please. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Vim. <laughs> I don't know, you know, I haven't thought of it. Maybe a girl. <laughs> Zacharine. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. 
John's uncle Charlie Lennon is a caring, compassionate friend of Beatle fans everywhere, always ready to sit down with Beatle people and talk about the good old days with his brother Fred and young John. He is that rarest of all creatures in the phenomenal world of Beatledom, a genuine eyewitness to the formation of a legend. Here he sings an original ballad beckoning back to the first bygone days of Beatlemania in Liverpool. Where are the ships of the Mersey That sailed away from the shores They have been and gone and left us Never to return no more Oh, come back to the Mersey To the sounds of twist and shout We'll keep the world come here on Mersey side of that there is no doubt. The live bird is silent, it's got nothing to shout about. It's seen the ships come in each day, and it's seen them all go out. But now those days are over They were the scenes of the past Now all the live bird is these days Is the chimes of the live clock As the Beatles will certainly tell you, Liverpool has its share of characters and Auntie Nellie is certainly one of those. The kids called her Auntie Nellie with the wooden belly in Ringo's old neighborhood of the Dingle back in Liverpool. But I spoke to her in Toronto about living next door to the Starkeys for many, many years. I was surprised at some of the funny things she had to say, as I think you'll be. So here she is, Auntie Nellie with the wooden belly. Richie, they called him Richie, isn't Richard? He never got Dickie. Dickie St- never got Ringo or Dickie. Ringo when he came up. But he was always musically inclined. I remember his dad buying him his first drums, you know. And they were getting a bit on their feet then, low down, you know. Well, they all were, you know. Mm -hmm. None of us had much. He wasn't a well child. And he was protected. They took good care of him, like they were good parents. He was a good kid, yes, rough and, as I say, they were all rough diamonds, rough and tumble. He was the average Liverpool, Liverpool scouser. He was the average scouser. Right. I don't think Ringo will ever really forget from whence he came. He will always be there with the boy. I mean, he had sad memories, he had good memories, and I don't think he'll ever change. It might have only been a, a gig, as Dorothy calls it. It wasn't a big concert. My husband used to like going because it was Dickie's son. Go and see, go and see Dickie's son playing. Could have been there. It was only a small place. With they had jackets? Or? They had leather jackets and they had their wigs on at the time, so it's that far you back. They had wigs. For they had days? long hair because I met one of them. I think it was George Harrison coming down church. She's outside. And it was somebody in the crowd that said, That's George Harrison, you know, and I thought, Well, I don't know the man. Father Tom McKenzie, an early Beatles compere in Liverpool, recalls the unqualified madness that was Beatlemania. I'll I'll go back into 62. When the uh, boys started doing their first numbers and and they hadn't done Love Me Do or Please Please Me then, they were doing the the, uh, My Bonnie twist and shout. The girls found out that Ringo, they found out he liked jelly babies, these sweets, and they used to bring these sweets and throw them on the stage in the bags <laughs> for Ringo. In these, uh, these shows that they were throwing the jelly babies, when we pulled the curtains and they went off stage, John used to come on, on stage and he'd say, give me a hand with these. Now there was only one young lady we let on stage and she was a polio case in a wheelchair. And used to be in the hall, she couldn't see at the back. We used to bring her through the back end and put her on the stage. And John and I used to throw out and put all these jelly babies in her lap. You know? And he used to think the world of them. I had to get to the hall for, to do the dance. 
And they got in the hall about half past seven, soaking wet. And the ladies go on stage, the hall was packed out. Every ticket had been sold, and there was thousands standing outside in the lane, just in the shelter of the hall, listening to the lads playing and the girls screaming. Because hysteria used to break out in those days. The girls, when they started doing Please Please Me For Me To You, uh, the hysteria of the girls shouting, I love George, I love John, and they'd throw notes on the stage. These are the things I used to collect. There was um, a relative of Ingo's lived in Northwich, and they'd gone there for the dinner, so they wanted something to eat, and they couldn't go into the canteen, into the cafeteria, counter the kids, you know, mobbing them, see. So they went to this relatives. So I used to go into the dressing room, make sure everything was okay and that, and I went into the dressing room. There was two big dressing rooms, and I went, I went into one, this one that the Beatles were in, and I saw the toilet door move. Oh, I just pushed this out, and I could feel it with some of the eyes. I, like, come on, let's have you out. And five girls <laughs> swooped out. Now, the only way those girls could get in, and I noticed, was a toilet, little toilet window half open. One girl had climbed up a spout, two stories high, and got through that window and opened the window, and all the others had climbed up the drain pipe and, and got in. <laughs> <laughs> the lads knew I was quite sick, but they, they went to the rules. And uh, there's another thing about them, I never even saw them smoke. All these stories later on about John and Paul smoking, and that, I, I never even saw one of them smoke. Not one. Anyhow, um, they got to the top with Please Please Me from Mitch and I was at Buxton Pavilion. Now, it was a very low stage. It was a big round dome, but it went into a bottleneck where they're like pushing all the people into that, you see, follow what I mean, this is all round. And I saw a girl go down, swaying like anything. And I, I jumped off the stage, grabbed her, brought her on stage, and it shows me bringing her around and, and with, the, with the police sergeants on stage, and the Beatles playing behind me, you know. Pete Best's fun-loving mother Mona was always quick with a quip and friendly with the fans. Here she is at an impromptu press conference at her home in Liverpool in 1990. Mrs. Best, could you tell me what uh, inspired you to open a club on the outskirts of town where there were no other clubs purely for the benefit of youngsters? Oh, well, I used to have them coming in and, in and out of my house as if it was a railway station. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, well, we've got a nice place in the cellar, which, of course, they'd made their den. And I uh, said, don't you take all your gang and go down there? And they said, well, what are you going to do down here? There's nothing going at all. Let's make it into a, into a club. A little club, and you take it on from there. But the little club ended up with nearly 3,000 members. <laughs> <laughs> Every night, well, it used to be jam-packed solid. We used to light the fire, even if it was a hot night, so they'd buy more coke. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody would say, God, it's hot. Uh, another coke, please, uh, Rory. And the coke would be flying, and uh, the people would be enjoying themselves. Chock a block, but the atmosphere was, I've never seen a club with an atmosphere like that. And I don't think I ever will. Well, what sort of year was that? Because this was before the cabin club, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. At that time, uh, when I spoke to Ray McFall, uh, he was doing jazz in his club. And he said, I believe, he said, uh, you've opened up a little rock and roll club. I said, yes. He said, why don't you come down? I said, I can't. I said, I'm too busy with my own club. I said, but uh, I said, a very, very good rock and roll group over here called the Beatles. I said, why don't you put them on? So he said, I'm thinking of changing over. And he said, maybe I'll do it. And that's how the boys eventually went to play the, the Cavern Club. I spoke to Cavern Club announcer Bob Wooler about his memories of Brian Epstein and the Beatles during a 1983 interview in the Fab's hometown of Liverpool. And I met the Beatles. Now, I didn't know them, really, but I knew the drummer. This drummer was Tommy Moore. Now, he used to work at Garston Docks on the railway with me. He was older than the Beatles, and he did suffer 
at the hands, and he came of the Beatles, especially John Lennon and Paul McCartney. William. My fourth meeting with them was in the Jacaranda in December 60, where I met two Beatles in the Jacaranda. And they explained to me that they had been to Hamburg and this and the other had happened. So I was then with a promoter called Brian Kelly, and I said, uh, half an hour spot at Litherland Town Hall as an, as an extra. And they agreed to it, and we fought over the fee with what Kelly. Was it? Well, I asked Brian Kelly for eight pounds, and he collapsed, uh, and he said four pounds. I said, well, there's five of them. Uh, there were five Beatles, you see. Actually, Neil Aspinall was a kind of Beatle. He drove them around. Anyway, after a lot of argy-bargy, it became six pounds. Now, uh, because I was handling that show, the order of the groups, I was able to give them a very good spot, not a, an early spot, you see, and not a late spot. I gave them a, a middle-of-the-bill spot. And, of course, they were, they transfixed the audience, and that was the beginning of what was later to be coined, not by me, as Beatlemania. Now, of all the Beatles, Stuart Sutcliffe, we used to talk, not just rock and roll, we used to talk about films, books... Uh, paintings, he was, a, uh, as you appreciate, he was quite a painter. Well, it, it was really more close to his heart than the, the guitar was, the music. Uh, uh, Stuart wasn't a meek and mild person, you know. He, he could be quite uh, verbally aggressive. So he used to stick up for himself, because uh, John, when he was in the mood, and Paul... Uh, they used to shout him down, you see. It wasn't a falling out. It was simply uh, an establishment of uh, uh, a position, of uh, pecking order. Now, uh, lots of things had happened to them because Epstein was uh, with them and lots of uh, glowing things uh, were going to happen to them. And in a way, they were rather full of that. Uh, in other words, they had rather got out of any emotional feelings for Stuart by then. They'd been uh, coming and going between uh, Liverpool and London. They'd been away on tours around the country. Throughout 63, uh, they actually departed lock, stock and barrel from Liverpool at the end of 63, when uh, Epstein uh, set up a shop in London where all the publishers and television people are, really. And, of course, he was preparing for your Feb 64 invasion. They had been extremely big in this country, but they rather swept the significance of Kennedy's death in this country. So it seemed a logical step that America would take to them. But, of course, I had no idea that the America would be uh, swept off its feet. I always Lennon's complaint, and George Harrison was always concerned about uh, his guitar breaks, you see. Uh, and they, Paul McCartney used to say, go through the motions, and they, indeed, they, that's all they did. Few true Beatles fans have anything on Patricia Daniels besides enjoying the incalculable boon of being born in Liverpool at the same time as her heroes. She often used to see them as teenagers, fast asleep on city buses, drinking too much lager in the local pubs, and best of all, regularly assaulting audiences with the wittiest, raunchiest rock and roll ever made at the famous Cavern Club. Um, there was a lot of opposition because Pete Best was like the handsome one, and then. Um, when Ringo came, it was always like, you know, because well, with him playing with Rory Storm, and it was like a different type of band altogether. And uh, a lot of them sort of all had the hot for Pete Bass, and they thought that was it, you know. Once he goes, they won't like the Beatles anymore. Who did you like? Like, say, in the cavern, you'd sit on the front row. If you like Paul, you sat opposite him. If you like John, you sat opposite on the right hand side. But uh, the last time they played in the cavern, yeah. It was like Liverpool coming out with the club. Yet again, you just had to be there and, you know, just be part of what was going on. Uh, that was like the last chance 
you know, met the people who had gone to Stephen for years and years. Just had to accept that they'd, you know, hit the big time. There was no way you could get them back at the lunchtime session and uh, come down to see them a couple of nights a week. A veritable giant of a man, Calvin Club doorman Paddy Delaney spoke to me about his days with the Beatles back in Liverpool in 1983. Here's what he had to say. Well, um, their appearance on the scene uh, occurred on the 21st of March, 1961. And the first one I saw was George Harrison, who ambled down the street. And um, in them days... Her styles were very strict and very tidy, as it's worn by teddy boys. His hair was um, lank, hanging down onto his uh, collar. He was very scruffy, that's a word for it in this country. He looked very trampish and very hungry looking. He ambled down the middle of the street and um, for a moment, I didn't think he was coming into the Cavern Club, but uh, I stopped him and um, asked him if he was a member. And uh, I knew he wasn't, but I know that I'd stop him anyway. But he said no, he was with the Beatles. And I knew the Beatles were on that particular night. I couldn't do anything about it, I just had to let him in. But what I did notice, he was wearing jeans, and um, we'd banned, well, I'd banned jeans from the club. About 15 minutes later, Paul McCartney ambled down the street with uh, John Lennon in close pursuit. Paul McCartney was carrying his bass guitar. John Lennon, hands dug deep in his pockets, ambled after him. And um, I had an idea that they might have been the same because he had the same sort of hairstyle. I let them in. And a, a while afterwards, a taxi came down the street and... It, Sitting in the back was this chap um, I later knew was as uh, Pete Best. He was carrying the Beatles' uh, two speakers. He had his set of drums, series of wires and everything, and um, took him downstairs and he paid the taxi. Now this is how the Beatles arrived, first arrived at the Cavern Club. In later years, when I saw groups arriving at the Cavern Club with... Um, like big furniture removal vans, two of them, and about ten men running around moving equipment for four or five people, I realized that the Beatles actually came from nothing. They came from the earth. And it also matched the music. The music was earthy. Also, the, the animal magnetism that they had, they, it was all, uh, all encased in that one particular moment. They had this thing that, uh, if you don't like me, it's just too bad. Uh, I'll say no more about it, but I'll tell you this. I saw the gradual build-up from that first meeting up to the stage where a toilet roll was passed down a queue near the height of the Beatles' fame when he went to America. Passed right down uh, the queue, went right down Matthew Street, right round the corner, and it was... Five, maybe five, maybe half a dozen times more than we'd be able to get in the club. And I knew it was my sad duty to turn them away. But I seen them holding all sorts of objects, all depicting um, requests. And one of the most outstanding requests I ever saw that happened to get into the club, a toilet roll signed from the very beginning unrolled, gradually went down the queue and signed by everybody just for one number. After the Beatles first clicked, virtually every promoter and huckster came to Liverpool looking for virtually anyone who could hold a guitar. Many of those acts, like Scylla Black, Jerry and the Pacemakers, and Billy J. Kramer with the Dakotas, hit it big, if only for a while. Tony Mansfield was drummer for Billy J. Kramer and also great friends with the Beatles, having all been thrown together out on the road working for Epstein. Here's a little of our conversation. The Beatles certainly paid their dues, you know, especially in Germany, long before we ever went over there, yeah. uh, playing seven nights a week and uh, learning how to play, really. It was great, you know, because they started writing their own songs because they started running out of songs, apparently, and uh, 
they started writing their own material. We weren't into doing that. None of us were that talented. Have you ever, did you ever see the Beatles record at Abbey Road? Uh, yes. Uh, I saw them do... Um, what do you, uh, you can't do that. I think they were finishing off that. And we've also been in the... Uh, Radio, we, we've done radio shows together. They always had loads of instruments coming in and out, right? And uh, Joe Joyce was a quiet one. He's a nice guy. We, we've been in a couple of clubs. I've been in the Blue Angel with the boys. I'm, I've been, I'm drinking Coke here now. Yeah. Uh, scotch and Coke. Yeah, I always remember drinking Scotch and Coke in those days. That was days. Alan Williams, Bit of a hustler. Right, yeah, a, a real hustler, Alan Williams. Uh, never hurt our band at all. I mean, never worked for Alan, actually. But I always had a lot of respect for him, and I think he, the feeling was very mutual. Last time you saw Paul? Was, was it, it Brian's house in 1966, in the summer of 66? We used to do a lot of clubs, you know, where the Beatles... Obviously, never. Uh, they stopped... Uh, I think their last gig was 1966, wasn't it? No, well, you see, they got to a stage where, you know, the music they were doing, obviously, was so complex that they couldn't re reproduce it live. There just wasn't the technology around to reproduce, to do it on stage like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know they had a lot of difficulty, even if you look at the Shea Stadium gig and all that, you know. And it's terrible for a drummer, to, you, know, a lot, you know, to try and play when, when you can't really hear the singer properly, you know. And we used to have that problem an awful lot um, so consequently you didn't play that loud absolutely nobody in show business before during or since knew how to talk to the press like the Beatles did with the sole exception of perhaps the Marx Brothers the Beatles were incredibly witty and refreshing Although it's all incredibly rare archival material, the Beatles' magic shines through. Here's a press conference in Hollywood to start things off. One question we like in Hollywood, would like to know how you compare movie working to, say, the concert tour or recording sessions. Well, we don't compare it much. You know. uh, would you rather play the Hollywood Bowl again than Dodger Stadium? We don't really mind. Maybe we can um, start another controversy here. One of your countrymen was here yesterday or the day before, before he returned to England, or on his arrival in England. He said he thought uh, American women were out of style for not wearing mini skirts, and that they're, because they didn't wear mini skirts, their legs were ugly. Uh, I'd like to ask you what you think about American women's legs. Well, if they He's don't wear the mini skirts, how does he know their legs are ugly? <laughs> we'll be... You know, on your uh, album cover that was banned here, first of all, whose idea was it? And second of all, yeah. what was it supposed to mean from your standpoint? What's he say? Can you say that again? <laughs> it's everyone's you know, the album cover that was banned here, you know, oh, yeah. with the dolls and the meat, whose idea was it? And yeah, what... the photographers who took it. John, why did you decide to make How I Won the War, minus the other beats? Because um, uh, he just asked me, you know, and I just said yes. <laughs> it was just like that. <laughs> Do you uh, consider that now, uh, since you've been in the United States here for almost a week, that this religious issue is answered once and for all? Would you clarify so. and repeat uh, the answer that you gave you in Chicago? I can't yeah. repeat it again because I don't know what it said, you know. Well, would you clarify the you remarks read, that were attributed you know, to you? You tell me what you think I meant, and I'll tell you whether you, I agree or... Well, you know. some of the remarks attributed to you in uh, some of the newspapers, the press here, uh, said that uh, concerning the remark that you made comparing the relative popularity of the Beatles with Jesus Christ and that yeah. the Beatles were more popular, this created quite a controversy and a furor in this country, <coughs> as you are obviously aware. Do you know that, John? Now, uh, would you uh, clarify the remark? Well, I've clarified it about 800 times, you know. I could have said TV or something else, you know, and that's as clear as it can be. I just use Beatles because I know about them a bit more than TV. I could have said any number of things. Wouldn't have got as much publicity, though. <laughs> my, my, question, my question is directed at all of you. Do you think this, uh, this controversy has hurt your careers or has helped you professionally? Obviously, you're quite aware of it. It hasn't helped or hindered it, I don't think. I think most sensible people took it for what it was. And it was only the um, bigots that took it up and thought it was, you know, on their side. They thought, ha-ha, here's something to get them for. 
But when they read it, uh, they saw that, you know, there was nothing wrong with it, really. It's just that they thought that by us saying, uh, by John saying that we were more popular than Jesus, they thought, ah, oh, you know, he's bound to be arrogant. And did you see the fellow on telly last night? He said it. Tonight, sure. John, what stimulates you in your work? <laughs> That's just anything, you know. And also, what's your favorite group in the U.S.? Favorite what? Group in the United States. I've got a few, you know. Birds, spoonful, mamas and papas, I suppose. Beach on that side of it. Beach and boys. miracles, etc. on the other side of it. Uh, my question concerns uh, money. Uh, I was wondering if you still have an arrangement with the U.S. Internal Revenue Department to pay your taxes to England through them. Another part of uh, the question is, how much money have you grossed in your current U.S. tour, and is it true that oh. you lost? We don't know. Money's got nothing we don't to know do about that. that. Don't we don't do the money side of it, you know. Uh, Brian does that. And we don't particularly worry about it. tell us what we get in the end. <laughs> the uh, tax... Thing. We pay tax and things, but we don't know how much or how much we've made or anything, you know, because uh, if we were going to worry about that, we'd be nervous wrecks by now. I'd like to direct this question to Messrs. Lennon and uh, McCartney. In uh, a recent article, Time magazine put down pop music, <laughs> and they referred to uh, Day Tripper as being about a prostitute, oh, yeah. and Norwegian Wood about, as being about a lesbian. Oh, yeah. Now, I just wanted to know what... <laughs> What your intent was when you wrote it, and what sh what your feeling is about the Time magazine criticism of the music that is being written today? We were just trying to write songs about prostitutes and lesbians. That's all. Quick ring. Quick. Do you have any? Will you be working separately in the future, or together? Together. It's all together, probably. Together, aren't? John Lennon, aren't you doing the picture alone? Yeah, but I mean, that's only in the holiday bit, you know. I see. In between Beatle. Fred Paul from KASK. First of all, I'd like to say hi to you all again. It's hi, really Fred. good to see hi. you. And so... <laughs> yeah, Go on, Fred. I'd like Go to on, ask me. a question that you've never been asked before. Oh, no. oh. What are you going to do when the bubble bursts? <laughs> Uh, well, Fred. You know, that's well, a personal Fred. in joke. He used to ask it at every press conference we went to, to keep the party going. Do you think we'll have another tour again next year? Ask Could be, Brian. Fred. Could, Could be. be, Brian does that. Thank you very much. He does a lot okay, of it, Fred. Right? Yeah. Outside in Hollywood tonight, you had to arrive in an armored truck, and the truck was swarmed by adoring fans. What is the situation wherever you go? Do you ever have a uh, an opportunity to walk out in the street without being recognized, or can you walk into a, a theater to see a movie by yourself? Or if you go and the lights are down, you can go in. We can do that in England. It's easier in England than it is here. And it's mainly because we know England better. No It'd better also be easier to do it if we were on tour, you know. Because we're on tour, people know where we are, that's why we have a crowd. <laughs> oh, is that not Paul? Chris, I wear that. <laughs> Paul? 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 Sorry. Many of the top artists and musicians in the pop field today have said that the Beatles have been a major influence in their music. Are there any other artists who have a, an important influence on you, the music you create? Oh, yes. Nearly everyone. You know, we, we pinch as much from other people as they pinch from us, you know. Ringo, do you carry wallet pictures of your baby with you? Uh, no. No? Why? I don't carry photos of anything, you know. Thank you. you can remember. Yeah. Uh, may I ask about the song uh, Eleanor Rigby? What was the motivation or inspiration for that? Two queers. <laughs> John, um, did you ever? <laughs> Two barrel boys. Oh, this is getting disgusting. This, but what? John, did you ever meet Cass of the Mamas and Papas? Yes, and she's great. And I'm seeing her tonight. <laughs> good. Yes, yeah, she's good. Uh, have you ever trained or used beetle doubles as decoys? Um, no. No. No, no. We tried to get Brian Epstein to do it. He wouldn't do it. <laughs> uh, Ringo, uh, one question. Uh, how much did you contribute to What Goes On? And are you contributing to any other Lennon-McCartney compositions? I 
Um, about five words to what goes on, and not, I haven't done a thing since. <laughs> like the dresses to John and Paul, uh, you write a lot of stuff that other people steal from you and also purchase from you. In different arrangements, uh, Ella Fitzgerald and the, a lot of these Boston Pops and stuff like that. When you listen to this on the radio or records and stuff, how do you feel about them using your pieces and changing them around to suit their styles? Depends how they do it, you know. The thing is, they don't steal it. No, I know that. What is it? You just said they did? Well, some... <laughs> yeah. okay. no, they, I mean, you know, it's, once we've done a song and it's published, anyone can do it. So, you know, the, the, whether we like it or not depends on whether they've done it to our taste. You know, well, then let's just, ask it this way. Who do you think does it the best, the Beatles songs? Us. <laughs> who? Us. Oh. <laughs> Uh, for those of us that have followed your career from the early days of Liverpool and Hamburg and the pride in you've been awarded the MBE and the dismay of the unwarranted adverse publicity of late, the question is, individually, what has been your most memorable occasions and what has been the most disappointing? Mm. Well, no idea. you know, there's so many. I Just think Manila was the most disappointing. <laughs> yeah. And mm. the most exciting is yet to come. Uh, gentlemen. Maybe the most disappointing. Gentlemen, uh, there was quite a laugh when you went uh, on the stock market with your stock. How is your stock doing? Fine, thank well, you. it went down, but it's coming up again. It's gone it went down. down it's it's the same as any other stock, you know. It goes down. down every time, and the LPs drop out. They all think they're buying bits of record. All of you. Leonard Bernstein likes your music. How do you like Leonard Bernstein? Very good. He's, you know, great. One of the greatest. I'd like to. Uh, how has your image changed since uh, '63? Is it uh, a little more? Uh, is it the same? An image is how you see us, so you know you can only answer that. You're the only one that knows. Who's that? Oh, it's you. oh you. well. No, I want to get your opinion. Is it a little tarnished now? Is it more realistic, or what would you say it is? Oh. I know I have my opinion. We haven't but, got any uh, tags for our opinion. We can't tell you our image, you know. We can only our, our image is what we read in the newspapers, and that's the same as you read, you know. The, I mean, we know our real image, which is nothing like our image. <laughs> <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, what I meant to say was... Uh, I like take two bricks. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the young man with the lengthy haircut to your right rear? Right uh, rear. It's good old Dave, isn't it? Where is he? Who That's is Dave it? Dave from the uh, birds, a mate of ours. Your hoy mateys. Shy, Do shy. Do you ever Stop plan fire. to record in the United States, and why haven't you yet? <laughs> We tried, uh, actually, but it was a financial matter. Mm. Mm. Bit of trouble over that one. No, we tried, but uh, it didn't come up. politics. Hush, hush. Dice. No comment. Mr. Lennon, is it true you're planning to give up music for a career in the field of comparative religion? No. <laughs> is that another of the jokes going on? I'm sure you've all heard of the many beetle burnings and beetle bonfires. And I was wondering, do you think American girls are fickle? All girls are fickle. Well, the photos we saw of them were a sort of middle-aged DJs and 12-year-olds burning a pile of LP covers. Uh, this question is directed to Paul and John. You have written uh, quite a few numbers for Peter and Gordon, and I understand they don't like it because they think that it's you writing the song that makes it popular. Do you plan to write any more songs for them? Uh, they... You know, if we write songs for they ask us to write songs for them if we do it. I mean, they don't mind it. They like it, but it's... People come up and say, ah, we see you just getting in on the Lennon-McCartney bandwagon. That's, that's why um, they did that one with, with, with our names not on it, woman. Because everyone sort of thinks that's the reason they get hits. It's not true, really. Uh, gentlemen, uh, what do you think would happen to uh, you four if... Uh you came to an appearance without the armored truck and without police. We'd get in a lot easier. We wouldn't make it. We couldn't do it. It depends, you know. Sometimes we could have easily made it much better without the armored truck. 
Uh, but today, probably we wouldn't have. You think you'd be physically harmed? Oh, yeah, probably. What do you think? Yes, I think so. Uh, could be. Uh, gentlemen, the uh, New York Times Magazine of Sunday, July 3, carried an article by Maureen Cleave <laughs> in which uh, she quotes the Beatles, not by name, as uh, saying, show business is an extension of the Jewish religion. Would you mind Who amplifying did she say that? that? Uh, I said that to her as well. No comment. Oh. Come on, John. Tell us what you I mean. I mean, you can read into it what you like, you know. It's just a little old statement. It's not very serious, you know. I was wondering, under what condition did you write in his own right? That sort of wild, uh, <laughs> those kicky words. I mean, how did you, uh, you know, put the, piece them together? Oh, I don't know. And do you have any more books coming? Oh, uh, well, um... Yes, and I can't answer that. You know, it's just the way it happens. Any more books coming? I didn't think, oh, how can I do this? Just like an author. <laughs> John. I hope so, you know. John. I don't know, it'll never be the same. I understand there's a suit pending against the Beatles by Peter Best, who claims to be a former member of the Beatles. Is that oh. true? Was he once a former? Uh, I think he's had a few, but we don't bother with those. If, is this the last question? Are all of your news conferences like this? No. Well, uh, yeah, that's not the. Last I'm talking question. about all of the uh, all of the reporters uh, or would-be reporters or semi-reporters that show up. Are you besieged by these kind of people throughout the tours that you travel here in the United States? You can't always tell the would-bes from the real thing. So we Is it know. this way when you travel in Europe? Yes. But what's wrong with the, what's wrong with the crowd? Nothing. I'm just wondering if you no. have this many reporters everywhere you go. No. Mm. It's not always. But it's it's some of them are just onlookers. Oh, on on tomorrow... This, this is the last question. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow never comes. Is the last cut on the second side, right? Tomorrow never knows. Tomorrow never knows. Thank That's you. Right. Uh, could you give me a vague idea of some of the tape manipulation you used when your voice drops into the track, John? Is that sung backwards by any chance and then recorded forwards? No, it's not sung backwards. It's just. Yeah, to do that. It's just uh, recorded pretty straight. You know, there's nothing really. Uh, there's tape loops on it which are a bit different. And uh, the words are from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Oh. So there. It's there, they nearly. Mm. Oh, well. Right, uh, now can we do the presentation that we were going to do slightly earlier for Alan J. Livingston, president of Capitol Records. Uh, when the boys come here, we always take advantage of the opportunity to present them with another gold record. Uh, because there's always one or more waiting for them. There's a little significance to this particular record in that uh, by receiving this, they will have received more gold records than any artist of any kind or type in the history of the Record Industry Association. So, uh, <laughs> It's a double-barreled question directed at both George and Paul, who are the two remaining... We're not getting married now. <laughs> okay. Who are direct... That's all I wanted to know. You're both the only bachelors, and you're not yeah. going to give us any indication of what your matrimonial plans might be. In fact, no. soon we're going to just get an answering service for press conferences for that question. Thank yeah. you very much. We're both queer anyway, you know. <laughs> Write that one in your magazine. Paul, do you feel that um, your vacation here in Los Angeles was a success, even though you didn't have very much privacy? Yeah. You had a chance to relax. What was your, did you have a lot of privacy. Did you mind the girls on the hill? No. Great. What was your most enjoyable part of your vacation? Pardon? What was the most enjoyable part of your vacation? Just lazy around. Yeah, I think. I'm oh, visiting okay. elders. Uh, may I direct this question towards uh, Paul and John? I understand you're. Uh, I understand you're Dylan fans. We all are you. All we all are. are. You all Dylan fans. Even George. Even me. Yeah. Even George and Rachel. Like even the non-musical members of the group. <laughs> you don't plan on. Uh, I don't uh, want to correct Ringo, but uh, 
You'll be back from San Francisco at the time of the Dilling concert. We'll, 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 we'll leave. Play the same exactly. Night, we play the same night that he's here. He's here. And we leave, leave on Wednesday for England. For England. For England. And we saw him in Britain, you know. And it was good, but we're not going to flog it. Did any of you help Mr. Steinreich's book? Pardon? Did any of you help Mr. Steinreich's book? No, no. <laughs> no, he needed no, it, no. but we couldn't. <laughs> 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 A couple of the tunes in the uh, in help sounded as if the sound might be changing just a little, getting even more sort of traditionally blues oriented. Maybe this is just an opinion. No, Do you feel that there's any change in the sound? We, yeah, we try and change every record. You know, we've tried to change from the first record we've made. And if you progress we, musically, then you naturally change. If you play our early records and the late, even though we haven't made all that many, there's, there's a lot of difference. You know, we're not trying to do it consciously. You know. Uh, Particularly. Even re recording technique, you, if you improve that slightly, your sound changes, basically. Ringo, I understand that the record album Help has four different numbers in the English version and in the United States version. Is this uh, true, yes, and so uh, why? Yeah. Because uh, we're in on the English now. album there's 14 yeah. tracks, yeah. and they're all our numbers, and on the American one, I don't know how many tracks there are, but then you've got some... The seven of us. It's real capital side. issue, all sort of mad stuff, you know, it's nothing to do with us. We See, make 14 tracks to be put out, but they keep a couple and it's stick a them out later. It's, it's a drag because, you know, the album, we, we make an album to be like an album, and to be a and they complete thing, and we send it over here, no offence Capital, but <laughs> send it over here, and they put the soundtrack on, and if so, you know, if someone's going to buy one of our records, I think they want to hear us, and not soundtrack. They even change the photograph off the front and put something <laughs> daft on. Yeah, either that or they should make it all well, soundtrack. the Capital would like to come round after, we'll settle it. We'll see him. John and Pa. Hope so. John, did you know that four girls have been circling above your home in a helicopter? I heard about two girls that have been in a helicopter. I what? Didn't, but that's all. Was four of them. Four? Yeah. Four were they them. driving it? We were in bed at the time. What do you think of the groupies or the girls that make a business of chasing groups? I think it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> do any of you go to church? No. No, not lately. What's your program for the next few months, say, for the next three or four months? Uh, like concerts or... Uh, Depends or on whatever. what Mr. Epstein wants to see. <laughs> Does he we have a month off as soon as we get back, and it'll most probably just be TV and records and... TV and bull rings and things like that. He likes that sort of stuff. There have been some quotes on some radio stations uh, in which you put down the movie magazines. You said that the things that they are saying are unfair, like Ringo always waves, and some movie magazine said that he did not wave, yeah. and television proved it. I, my question is, do you feel that, number one, there is a difference between the treatment that you have received by movie magazines and all other magazines, and teenage magazines specifically? Well, the teen ones and the movie ones are written by people that never leave the office and they just make it all up, you know, and it's a lot of rubbish. But there's nothing we can do about it because the libel laws are so peculiar over here. <sighs> well, no, yeah, movie magazines were talking about it, the same kind of thing. You know? But the thing is the teen magazines, like Sixteen magazine, well, even though the stuff they write is still rubbish it might it's not as bad as the movie mags but it's still rubbish but there's know? some there's some great magazines you know and some crummy ones like anywhere but there's just a few more crummy ones over here i think <laughs> i mean you know you've got to admit it if if someone puts in you know is richard burton dying i've just read about leaving article. the group as he's well, leaving yes, the group so definitely no, i mean definitely, definitely what married can you do about one. that you know you can't you can't sue him here what can you do it's and fun you can't to read bring him up and say I'm not leaving the group. Where did you get this from? Because then they get big publicity out of yeah. it. So you just got to leave it. But we just keep telling everybody that they're lousy and hoping the kids will gradually cotton on. You know, just buy them for the photographs and don't thing, believe all the rubbish. The thing is, if you read them like fiction instead of fact, it's much better, you know. But you get all these letters and you're really leaving. Or is Paul married? And have you got 12 wives? And all that stuff, you know. <laughs> I love them, And though, it's worrying. It's nice to read, I've got 12 words. John and, jo and John and Paul, in creation of a Beatles song, between inception and actual creation of the product, what's the process and how long does it take? It varies. It's just sitting down and working it out, you know. It, it can take days or it can just take a couple of hours. Depends on how easy it is. Sir. Pa? pa? I'd like to ask about. Ringo, uh, which country he enjoyed touring the best? of everything that he's... Uh, America, I enjoy America, you know. It's, it's, it's so different to England. 
I mean, all the other places are different, but at least you can speak to people over here, you know. <laughs> in a way, you know. Paul, how do you, how do you go about selecting the, um, the songs you are going to do for a concert? We, we just do, on a concert, we just do songs that are known, that's all. So we just pick um, the songs that are best known. Is there one particular favorite that you do at, uh, at many of the concerts? We do, we do most of them, most of the ones that we do now. We we've, do we've most done the, at all the concerts. Mm. All our records, you know. You know us. Uh, what group do you consider the largest challenge to your popularity? Could I ask Paul? Um, yeah. <laughs> you can ask me, I don't know, though. There's a new one every week, you know. Yeah, the Silky, I think. Big challenge there. The socks. Up and coming. Do uh, any of you actually get any fan mail at all, or is it all channeled through your fan clubs? Really? We get one. We get. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we, we get it because off. 16 magazine prints at our addresses in, you know, <laughs> handily for the fans. Well, do you um, ever actually answer it, or also do you accept registered letters from fans? Yeah, we, we get a lot of mail that we answer ourselves. Did but there's so much of it the goes into fan club the branches and offices the mail all over the world. The mail is that they put self-addressed envelopes with American stamps on. If they thought a minute, they'd know that it doesn't work. They should put English ones on. Oh, would you mail it if they put English ones on? We, may, we answer quite a bit, especially when we get months off. You get to, you're standing there at nine o'clock waiting for the postman <laughs> for something to do. <laughs> Paul, you've been Paul, you've been described as having the face of a typical matinee idol. How do you feel about this? I don't feel about that, you know. I hate that. I don't know, Paul. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Rugged, rugged, okay. Uh, five o'clock matinee. Oh, uh, you know. Last summer in San Francisco, a uh, doctor said that the Beatles... Uh, were instruments of the communist uh, yeah. propaganda. <laughs> that, you were, that you were softening up and corrupting America's youth. Yes. What yes, did you uh, say to that? Watch out next yeah, year. Yeah, you know, a doctor of what? I mean, who was he to say it? Who was he, you know? He's just some half wit, yeah. They call themselves doctors and Nurses sergeants and, and things. <laughs> we're all capitalists anyway, you know, don't worry. Capitalist, get it? <laughs> It went down well in Chicago. There was a lot of criticism uh, over your being awarded the Royal uh, Order of the British Empire. We didn't Empire. get the order. We got the MBE, whatever that one is. The MBE, not the MBE, MBE. Of the British Empire. Yeah. Not the Royal Order. order. Yeah, but the order's it's a the better one. one. Anyway, yeah, we got the it's the first step on the way to knighthood, right? It isn't. Isn't at all. I thought it was. We don't give enough to charity for It is for some I right. see. But anyway, there were some members who had received the same award yeah. who had turned yeah. theirs in. Well, what is your reaction to this? Well, ours were civil awards, and theirs were sort of, what are they? What are they Military heroes. Military, they got them yeah, for yeah. killing people, and I think, you know, we deserve we ours kill for not killing people. Anyway, you know, we've got them, and they haven't. Um, yeah, and most of them were <laughs> French-Canadians, you know. You know what they're already moaning about. <laughs> if they send any more. Oh, back, what uh, what great. American group do you admire the most? The birds. The birds. Yeah. And they admire the loving spoonful. <laughs> yeah, they like the loving spoonful. I'd like to uh, direct this question to any one of you. Is it true? We heard a rumor over here that your English, uh, as your British version of the last movie. Hard Day's Night was longer than ours over here. Is this true? No. No. And were there portions, uh, a great deal of the movie help cut? You get no, the same film is. You get nearly, gets... nearly the same film, only we well, have to... Uh, the same film. I think I think you do, but the thing is, for America, we have to cut out the word toilet. Exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> we have to call it a bathroom for oh, America. Yeah, right, this, is, this has to be the last question. That's true. That's true. We have to cut out a few words, because they What do you take think of your uh, movie, A Hard Day's Night, being nominated for an Academy Award? What do you think of that? It's funny, isn't it? That's all uh, I uh, there's, there's been a lot of controversy over the fact that since there's so much screaming at your concerts, you don't sort of rehearse them before or worry too much about them. Is that true? We never have. Well, we always we sing were... songs that, we've been, that we know. Because so we must know them because we recorded them, so we don't need to rehearse them, do we? And it doesn't bother us. The only thing we've got to know is which ones we're time, doing. The no. thing is, you know, we still don't rehearse for places where they can hear us, like on the Ed Sullivan show. And, you know, when, the, on the, when it comes on television, you can hear it. Sort of, uh, you know, much better than at a concert. We still don't rehearse for that. We never have, you know.
I read something recently that you are Nervous worrying it. about <laughs> <laughs> worrying about the Beatles being brought down. Certain people are interesting interested in getting the Beatles over with. Uh, oh, I don't know. Meeting. I think that's a bit of a one that's you know, I don't really know about that story, honestly. There's no be I've never said there's no need to like get pull us down. Yeah. And I agree that if there was if we were slipping there's lots of people that clap hands, Daddy come home. What kind but of people do you think would be interested? I don't know because they never show themselves until that time arises when it's ripe for them. Do you feel you are slipping? We don't feel we're slipping. Our music's better. Our sales might be less. So in our view, we're not slipping. Yeah. How many years do you think you can you can go on? Have you thought about that? It doesn't matter, you know. The thing is, we just you just try and go forward. And the thing is, if we do slip, it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, so what? You know, we slip, and so we're not popular anymore. So we'll be all sun popular, won't we? You know, we'll be like we can't control, maybe. And we can't invent a new gimmick to keep us going like people imagine we do. Did you say that Britain is becoming a police state? Oh, I'll tell you, we've really been putting our feet in it lately. <laughs> you can't say anything, you know, without it turning into the worst quote ever. I mean, somebody just in passing saying it to a friend, you see. That's what we forget we're Beatles sometimes. You can't help it. We're still us inside. And if you say something like that, I didn't say it, it was one other. But when you say something like, Britain's becoming a police state, you say it exactly the same as anybody in a pub saying it to their friend across the bar. About some sweeping statement, which anyway, they can't it, back up anyway. And it's obvious it's not to be taken literally, because if it was, then you wouldn't be allowed to say that, would you? to ask you, um, when you, with your music and your lyrics, uh, do you write the lyrics or do you write the music? Is John is the other way around with John? No, with the, with the songs that we write, we both write lyrics and music. And it depends, you know, like with uh, some songs I write lyrics and music, and so does John with some other songs. On some, we just get together and just do a line each, you know, words and music each. Depends, you know, how it happens and what kind of mood we're in. It's, it's normally no formula about it, though. How did you feel about your performance out there today? I think it's answered all enjoyed the questions, it. don't you? I enjoyed it, you know, it was quite good. The thing was that the amps uh, broke down, you know, in one of the numbers. Because uh, there was some business with the one of the wires broke or something, so which was a bit of a drag, you know. But uh, nobody seemed to notice. <laughs> Do you think that the uh, this god thing is quashed forever now? Well, it should be, you know. I mean, the amount of time we spent on it, and the you know, we, I don't know, all last night trying to explain to everyone about it. So we didn't really mean it like that, you know. And I think, uh, you know, from what I've seen of the people who've heard what we had to say about it, they, they seem to think it's okay now, you know. It should be, you know, because, I mean, I didn't think it was ever un-okay. <laughs> about the uh, Revolver album, the, the Indian sounds that you're getting on it, yeah. who is mainly responsible for this side of the... The Indian, the Indian yeah, sounds are uh, George. Yeah. George has been stuck. De definitely mainly George, because uh, we started off, you know, just hearing Indian music and sort of listening to things, and we liked the drone idea, because we'd done a bit of that kind of thing in songs before, you know. But George got very interested in it and went to a couple of Ravi Shankar concerts, and then he sort of met Ravi and sort of was knocked out by him and thought, like, just as a person, he's, a, he's an incredible fella, you know, he's, he's one of the greatest. And... Uh, he thought he didn't know that George was serious about it. And so when he found out George was serious, he was knocked out too. So the two of them are having a great time. <laughs> and, you know, that's how we've got Indian sounds on at the moment. Because the thing is, anyway, it's nice to sort of start bridging the two kinds of music. You know, because we, we just started off in a very simple way. And then this album's got a bit better. I mean, it's a little bit more like Indian music. And it helps people to understand it too, because it's very, it's a very hard at first to understand, yeah. But once you get into it, it's the greatest. Who decided on this uh, Tomorrow Never Knows Weird Effects? Uh, weird Effects. Uh, well, see, we wrote the song, and it was a very funny start song from the start, because John came up with the lyrics to it. And he'd just been reading Tibetan Book of the Dead. And he, want, he was dead impressed by it, you know, very impressed. <laughs> and uh, he decided that he'd... Um, 
write the song and we only had one verse and I think we stretched it to sort of two verses and we couldn't think of any more words because we sort of said it all what we wanted to say in about two verses so we had to try and work out how to sort of do it and how to make it different so I decided to do some of those those loops that I've been doing on my home tape recorder and they're just tape loops and I've been making them so I just took a longer a, a, a bag full of six tape loops to the session and we just tried them and mixed them in and brought them in in those places and so, uh, so I suppose it was sort of vaguely my idea that bit of it Did you find opposition from people who want you to play to the teenagers? Yeah, well the thing is you see uh, we've kept quite a few songs on the album I mean if we just suddenly did exactly what we'd want to do um, in fact I think actually at the moment that is what we want to do what we did what we've done on Revolver but if we did, like, all the way out things, I mean, I suppose people think they're way out. I don't, actually, but that, that kind of thing. If we did all, a whole album of them, then uh, we'd be doing what, like, the people who do electronic music do. They go too far out too suddenly, and no one stays with them. You know, everyone else is left behind because they're miles out ahead, sort of digging all this electronic stuff. But, in fact, what we've tried to do is, like, do the last album, Rubber Soul, a bit more towards that then this one a bit more and the next one should be a bit more and if people stay with us you know it's great Lovely. who de who decided the two tracks to go as a single from the from the uh, lp yeah um i think we all did you know i think it was a case of we knew that when the album came out there would be uh, quite a few people going to cover it so we thought we might as well have the hit you know <laughs> I think Rick will be another uh, yesterday. I don't know. I don't think you actually. The only thing that's similar to yesterday is the fact that uh, there's uh, violins and string instruments on it. Apart from that, I think it's nothing to do with it. Yeah. Completely different kind of tune. I think it's uh, better in a way. But I sang yesterday better. I sang Ellen Rick terrible. <laughs> wow. No, no it's, oh. you listen to it, you know, and it's. Uh, I've listened we well. Do. Okay. <laughs> I actually don't know what. Uh, your music now is improving every time and you're making uh, the lyrics uh, more interesting also, aren't you? Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, if we stayed where we were in, say, 1960 when we were doing Love Me Do and then um, Please Please Me and From Me To You, which was one kind of thing, you know, it was a kind of thing people liked. The thing is, if we did that now, I think... Um, our fans, so the kind of fans that we got now, wouldn't like that too much because it'd be going back and it'd be retracing your steps, you know. And also, from our point of view, we're never going to do that because I mean, if we ever have to do that, if anyone suddenly says you're going too way out, you've got to get back to then. But we'll give up, you know. Recently, at the last press uh, reception, which I didn't think it was too grand, uh, we had in Washington, that is. Yeah. Uh, the questions that were asked, one of them said that we're on about the crowds at the stadiums just recently. And uh, they wanted to know how you felt about it because they were, say, 20,000, 25,000, where before you used to get more. But yeah, I don't mind about that. You know, the thing is, the people keep saying to us, look, your record sales have gone down and your concert appearances have gone down. But the thing is that uh, compared with anyone else, they haven't. And the only people who set the records beforehand were us, you know, like for, uh, for, for the concerts. But apparently, at the moment, we still play to more people than any other group does. That's correct. And so, I mean, you know, that doesn't worry us, because everyone else goes down in proportion. I mean, the only time if we were going to be worried by the whole sort of rat race, which we're not, you know, it's, it doesn't really worry us. But if it did worry us, it might be when, for instance, another group started selling more records or more seats than us. Then we might get a bit, a bit worried, you know, but this doesn't worry us at all. We're still doing more fine, you know. But don't you think that the time when it comes, when there will be no more open-air performances or indoor performances for you, that your records will still be going on selling even ten years from now? Well, I don't know. You see, this is the thing, actually, that, that we are more interested, really, in, in making music than we are um, probably in actually performing it, because we're not very good performers, you know. We're, we haven't ever been able, really, to do what we've been able to do on records, on the stage. And also, when you, we play these big concerts, you know, it gets a bit more impossible each time to sort of get over to the people what you're trying to get over. So we're, we're tending a bit more to get this over on records, you know, in the lyrics of words and the, in the lyrics of songs, I mean. Uh, you know, so that, that I think that's getting a bit more important, and I hope it does go on for about, you know, 
as long as you like. Latch, then, with your recordings and also coming about your open performances, you're improving yourself each time. Well, I hope so, you know. I, I think probably we are, you know. But, um, yeah, we're trying to anyway. Now, uh, speaking of back home in England, Paul, where is it you're exactly living now? Is it in the centre of London or, or uh, out on one of the counties? Like No, it's just about uh, two minutes outside London in St. John's Wood, you know. St. John's Wood. Oh. Yeah. You're not living in uh, Serb uh, Weybridge or no, no. with the other lads? And... No, well, you see, the kind of house I wanted is that, like only exists sort of... Well, mainly exists a couple of minutes out of London. And also, I like cities, you know, so uh, I, got, I got the house there. I mean, I did think, obviously, you know, well, I ought to sort of go out to Weybridge and things, but, I mean, I've talked to the others about it since, and we both, we've all decided that it was would be silly for me to, like, buy a house in Weybridge that I wasn't very keen on. Um, you know, just to sort of go along with the whole thing. And we can still get to see each other dead easily. You know, I mean, we only live sort of an... Uh, for the most, say, half an hour away from each other. So we're still in pretty good contact, you know, and if I want to go out for a swim, I go out to their place. Oh, marvellous. Well, now, when you get back home from this tour, will you be taking a holiday, say, in Spain or somewhere like this? Uh... I don't know, actually. I may do. We've got a few weeks off, you know. But I know, see, for instance, we want to do a record for Christmas. You know, we want to have a record for Christmas. So we've got to start thinking about that now. You know, we've got to start thinking about... The, the next film that we do. So there's a lot of things, you know, it's like these people who start opening Christmas clubs in June. Mm. You know, we've got to start thinking about things like that now. So uh, it, it, it may, it'll be a holiday, but I think it'll be a holiday in which we'll be trying to think of things for when it isn't a holiday, you know. But, I mean, we'll take it easy. I heard you uh, took a trip to Spain before once, didn't you, on holiday? Mm. I didn't go to Spain, no. Uh, I tried once to make Spain, but and John and I were going to hitchhike. <laughs> But we hitchhiked down from Liverpool. Uh, we didn't hitchhike. No, we got the train down from Liverpool because we thought, well, we won't hitchhike the first bit. And we got the boat over to Paris. And we got the train into Paris because we thought, well, it'd be too hard to get, get a hitch here. And we just stayed in Paris all week. Eventually, I, I mean, all the time trying to get out of Paris and make Spain, you know. We never made it. We just flew home at the end. <laughs> Real lazy hitchhiking holiday. Um, by the way, I'd like to ask you just one more. Because what do you think about the other night at Cleveland when we had the great rush of the... Uh, young people there for the show. Well, How would you feel about that? Well, the thing is, you see, that the, I was talking to someone about our shows, and I was saying that the great thing nowadays about our shows is uh, it's a completely different thing from what it used to be. It used to be that we performed and that everyone sort of sat back and listened to us in the very early days and occasionally sort of joined in. But as it's gone bigger and bigger and, and, uh, and the whole thing has sort of improved a lot, uh, it's got now... It's gone along the track of the audience participating an awful lot, you know. So, I mean, now, for instance, when the kids are all shouting and things, it's part of our show. You know, the, the audience is half of our show, you know, easily. And we're sort of less of our show than we used to be. But, I mean, we don't mind that. It's great to have somebody else working on a show with you. You know, it's like all those people are in our act, you know. Yeah. So that's fine. I mean, we'd love that. And so, for instance, when they do break through and things, as long as, like, nobody gets hurt, and as long as it's not too dangerous. Because, I mean, you yeah, know, we've been through more dangerous things. We used to have fights when we started off, I mean, in the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, we were a lot more dangerous than that. Like, there'd be a hundred fellas fighting another hundred from the next district. And, you know, there'd be bottles and chairs going all over the place. And that was more dangerous than it gets now. So, I mean, it doesn't particularly worry us. As long as nobody else get hurt, gets hurt, we, we love it. Love every minute of it. But actually, I think the other night at Cleveland, when all these youngsters siege forward, yeah. it wasn't the act of violence or anything like this. It oh, was more no. love for you than anything else. But, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think any of them are violent. You know, they just come along. There's maybe one or two in a crowd of about a thousand that's violent. But generally, they just want to... I mean, for instance, the other night, they all just came to the front of the stage. Nobody really tried to make much effort to get up on the stage, you know. Admittedly, there were a sort of big gang of coppers saying, get off. But uh, I think they just wanted to sort of see us, listen to us and that, you know. It wasn't too bad at all. I enjoyed it. Well, actually, what we're trying to say now is that uh, the Beatlemania is still here in America and you're still loved, even though the papers might uh, put uh, words differently. So oh, yeah, you listen, proved the point, haven't you? Well, I think the thing is that, like, every newspaper anywhere, when, it, when they get articles about Beatlemania and, you know, so many seats sold out and things. 
They can't go on forever writing that because it's no longer news after a bit. They've got to start knocking because it's the only way they can get any news out of it, you know, and talk about us or else they don't talk about us. So they try and find sort of the knocking things in what we say, like John's remark on Christianity, you know, and they try and knock it because it makes a big news story for them. But, uh, I, you know, it doesn't worry us that because, I mean, we just go along, we do the same things we always did. Uh, in a way, and we don't worry about them. As charismatic as he is outgoing and controversial, Alistair Taylor was one of the best interviews I ever had relating to the Beatles. He was quick, on target, and really, really funny. We spoke together in a New York hotel room in the late 80s about, well, just about everything relating to his time with the Fab Four. Long since having left show business completely, Alistair looks back on his time with the Beatles with a mixture of regret deep emotion, compassion, and as I said, a great sense of humor. We began our conversation by discussing the untimely death of Brian Epstein. Yes, I don't think, you know, there's a lot been said about how he went around saying they were going to be bigger than Elvis and all that. I don't... I, I can't remember it being as, as blatant as that. I don't know what the right word is. Uh, I mean, we were enthusiastic, he was, and we went for lunch that same day and we sat and we talked and what we should do. But I think it was. I think that the great excitement came a little later when it dawned on him what that, that he'd signed them. You know, uh, it was just something new. It was. It, it was fun. I mean, he came and twice. I had a phone call from him saying goodbye. He was committing suicide. You know, and I've often said, in many ways, I would have been happier, I suppose, if he had committed suicide. You don't think he did? No, no, he didn't. What happened? Accidental death. I was there behind the doctor, 30 seconds. You see, this is the, the times I have been asked the question, why did he commit suicide? And I want someone to tell me where it is said that he committed suicide. The verdict by the coroner was accidental death. The whole survey revealed accidental death. I have never, there were only two people in that room. One was the doctor and one was myself, right? And I've never said it was suicide. You know, I've heard stories about there was a note found. Well, I didn't find it. There's a lot of bullshit been talked about Apple. Right. Apple was set up purely and simply as a tax-saving project. Instead of paying 19 and 6 in the pound, we could only pay 16 shillings, right? And at, at, in the beginning, when there was an executive board of Apple, the boys and Brian didn't want to know, right? It was Clive Epstein... Myself, Jeffrey Ellis, a solicitor and an accountant. And the idea was that we would just quietly get on and announce to the tax authorities that we would be opening a string of shops. That was the original idea. And the boys heard about this and they decided this could be boring, right? And they didn't want their name above a string of what the original idea was, was greetings card shops. You know, imagine Beatles greeting card shops. And they didn't dig that at all. And they started drifting in on meetings. And it evolved from that. And it really became more so that it turned into this silly philosophy, admittedly. But all it really was, was to get rid of the hassle of big business. Why couldn't business be fun and pleasure? That's all. That's what it was all about. Neil Innes, a founder member of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, Monty Python, and the acting talent behind the role of Nasty in the Ruttles, recalls the incredible burden of being a real live Beatle. As it must be, you know, quite grueling to sort of be placed when, you know, in such a thing, because you've made some popular records and you're a rock and roll band that people will bring people in wheelchairs up to you so that you can touch them and Heal them. make them better, you know. So, uh, on the whole, it doesn't, you know, make for a healthy ego, all that stuff. But on the whole, I think all the Beatles survived the madness of it, you know, really quite well. Australian-born broadcaster, author and journalist Richie York seems to have been around forever. Wherever there was a scene, Richie inevitably found his way in, and not only hung out, but contributed to the buzz that was happening. In 1969, he worked as a personal assistant to John and Yoko for some time. He was there when John met Prime Minister Trudeau in Canada, was standing right behind the often beleaguered Beatle at the Ontario Science Centre for his peace conference, 
and helped to organize the biggest rock festival that never was, John and Yoko's infamous Peace Festival of 1969. We talked about all this and more in 1982 at my home in Toronto. John grew and Paul didn't. I guess that's what it comes down to. But yeah, John grew with Yoko. You know, I mean, it was like you can't give her the rap of breaking him up or anything like that. I mean, John certainly imposed them. You know, on the Letter B film session, opposed, you know, said, uh, and they'd always been together, the four of them making the records, that Yoko had to be in on it. You know, that was the, he wouldn't come unless Yoko was there, so. Because she was like a fifth Beatle to them. They sort of th- saw it coming between them and John, but he wanted to demonstrate his independence. He wanted to say, hey, you know, but there, I do what I like, boys. You do what you like. I do what I like, you know, that was John's attitude. Yeah, he had the bag one office. He had the front room, the best room in the place. Uh-huh. It was the bag one office, yeah. But it was autonomous, and that created a lot of ill feeling among the office staff. I mean, Derek on down, no one liked, or Peter Brown, any of them. None of them liked the fact that John realized he didn't want to be part of this trip. I mean, a lot of intrigues were going on, too, in the you know, Apple empire with Alan Klein trying to get in and John trying to get him in and not knowing who you could trust. John was real keen on him at the time. You know, he thought he would, you know, straighten out the business thing. But, you know, I mean, I could see, you know, I didn't like Alan Klein personally. No, I didn't. But, you know, I mean, I could see, you know, you know, where it was coming from, and, and he was desperately afraid of anything to do with the peace venture whatsoever because it hit Alan's client big plan was to put the Beatles back in the road early in 1970 for one farewell tour, and he was starting to put that together. And he figured he could get John and Paul back together, you know, and he had John sort of half enthused about it, you know. In mid-1994, Harry Nielsen, that famous singer from the 60s and 70s, passed away at home of a heart attack. Like his good friend Keith Moon before him, Harry had lived many lifetimes within his short years. One of his most famous roles, though, was as John Lennon's best friend, a relationship he coveted right up until the day he died. I spoke to him about John, the Beatles, and much more at an anti-handgun rally in New York. I had to hold uh, Ringo's hand for a week. You know what that's like? It's like saying, listen, man, if I could take it from you, I would. You know, but but I can't. But if I would, I could. I just can't. There's nothing I could do. But let's do something about it, maybe. You know, let's put it into some of the stupidity. Ringo and I speak uh, a couple times a week. We're very, very dear friends. Good night, Ringo. Sleep uh, tight. He's my pal. He was best man at a wedding. He's one of the. He's one of the dearest friends you can have in life. He's godfather to our children. And if I hope I'm his best pal in life, you know. George and I are very, very good friends. Paul is just Paul. I don't know. I've known Paul over the years, but I don't know him like Ringo or George. You know, I knew John a lot more than Paul. Paul is an amazing guy. Smokes his joints and whistles his way through life. You know, I God bless him too. Shambhu Das, Ravi Shankar's longtime aide, remembers the Beatles' search for something beyond the incredible success that they had wrought for themselves. The, all the Beatles came uh, to India? India with. Um, Maharshi, transcendental meditation, Maharshi. What I feel, they are looking for something in the life beyond, beyond the uh, reputation, beyond the money, beyond the, some kind of a, a settlement, settlement, peace, whatever you say. Probably they are looking for that kind of uh, peace of mind or something. Perhaps my biggest coup as a journalist to date was my 1983 interview with Yoko Ono at her Dakota apartment home in New York. Here's a brief snippet of our conversation. After John died, uh, somehow, when people call me Mrs. Lennon, I felt good about it. When people write to me saying, well, you know, we're grieved over John's death and uh, we just wanted to know how his widow was doing or whatever. You know, and that would have maybe uh, made me feel a bit strange uh, two years ago, you know, mm-hmm. but now I sort of I'm grateful that people are writing uh, because they love John and concerned about, by the way, his family. That's fine. Yes, I am, by the way, family. <laughs> you know, let's say that uh, that uh, it mellowed me in a way. As Yoko, and I'm very mellowed uh, to the point that yes, it's all right that I I am Mrs. Lennon. You know, and it's a nice new feeling that I'm sort of enjoying. So that uh, independence thing is rapidly sort of disappearing. Yeah. And um, if John thought of it's all right, and that's why I slapped it on my album, that's fine. Thank you very much, John. You know, that's the feeling. Part of us, of course, uh, John and I felt that we know it all. And, 
uh, seems like we uh, know about enlightenment and this and that. So um, there was that arrogant side of us, and this was like a big hammer from above saying, well, just remember you don't know it, you know, <laughs> there's a lot more to learn. And, you know, I feel that now John is helping me through Sean. Or start your own label and if so, where is it going to be? We'd never start our own label, it's too much trouble, you know. I don't know, it's all, that'll be all up to Mr. Epstein. How long before your contract does terminate with Capital? I don't know. I don't even remember signing it. A year. It lasts another year. Hi, Jeff. I'd like to ask you all a personal question while you're here. How can you sleep at night with that lock? Well, when you sleep, you don't notice. True. How do you sleep with your arms and your legs still attached? Just the same. We got you to it for years, you know. People have only had short hair since the World War. So they've been sleeping for all those thousands of years with long hair. How are you used to sleeping with it short? I don't know. Maybe that's why we've been up every night for the last year. Yeah, maybe that's why we have parties. That's it. We can't, that's it. We can't sleep with this long hair. When we arrived in London in 1968, uh, our small party decided that the best way to become known, Prabhupada wanted us to make a splash. So the best way to become known would be reach the Beatles because they were luminaries of the time. So we <laughs> agreed that we would make prashadam dishes, apple dishes, to bring to Apple Records every day and see if we could catch someone's attention. So we did that, and uh, the prashad went from the lower floors to the upper floors, so that ultimately everyone tasted some the prashad, and they became a little addicted to that. So finally, when we stopped uh, sending prashad, we were notified, where is this, uh, where is this uh, Apple Hare Krishna group? So we uh, came to meet them and ultimately, I think, met George that day. And when George heard that we were into transcendental chanting and uh, chanting Hare Krishna, he really wanted to hear us. And almost right away, we started having really good kirtans with him at his house and said, I want to record this. And so the first thing we did was the Hare Krishna mantra on a 45 and I believe it's the Sri Krishna on the back side. That became number one in Czechoslovakia, it was top ten, top the pops in England. And then that led to the larger uh, album, the Govindam album. So Srila Prabhupada was of course very happy with the involvement that we were having with the Beatles. We ultimately lived at John Lennon's Tittenhurst estate for much of the fall of 69. And um, when Srila Prabhupada finally did arrive, he was so very pleased uh, of this connection. Jeffrey Giuliano is the author of some 30 internationally best-selling books on the Beatles, John Lennon, and other iconic musicians of the 1960s. In 2006, his book, Paint It Black, the Murder of Brian Jones was made into a film by Stephen Woolley and Nick Powell entitled Stoned, The Wild and Wicked World of Brian Jones. It remains a cult classic and the only film bio of the Rolling Stones. Giuliano is also a veteran journalist, having written for dozens of high-profile newspapers and magazines, including The Sunday People, The Daily Mail, The News of the World, The Mail on Sunday, Playgirl, and Rolling Stone. A noted film actor, Giuliano starred in such movies as Vikingdom, Scorpion King 3, Jules Verne's The Mysterious Island, The Fifth Execution, Far Cry 3, Firefire Desire, among many. In addition, he hosted the long-running North American syndicated radio series, Jeffrey Giuliano's Roots of Rock, for five years, as well as pioneering the audiobook industry in the 1990s by authoring, narrating, and producing over 250 original, non-book-based, interview-driven productions. 
Giuliano's publishers included Random House, HarperCollins, Delta Entertainment, Dirk and Hayes, Playaway Audio, Speechworks, and B&B Audio, among dozens more internationally. In 1998, Random House acquired his firm Tribute Audio, for which Giuliano acted as CEO and publisher for five years. His best-selling audiobook, That Fateful Night, True Stories of Titanic Survivors in Their Own Words, was nominated for a Grammy. In 2014, Jeffrey Giuliano founded Icon Editions and G2 Media Arts to market his updated works as well as publish new projects. As a visual artist, Jeffrey has been showing in galleries across America since 1977, garnering impressive reviews. His first professional assignment was designing several t-shirts for The Who's Pete Townsend in 1976. Jeffrey also designed and illustrated many of his original rock biographies for the biggest publishers in the world from 1984 to 2006, as well as designing for his pioneering record label, Samba Records, in the mid-1990s. From 2006 to 2011, Jeffrey was also the primary designer for the French fashion house Cotai. When Giuliano first conceived of creating his own literary imprint, Icon Editions, he became responsible for illustrating and designing 35 book covers, several hundred CDs, DVDs, as well as dozens of promotional posters, and eventually, an entire collection of exclusive fashion and art. The expansive design by Giuliano brand grew out of Jeffrey's impressive commitment to the arts and is the culmination of a lifetime's work by an extraordinarily talented and determined Renaissance man. Your host and narrator, Jeffrey Giuliano. We hope you've enjoyed this Icon Audio presentation. Icon Audio Arts. Thank you for listening.